Regenesis Code, The Cosmic Conspiracy, Book 1, by Dr. Douglas Hamp and Monet Theonison. Copyright 2023 by Dr. Douglas Hamp. All rights reserved. No part of this book may be used or reproduced in any manner without written permission except for brief quotations for articles or reviews. Published by Eschaton Media Group. Read by Dr. Douglas Hamp. Chapter 1. In Defense of Israel. Damascus, 2038. In the distance, a man on a white horse galloped at surprising speed. As the horseman drew near, Caleb realized it was a horse's body with a man's torso, like a centaur, yet different. The creature had a man's head and a lion's head, wings and a scorpion's tail, in its right hand a bow. Just as the centaur beast was upon him, Caleb threw himself to one side. The wind of the passing creature hit his face as he escaped being trampled by mere inches. He quickly got to his feet and faced the beast, who had now turned around and was staring at him. Caleb, it is time for Israel, a voice spoke as Caleb heard a piercing sound pulsing through his mind. Beep, beep, beep. Caleb's earpiece woke him up. It was time. With the cover of nightfall, the operation could begin. As a highly trained and seasoned Israeli soldier, he could usually take a power nap and jump right into action. Refocusing from his disturbing dream, he forced himself to begin scanning the area using thermals from Israel's stealth surveillance drone. Caleb carefully noted where all the warm bodies were in the building. The situation on the ground floor was unknown. He knew there was also a possibility of tunnels underneath the building leading to different entrances further away, although Raven's intel did not contain any such information. By his reckoning, their mark would not have entered through the front gate if a tunnel was an option. So far, there were no surprises. Their intense preparation for the mission was paying off. For three days, they had run drills, repeatedly preparing for various scenarios. Each scenario was given a sequence number, Alpha 1 through 5, which the team had all memorized. They had identified blind spots where they could breach the enemy complex and were ready. Caleb was prepared to defend Israel from any hostile force at any cost. Caleb had passionately defended his homeland for as long as he could remember during his 38 years. It was Israel who had considered him family worth fighting for after the death of his biological parents in Russia. Israel genuinely wanted him and cherished him. It was a debt he could never repay. Sure, Israel had its issues and people could be people like anywhere else. Yet there was something special about the land, about the people, and the culture. Now he would defend his homeland even if it meant going secretly to Damascus to ferret out the one man who had sworn to destroy Israel. Many had made a similar vow to wipe Israel off the map. Nevertheless, this man was different. He also had the means, the network, the weapons, and the military intelligence to do it. Chief of Staff and Commander of Israel's military forces, Brigadier Magan Daron, looked at his tablet that had just pinged. He relayed the intel to Prime Minister Eitan Baruch, who was also present in the Israeli military headquarters at an undisclosed location in Israel. We have confirmation from Raven. The target is in the building. Coordinates received. We need to move now. Prime Minister? Eitan snapped back to reality. The team's in position. Do we have a go? asked Brigadier Doron. The atmosphere in the room was tense. Present were the generals of the various military branches, Defense Minister Yitzhak Leibovitz with his deputy, and the directors of Mossad and Shin Bet representing the intelligence agencies. All eyes were fixed on the Prime Minister. Eitan clasped his hands together and asked, How sure are we on the intel? Daron tensed up. He knew his men were well prepared. They had intently studied surveillance and satellite feeds of the complex, movements of personnel, as well as video clips and photos from inside the building. Israeli agent, codenamed Raven, had been undercover for more than four years within the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and had been able to send the intel from a secure phone. Earlier that day, a convoy of vehicles had entered the compound. If the intel was accurate, it would have been General Gorabian, which meant the WMDs, the weapons of mass destruction, were likely already somewhere on the premises. As soon as Raven had clear confirmation, he would send a tracking pin to Israeli military command who would give the go order. Brigadier Daron said clearly, the intel's good. We need to proceed now or we will lose Gorabian. This was a tan's moment. He finally nodded and said, proceed. 
The general nodded to the communications officer who then sent the message. Hashem be with you, Eitan prayed under his breath, invoking God's blessing. A notification flashed in Caleb's display. He tapped on the panel. A rotating 3D schematic of the complex popped up with the three areas highlighted where the unit would penetrate. Caleb swiped across the panel, sending the pin to the rest of the unit. Text appeared, proceed. Caleb tapped his throat mic and said, two is a go, Alpha 4. Opposite the entrance to the complex, a car sped into the intersection without stopping. Another vehicle traveling at high speed from the adjoining road smashed into its side. The sound of the impact combined with the crunching metal and shattered glass reverberated through the street. The drivers of both vehicles jumped out of their cars. The collision activated the alarm of the first vehicle, which had a piercingly loud siren. Traffic stopped and was backing up fast. Car horns honked up and down the road, adding to the chaos. You idiot! Look at what you did! You could have killed me! Shouted the first driver, a man taller than the average Syrian with a full beard and dark eyebrows. Me? This was your fault! You didn't stop! The second driver snapped back, pointing in the direction of the intersection. He hadn't noticed the cut on his forehead. Though he was shorter than the other guy, he was stocky with thick forearms. He added, You're going to pay for this. I'm not going to pay... You'll pay if you know what's good for you. Are you threatening me? Don't you threaten. The tall guy smashed his fist into the mouth of the other driver, but it didn't quite have the impact he expected. The shorter guy hit back fast and hard. Punches became grapples as the two rustled onto the hood of the car while loudly screaming and cursing each other. Subhi, the gate commander at the complex, came running out, rifle in hand, shouting, Stop! Stop it, you fools! He thumped each of the men with the butt of the rifle. Ouch! Move your cars out of the road. Now, you're holding up traffic. You can't stay here. My car won't start. It's his fault. No, it's not. He didn't stop at the intersection. I don't care whose fault it is, the soldier said as he aimed his rifle at them. If you don't move these cars now, I'll have you both thrown in jail. Or I'll just shoot you here on the spot. Now move it. You, help him push his car to the side of the road and then park yours there in front of it until the police get here. Do it. And cut that damn alarm. Begrudgingly, the two complied while still cursing each other under their breath. With all the commotion, the distracted guards on the roof didn't notice the dark figures scaling the walls at the rear of the complex. Caleb bounded silently to the roof, followed by Sergeant Natan Davidi. Two other men dressed in enhanced black spandex-like suits appeared from the shadows, each finding their section on the wall. Three cables with grapplers arced through the sky to the roof, anchoring behind the cement parapet. A rapid electronic pulley system helped propel the men up the wall quickly. On the roof, they found their hiding spot right away, as rehearsed. Further along the wall, Brovsky was about to reach the roof when a section of wall anchoring his grappling hook gave way, sending him hurtling back 20 feet toward the ground below. He hit with a loud thud and a groan. Stunned from the fall, Brovsky tried to get up, but found it difficult to move. The noise drew the attention of the lookout stationed on the roof. The one named Amar looked at his nephew, Rahul, and asked, Did you hear something? What was that? Rahul shook his head and guessed, It was just a dog or something. Go look, Amar yelled. Rahul casually glanced around and shrugged and said, There's nothing there. Amar had stuck his neck out getting his nephew this job. Now he wasn't paying attention when he should be. So Amar scolded, Rahul, I've had a bad feeling in my stomach all night. I'm telling you, something is going to happen, and if you don't pay attention, it will be the end of you. This isn't training. This is the real thing. Now do what I tell you. Rahul could see that his uncle was serious. He looked across the roof again. That time, he became aware of all the potential hiding places. Maybe there really was something brewing. Go look over there. I'll go this way, Amar said as he pointed toward where Brovsky fell. Rahul looked around nervously and walked back toward the edge of the roof. There was just enough light coming across the rooftop to create long shadows. Was there something hiding in the shadows? Rahul clutched his AK-12 tighter with his finger on the trigger. Amar walked in the other direction. His instincts told him something wasn't right, but he didn't want to break radio silence without a good reason. He remembered his humiliation all too well from the last time that happened. 5,000 militants were mobilized because of Amar's false alarm. He could have sworn it was Israeli spec ops planting a bomb. Amar had an obsession with Israel and suspected everyone of being an Israeli spy, even his own family members. 
He often fantasized about taking down an Israeli cell and his imagination often ran away with him. Turns out the supposed bomb planters were actually a crew from Damascus sewerage repairing a busted sewer pipe. When thousands of gun-wielding militia descended upon those poor souls, they thought it was their end. It took weeks to convince them to return and fix the pipes. The commander called Amar a brainless fool in front of everyone. He was the butt of their jokes for months. Amar was forced to do bathroom duties until the repairman agreed to come back and finish the job. He also had to redo his military training along with the new recruits. This was his first assignment again with the militia, and he was determined to show them they were all wrong about him. That night, the commander threatened them all within an inch of their lives if anyone messed up, especially in front of General Garabian from Iran. The commander was determined to make a good impression. Amar walked along the edge of the building to see if he noticed anything out of place. He saw their soldiers were inside the compound along with some elite Iranian revolutionary guards who had escorted the general. They were supposed to be the best of the best, and they acted as if they believed it. Amar saw one of them barking orders at another guard. Amar sneered. Persians, humph, they think they're better than us Arabs, just like the Turks, always acting like they are our masters and saviors. But we Arabs are the children of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and our father Ibrahim. We are the chosen ones, not them, he spat on the ground. From the roof, Amar saw the gate guards talking to each other, and he tried to get their attention. He wanted to ask them to check the perimeter monitors for anything suspicious. Subhi! He whispered called to the one he knew, but Subhi didn't respond. Surely he heard him. Subhi! Subhi didn't react to Amar, but instead turned and walked the other way toward the main compound. He was probably just trying to impress the Iranians and didn't want to look like a fool talking to the guy in the roof. Amar began to hope there really was a threat, and he would be the one to neutralize it. He imagined himself killing some Israelis and chuckled. Yes, then nobody would make fun of Amar again. He walked back to check on Rahul and saw him just standing there on the side of the roof, blowing smoke. What was the fool doing? Was he seriously taking a smoke break? Didn't he know they could see him on the monitors? He would make them both look like incompetent idiots. Amar's blood pressure rose. He ran over to him and grabbed his arm. He barked with clenched teeth. Rahul, you imbecile! What the hell are you doing? It wasn't Rahul standing there, but Caleb dressed in Rahul's clothes. In a moment, Caleb's knife did its work. As the life drained from Amar's body, he felt a fleeting sense of relief. He was right. Who's the fool now? He thought as he exhaled his last breath. Curiously, Caleb could swear the man was smiling. He took no joy in killing others. As a fourth-degree black belt Krav Maga practitioner, he learned to be lethal only in self-defense. Sadly, when another country threatened Israel's very existence, he had to respond in self-defense. At the gate, the real Subhi and his partner had previously been taken out by the two drivers who had caused the commotion in the street. The unit had infiltrated successfully and was moving toward the target. With the aid of surveillance drones and the enhanced capabilities of their communications equipment, they managed to take advantage of every blind spot of the compound's defenses. Brovsky had made his way onto the roof with the help of Caleb and Davidi, but his mobility had been compromised by the fall. Aside from that, all was going to plan. The unit was inside and in position. Caleb signed for Brovsky to hold position on the roof while he and Davidi proceeded. Suddenly, a voice broke the silence of the communication channel. Fall back! Mission compromised. Evacuate immediately. The unit froze, and then gunshots rang out. Caleb stopped in his tracks. It was Amitai's voice. His brother was the best of the best, so he knew he would only break silence as a last resort. His heart sank. So much time and planning had gone into this mission. They had to succeed. But his heart also went out to his big adoptive brother. No one knew him like Amitai did. They were inseparable growing up. Amitai never questioned whether Caleb deserved to be part of the family. He just was. Raven, confirm status. Raven, Caleb whispered, not wanting to give away their position. Tension was high at Israeli military command. The prime minister leaped up and said, No, how is that possible? Give me the drone view. His heart sank. His two sons had eagerly volunteered to continue in their military service once their mandatory duty was over. He was proud of them for their dedication to Israel. 
but he also knew that it could put both of them at risk. All monitors combined to show a large view of the surveillance drone footage. All the members of the unit were shown in their positions highlighted by white triangles. Some were on the roof, some were on the ground level moving toward the entrance. Red triangles indicated enemy soldiers. Orange triangles indicated potential threats. Red triangles began to multiply in the courtyard as more enemy combatants poured out from the buildings. The white triangles moved back in retreat. How? Unless they were expecting us, said Etan as the implications of events became clear. It's a trap. Brigadier Doron shook his head as he said, Our men are pinned down and outnumbered. If they are killed or captured, their bodies will be paraded as trophies through the streets of Damascus as evidence of Israeli aggression. On the perimeter of the feed, some orange triangles appeared and they were moving rapidly toward the compound. Doron tapped the drone operator on the shoulder and said, Give us a wider view. The camera zoomed out. Orange triangles, hundreds of them, began flashing in a wide perimeter around the complex, only a few blocks away from the team's position. As the orange triangles moved closer, they turned red. Doron straightened his back and turned to face Eitan as he said, The mission has been compromised. Ghost team needs to evacuate right away. Drones can help clear a path for their extraction. Eitan glanced at the monitor with all the flashing arrows and said, Yes, let's get them out of there right away. Send in the drones. As soon as we've evacuated the team, we need to send in the Air Force and level the compound, Daron said, stone-faced to the Prime Minister. What? No, what? Defense Minister Leibovitz said as he jumped up. We can't do an aerial strike. That is not an option. We must avoid that. Prime Minister, do not send in the planes. That was not the mission. Brofsky scanned the area around the compound through night vision binoculars. He looked back at Caleb and Davidi. With a circling motion followed by sharp pointing movements in various directions, he indicated the enemy was approaching. Caleb tapped on his arm panel and the drone confirmed it. Caleb leaned over to Brofsky and said intently, Wait two minutes and then blow the charges. It will cut them off and buy us some time. A message appeared on their HUDs. Abort mission. Extraction point. Suddenly there was a loud humming sound in their ears. Then everything went dark. An entire section of Damascus blacked out, their HUDs, the comms, all electronics instantly disabled. At the same time, heavy gunfire broke out between the Israelis and the enemy soldiers. A few moments later, the surveillance drone smashed through the roof of a building across the road. Brofsky, blow the charges, Caleb commanded. Brofsky tapped on his panel and answered, I can't, there's no signal. Then we're going blind. Remember the mission rehearsal. Stick to the plan. Let's move. Davidi grabbed Caleb's arm and protested. We cannot stick to the plan. We've been compromised. The order said abort mission. We need to evacuate now while we have the cover of darkness. The enemy is closing in on us. Caleb thought for a second and said, We don't know the extraction point and the threat to Israel is still in that building. We must complete the mission and I'm not leaving my brother behind. Caleb thought again and looked down toward the street and conceded. Actually, you're right. New plan. Defend our position as long as possible and cover me. I'll be back. Davidi nodded. He raised his rifle, ready to cover Caleb. Caleb sprinted toward the roof entrance of the main compound. Bright spotlights from around the compound lit up, revealing the positions of the Israelis. A barrage of fire was let loose on them. Caleb didn't miss a beat, continuing to run at full speed. Davidi and Brofsky returned fire, providing cover for Caleb. Every shot hit a target. From the opposite side of the roof, two of the unit's snipers were also providing cover fire for Caleb and the rest of the unit down in the courtyard. More enemy soldiers poured out of the building. The first ones out were young men used as human shields who took the brunt of the fire from the Israelis, while the more seasoned Syrian fighters followed from behind. The roof entrance slammed shut. Without hesitating, Caleb changed direction and leapt from one section of the roof to a lower section with the skills of an experienced parkour athlete. Within seconds, he was in the courtyard and took down two soldiers before they had a chance to react. Many of the other soldiers turned their attention to Caleb, but he moved so quickly between them, they couldn't get him in their sights. Caleb fired his pistol rapidly as an extension of his punches. He emptied the magazine and took out a few more attackers with his bare hands. The Israeli Special Forces' advanced Krav Maga fighting skills made them deadly weapons, even without the use of other weaponry, and Caleb was a master at it. 
The Iranian guards were barely a challenge. The distraction Caleb provided gave the rest of the unit the few seconds they needed to turn the fight on the Syrians. One of the Israeli snipers took out the spotlights while the other was picking off targets in the complex. The Israeli rifles had optical night vision scopes and were not affected by the EMP. The poor light, along with the sniper's cover fire, began to cause confusion among the Syrians. Caleb saw one of the entrances was less guarded. He slammed a fresh magazine into the pistol grip and headed straight for the door. In the Israeli command ops room, the communications officers were trying desperately to reestablish contact with the team, but to no avail. Duran stated decisively, We can't wait any longer. We need to send in the Air Force. Hetan, shocked at that suggestion, instinctively countered, No! Our men are in the compound. My sons are in there. And you want me to authorize their destruction? The other generals and ministers looked at each other to gauge at reactions. Prime Minister, Eitan, said Daron, speaking as much to his friend as his Prime Minister. I know this is hard, but we don't have a choice. If those weapons are successfully deployed against Israel, it could be the death of tens of thousands of Israelis. And if it hits Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, it could be the end of us, of Israel. We have to send in the Air Force, and we need to do it now. I disagree, said Defense Minister Leibovitz. We don't know for sure the weapon is there or even exactly what it is. The last we heard from the unit was that this was a trap. What does that mean? Maybe there isn't even a WMD there. When America was there to back us up in the past, we could get away with aerial strikes on foreign targets, but not anymore. If we launch an attack on Damascus, the world will say we are the aggressors. The point of this mission was to prove otherwise. That's why we went covert. And if there is a WMD, blowing up that building could set off a nuclear bomb in Damascus. Imagine that. Would you rather the nuclear bomb explodes in Israel? Brigadier Daron retorted. We have Iron Dome too, said Defense Minister Leibovitz. The chances of it reaching our cities are very slim. Ten percent, replied Brigadier Daron. Ten percent. That may sound like good odds, but a ten percent chance that we could be hit by a cobalt nuclear bomb is not a chance I want to take. Do you? Defense Minister Leibovitz didn't answer. Daron turned to Etan again and said, They managed to cut off communications and could be launching any minute. If we delay, it could be too late. Your sons would agree with me, Etan. You know it's what we have to do. Also, we don't even know if they're still alive. They're alive, said Etan matter-of-factly as he stood up and walked to the monitors with his back to the others in the room. He just stood there staring at the video feeds and the blank screen that was the Damascus mission feed. He knew everyone was awaiting his order. But how could he answer? Yes, his sons knew what they were getting into and were willing to give their lives in defense of their country. But still, he was their father. Was it right that he should have to push the button? General Paris, said Etan. General Jeremiah Paris, the commander of the Israeli Air Force, stepped closer and answered, Yes, sir. How many minutes from takeoff to strike? The objective is in our target bank, and the pilots are ready and waiting on the tarmac. From takeoff to strike, 25 minutes. The unit's mission was timed at 20 minutes, correct? Etan questioned Daron. That's correct, Daron agreed. Up to 30 minutes if they encountered heavy fire and then evacuation. Etan rubbed his forehead, as was his habit, when deep in thought. Oh, there was no time to falter. With what happened to America, Israel had no more real allies in the world. This decision could be the biggest of his whole life. Hatan thought aloud. That's cutting it close. It won't give them much time. Are the stealth copters en route? Yes, sir, replied General Paris. They are circling on the outskirts of Damascus, awaiting orders. Hatan nodded, but was still thinking of his options. He needed to give his team and his sons as much time as possible. Hatan gave the order. Get planes in the air toward Damascus. Make sure we have clear communications. If we hear from Captain Baruch within that time, they need to abort immediately upon my command. General Paris instantly walked over the communication to carry out the orders. That's the right call, Prime Minister, said Daron. He could see his old friend's eyes moisten. He and the other generals all understood the implications. Defense Minister Leibovitz was still obviously unhappy. The communications officer started typing the order while the other generals were already on the phones with their own divisions. Leibovitz pulled his aide aside and whispered something in his ear. The aide moved to the door in a hurry, but was blocked by two soldiers. 
Where are you going? asked Brigadier Daron. This is an active operation. No one in and no one out. Minister Leibovitz wiped the sweat off his face and said, He's getting my heart medication. I forgot it in my office. Please, Magan. Daron nodded and the soldiers let the aide go. Brigadier Daron noticed the Prime Minister had put his hand over his eyes and his lips were moving in a silent prayer. Daron knew all too well what he was doing. It was a Hebrew prayer recited since ancient times by Israel's warriors before going into battle. He was praying for Israel, for the soldiers, but especially for his sons, Caleb and Amitai. He had just given an order that could cost them their lives. They were in the hands of the Almighty. Within minutes, Israeli jets would be in the air, speeding toward their target. They would not miss. That entire building complex would be reduced to dust. If the Israeli soldiers did not manage to get to the extraction point, they too would be caught up in the blast. Chapter 2. A Ruinous Heap Caleb had managed to get far into the building. He noticed there was light coming from some of the rooms. They were obviously prepared for the EMP and were somehow shielded from it. Still dressed in Rahul's uniform, Caleb moved rapidly past some soldiers who were on their way to the courtyard. One shouted, Hey, where are you going? This way. Caleb replied in Arabic, I'm getting more ammunition. Four of the Israelis managed to fight their way into the building through the main entrance. They blockaded the entrance, only leaving slits through which they could fire back at the enemy soldiers outside. The rest of the unit remained outside, trying to keep other forces from entering the compound. They wouldn't be able to do so for long, though. Most of the enemy in the courtyard had been taken out. Israeli casualties were unknown as they had lost contact with each other. Mortars and rockets were being fired at the Israelis from nearby rooftops, while constant light and heavy machine gun fire was coming from everywhere. Caleb came to the end of the passageway, which split to the left and right. First left, then right, he reminded himself. He was about to turn the corner when he sent someone behind him. He moved just in time to see a sharp blade pass his side. Caleb countered with an elbow, but the man blocked it. After a quick exchange of blows, Caleb knocked the attacker back. He managed to grab his flashlight from his belt and blind the attacker. Amitai? Caleb? Amitai said surprised, blinking from the after effects of the bright light. I almost killed you. You're dressed like one of them. Wait, why are you here? Didn't you hear my call? This was a setup. They were waiting for you and they knew about me. I'm not that easy to kill. Caleb said, knowing there was little time, but relishing in the knowledge that he could easily beat his brother at any time. It mattered that for the record be straight. So Caleb asked, how did they know about this mission? I don't know. So there's no nuclear missiles and no General Gurabian? Caleb asked. Oh no, he's here, or at least he was. They captured me and for some reason didn't kill me. They needed me alive as a patsy. Fortunately, I was able to escape. Something is very odd here. Gurabi knew exactly who I was, Caleb, and he knew about you. They do have a weapon, and it's something big, but I don't think it's a missile. I saw men in hazmats entering a room. I was told they brought in two large crates. My guess is they're going to do something horrific and blame it on Israel. Have you seen how many cameras are in this place? They're filming everything, and now you and your unit are inside." Caleb looked around and saw camera lenses and light fittings on roof beams, even embedded into the walls, small enough to miss if you didn't look closely. A dirty bomb, Caleb said, thinking out loud. Amitai confirmed. Yeah, and it's big. There have been a lot of rumors about a salted nuke that could wipe out an entire city. They're not launching a missile at Israel. Iran is doing this to Damascus and framing Israel. If they pull it off and the world believes them, Israel be finished. Caleb had a realization and blurted, Israeli command set the extraction order just as the power went out. They will send in the Air Force. They'll be here in a few minutes, and we can't stop them because our comms are out. Amitai responded, That's probably what Garabin was counting on. The Israeli Air Force missiles will be blamed. If they blow this building, it will detonate the nuke. You need to get your men out now. The roof exit opens from the inside. I came to get you too, so let's go, said Caleb. Amitai resisted and said, I have to find the weapon and disable it, or millions of innocents could die. Caleb nodded in agreement and said, Then I'm coming with you. No, Caleb. First, you need to stop those planes and get your men to the extraction point. 
There's a comms room at the end of the next passage. I'll bet their communications are still functional. I think only a few of the Syrians know who I really am, and the Iranians have fled. I can get to the weapon, but not if you're with me. Caleb was about to protest when they heard Syrian voices approaching further down the next passageway. Amitai grabbed Caleb's wrist. The two brothers locked eyes for only a few moments, but nothing more needed to be said. They knew what they had to do. Caleb embraced his brother and whispered in his ear, I'll find you. Amitai knew better than to argue. The voices in the passage drew closer. Caleb ripped a smoke grenade from his vest and hurled it around the corner down into the hallway. The Syrians yelled and started firing indiscriminately. They didn't see Caleb slide on his back into the hallway, pistol blazing. Two dropped to the floor, wounded, and were met with more fire, killing them both. In the confusion and panic, the young soldier who was behind the others fired his automatic weapon, accidentally shooting one of his own in the back, killing him. When he realized what he had done, he turned and ran. Caleb was on his feet and within seconds was ready to fire again, but there was no need. He looked back and saw Amitai was gone. On the roof, Davidi checked his ammo and said, I'm running low. How about you? Four magazines. Here, take one, replied Brovsky. It's not enough. We need more. Just as he spoke, someone came running at them across the rooftop carrying an armful of rifles. Davidi aimed his weapon, finger on the trigger. It's me, Yolson. Davidi looked up to the night sky and released a momentary sigh of relief. Just then he saw a luminous orb zip across the sky moving at incredible speeds. He had seen many aircraft in his military training, but never anything like that. It was very strange. He stared incredulously for several moments. Davidi, Yolson shouted. Yolson handed out the AKs to the team and said, We've cleared the courtyard. Gun and mortar fire was now coming from all around the complex, forcing Davidi's attention back to the mission. Enemy combatants were swarming toward the command center from everywhere. The Israelis were outmanned and outgunned. Communications were down and there was no drone support. They didn't know where the extraction point was and even if they did, they were now trapped. They would fight until the last round had been fired and then they would fight with knives. Enemy dead and wounded littered the streets of Damascus as the Israelis fought valiantly. Each sniper round hit its target. Still, they kept coming. At the end of the passage, Caleb found a reinforced door. He fired a shot at the lock, but it was no use. Caleb placed miniature explosives at stress points on the wall around the doorway. He ran back to his previous position and detonated the charges, blowing the whole door and reinforced frame down. Seconds later, Caleb came through the doorway. A soldier fired in his direction but missed. He didn't get another opportunity. A timid-looking technician begged for mercy. Please, don't shoot, don't shoot. I'm not armed, he pleaded in Arabic. There was a loud hum, creating a strong audio depression in the room. Caleb looked around the room and saw a device connected to a cable which led up to the roof. The writing on it was Russian. What is this? Caleb asked the tech. He didn't answer. Caleb pointed his pistol at the man's head. Sonic pulse emitter, came the quick and fearful reply. Turn it off. The man shook his head defiantly. Caleb slapped the man hard across the face. The man's head snapped back. Caleb pressed his pistol against his head and pulled back the hammer. Turn it off, Caleb commanded as his finger tightened on the trigger. The man's eyes widened. With his lips quivering and eyes tearing up, he nodded. He turned and punched in a code on the analog keyboard and then flipped a switch. The sound stopped. A few seconds later, Caleb heard a beeping sound in his pocket. His wrist panel booted up. Caleb tapped on the panel. The boot up was only a few seconds, but it felt like a lifetime. Come on, come on, Caleb shouted. A message appeared in the HUD. Abort mission, extraction, Alpha Tav Zero, Eagles inbound. Caleb typed on the panel, negative, mission compromised, trap for Israel, WMD dirty, target Damascus, delay Eagles, Raven will secure, new extraction, Aleph Bay 1, need drone support. He waited for what felt like an hour, but it was only a minute. The reply from commands ops came, affirmative. Caleb sighed in relief and typed a command on his panel, find Raven. A tracker icon appeared in Caleb's HUD. It was Amitai. Hold on, Achi, my brother, he said. I'm on my way. With his back turned for the moment, Caleb didn't notice the technician get up. Before Caleb could react, the man stabbed him with a knife behind the shoulder blade. 
The man pulled at the knife to stab him again, but the hilt was hooked on a strap from Caleb's uniform. He yanked again hard and pulled it free. Caleb swung around and with one rapid motion grabbed and twisted the attacker's arm and impaled him with his own knife. Pain coursed through Caleb's body. Caleb shouted with pain and anger. The anger was for him dropping his guard and turning his back on an enemy. He knew better than to do that. Caleb took a deep breath and a quick damage assessment. How deep did it go? Did it hit any vitals? How did it penetrate the suit? Am I losing blood? He reached back to find the wound. His hand came back red with blood. Not a good sign. He reached for the desk but lost his balance and fell. The comms are back on. The extraction point is Aleph, Bet, 1. 15 minutes. Drone support inbound, said Davidi. Yolson checked the code on his panel and then pointed to a section of the roof, close to their position. It's here. They're picking us up from the roof. Davidi shook his head. They can't do it. Now with all this going on, we'll have to create some space. Brofsky, as soon as the drones engage, blow the charges. That'll cut off some of their forces, at least for a few minutes. Two stealth military helicopters came flying across the rooftops of Damascus. High above them, they were preceded by attack drones flying at top speed. The drones fired missiles at the approaching militias around the compound. Brofsky activated the remote detonators. At once, bombs exploded at intersections all around the complex, creating massive confusion and chaos among the Syrian forces. Caleb was losing blood fast and was desperately trying to hang on to consciousness. In the HUD, an incoming message, full extraction, Aleph Bet 1. Caleb got up and looked around the room. He yanked the cables out of the EMP device and stashed it into his backpack, along with a few hard drives. Caleb placed a few remote grenades in the room and stumbled out, weakening from blood loss. He triggered the remote detonator, which blew the room. Caleb took a few more steps and then blacked out. The drones fired their missiles at the militants, hitting many. Further back, the advanced high-tech silent choppers approached low over the city line toward the compound. Tear gas missiles were fired onto the enemy combatants surrounding the building, enveloping the area in a tear gas fog, making it impossible to see. A chopper landed on the roof. On the roof of the building, Caleb opened his eyes. He was being carried by two of his men. Everything was a daze. He could see some of the fallen soldiers carried by their comrades to the chopper. Sergeant Davidi and two others provided cover fire from the roof. The first chopper took off, and then the next one came in for a landing. He grabbed hold of Davidi's shirt. Ah, uh, me tie? Caleb pulled up his shoulders and was about to say something when a rocket hit the first helicopter, blasting it out of the sky. No, shouted Davidi. Caleb couldn't utter a word. Half his men were gone. He tried to pull himself up, but a rocket hit the wall above him and sent debris crashing down onto Caleb. Amitai had found the device. It was placed in an open courtyard covered only with a tarp as a roof. Around the bomb were the bodies of enemy soldiers, mostly Syrian. Amitai recognized some of them. He knew they hated Israel, but would never knowingly use such a weapon on their own people. They were expecting Iran to provide some kind of super weapon to use against Israel, but little did they know it was to be used against them. One of the bodies was an Iranian revolutionary guard. The Syrians had obviously realized Gurabin's plan and a fight broke out. Unfortunately, the Iranians had won the battle. Amitai examined the device. It was a series of large metal canisters welded together. In the center of it, there was a flashing red light. He wished his little brother Asher were here to deal with the electronics. He was the genius of the family and could have sorted this out in no time, but his soldiering left something to be desired. Amitai searched the bodies and found a phone on one of them. He held the phone's camera up to the man's face and the screen unlocked. On the screen was a photo of the man and his young son. Even bad guys have loved ones. Amitai tapped a number and dialed. After a few moments, the call connected and he said, It's Raven. I found the device. He tapped on the camera and pointed it at the device. At Israeli command, everyone was paying attention. Amitai slowly moved the camera around the device. The canisters were mounted on top of a metal box. I assume the canisters contain the explosives and the box is the trigger mechanism. That flashing red light probably means it's been activated, he narrated. Eitan took the microphone and asked, can you defuse it? Amitai examined the device carefully. I don't know. There's something that looks like a switch. If I can get to it, maybe I can disconnect it from the detonator. I'll need advice from bomb disposal quick, Eitan nodded. The communications officer was immediately on the line to summon the bomb unit's best experts. Amitai warned, Brigadier Doron, 
The others need to be extracted immediately, including Captain Baruch, just in case I don't succeed. Extraction in progress. Captain Baruch's status unknown at present. Bomb unit on hold. We will patch them through, Daron responded. Amitai spoke Eitan. Amitai looked at Eitan's face. At the moment, he wasn't the Prime Minister of Israel, but his father. I... I'm... Eitan choked as he struggled to get the words out. Hashem be with you, son. Amitai reflected for a moment and smiled. He had the best Abba in the world. He was glad that he had been raised in the conservative tradition. Knowing Hashem existed and was watching over him gave him incredible peace. Peace Caleb could never accept. He stiffened his lip and said, The people of Israel live. Am Israel Chai. Amitai turned the phone and strapped it onto his chest like a makeshift body cam. He reached for the wires below the switch. Just then he heard a noise behind him. He swung around to see the Iranian was still alive, though heavily wounded. The Iranian's rifle was trained on Amitai. In the distance, the sounds of gunfire and explosions could be heard. But in the courtyard, it felt like time had come to a standstill. The tension was palpable. Amitai lifted his hands to his chest. Never put your hands in the air, his Krav Maga instructor had taught. Only the Americans put their hands up because they see it in the movies. Bring your hands up to a ready-to-fight position, but look like you mean peace. Throw your phone to the ground, the Iranian commanded. Amitai hesitated. Now, the Iranian demanded. Amitai obeyed, hoping it might gain him a little more time where there was precious little. Please, I need to defuse this bomb. Tens of thousands will die, maybe millions. Muslims, like you, innocent women, sons and daughters. Is that what Allah would really want? Amitai reasoned. The Iranian spat on the ground. Don't mention his name, Israeli scum. He then lifted his knee up high and smashed the phone with his boot. Amitai's heart sank. He could not defuse the bomb by himself. The phone was the only way. They will die at Israel's hand, and the world will avenge their death. Their martyrdom will never be forgotten, chanted the Iranian. Amitai sensed reasoning might be a lost cause, but he had to try. How can you allow your own to die for the sake of your hatred of Israel? Why blindly follow Gurabian? The Iranian's finger tightened on the trigger. The man was just too far for Amitai to land an advancing kick, but also too close for him not to miss. Gurabian? He's a puppet. Amitai was stunned. Wait, Gurabian was a puppet? Then who was pulling the strings? Over the distant gunfire, the clear sounds of the Islamic call to prayer could be heard again. The tension left the man's face, and he suddenly grew calm. Allahu Akbar! No! Amitai lunged at the man with all he had. In the melee, he saw two tall, bright men out of the corner of his eye. Caleb was rushed into the chopper with a medic attending him. He looked around. Amitai? Sergeant Davidi and his team hurled the last few grenades onto the road below and withdrew to the chopper. The chopper lifted off. Caleb tried to force himself to get back up and jump down onto the roof, which was already almost 40 feet down. There was no way he was leaving without his brother. He would gladly give his life for him. The medic and Davidi grabbed Caleb and held him down. Caleb was too weak to resist as he drifted in and out of consciousness. Captain Lewis and his co-pilot, Lieutenant Kaplan, set their course for Israel at full speed. Caleb tried to keep his eyes open, but blacked out. Caleb found himself on top of Mount Hermon, and it was night. Ahead of him were two enormous lampstands with lamps burning in the seven branches. To the side of the menorahs were two olive trees with tubes carrying their oil directly to the menorahs. Beyond those, two glowing men came into view. Their faces displayed a fortitude he had never seen, not even on the most hardened soldier, himself included, and they held themselves with such dignity and poise. They were mighty and resolute with years of experience, but not simply in military strength. There was something more, something Caleb could not put his finger on. Standing before them was a being altogether different. He looked human, but his form was more glorious than the other two. Electricity and plasma raged around his form, exuding from his body and mingled with fire. His face radiated brighter than the sun. Who will go for us? He said with a voice that boomed like an explosion. A blinding white flash filled the sky, 
and an ear-piercing explosion rocked the ground. Lewis and Kaplan exchanged quick looks and tightened their grips on the controls. Plumes of smoke and fire shot into the air, followed by a shockwave that expanded out from ground zero across the city at great speed. The stealth copter was built to fly at high speed, but even so, the blast waves were quickly gaining on them. Hold on, shouted Lewis. The next moment, the wave hit them, flipping the helicopter upside down and back again like a piece of trash in a windstorm. The engine cut and the helicopter dropped, heading straight toward a heavily built-up neighborhood. The rotors were still turning from the upward pressure of the wind, which slowed the fall somewhat. Hard start, yelled Lewis to Kaplan, who was already on it. The system had a quick boot backup function designed to jumpstart the engines midair. It wasn't taking. Kaplan pushed the button again. Come on! The ground was coming nearer. Everyone braced for a crash. The engine booted up and the blades began spinning, gaining speed. The pilots pulled up with all their strength. The descent slowed, but not enough. Boosters, fly forward, commanded Lewis. Rear turbines pushed the craft forward while the pilots kept pulling up. The forward push was exceeding the upward counter pull to the descent, which sent the craft pointing diagonally down at accelerated speed. The buildings were nearing. They could literally see into the windows that had been blown out by the blast. 60 feet, 50, 40, 30. The upward pull of the blades overcame the descent and just in time. The helicopter sped up into the air, rapidly gaining altitude. In the back, Caleb and the other surviving soldiers were being slammed about, only held in place by their seat harnesses. The pilots were ecstatic for managing to pull out of that maneuver. Yeah! They climbed to altitude and leveled off so they could circle back to their flight path. As the nose of the craft leveled, the pilots saw the horrific sight, and so did everyone else in the back of the aircraft. The momentary relief and joy the pilots had experienced turned to horror. A large mushroom cloud rose high into the air above Damascus. The unthinkable had happened. Oh my God, Davidi moaned. Caleb came to and saw everyone staring out the window. He forced himself onto one hand and then he saw it too. It all seemed like a strange dream. He reached toward the window. Tears flowed down his face. He wasn't ready to say goodbye. Not like this. Not today. This could not be the end. Amitai. Chapter 3. Final Goodbyes. Jerusalem, Israel, a week later. After Israel's chief rabbi had finished his message and prayer, Eitan Baruch stepped up to the podium in Jerusalem's military cemetery. It was a calm place filled with carved rock seating made of the beautiful Jerusalem stone and flanked by tall pine trees. Eitan felt the dark cloud that hung over the hearts and minds of Israel's citizens. He scanned the faces of the families and friends sitting in attendance. A pregnant mother put a tissue to her tear-filled eyes. Children were sobbing. Mothers and fathers wept intensely next to their sons' caskets. He gazed at his lovely wife, Ahava. Though she wasn't the mother of his oldest two sons, Amitai and Caleb, she still loved them as her own. The loss of Amitai was as hard on her as it was on him. Next to her sat their son, Asher. He hadn't quite possessed the loss of Amitai. He had to deal with things in his own way and on his own time. Eitan looked at all the other grieving families. They had all lost someone special today. As prime minister, he attended every fallen soldier's funeral without exception. Even world leaders had to accept that a meeting with the Israeli prime minister would be rescheduled if it clashed with the funeral or memorial of a soldier. Eitan knew his presence as prime minister offered a bit of solace for the grieving, knowing he also came from a military background and he understood their pain. But today was different. He wasn't only comforting others. He, too, had lost a son. Friends, he felt warm tears well up in his eyes. He tried to speak, but there was a knot in his throat. He tried holding back the tears, but could not, and sobbed for several seconds. Everyone in attendance knew this day was different for him as well. They cried along with him. Faint outbursts could be heard from the press and the international protesters who had recently convened upon Israel. Down with Israel! Israel will burn! 
The Israeli police had created a barricade to keep them from coming too close. They carried little about all the Jews who had died in the battle and even less about the soldiers who perished in defense of Israel. Hatan had to block their slurs. The international reporters were no better than the protesters. They swarmed any event where the Israeli prime minister appeared, all trying to get his response to threats from Russia, China, and the Islamic League of Nations to destroy Israel in retaliation for Damascus. He could feel their fear, but he had no comment for them. Today, I mourn with you, not merely as your prime minister, but as a father who has lost his son. He was able to choke back the sobs this time. I do not have my son Amitai's body to lay to rest, but like you, I have memories that will live on. I love you, son. He choked up again and took another moment to compose himself. He had dealt with the death of his first wife some years ago. Now here he was, having to bury his son. His heart ached. Caleb was leaning against a memorial stone with his arm in a sling. His face was pale. For someone usually so strong and powerful, he felt frail. He still couldn't believe that Amitai was gone. How could he? Caleb had looked up to him since they were kids. Without him, his world felt empty. But he knew Amitai would tell him to keep fighting for Israel. A nurse had tried to convince Caleb to sit in a wheelchair for the service, but he refused. Caleb noticed two strangely dressed figures at the back of the cemetery. Their dress was similar to that of Arab Bedouins. They didn't seem to be focused on the funeral as they were facing the direction of the Temple Mount. He looked in the direction they were facing to ascertain what they were looking at. When he looked back at the men, they were gone. His father finally continued his message. Like so many times before, our enemies have tried to destroy us, and like so many times before, they have failed. Still, they rattle their sabers, and still they threaten to attack, to punish us. For what? For defending ourselves? For having the audacity to exist? I know the media are saying terrible things about your sons who put their lives on the line to protect our nation. They call them murderers, butchers, assassins. Don't believe it. No matter what you read in the newspapers or see on the internet, know this. Israel did not attack Damascus. That was not the mission. What happened there was evil beyond comprehension. Someone planned and executed that plot to devastating effect. Someone, but not Israel. In time, the truth will be revealed. As a nation, we weep with the people of Syria and the world. We offer a hand of friendship to all who seek it. But today we also mourn the loss of our sons. Caleb knew his father meant well, but his words still rang empty. Hatan choked back the tears again. Our sons, my own son, who sacrificed all for us, we will never forget you. We will defend your names and your honor. Adonai has given and he has taken away. Blessed be the name of Adonai. Am Israel Chai. Etan stepped down from the podium and walked up to Caleb. The two looked at each other for a while, neither saying a word. Caleb loved his father dearly. Etan had diligently sought him for three years after hearing about the murder of his Orthodox parents. He probably would have lived in a Russian orphanage his entire childhood, and not just three years, if it hadn't been for Etan locating him and bribing the Russian officials into letting him leave their country. Etan adopted him and loved him as his own son. A tear welled up in Caleb's eye. His father was a great man, but his belief at an invisible being called Hashem, Adonai, God, whatever, was illogical. Perhaps his father could ignore the Holocaust and the untimely death of his wife due to cancer and the death of Amitai, his firstborn, and the tens of thousands who died in Damascus and the death of his own biological parents who were killed for being part of the chosen people. But Caleb couldn't. Etan broke the silence and said, Caleb, what happened with the mission and to Amitai? It wasn't your fault. When you've recovered, we'll come up with a strategy to stop Gurabin. He will pay for what he did. Caleb looked back at his father, steely-eyed. Yes, he will pay. I will make sure of that. And the traitors of Israel who fed my men to the wolves will pay too. They murdered Amitai. I do not care who they are. I promise you this, I will find them, even if I have to rip apart this government to do so. 
Natan recoiled at Caleb's words, knowing he was fully capable of carrying out his threat. Be careful with your words, son. We don't know what happened yet. There may be a spy, and if there is, we'll find him or her. I will leave no stone unturned. You know that. But we will do it the right way, within the law. You must just focus on getting better. You can take leave as long as you need. I tendered my resignation from the IDF already. Hitan shook his head. I wish you hadn't done that. Israel and its Israeli Defense Force need soldiers, leaders like you, now more than ever. You're not yourself. You're hurting. We all are. Come stay with Ahava and me for a while. We need each other now. Caleb clenched his jaw. There was so much he could say, but the time for words was done. He turned and walked away. Caleb, don't let your hatred overtake you, Etan shouted after his son. He felt very uneasy about Caleb's state of mind. With Caleb now outside the IDF, there would be no one to watch him. Ahava interpreted her husband's concern as pain and tried to comfort him. Don't worry about him. He needs some time to process it all, but he'll be okay. Asher ran after Caleb. Caleb, where are you going? What did you say to father? He looks sad. Or is he angry? I can't tell. Not now, Asher. Asher kept run walking next to Caleb. What happened to Amitai, Caleb? Nobody will tell me. I, I know he's dead because I saw Abba crying yesterday. I've never seen him cry. Well, it wasn't crying like Mrs. Weitzman from next door when her son married that Goy woman. But he did have tears flowing from his eyes. I saw it and his shoulders were shaking. He won't discuss it with me. Caleb exploded. I said not now. Asher... Ahava tried to distract Asher since, like usual, he wasn't picking up on Caleb's body language. Asher turned to her. She gestured for him to come. Asher stood there for a while, looking back at his mother, waving her arms like the traffic controller at the King David roundabout. He turned back to continue his conversation with Caleb, but found he was gone. United Nations, New York City, USA, a week later. We demand an investigation, boomed the voice of Russian President Vladimir Vinchenko. His big frame and loud voice were enough to intimidate most men, and he had the temper to go with it. Etan and Brigadier Daron sat at the other end of a large conference table. They were not part of the Security Council, but considering the circumstances, they had flown immediately to the UN to do their best to present Israel's side of the matter. Etan insisted Daron come with him to explain militarily what had happened. Etan hoped he could still count on America who had always been a good friend of Israel. To his shock, however, America was absent, as was China. The cyber attacks launched by America's enemies had done considerable damage. The hope of shutting down the old internet for a few days until the Trojan virus attack could be rooted out of the system had failed. The virus had gone deep and practically all data had been compromised, including top secret military sites and the markets. In a moment, millions of citizens in the West had lost all they owned, America had been crippled without a single shot having been fired. It was unclear who was behind it. The big clue was which nations remained unaffected by the virus, possibly China, with the help of Russia and Iran. Etan's hope faded with America's absence. It seemed fear was the only thing everyone agreed upon. Fear of an all-out nuclear war and the end of civilization. Israel will pay for this, and if the UN doesn't have the backbone to finish them, Russia will, Vinchenko added. French Prime Minister Hélène Renoir took a more cautious tone, trying to be reasonable. What happened in Damascus was unthinkable, but we need to be careful not to jump to conclusions. I disagree with President Vinchenko. Israel has the right to answer with the accusations, and we should hear them out. Until we perform an investigation, we need to reserve our judgments. The last thing the world needs now is for this to escalate any further. There are further threats of a nuclear response. We cannot allow that to happen. Etan started to explain. Our men were there too, but Vinchenko interrupted and slammed his big fist onto the table. The only one guilty of using nuclear weapons is Israel. Vinchenko raged as he wagged his finger at Etan. And they will not get away with it. If I may, Doron protested. My men were there and can attest that Israel was trying to de-escalate the situation and defuse the bomb once it was discovered. We thought the bomb was going to be used against us. 
Prime Minister Renoir also hit back at Vincenco. Do you have proof? If not, you should take your seat before you launch World War III. She was not intimidated by the men. France could and should take the lead and fill in since the U.S. was no longer running the show. The Americans refused to participate in any U.N. body until action was taken against Russia for its recent aggression against them. America had given the world body notice it was withdrawing all support and would no longer host the U.N. in the U.S. until action was taken. Renoir knew this was the time for her to mark her place in world history. America was dealing with its own domestic crises, and at this stage, internal affairs was a higher priority than foreign engagement. Due to budget constraints, the U.S. military was running on a skeleton staff. All other servicemen and women were put on unpaid leave. China had not yet formed a new government, and for the time being, its membership was suspended until a stable government could be put in place. She would prove her mettle as head of state. Still, this was an unprecedented time, and the fear of the room was palpable. Vincenko was red in the face and burst out, Proof! We have video footage of IDF special forces entering the compound in Damascus and activating a bomb. There was an audible gasp in the room as everyone tried to process what they had just heard. Hitan felt a pang of fear hit his heart. No, no, no. My men were there trying to disarm the bomb. Daron finally shouted and stood up. He couldn't believe they were pinning this on Israel. Well, he could believe it, since the world had blamed the Jews for ages. What had the Jews done to be thrown into the ovens in Nazi Germany other than being Jews? We were trying to save lives, not take them. He exploded and slammed his fist onto the table. British Prime Minister Leonard Cahill looked at him disapprovingly. Daron's 6'2 muscular body, chisel jaw, and dark hair were imposing. But if Eitan thought bringing his top general would intimidate them, he was sorely mistaken. Security. At once, armed guards entered the area. Any more outbursts from you, and I will have you arrested, he barked. He then turned back to Vincenco. Why are we only hearing about this now? We've been here debating and speculating on what really happened for hours, and now you tell us you have video footage? Our security agencies need access to that footage immediately. And pray tell, President Vincenco, where did you get this footage when the building was demolished in the blast? Vincenco had obviously not meant to play that card, but had blurted it out in anger. Without another word, he turned and walked out of the room. Renoir looked at Doron. I had things under control until your outburst. The other leaders looked at each other, greatly concerned, and left. Only Eitan and Doron remained in the room, stunned. Had they really flown over the ocean to get in only a few words and to be mostly ignored? How could the world leaders not even care to hear the truth? It was a testament to how badly broken the UN had become. They finally walked to the door to let themselves out. And Etan turned back toward the room. He had a tear in his eye. This was the end of an era. The days of America helping Israel were truly gone. Goodbye, old friend. Chapter 4. Vigilante. Somewhere in the Middle East, months later. Did you hear something? Irani checked the windows as he had done so many times already that night. Not long ago, he was the one who was feared and respected. One of only a select few, the best of the best, member of the elite Revolutionary Guard of Iran. Untouchable, or so he thought. And then, Damascus. Everything went according to plan, just as the highly secretive General Nasi Gurabin had said it would. Israel was drawn into a trap. The bomb had detonated. Forget that it cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. Irani had convinced himself the cost was worth it, and the dead would be rewarded as martyrs in the next life. Most would believe it was inhumane and too high a price to pay. No price was too high, no sacrifice too great, no price too dear to rid the world of the devil Zionists once and for all. The world would blame Israel for the blast, and Israel would be finished. That what was supposed to happen, but it didn't. Now Arani and his men were being hunted. They had no idea who or where their hunters were or their numbers. Of the elite guard, 19 returned from Damascus. Only nine were still alive. The others who were killed were his friends, his brothers. 
He never would have believed they would be taken down so easily. Hirani shuddered as he thought of the bodies he had found. The lucky ones died quickly. Judging by their broken limbs and mangled fingers, the others were tortured, obviously for information. He had, of course, done similar things when interrogating captives, but it's different when you're on the receiving end. He wondered how long he could endure. Intelligence sources didn't reveal any official Israeli operation by Mossad or IDF, but it had to be them. The Americans were out of the picture. The Russians and the Chinese were allies. Who else? It could only be Israel. Irani, I've told you, there's no one there, spoke Ahmad, the team's surveillance man, his eyes glued to a bank of monitors with feeds from multiple remote cameras. A top-of-the-line thermal drone patrolled the perimeter for any heat signatures. We have cameras and sensors everywhere. Nobody's getting in here. Focus on our assignment. He's under your protection. If he sees you're nervous, he's going to get nervous, and then he won't be able to do his work. The general won't be happy with that, Ahmad tried to encourage him. That got his attention. Irani was nervous about a possible attack, but completely terrified by the prospect of facing the general. Those who had betrayed or turned on him suffered worse fates than death. Yes, yes, all right. Do we have food for him? Ahma pointed back to the kitchen, but still kept his eyes on the monitors. Despite what he had just said to Irani, he too was nervous, leaning against his desk with his rifle loaded and ready to use in a moment if necessary. Irani placed the vacuum-sealed pouches of food on a tray. They were prepared especially for Amir, according to his specifications. No one but him was allowed to open the pouches. Amir Atta known simply as the Egyptian, was Gurabian's right-hand man. Besides being a cunning tactician, he was an explosives expert and electronics genius who had developed numerous ways to construct and deploy incendiary devices and explosives against much better armed and funded enemies, particularly Israel. Mines, drones, balloons, suicide vests, and car bombs were his specialty. He had even demolished an entire British embassy, killing most inside. It was the worst terrorist attack ever suffered by Britain. Amir's biggest achievement, however, and the one he was most proud of, was the bomb that demolished half of Damascus. When he was building the bomb, he had no idea what the final target would be. Gurabin always kept things on a need-to-know basis with everyone, even Amir, who knew more than most. Of course, if Amir had had his wish, the bomb would have been detonated in the heart of Jerusalem itself. One could only dream. That was still Gurabin's plan. That was why he had Amir working on another bomb. Whatever the reason, the general knew what he was doing. Amir smiled contentedly. The days were fast approaching when the guided one and his ally would restore justice to the earth. Gurabin, Iran's top commander, favored by the Ayatollah himself and regarded by most Iranians as a national hero, had already united most of the Arab world something not seen since the height of the Ottoman Empire. Surprisingly, he had even led a coup to topple his own government. When he had succeeded, he had blamed their weakness against the U.S. and Israel as the reason for their downfall. He had vowed to rebuild Iran and unite the Islamic world into a glorious caliphate. Ayatollah Rameni had publicly denounced his own government and had declared his support for Gurabian, who had made good on his promises by activating all Iranian-backed forces and allies across the Middle East to take control of their governments. The latest bomb project wasn't nuclear, though. It was biological. Biology wasn't Amir's area of expertise, but Gurabian said he should just concern himself with the delivery mechanism. Someone else was taking care of the biology. Inside the larger concrete bunker was another glass-walled room, hermetically sealed to prevent any contamination. The glass was bulletproof, up to 50 caliber rounds. It was transparent glass, but it could be turned opaque in a second. Amir wiped his forehead with a cloth and then carefully leaned in with the soldering iron. He was about to touch it to the circuit board when there was a knock on the door. Who's there? Arani, I've brought you lunch. Amir glanced at his monitor to confirm. The computer ran a biometric scan of Irani, confirming his identity. He laid down the soldering iron covered his work, and logged out of the software. He didn't get to where he was by being trusting. Amir stepped out of the cube and scanned his iris, sealing the room and clouding the glass. Only then did he release the lock on the bunker's door. 
Arani knew the drill. He expected the wait. Amir pointed toward the square table with the single chair. There. Arani set the food down on the table and motioned toward the cube. How long will the assembly take? Amir's eyes narrowed. What is that to you? I'm in charge of your security, Mr. Atta. Our location is secure for now, but I prefer us not to be in one place for too long. We need to keep rotating between our bases so the enemy can't pin us. Amir was in the dark about the recent attacks on Gurabian's men. It was not on his need-to-know list. Enemy? Are you expecting an attack? Is there something I should be aware of? Harani didn't answer, and that didn't put Amir at ease. It will take as long as it will take. And when will the general be making contact again? I need to speak to him. He is busy with other matters. I don't care what he's busy with. Just tell him I need to speak to him. Irani bit his lip. He was an elite soldier, not some messenger boy running snacks and messages for the general's lackey. But he knew they were only put on this guard duty because they were the best. The general wouldn't trust anybody else. Amir waited until Irani left the room before he sat down to eat his meal. He poured himself a glass of distilled water. As he lifted the fork toward his mouth, he noticed there was a slight breeze. The room was airtight, so that shouldn't be. It could only come from the door. Shut the door properly, he shouted after Irani. But he must have been too far to hear. Irritated, Amir stomped over to the door and bumped it, expecting it to slam shut, but it didn't budge. He leaned harder onto it with his palm. Still, the door wouldn't budge. Amir looked down to see what the obstruction was and noticed the edge of a boot sole. His eyes widened. Suddenly, something hit his head and he blacked out. Amir came to and found himself tied to a chair, unable to move. He looked at his captor, who he realized was an Israeli. You can do to me what you want, you Jewish swine. I won't tell you anything. I know, Caleb said flatly. Amir Atta was a psychopath, but even psychopaths had their limits. One thing Israel's enemies understood was that defeating Israel would come at a great cost to themselves. Israel would never surrender, and while they had breath, they would fight using every weapon at their disposal. Israel had nuclear weapons, so did they. But having nuclear weapons and using them were two different things. There were no accidental civilian casualties when a nuclear weapon was deployed. Civilian casualties were the obvious goal, and the world had no taste for it. Since Nagasaki and Hiroshima, it had been a known rule that no nation had the right to attack another nation with a nuclear weapon. They were merely deterrents, a balance of power between nations, an absolute last resort, and never to be used as an offensive weapon. Caleb shuddered at the unthinkable horror of the destruction of Damascus that shook the world to its core. And the world blamed Israel? He hated the world for that. The world didn't know Israel like he did. They didn't know how much she had given him and so many other immigrants. Israel was like any other country on the face of the earth. They could not blame Israel. They needed to open their eyes and see the truth, the truth that so blatantly stared them in the face. If only they had the courage to simply open their damn eyes. Why would Israel destroy the oldest inhabited city on the planet? Israel was not to blame for her becoming a ruinous heap. Israel was not to blame for the deaths of perhaps a 100,000, exact total unknown. Many who survived the blast would not survive the after effects. Though it wasn't the first time in history that such an explosion occurred in a populated city, it was the first time such an attack was witnessed by the world in such detail. The videos and photos of the survivors, who probably wouldn't survive long, were horrifying, especially of those who had been near enough to be directly affected by it. Skin and hair peeled from their bodies, melted like plastic onto the ripped shreds of clothing that used to cover their bleeding and exposed flesh. Mothers rocking their dying children in their arms, crying to a God who remained silent. All that was being used as a witness against Israel. Caleb was seething. His rage was boiling over. The world be damned. The world would learn the truth if it was the last thing he did. He would clear Israel's good name. He would defend the honor of the country that had taken him in when no one else would. One of the videos from that day showed an angry father shouting at a camera, Israel did this! Khaybar! The armies of Muhammad are coming! They will avenge us! It was at Khaybar in Arabia where Muhammad defeated the Jews. The tale was legendary and became a rallying cry in all Palestinian cities where Muslim communities settled and resisted Jewish control. Caleb would show the world the true culprit, General Gurabian.
It was the only way. No matter how often the Israeli government proclaimed their innocence, no one seemed to listen. No one cared. The world had made up its mind as it always did about Israel. It was always Israel's fault. Some even blamed the Holocaust on Israel and the Jews, but not this time. This time, he would get his pound of flesh and clear Israel's good name, no matter the cost. If justice was to be served, he was the only one who had the resolve and the skill to do it, and so he would. Ada knew Gorabian better than anyone. Caleb would do whatever it took to extract that information from him. The world was terrified and blaming Israel. Gorabian was the key to clearing Israel's reputation. The trouble was there was no clear intelligence on him. He was well protected and his identity was closely guarded. There were many stories about him, but it was hard to know which was real. He was famous for using decoys. The only one who supposedly knew him personally was his right-hand man, Amir Atta. Caleb didn't say a word. First, he would break the man. Then there would be time for questions. He pulled his knife from its sheath. Caleb never pulled a weapon he didn't intend to use. Everything he would do would be to defend Israel and avenge his brother. In defense of Israel, the ends justified the means. If hell were a real place, Amir had a reservation waiting for him. Amir laughed. Ha! A blade! I like the way you think, pig! A pistol would have been so boring. The blade stabbed deep into his thigh and then twisted before being yanked out again. Arg! shouted Amir. He gritted his teeth and shook his head violently. Caleb stepped back and watched coldly as his prisoner processed the first infliction. It was only the beginning. He felt no pity. This man killed hundreds of thousands of innocents. Caleb would have no remorse in killing him in any manner in order to get the information. If his father's God existed, he would certainly condone afflicting one man to save millions of others. Amir looked up, his teeth still clenched. But to Caleb's surprise, the next moment, Atta started laughing hysterically again. More! Do more, pig! Fine, he would do just that. Caleb proceeded to torture the man through repeated beatings and inflicting of wounds. He knew exactly how to do it so as not to cause fatal injury. He needed information which he would not get if the man were dead. When he was done with him, he would deliver him to Israeli intelligence for further interrogations. Still, Atta was true to his word. He didn't tell Caleb anything willingly. What he didn't realize was that in the process of beating him, Caleb had injected him with sodium pentanol, a good old-fashioned truth serum. As his body weakened, so did his cognitive resistance. Caleb bided his time. As Atta started drifting in and out of consciousness, Caleb knew it was the right time to ask the questions. He pointed at the glass room. What's that? What are you building in there? Bomb groaned Atta. Nuclear? Atta nodded his head as to say yes, but answered, bio. Biological. Is it in there? Asked Caleb. No. What's the target? Jerusalem, he shouted. Blood splattered from his mouth and then laughed again. Jerusalem? When? Is this the only bomb? Jerusalem will burn. He's going to love that. Oh, I wish I could see his face. More laughter. Caleb had a flash of Jerusalem being blown away, like Damascus. Who? Gurabian? Amir was terribly delirious from the drug. Who? Caleb screamed. Gurabian? Mahdi. Destroy Israel. The mention of the Mahdi was added information. Probably in Amir's mind, Gurabian's desire to destroy Israel made him the Mahdi based on some fanatic end-of-the-world teaching. Caleb shook his head. Such a waste of time. If only their beliefs were just opium for the masses and didn't suck their souls dry with empty promises and constant blame shifting. It didn't matter if it was Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. They were all the same at the end of the day and were responsible for the deaths of millions and the gods they purported to believe in never materialized to save the day. Is General Garabi in the Mahdi? Is he in Israel? Who's the leak in the Israeli government? Speak! Ada giggled and shook his head again, fighting the effects of the serum, but not able to overcome it. Caleb wanted answers now. His face flushed red and his eyes narrowed. This man killed thousands with no remorse and said it was his God's will. How dare he? Caleb felt his pulse quicken. He was angry at Amir's God who demanded so much death and hatred. Angry that Amir had made a God in his own image and likeness and blamed his evil actions on that God. 
He knew he should calm down. He was not acting professionally, but his rage filled him. It satisfied him and energized him. He could feel its seductive power grip him and urge him on. This low life had devastated countless lives with his twisted, depraved, and distorted religion. It was just like that disgruntled anti-Semitic fanatic who killed his biological parents. They were no different than Amir, except their gods had different names. Caleb gazed at the man before him. Was he even worthy of being called a man? No. Anyone willing to slaughter hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions, for their god was unfit to be called human. He was just an animal. Evolution had not finished when it spit him out of his mother's womb. He was nothing more than a beast. Caleb lifted the back of his hand and released it toward Amir's face. Amir started saying, Two will jut as Caleb's hand connected to his face. The impact of Caleb's hand stopped his words and Amir jerked back. The motion flipped the chair he was tied to backwards, causing his head to hit hard on the corner of a table. By the time he hit the floor, he was unconscious. Blood poured from the wound. No, 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 shouted Caleb, but it was too late. Amir Atta was dead. Caleb screamed in frustration. It had taken him months to track down Atta and plan his capture. He was Caleb's best chance of finding Garabian. There was an attack planned on Jerusalem, and Gurabin was likely somewhere in Israel. Just like with Damascus, Gurabin wanted to be close enough to witness the destruction. Caleb had no idea what two will judge meant. It was probably just some more silly religious talk associated with the Mahdi. Though he did recall that in Muslim end-of-the-world theology, the Mahdi had a companion who assisted him in his so-called work. Caleb looked to the glass room and the computer inside. He saw Atta's phone and grabbed it and made for the exit. Hopefully, Israeli military hackers could find some useful information on the phone. He walked out of the building, pushed his remote, and the building went up in flames. Chapter 5, Arrival, Negev Desert, Israel Caleb sat down in front of his TV with his dinner at the table. Breaking news tonight, John Locke, BBC News anchorman, spoke to the camera in his studio in London. The reception was bad because he was living in the Negev where there was no cable service. Video clips from the Israeli Battle of Damascus played on a loop as the narration continued. Shocking video footage released by the Russian government shows what they claim are Israeli special forces infiltrating a government facility in Damascus and planting the dirty nuclear bomb that destroyed a large part of the city and so far claimed the lives of more than 100,000 civilians. A warning to sensitive viewers, the video footage you are about to see is disturbing. The footage played showing Israeli special forces taking down Syrian militia members intercut with shots of drone missiles striking their targets and dead bodies strewn across the rubble as a result of the explosions. Caleb saw himself, Davidi, Amitai, and others. The footage had selectively been edited to make Israel look like the aggressors. To hell with them, Caleb exploded, bringing his hand down on the table, almost knocking his plate to the floor. We were not the bad guys there. BBC Russia Bureau staff reporter Jessica Gonzalez continued, Yes, John, that is correct. Her demeanor was serious, and the weight of the historic significance of her words was not lost on her. Russia has given Israel 24 hours to comply with international demands, or they will declare war. President Vinchenko said Israel should not test them. Unlike Syria, Russia can and will deploy any weapon at its disposal should the need arise. Many speculate that this is a veiled nuclear threat, there have been major movements of Russia's military and naval forces over the last few weeks, giving every indication they are getting ready for a full-scaled war. Caleb threw his plate across the room. The reporter was still talking. Other Middle Eastern nations, though emboldened by Russia's actions, are concerned Israel might retaliate against Russia's allies in the Middle East. Britain and France might also be drawn into this war reluctantly, so we are facing potentially the deadliest war in history, perhaps even a nuclear war. Just three months ago, before Damascus, that would have been unthinkable. And now, it's a very real possibility. The feed cut to protests and demonstrations around the world. Jewish businesses were being vandalized, Israeli flags were burning, an effigy of Eitan was hanging by the neck from some gallows. The fear of an all-out nuclear war is very real, and the blame is being cast on Israel. All I can say is, if you're religious, pray to whichever gods you serve. May they help us all. Caleb scoffed. 
calling on various gods is not what got us into this damn mess in the first place. Perhaps if we'd got rid of all the gods, we'd have fewer problems. The shot cut back to the news studio with news anchor John Locke at the helm. Indeed, as Albert Einstein once said, I know not which weapons World War III will be fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. It took a moment as the implications of the report registered. In response to this threat, Israeli Prime Minister Eitan Baruch has repeated Israel's claims of innocence. Despite the very incriminating video footage that took the world by storm just a few weeks ago, our reporter in Israel, Leonard Simpson, is standing by with the latest. Leonard, has the Prime Minister said anything further about Russia's demands? The feed cut to Leonard Simpson on the steps of the Israeli Knesset. International protesters were there chanting, Death to Israel! their faces filled with a look of dread. Israel has, of course, released their own footage filmed from a body cam being worn by an Israeli soldier who they claim was actually attempting to defuse the dirty bomb. They say it was planted by the Iranians under orders of General Gurabian himself. A wounded Iranian revolutionary guard is seen pointing to a weapon and talking in the video, but the sound is very unclear. Iran has refuted this, saying the soldier seen in the video was a hero who gave his life trying to stop the Israelis. Caleb again slammed his fist onto the table. Chara! It is all Chara, they're saying. We were trying to defuse the bomb and save the damn city! His face was red. Not only had he lost his brother, but now Amitai's valiant efforts were being twisted to making him look like the aggressor. Oh, he could explode! He also hated himself for accidentally killing Atta. He had hunted him for so long and was so close to getting real information. The news continued. Prime Minister Baruch reacted to the Russian de- president's demands for Israel to hand control of Jerusalem and the Palestinian territories over to the United Nations by saying that President Vinchenko is unreasonable and unhinged. He is called on the United Nations to intervene. The feed abruptly cut back to the studio. Sorry, Leonard. We interrupt this broadcast with breaking news. Apologies as we wait for the feed to be connected with other networks and stations. John looked off camera, waiting for the update on his teleprompter. He looked at his co-host, Leona Smith. What could possibly be more breaking than nuclear Armageddon? She shook her head and shrugged, and I don't know. The floor manager walked briskly onto the set and handed John a page. He quickly scanned it. John looked questioningly at the floor manager, who nodded and pointed at the paper and then walked off. John cleared his throat, took a sip of water, and then looked at the camera. This morning at 10 a.m. Central European time, a large unidentified object appeared in the sky above the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. It has remained in that position unmoved since then. One of our reporter drones that was filming an update in the area captured this footage. What you are about to see has not been altered or enhanced in any way. Above the Umayyad Mosque hovered a large oval object, There were no windows, no propulsion devices, no wings, no propellers. It didn't move at all. It was just there, suspended in the air, defying all the laws of physics and gravity. It made no sound. The news quickly went viral around the world as social media networks buzzed with shares and discussions. People were glued to their television sets and mobile devices with their minds struggling to comprehend what they were witnessing. Caleb's anger subsided for the moment and his intense curiosity took its place. He had seen things in the sky that evening in Damascus, but nothing as big or concrete as this. No military power or nation has yet claimed ownership of the craft, if that's what this is. We're switching now to live footage from a second drone. The live footage showed the object still in the same position. The drone was slowly circling to get different angles. The surface of the object seemed smooth, but non-reflective. The operator is going to try and bring the drone closer now. The camera shot moved closer to the orb. As it came within 25 feet, the feed started breaking up and the drone motors jammed. There seemed to be some kind of electrical interference. Can we get the drone back? The footage became more abrupt and then scrambled as the drone fell from the sky, crashed to the ground. In the studio, John and Leona turned from the screen. They were viewing toward the camera. It seems we've lost that drone. Our editors are working on a replay now. Leona, what do you make of that? Leona shook her head, her face flushed red. I think, actually, I don't know what to make of it. I never dreamed when I became a reporter that I would one day be reporting on, 
I don't even know what to call it. Is it a UFO, an orb? What is it? What do you think? Extraterrestrial or military? Is it here to hurt us? John answered, the correct term is UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. As to its origin, I don't know, but the timing is interesting. 24 hours before a nuclear deadline, and why is it hovering above that mosque? Is there a religious connection? No one knows their intentions yet. Let's hope they're here for us and not against us. Can we replay some of the footage? The footage was replayed, and at the bottom of the screen, a ticker tape banner was running the highlights of main news stories. As the drone dropped from the sky, the shot froze and cut away. Damn it, Caleb muttered. He had tendered his resignation and would not have access to Israeli intelligence. He would need to get back to Jerusalem soon, and that would require him to hurry up and fix his motorcycle. By the time the news broke to the rest of the world, Israel had already been observing the object from its surveillance drones. There were no lifting blades or wings. Thermal imaging sensors could not detect a heat signature, emission, or any other energy pattern. The Israeli Air Force dispatched two unmanned, laser-equipped stealth F-35s, along with a swarm of armed drones, to Syrian airspace, just in case a response was called for. When the news drone fell from the sky, sensors detected a localized electronic magnitude pulse. The new Israeli drones and F-35s were shielded from EMPs and were not affected, but it did indicate there was some kind of energy powering the UFO and that it had offensive capabilities. An F-35 swooped down toward it, but in an instant the object shot up into the sky at great speed. The Israeli fighters pursued the UFO but could not match its maneuvers as it did 90-degree directional changes at high speed. The two F-35s increased their speed to Mach 2, maximum velocity. The UFO matched their speed for a minute and suddenly accelerated, completely leaving them behind. Prime Minister Eitan Baruch stormed into Israel Defense Command. Is this some kind of classified Russian tech, more advanced than anything we have access to? Brigadier Daron replied, Prime Minister, reports are coming in from Russia that UFOs appeared over a number of top-secret nuclear reactors and weapons facilities and took complete control, locking down all control systems for exactly two hours before they took off. Sir, other reports are coming in of similar occurrences from the U.S., England, France, India, Pakistan, and China. Corporal Parrots said. Daron walked to a large monitor with a map of the world's military and nuclear weapons facilities. It seems the objects have specifically targeted these. None of them have been able to prevent the interference or engage the UFOs. Even the quantum-based AI defense systems have been unable to regain control while their systems were locked down. Etan looked tense. He trusted Daron to help him make informed decisions. However, this was something altogether unprecedented. Fear flooded him like never before. He had prepared for every contingency, but how could a nation prepare against such forces? The world already wanted to kill Israel. Now this? Sirs, Parrots held his ear to his headphones and raised his finger, telling them to hold on. Daron and Etan gave him their attention. After a moment, he relayed the new intel. We have confirmation. Our own sights are no go. Daron looked shocked. What do you mean they're no go? They're offline, dead. That means we are completely open to attack. Daron lowered his head, bewildered. The news shocked him more than he could articulate. This could not be. Israel had prepared for everything. No earthly enemy could ever, ever, ever get the drop on them again. There would never be another holocaust. He would personally make sure of that, no matter the cost. He hated feeling powerless. Pull up visuals at all sites, now. If this were true, he would need to see it for himself. The wall of monitors lit up the multiple angles of each of Israel's seven nuclear sites. Hovering over each one was a craft identical to that in Damascus. Daron couldn't believe his eyes. He walked closer to the monitors and inspected each of the sites. The monitor showing the Negev Nuclear Research Center, a plutonium production and extraction facility, along with other weapons-related infrastructure, displayed an ominous and foreboding craft hovering overhead. Over Kfar Zecharia, what the world only suspected to be a nuclear missile base and bomb storage facility, was the same kind of craft. Eliabun, Nahal Sorek, Yodefat, Tiroche, and Raphael had similar craft above them. Daron grew increasingly anxious. It was one thing when Israel's enemies' weapons were offline, but it was quite another story when their own were. How could this happen? Israel was one of the greatest nuclear powers in the world. Though they denied having nukes, everyone knew they did. 
That was part of the game, deterrent. But if they no longer held that deterrent, then anything was possible. He felt sweat beat up on his forehead. Give me a status report, Daron barked. Now, all communication with weapons is offline. None of the protocols are working. We are dead in the water. Daron was feeling incredibly vulnerable. What kind of enemy could do such a thing? What kind of technology and intelligence did they possess that they could, at will, simply turn off the most advanced and hearted weapons in the world? He had heard the reports of this happening to the U.S. and Russia, but those were just fanciful theories. At least that's what he'd convinced himself to believe. Then shoot them down with conventional missiles. Sir, those are dead too. Scramble our jets pronto, Daron barked. No, Eitan interjected. That won't be necessary. Daron looked back in disbelief. We need to blast those things out of the sky. We need to do it now. We can't, Eitan said stoically. We are facing an opponent greater than us. They have already demonstrated that quite effectively. We and other governments have compared notes on what we know so far. Of course, Daron understood that by sharing, he meant they shared only unclassified information. Israel had to keep her cards close to the vest, even at a time like this. It was very odd, though. For a reason he could not put his finger on, this encounter felt altogether different from other hostile encounters Israel had faced with her enemies. This felt... The words came slowly to his mind. It felt metaphysical. Parrots called to Etan and Daron, Sirs, we have a strange signature coming from outside all the craft. There is a working theory, he stopped to check his screen again, that this could be a trans-dimensional phenomenon. And that means in plain language, Sir, it appears that these craft exist in a wormhole, that they came through portals. Caleb had packed a few things along with a bottle of water and was about to start heading back to Jerusalem when he got a text from his father. It read, Need eyes on negative nuclear research center. Of course, Caleb knew about the UFOs shutting down nuclear sites during the Cold War. He knew his father couldn't tell him in detail and openly what was happening since he had resigned, but he was still free to go look. He finished getting his things together, hopped on his motorcycle, and set out. It was only about 10 kilometers away, and he would be there in 30 minutes. He would go faster, but his bike could not shift beyond third gear, so it wouldn't go at highway speed. After 25 minutes, he was getting close to the research center and could already see an enormous craft, very similar to the one in Damascus. He pulled up as close as he could to the center and got off his bike. He craned his neck up to the sky. He was overwhelmed. This craft was real, but literally from out of this world. He felt a strange sense of awe toward the craft. It was different seeing it up close and personal, rather than on the alien TV shows. This was real, substantive, actual. This was tactile and tangible, whereas all the religious talk about invisible gods was ethereal and abstract. Sure, people had long debated the existence of aliens, but here it was in front of him. Did he need to question it any more? He looked at it for a long while. He felt a strange connection with it. It was almost spiritual. He was surprised by the feeling. He had imagined it might feel warmer and more inviting. This craft felt cold and dark. There was some primal power he could sense. It excited a feeling of fear and greed inside him. He didn't know what to make of that. He stared at it for a long time and then remembered he was there to take pictures and send them to his father. He did so and then pondered some more. This was a life-changing moment. He felt a strange sense of hope. Jane Williams, star news anchor for the British News Network, looked into the camera in her London studio. Good evening. We have reports that similar craft are appearing over nuclear facilities and nuclear silos around the world. George Knott, former assistant U.S. Secretary of Defense and one of the world's foremost researchers on UFOs and extraterrestrial contact, joins us to help interpret what the UFOs might mean. Do you think the crafts we are seeing are from outside of our solar system? George stated his opinion. They've always lived on Earth. Far longer than us. They are crypto-terrestrials. Jane looked shocked at such a suggestion. They've always lived on Earth? Where? Possibly in the ocean. Our best research suggests they live behind some thin psychical dimensional membrane. They can move back and forth under the right conditions. When they come through, they often appear as ghosts in our realm. They've also given us new tech. Jane was speechless. George continued explaining, They have lots of names throughout history. Sons of God, sky people, aliens, gods, etc. They have been here to watch over and protect us. 
The things we are seeing today are the same as what we have been seeing since the 1940s. All of this has been cataloged, but the world has been too busy to really take notice or care. We have so many well-documented occurrences of them interacting with us. In Southern California in 2004, it was observed by radar, by camera, and four naval aviators. Around 2015, U.S. Navy pilots training off the Atlantic coast saw UFOs every day for several years. There are mountains of readily available information on this. Many are claiming this to be the end of the world. There is massive panic in cities around the globe. Should we be afraid? Do they intend to harm us? The intelligence behind these crafts, or whatever they are, obviously does not mean us harm. These kinds of encounters have been observed and tracked by many governments for almost a century and have always been non-threatening. If they had meant to harm us, we'd have known it by now. Jane sat forward in her seat. Explain. They have the technological ability to take complete control of all of our nation's military arsenals. The U.S. military security claimed they spotted a pulsating oval-shaped object hovering above a base. The launch officer stated the missiles went into the no-go condition. The display of power by the UFOs came at the height of the Cold War. There is a massive correlation between UFOs being seen near or over nuclear aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, and nuclear weapons storage areas and power plants. Jane tilted her head to one side. So what are they telling us? It's obvious. Basically, get rid of your nukes or we will because nukes will be your destruction. Aha. Jane was processing the implications. Has it ever happened that there has been a simultaneous appearance on all nuclear powers on Earth, like we are seeing now? No. The Damascus UFO is different in that it did not appear over any nuclear facility, but it did appear over ground zero of the Damascus blast. They are sending a major shot across the bow. Change your ways, or we will change them for you. Most sightings in the past have been fleeting and mysterious, only observed by a few. This time it's different. There is speculation that they will communicate with, or perhaps they have made contact already. There are historic reports of them communicating through certain chosen individuals, and they may do that again. Interesting. Do you have an idea who that chosen one might be? I have no idea. George, thanks for your insight. The network turned back to Simpson, who was still reporting from Israel. Just as the camera turned on and before he could speak, a strangely dressed man shouted as he stepped in front of the camera, completely startling Simpson. He is coming to judge the earth. Change your ways, or you will have no rain. Come out of Babel before it is too late. After regaining his composure, Simpson was sure that this person with a long beard and tunic made of rough material must be an escapee from a mental asylum. Simpson attempted to regain control of the situation and grabbed the man by the sleeve. Hey! The camera's view of Simpson was obstructed, but something happened between him and the man causing Simpson to drop to the floor. Oh my God! exclaimed John Locke back in the studio as he saw Simpson fall to the ground. What did he do to him? Leonard, are you okay? The news director was about to cut back to the studio, but the producer stopped her. Keep rolling. Let's see what happens. Simpson hurriedly got to his feet and put some safe distance between him and the crazy man. He saw the police and waved his hands. Over here, help! The police came running. The stranger didn't seem at all concerned about the police running toward him. He turned back to the camera. His eyes were intense, focused. Tremble, O earth. He's coming. Change your ways. Humble yourselves before him or you will have no rain. Come out of Babel before it's too late. The police grabbed the man by the arm to lead him away, but somehow, unexplainedly, slipped out of their grip and disappeared into the crowd. Simpson straightened his hair and stepped in front of the camera again. Are you all right, Leonard? asked Locke. Yes, I'm all right, just a bit shaken up. The touch from the stranger had flooded his mind with thoughts of deep remorse for the people he had cheated to get to his current position. Then he felt grief for how he had treated his late mother. But the show had to go on. He shook off those feelings and focused on the camera. There are just too many mentally unstable people in the world today. It should come as no surprise when we run into one of them. He put his hand on his earpiece. Um, I am hearing that Russia has de-escalated its threats against Israel for the time being while they are assessing the meaning of the appearances. Chapter 6, Babel Initiative, Tel Aviv, Israel 
For the last several weeks, end-time prophets have been having a heyday proclaiming the end of the world due to the threat of nuclear war and the appearance of the UFOs. Churches, synagogues, mosques, and spiritual centers worldwide reported record attendance. Then the charismatic trillionaire Alexander Theron released a statement saying he had made contact with the UFOs and would reveal them in front of everyone in Tel Aviv. This good news he was expected to debut caused people to flock to Israel any way they could from all parts of the globe. The auditorium was double its capacity. Tens of thousands waited outside, and it was expected an astonishing 90% of the world would be watching on TV. Caleb made his way to a special observation platform in the auditorium created specifically for Israeli intelligence and police. He needed a safe perch to be able to spot Gorabian, who could very well exploit such an event to create more fear. He scanned the room and then noticed someone sitting in the 10th row. He whispered to himself in disbelief, wait, could that be her? His mind raced. Therian's companies were revolutionizing agriculture, computing, engineering, energy, and bioengineering. It would make sense if she were here. He took a closer look through his binoculars. He could see a woman with a petite feminine build, maybe around 5'5", five five, smartly dressed, mid-thirties with her blonde hair and a neat ponytail. Just then the lights dimmed and the stage lit up. He bit his lip disappointedly. Then Alexander Therion strutted out on the stage. The crowd erupted and rose to their feet. The place was electric with anticipation. His athletic build and chiseled appearance were something like from a GQ magazine. The news media and the paparazzi could never get enough of him. At six foot six, he towered over most average men around him, and his presence immediately caught the attention of everyone when he entered the room. Therian walked to the center of the stage, and with no podium or notes in hand, he began his discourse. A holographic multimedia presentation began showing on the stage a hundred feet high, perfectly synchronized with his speech. Bruchima Baim, bienvenido, welcome. Therian greeted the crowd in major languages with perfect pronunciation. In 1962, Francis Crick received the Nobel Prize for his role in unlocking the structure of DNA. As a man of science, he found it impossible that the complexity of DNA could have evolved naturally. Just 11 years later, he published his theory of directed panspermia, that life on Earth was seeded from above by a non-human intelligence. Area 51, crop circles, Roswell, UFOs, alien abductions. World governments have tried to keep the truth hidden. The truth is, we are not alone in the universe. Crick knew it. You know it. The audience began whispering to each other. The giant holographic video display showed thousands of shards of light descending from the heavens, landing on a mountain and merging together to resemble humanoid light beings. They gathered in a circle and one even more glorious being descended into the center to communicate an important message to them. After he spoke, the beings departed in every direction. Therian continued his message. Ages ago, advanced beings called them gods, angels, watchers, jinn, ancient aliens, Anunnaki, if you prefer, came to earth and reached out to us in friendship and cooperation. They taught us principles of science and technology, propelling us beyond the mundane cave and tent-dwelling existence. A montage of CG images and videos depicting human development was played, showing societal transformation from nomadic communities to advanced ancient civilizations and megacities. An Anunnaki demonstrated the forging of metals. Another was instructing a group of men on advanced chemistry and alchemy. Giant beings worked alongside humans and erected megalithic structures. A man was holding an electronic device in his hands. A shadow passed over him. As he looked up, a gigantic hewn boulder floated over his head, defying the laws of gravity. One of the giants guided into place on top of a wall built with other perfectly cut and placed boulders. Therian paced energetically across the stage. They wanted to help us become gods and later inspired us to build Babel, Gate of the Gods. The gateway was constructed so that we could have open communication with them. It was there that the human race in unity and common purpose reached the pinnacle of our development and progress as envisioned by our benevolent extraplanetary visitors. 
The hologram showed a magnificent tower, mid-construction, rising high above the skyline of the ancient city of Babel. Untold thousands of workers were involved in the construction of the tower. Supervisors and architects studied a blueprint of the tower's design. They looked toward the sky. Ancient astronomers gathered at the top of the incomplete tower, pointing to the constellations of stars above them, discussing their findings. Hovering over the landscape behind them was the same object that had hovered over Damascus. Mankind was reaching beyond the boundaries of this planet toward the heavens. We were ready to join our friends among the stars. But unbeknownst to us, our progress had been watched by another powerful and advanced entity who was satisfied for man to exist in a state of perpetual inferiority. He was not pleased with our advancement and the interference of the Anunnaki with his human playthings. He saw the strength of our unity as a people and knew that nothing would prevent us from achieving our ambitions and from casting off the constraints that he had placed on our ancestors. In anger, he corrupted the minds of men and sparked seeds of division, breaking down communication and confusing languages. And just like that, everything stopped. Therian snapped his fingers. All the progress and advancement we had made, lost, forgotten. No longer united, we divided into clans, tribes, and nations. From that time to this, we have existed in a constant state of war. Our dominant religions have prevented the history of those great civilizations, and in doing so, robbed us of our identity and our heritage. Please do not allow those perversions to cloud your judgment today. Now and then, the Anunnaki attempted to rekindle the friendship we once shared, as evident in the cultural writings and artifacts of civilizations across the globe, but never with the same impact as before. Instead of being inquisitive and curious, man just became content to worship anything supernatural. But suddenly around the 20th century, man's advancement jumped forward and we discovered and developed electricity, powered transport, communication, flight, the computer, the internet, genetic engineering. What changed? Many of the great minds behind these innovations claim to have made contact with extraterrestrial beings, and rather than just giving them worship, they inquired and sought knowledge from them, just as our ancient ancestors had once done. Great minds like Nikola Tesla, Jack Parsons, Werner von Braun, and many others, yes, the von Braun, once more we began reaching for the stars sending probes into the far reaches of the galaxy, visiting the moon and preparing for the first human mission to Mars. And beyond that, who knows? There's no limit to what could be achieved. Therian paused. The crowd was electric. He let the energy build for a moment. He then turned on the stage, signaling something was wrong. In case you haven't noticed, the world is not in a good place. Everyone chuckled at his comic relief. The giant holographic video displays showed visuals of world wars, the nuclear bombs of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Damascus, and the destruction left in their wake. The scenes turned to religious chants, riots, empty shelves, a tattered and burnt American flag quivered in the breeze. Five years ago, I told you that we could save our world, but we weren't ready. Instead of using the technologies to improve ourselves, we have built economic systems based on greed and selfish interest, hatred, nationalism, and religious fundamentalism, which have now brought us to the brink of annihilation. We are at a crossroads. Continue down our current path and destroy ourselves and the planet, or enter the new path to radically reinvent the very idea of what it means to be human. Dr. Gavriela Levy listened intently. Solving fundamental human needs was precisely what she wanted to do. She had been bumped around like a pinball in the sea of people crammed in the auditorium, and someone had almost taken her seat, which some mysterious person had bought for her, but she was glad to be present. She was even giddy about the possibilities. Why treat disease when we could just eliminate it? It was as if everything in her life had been building toward this moment. Ever since she was a child, she felt a calling to alleviate sickness and disease. With some concern, she had followed Therian's attempts to fuse the advanced AI with the human brain. No doubt those efforts could result in bad outcomes for the human test subjects, and who could really know what the long-term consequences of such a merger would be? Regulatory agencies around the globe mostly turned a blind eye since 
Therian Industries brought much-needed capital into their countries. But Therian himself had promised that he would never subject anyone to any experimentation that he would not first test on himself. And as he had stated, someone has to take the first step. Perhaps with his help, she could cure sickle cell anemia, MS, cystic fibrosis, and more. Her heart swelled at the thought of the good she could do with his financing. A big smile parted her face. Therian was still speaking. The Anunnaki sent us a message by appearing for all to see, and they intervened by shutting down nuclear missile sites and launchers across the planet. You are all witnesses. They will not allow us to destroy ourselves. They are far more powerful than we are. Our militaries know that. Such episodes are, in fact, very well documented. Now, for the last few years, they have engaged those who are ready to beat their swords in the plowshares and rebuild the world. I am fortunate to be the one chosen, and with their help, I have recruited the best minds on the planet to begin working on real and innovative solutions to address humanity's basic needs, food, shelter, security, health care. Beyond that, we started developing some of those advanced technologies which were previously thought to be lost to humanity. Now let me show you what I've been working on for the past five years. It was not easy keeping this a secret, Therian said with a wink and the crowd laughed. The Anunnaki have so much to share with us if we will stand united like we once did. It was at Babel that nothing was impossible. To prove the principles, we built New Babel, a megacity from the ground up as a real world model of what is possible for the entire world. At that point, the visuals changed to show a city that looked like it was from a futuristic science fiction novel. The screen flashed images, autonomous vehicles, advanced architecture, anti-gravitational technology, solar arrays, mass hydroponic vertical food-growing warehouses, lush gardens with happy families and children playing carefree, high-speed maglev trains, advanced science labs, and medical facilities. DNA ribbons being rearranged and edited, paralyzed people walking again, blind people regaining sight. Our forefathers built a tower in Babel as a beacon of unity and hope, a monument that nothing is impossible for us when we work together. Now after millennia, we can do anything. Therian pointed to the tower. What took them decades using mud brick and asphalt for mortar, I have constructed in mere months with graphene robots, nanobots, 3D printing, drones, and quantum computers. He was speaking quickly and building to a crescendo. Working together under the Babel Initiative, we can do anything and evolve into something greater. No more hunger, poverty, disease, and soon we will become immortal. Gavriella's face lit up at those words. She felt a warm feeling flood her body. Could it truly be? If Theron could do that, then he was the one she'd been seeking all these years. She could help him achieve his noble goal. Those around her were sitting on the edge of their seats. Their eyes were popping out with anticipation of what he would say next. I have a radical plan for the world, if you will join me. Instead of the failed UN, demand that your leaders join the Babel Initiative. Lay down your weapons and national ambitions. Come to me, you who are tired of the status quo, and I will give you a unified human race. They were waiting on bated breath for the next words. Now, I wouldn't expect you to just take my word for it. That is why I invited my friend. He looked up at the ceiling of the auditorium, and then everyone else raised their eyes, curious about his gaze. Just when they raised their eyes, a glowing orb passed through the ceiling and descended into the stage. The audience gasped. Seeing what up close was a completely new experience. The orb circled around Therion several times. It expanded from its two meters in diameter size to about six meters. Four faces appeared on it. The one facing the audience was a man's face. On the other sides were a lion, an eagle, and a bull. The orb gyrated, revealing all four faces to the audience. It returned to the face of a wise man. I am Enlil, the orb said. I and my kind have been watching over your race for eons. We have raised up Therion for such a time as this. Listen to him. He is our chosen vessel in whom we are well pleased. On the TV monitors, glowing orbs could be seen over Rome, Washington, Moscow, Tokyo, Johannesburg, Jerusalem, and other major cities around the world. They were speaking the same message at each location. The crowd stirred loudly at those words. 
The orb then collapsed to its normal size and flew out into the middle space of the auditorium, hovered a few seconds, and shot up like a bullet through the ceiling. There was not a sound in the room. There was a sense that something in the world had just changed, and it would never be the same. They had all seen the orb and heard the voice. This would be a day about which they would tell future generations that they were there when this happened. They were in Tel Aviv the day Enlil revealed his chosen world leader. Had there ever been a day like this? Had there ever been a leader like this who had brought so much hope at such a dire time? Therian immediately spoke. For those of you who do not yet know me, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Alexander Therian. Join me in Babel, and together we will claim our destiny and become gods. For those of you who do know me, you are aware that I believe it is our destiny to work with the Anunnaki and make heaven right here. The audience erupted from their seats and passionately applauded and cheered at the top of their lungs. Some were hooting and hollering, others whistled, but most were enthralled at his promises and overwhelmed by the worldwide endorsement that Enlil brought. Still others were weeping and some fainted. Brigadier General Doron was standing at the back of the auditorium. He rose to his feet as well. Never had he heard anyone speak like Therion. Who could deny that Therion had the support of the UFOs and that he was the man Israel and the world needed at this hour? Gabriella stood as well, ecstatic at the thought of what they could accomplish together. She imagined herself standing with such great visionaries. She knew what she had to do. Chaim ben Emmet was watching Therion's address on TV in his Jerusalem apartment. He was about to turn off the TV when he saw Malcolm and Isabel on stage with Therion. He shook his head and stared at the beautiful Isabel Markov. There she was, as stunning as ever. Wow, so she figured it out, he said to himself, shaking his head once again. He walked over to his desk, rummaged through some old photos, and found their photo from 20 years earlier. Indeed, she hadn't aged at all. How could that be? And what would it have been like if he had stayed with her? Perhaps the untold riches could have come like she had promised? He chuckled. Memories rushed into his mind like it was just yesterday. Chapter 7, Ancient Keys, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, 20 years earlier. Professor Ben Emmett! Isabel rushed up to the front of the university lecture hall to catch the professor before he raced out of the room. Getting into the Hebrew University of Jerusalem's ancient Near Eastern graduate apartment was not easy. What she lacked in stellar grades, she made up for with ravishing looks. Sure, she might have used her beauty occasionally to tip the scales in her favor, but now she was studying with the premier ancient Near East specialist, Professor Chaim ben Emmet. For a man only in his mid-forties, his list of accomplishments was staggering. He was a renowned expert in Sumerian, Akkadian, Amharic, Ugaritic, Aramaic, Biblical Hebrew, Classical and Koine Greek, and many other languages. He had written over 100 articles and done countless digs. He was just the man for the hour. Professor she said, slightly wounded from bounding to the front of the room. Her décolletage was in full display, augmented by her trim figure. She wore an eight-pointed pendant around her neck. Chaim studied it briefly. It was the same as the one associated with the ancient goddess Inanna. Ah, I'm so glad I caught you before you left, she said, catching her breath. Ken, he said affirmatively and curtly. He was annoyed that he did not escape in time. What could this student want? Matotza. Isabel showed her beautiful whites. Oh, she would get what she wanted in due time. Playing dumb for now would pay off later. I I prefer English if that's all right. My modern Hebrew is not so great. He nodded, still hoping to get out quickly. Normally he would have just ignored any student that approached him. Had he not clearly stated in the syllabus that all questions were to be asked during class or during office hours with no exceptions? Teaching was unavoidable for a great professor like him, The university allowed him to focus on research, but teaching one class per semester was the trade-off. But oh, how he hated students. They had so many worthless questions. Even graduate students who should know better asked the dumbest questions. But he couldn't help noticing her amazing figure, enhanced by her scant clothing. Today's lecture was brilliant. I so agree with you that humanity is the poor for things not being kept in public museums. I might be able to help connect you with more information about the tomb of Gilgamesh. But first, I was hoping you could help me with a text my great-great-great-grandfather, Lord Charles Warren, found on Mount Hermon. 
Wait, you are related to the Charles Warren? The one who made numerous discoveries here in Israel? Uh, That's right. There is more to the Mount Hermon steel that he and others have translated for us. Do you know the text? Betach, I mean, of course. Wait, you have a Russian accent, Ms. Markov. Isabel Markov. Yes, I was raised in Russia, but he is in my family line. Our family has guarded the secret knowledge of the steely for many generations now. This was interesting, so he decided to move the conversation to the university cafe. So, tell me this secret knowledge, he said, sipping his coffee across the table from Ms. Markov. He had to admit to himself that she had gone from being just another hot student to someone of incredible interest who might help him make a truly groundbreaking discovery. As you know, Kasar Antar was the highest temple in the ancient world. People who worshipped there did so at incredible personal effort. They climbed over 9,000 feet to reach it. They obviously believed the site was significant. He was already losing interest in this conversation. Yes, yes, 200 watchers came down in the days of Jared, as stated in the book of First Enoch. It was so annoying. Every foreigner who came to Israel thought they had some secret knowledge, but it was usually stuff the average Israeli knew. Listen, I don't think there's uh, much mystery here. The text on the stele is straightforward. Uh, according to the command of the great and holy God, those taking an oath proceed from here, he said by memory. He stood up to leave annoyed that he had agreed to meet her. He had let her beauty distract him, but enough was enough. Slicha, excuse me, I have to go. The text does not say, and holy, or kaihagios, like my ancestor Charles Warren translated. Since you are an expert, you certainly knew this, Isabel said with the casual intrigue that was her forte, while she picked up her coffee and took a sip. Chaim found himself a bit off balance. He had expected that a lowly grad student might know something he didn't. He'd never actually studied the original Steely himself, but only the scholarly papers about it, which he had really just glossed over. The loss of face was more than he could bear. Well, spill the beans. I have things to do, he said, bluffing. My family has guarded the secret name hidden in plain sight, Professor. I can't tell you here because people may be listening, but it is the name of a powerful ancient being. With that, he lost his patience. Sure, she was astoundingly beautiful, and he was having trouble keeping his eyes off her. Nevertheless, she would need more than powers of seduction to win him over. He rose again to leave when she placed a piece of stone on the table. That is the missing piece to the stele. He paused to examine it. There were a lot of pieces of rock floating around Jerusalem. He turned it over in his hand and came to what looked like an engraving. She pulled out a picture of the stele and he could see that it was the missing piece. Where did you get this? I told you. It has been in our family for generations. She extended her hand and he gave it back to her. This is also a key that will unlock a door at Mount Bashan that will change the world itself and will afford you academic fame and fortune. You seem to have it all figured out. What do you need me for? We need an expert to translate what looks like Sumerian. Who are we? Hmm, let's just say unnamed interested parties. Let me see the text. Let's get to know each other first. I need to know that I can trust you. I can't wait to show you. Isabel opened the door hurriedly, set down her keys, and went straight to her kitchen table. Numerous ancient documents were scattered across it. She pointed to a text. Look, it does not say Kaihagios. Our family has researched these words for years. Chaim's eyes were drawn to an altar in the corner. A goddess wearing an eight-pointed crown stood on top of a lion flanked by owls and female worshippers presenting their oblations. Apples and oranges were sitting on the table, and electric candles were burning. Chaim frowned, thinking about the crazy anti-Semitic theories suggesting that Magen David, commonly known as the Star of David, was in some way associated with Anana's star. If only people would study Hebrew, they would know that the six-pointed star was not even a star in Hebrew. It was a shield. Isabel realized her audience was lost in thought about the altar. Isn't she wonderful? She is the perfect goddess, Inanna, queen of heaven. Ishtar, worshipped through the ancient Middle East as Astarte, Ashtoret, Aphrodite, Demeter, Persephone, Athena, and Venus, goddess of fertility, love, war, justice, and death. She embodies all aspects of the divine feminine. She also brings self-empowerment, protection, love, strength, and abundance. She will aid in your spiritual endeavors and will also help heal and bring to light your shadows. 
What's not to like about her, right? Chaim cocked his head slightly. He had never thought about any of the ancient myths being anything more than curiosities. Certainly, Isabel didn't believe the goddess was real, did she? Isabel sensed Chaim was not on board with her enthusiasm. No matter, he soon would be. She touched his arm and he turned to look at her. Let me show you the texts. I know you are going to find them amazing. They walked back to the table and leaned over. Isabel pointed to a document to her right and leaned in so close they were touching. Chaim inhaled the smell of her perfume. Look, the British Museum translation just omitted these words, Bo and Batiu. They are not accounted for. Chaim managed to focus on the massive discovery she was revealing and not her being so close. Indeed, he was perplexed. He had read the papers on this steely and had assumed them to be right, to be correct. But now he was looking at them with his own eyes. He could not deny that she was right. Bo fits with the Taromorphic language associated with Baal. The real mystery was Batiu, or Batios in the nominative case. It simply is not Greek. It took us years to trace it, Isabel said. This word is found in only one other place in the entire world, in a cave in southern Italy in the Messapian era, 8th to 3rd centuries BC. Phoenician sailors brought it there. Chaim's academic inquisitive was picked. Wait, if it was brought by Phoenician sailors, then it probably originated in the Near East. Long story short, it is based on the symbol of Enlil, whose logogram is pronounced Bad. She pointed to it in the text in front of her. The Eos ending is a people group ending. Hmm. But the logograms were known and understood by the scribes, but not transliterated. True, but we have precedence. The liver seer was a profession brought to the Italian peninsula from Mesopotamia. It had a Sumerian logogram combined with a Latin phrase similar to batios. It was by his command that the ancient Anunnaki, the sons of God, the watchers, and the ancient aliens came down to Mount Hermon. Chaim was speechless. She was right. The word was not to be translated as holy, but it was actually a hidden name. It made sense. He felt a cold sweat come over him. Something didn't seem right. So what do you need me for? He sensed it might not be best to be at her home discussing these matters. He got up to go, but she caught him by the hand. Oh, Professor, we need you. She stood up and pressed her body closer to his. I need you. Help me. Their eyes connected. Chaim loved the feeling of her body close to his. There is more to decipher, she said as she put her face close to his. More to uncover. If you make the discovery, it will make you world famous. She leaned in to kiss him. He resisted. She attempted to kiss again, and their lips met. They embraced and made their way to her bedroom. Chaim had his hand on the steering wheel. They decided to drive two and a half hours north to Rujum al Khiri. In his mind, he was reliving the previous night with this dazzling love goddess who had come out of nowhere and was now by his side. He couldn't believe this turn of events. Her knowledge of these texts would truly catapult his career to new heights. Her talk of believing that the ancient gods want to make contact again to usher in a new age of peace and prosperity and some other god, Elion, wanting to wreck it was all nonsense. Never mind. She was useful and they would have some fun. The Mesapian grotto text she had shown him had mentioned Jupiter Batios and was surrounded by concentric circles. He had racked his brain for at least an hour trying to remember how this symbol was connected. It was only after hurrying to his office that morning before leaving on their trip that he compared it with a logogram he had been researching. That's when he realized the Mount Hermon Stele was a parallel text to the text supposedly buried at Gilgal Rephaim. They pulled up to the enormous ancient megalith. Chaim had been here before and was well acquainted with Gilgal Rephaim's four concentric circles consisting of 42,000 basalt rocks with a tumulus that was 4.6 meters tall at its center, flanked by an outermost wall that was 2.4 meters high and 160 meters in diameter. Most of his colleagues believed it to be dated to the early Bronze Age II period, somewhere between 3000 to 2700 BCE. It was clearly an interesting find, but it had been explored time and time again. He stopped the car and she immediately jumped out and rushed to the center of the tumulus. She disappeared inside. He got out and followed her. 
They both search the inside walls looking for some clue. According to the text, this ought to be the place. He knew he had translated the text correctly. If there was anything more, then this ought to be the place to find it. But he was a skeptical academic at heart. This could be a wild goose chase. If it was, then he would undoubtedly need to console her. And what better to lift her spirits than, Darling, here it is, Isabel blurted out, interrupting Chaim's thoughts. He looked at her and saw a lustful glee in her eyes. Something in the countenance of this gorgeous goddess had changed. Was he sensing greed? He stared at her face, unmoved by her claim of a discovery. Suddenly she felt less like a goddess and more like like something he could not put his finger on. Help me remove this stone, Isabel said, struggling to move the massive stone. It is right in there. Chaim turned to her side of the tumulus and helped her remove the covering stone. Then he saw it. There was a steely that would catapult him into academic greatness for all time. He forgot about the greediness he felt in her. He started thinking how it would indeed make him world famous forever. The great professor Chaim ben Emmet, discoverer of the Batios inscription. They heaved it out and onto the ground. Transfixed, Chaim stared at the steely, a mirror of the Greek, but written in Sumerian. His intimate knowledge of the cuneiform symbols flooded his mind. The logogram Bad jumped out at him. He knew it well. It was Bad, the symbol of Enlil and many others like Dagon, Baal, Nergal, all syncretisms of Enlil. Then the other symbols came into focus. Isabel stared at him in great anticipation, like a dog waiting for a bone. So, what does it say? Chaim didn't say a word, but focused on the text. His mouth was moving, making sense of what he was reading. He wrote the words in his notebook along with the translation. The first symbol, Bad, was repeated, reading Bad, Bad. He sensed it could mean something special, but wasn't prepared to speculate without his lexicons or talking it over with his colleagues, so he simply read it aloud, slowly, line by line, in Sumerian, and then offered his best on-the-spot translation. Bad Engura Usmi Kurgal Enlil, house of the Lord, whose return is triumphant, who shows the way to his great mountain house. Anaku Inana, Belet Ersetim Kiam Parsusa Salamu Rabum. I, Inanna, mistress of the netherworld, am become black, tremble, shake with fear. Petabab kama luruba anaku, open the gate for me so that I can enter here. Isabel was focused and looked like she had seen a ghost. Tell me the words again, starting with anaku, was it? Chaim said the words again slowly, and she repeated. She took the notebook, whispered the words to herself, until at last she took a deep breath and said it with all her might, four times facing the four compass directions. Anaku inana, belet ersetim kiam parsusa salamu rabum, petabab kama luruba anaku. Right then the earth began shaking under her feet as if a gate was opening and the sky darkened. What's, what's going on? Chaim was trying not to panic. After several seconds, the shaking stopped and the sun came out. Why did that happen when you said it, but... Nothing happened when I said it. I don't know, darling. Perhaps it was just a coincidence. Is there anything else on the tablet? Chaim picked up where he left off. Alaku alik dimtu bashmu asarazag. Go, tear of Bashan, all-powerful, awesome, all-seeing great serpent eye. Margida ana harani sa alaktasa latarat. River of the night, road whose course does not turn back. Isabel's eyes were as big as saucers. She abruptly made her way out of the enclosure. Chaim stared another moment at the inscription and then realized she had gone out. He awkwardly made his way out and came up behind her. He ran his hand over the small of her back up to her neck and said, What is it? It is giving us directions. There is something else we are supposed to find. It said, Go to the eye of the serpent, right? I believe it was in parallelism, the tear of the Bashmu, the all-seeing eye of the serpent. I don't know what that means, though. Isabel scanned the area looking for clues. She ran back inside the enclosure to the tumulus and climbed on top, gaining another 15 feet of height. She looked slowly in every direction. This area is known as the area of Bashan, right? You said Bashan is Bashmu? 
Yes, that's correct. The area of the dragon snakes. According to ancient Ugaritic and biblical texts, the deified god of the dead used to live in this area. The Ugaritic people believed Hermon was his abode. The Tanakh called him King Og. Silly mythologies. It also said there was a river and a road whose course does not turn back. Isabel exited the circles and started walking in a northwestern direction. Chaim chased after her. Yes, it said that, but what of it? She didn't say a word, but kept walking. Soon they crossed the Daliot Wadi, and she proclaimed, This is your river, a road whose course does not turn back. Now she started to jog, sensing she was getting close. Ahead of them was a wall of some length, no more than three or four feet high. Isabel paused for a moment, then turned to the left, and came to two mounds of black quartz stones. Here are the eyes of the snake. How did you know this? Oh, yeah, your family has kept secrets for generations. Okay, but there is a problem. Snakes don't have tears. True, but our tear ducts are on the inside of our eyes, so it ought to be on the inside of the eyes. She pondered the next clue. Let's see, river of the night. She looked at Kaim and shrugged. Hmm, well, night falls on the east before the west. I'm going to guess we need to focus on this one. She turned to the southeastern eye. After searching in the black quartz for several minutes, she felt an indentation under one of the rocks. She took the broken piece of their Hermon Greek steely and, after a bit of finesse, she inserted it in the belly of the stone. With that, a door in the stone opened up and a clay tablet appeared. Chaim was still mesmerized by the things she was finding. Well, they were finding. She picked it up and handed it to him. Translate. Chaim took the tablet, which was the size of a large sheet of paper. He studied it for several minutes. He quickly wrote in his notebook, This is just a rudimentary translation, like before. I really need more time to do it properly. He read it aloud. Anaku inana belet et setim kiam parsusa. I am inana, mistress of the netherworld. Bad ati me peta babka. Enlil, gatekeeper, open your gate for me. Chaim paused for a moment without finishing the entire translation. Once again, she took the notebook and said the phrase with all her might in the four compass directions. Once again, the earth began shaking and the sky darkened. Chaim was white with fear from the shaking and darkening skies like before. Darling, is there anything else on the tablet I should say? Chaim remained quiet, regaining his composure again. He looked at the tablet carefully and slowly, buying himself time to process. He looked at the last lines of the text. Nin hursag sada emedu adanu akida. O lady of the mountain head, reach the mountain at the appointed time of heaven earth joining. Anaku bad usela mi tutti ikalu bal tutti. I, Enli, will raise up the dead here, consuming the living. Anaku ushum galu mushhushu bashmu enki awil bad galdinger. I am the great dragon, the red dragon, the dragon serpent. Lord of the earth, man of the great fortified place of the gods. Eli baltuti, ima idu mituti. The dead will be more numerous than the living. Then it hit him why the ground had shaken and the sky had turned dark when she said it, but nothing happened when he said it. He was just a mere scholar. His words were sounds. When Isabel spoke, her words carried authority. She was not just a beautiful grad student but was none other than the high priestess of Inanna. She was more a goddess than he realized. There is nothing more in the text. That's it, nothing more. Are you sure? For generations, my family thought there would be three episodes, but you are the expert, Motek. Chaim loved it when she had said sweetheart in Hebrew the night before, but this time the words fell flat. For his entire academic life, he had thought the texts he studied were just the product of ancient superstitious people with vivid imaginations. Now suddenly he was confronted with the evidence that the incantations were real. The goddess Inanna was real. Enlil was real. As he contemplated these matters, it felt like there was a black hole in his heart. If those were real, then what of his own tradition? Was Hashem real as well? Chapter 8 The Man for the Hour Tel Aviv after Therion's debut. Outside the Tel Aviv stadium, the crowd had been waiting for hours. Journalists vied for the best position. Israeli police and event security tried with little success to gently move the people back. 
A convoy of black SUVs coming to pick Therian up entered the compound under Belize's escort. The crowds thronged against the hurriedly set up barricade. Everybody tried to catch a glimpse of the enigmatic Therian before he disappeared into his waiting SUV. As Therian finally exited the building, the crowd cheered. Therian! Therian! A journalist tried to get a comment from him. Mr. Therian, do you honestly believe the governments of the world will agree to your initiative? Won't it mean surrendering their sovereignty? Yes, I do, he stated bluntly. Had the Anunnaki not powerfully demonstrated that humanity had no means to fight them? What would it take for humanity to finally see that their weapons only worked against flesh and blood? They had no ability to fight interdimensional beings. It was a mystery that Enlil was such a champion of the human race. Soon, it would not matter. He would not need to appease men. He would simply tell them what was best, and they would obey. Listen, he softened his tone. The Anunnaki are terribly powerful, and they could destroy us in a moment. But they are here to save men's lives, not destroy them. And of course, there is the obvious fact that if governments don't unite, there will be no world left to govern. A second journalist held his mic toward Therian. Mr. Therian, can you give us more details on the technologies the visitors will share with us? When will Babel City be open to the public? With great difficulty, the police managed to clear a path to his SUV. Closer to the vehicles, there were barriers that allowed Therian to break away from the crowds. As Therian was about to get into the car, a cute little girl broke free from her parents and ran up to him tugging on his jacket. He turned and looked at her. She was so innocent and unsuspecting. Her face would be perfect to show the world that the Babel Initiative was the right path. Hello, what's your name? He asked. Maddie, I'm six, she said. Oh, that old. Well, nice to meet you, Maddie. My name is Alexander. Maddie nodded. I know who you are. My daddy says you're going to make the world a better place. Is that true? Theron smiled at her. He could not have envisioned a better piece of propaganda if he'd tried. But then, there was always the possibility that Enwell was working in the background, working all things together for his supreme plan. Caleb was watching from the distance to see if Gurabian might show himself, when he noticed a man on the other side of the limousine placing something underneath the vehicle and then walking away. He looked over to Therian, who was still kneeling in front of the little girl. Therian was obviously the target. The distance between Caleb and the assassins was too great. He looked around and saw a cop that had just climbed off his electric bike. Caleb ran over and shoved the officer away from the bike. He jumped on and sped off on the sidewalk. Behind the police were pursuing him. Therian looked up and saw that Maddie's mother was concerned about her. He had enough footage of himself with the little girl. She no longer served his purpose, so he took her hand and walked her over to her parents. The news reporters were straining to get a good picture. Therian addressed them while glancing down at Maddie. This is why we need to heal the world, so that Maddie can have a future, so that we can all have a future. Maddie tugged on Therian's hand. I asked you a question. Can you make the world better? He laughed and bowed down to her eye level. He hated children, if you were honest. They reminded him too much of Enlil's enemy, his enemy. To be part of Enlil's kingdom, all of them would need to no longer be as little children. They needed to grow up and fall in line. But for now, she served a greater purpose. Yes, Maddie, I can, and with your help. Will you help me make the world a better place? She smiled and nodded. All right, then, that's a deal. He put out his hand and she shook it. Welcome to Team New World. The crowd laughed and cheered. Some would point it to something behind Therian. Therian turned to see Caleb on the bike racing toward him. Caleb gestured with his hand toward the SUV. Bomb! There's a bomb! Just as Caleb leapt off the e-bike to pull Therian down, the car exploded. Chaos ensued. The crowd ran in all directions. A few reporters and two police officers who stood between Therian and his car took the brunt of the blast. Caleb took a few seconds to recover from the fall. Theron got up and checked to see if Maddie was okay, knowing the cameras were on him. She wasn't hurt, but screamed in fear. Mommy! Daddy! Maddie's father, bloodied and wounded from the blast, forced his way through the panicked crowd. Caleb noticed a man moving toward Therion, with his right hand holding onto something inside his jacket. The man pulled a pistol from his jacket and aimed it at Therion. Just as he was about to pull the trigger, Caleb snapped the assassin's arm back, disarming him with a single move, and took the man out with his own weapon. Seconds later, three more men were upon him. Two of them managed to get on either side of Caleb and grabbed him by the arms. The front assailant approached and pointed the gun at Caleb, intending to shoot when Caleb delivered a sidekick to the assailant on his left. 
Then Caleb took advantage of the other assassin being put off balance by his move and yanked the guy in front of him just before the first assailant fired his weapon, sending a ball of lead into the man's chest. Caleb quickly advanced three feet forward into the man's right hand. Caleb extended his right hand, turned the gun, removing himself from the line of fire, and simultaneously pushed the gun into the man's waist while his other hand cupped the back of the gun. With a quick snap, he dislodged the weapon from the man's hand, flipped him over in one move, and jammed the tip of the gun into the man's head, knocking him unconscious. The former assailant, who Caleb had kicked, was back on his feet and approaching from behind. Caleb, in a flash, delivered a powerful roundhouse kick to the head. The man was able to partially block it, but staggered backwards. Caleb ran up the assailant's leg, wrapped his own legs around his enemy's neck, and twisted his body in such a fashion that the man flipped 360 degrees. The man landed with a thud on his head, rendering him unconscious. Theron was amazed. Caleb's movements and reactions were so quick, he had never seen anything like Caleb using his skills with deadly efficiency and unbelievable speed, easily neutralizing all the attackers. Who are you? asked Theron. Stay down, Caleb commanded. He scanned the area and saw more men approaching from different directions. A police officer tried to stop them but was gunned down. Caleb quickly checked the magazine and the pistol. He had just taken off one of the assassins. He slammed it back in, put a round in the chamber, and ran straight toward the approaching assassins, firing shots in rapid succession. He took two attackers down, both with headshots. He slid behind the one as he fell, using him as a shield against the other's bullets. He fired four more rounds, hitting the next attacker in the chest and head. The pistol slide jammed back after the last round was fired. Caleb threw the weapon at the last attacker, and in the two seconds it took to dodge him, Caleb was on top of him. Caleb managed to knock the weapon out of his hand, but the man managed to knock Caleb back. Obviously also a well-trained fighter, the assassin engaged Caleb in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Each tried to land blows that the other managed to block. The attacker pulled a blade and lunged at Caleb, but in a swift movement, Caleb turned the knife on him, burying it in the man's throat. Tactical police units swarmed onto the scene. Caleb stood back with his hands in the air. Chapter 9. A Proposition The waves lapped gently against the beach. Caleb loved coming to the Mediterranean Sea and staring out at the majesty of the water. He had loved coming here with his parents. He smiled, remembering all the mischief he had caused as a little boy. They nicknamed him Kofkatan, their little monkey. A chilly wind suddenly hit his face, and the sun ducked behind some clouds. Caleb looked out to the sea, and he could see something was changing, which was abnormal for this time of year. About twenty feet from shore, the water became agitated, and something began rising. His heart shuddered in disbelief. It looked like an enormous leopard with spots, though its feet were more like that of a bear. It also had wings, seven lion heads with crowns on them, and a tail that looked like a scorpion stinger. One of the heads looked like it had been killed, but then it came back to life. This beast walked toward the shore and was soon towering above Caleb. Before it got too close, Caleb ran away from the shore. The dunes were taller than he had remembered, and climbing the sandy hills took all his energy. When he had ascended some distance, he turned around and noticed that the beast was now standing upright like a man. Suddenly he saw a red dragon walking toward the beast. The beast bowed down before the dragon, and words were spoken though Caleb couldn't make them out. When the beast stood up, his eyes were glowing red, and horns had grown from his head. The horned beast looked straight at Caleb. Caleb tried to hide, but there was no place to take cover. He turned to run up the sand dune, but it was even taller than before. His feet were moving, but his body wasn't advancing. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't ascend the hill. He turned to look at the horned beast who was moving closer to him. He heard a voice call out, the whole world is in my hands. Caleb turned back to run again, but the sand started falling into a deep hole, taking Caleb with it. He screamed, but no sound came out. Everything went black. Somewhere in the Negev wilderness, Israel. Caleb woke up with a jolt and was breathing heavily. His hand shot out to the hidden holster next to his bed, extracting the loaded pistol. He bolted upright and pointed the pistol right in the face of nothing. There was nothing. Sweat was running down his face and torso. It took him a few seconds to register reality. Not again. He re-engaged the safety and returned the pistol to the holster. These dreams were becoming increasingly terrifying and were so real and bizarre. He sat up on the side of his bed and looked up to the photo of his brother Amitai and himself in happier days. Ever since Damascus, he had been plagued with nightmares of the strangest kind. Next to the photo was a near-empty whiskey bottle and empty glass. 
He finished the last bit from the bottle and dropped it into an overflowing trash can. Caleb stood under the cold shower with the water beating on his battle-scarred body, as if hoping somehow it would wash away the nightmares. Those demons weren't so easily exercised. Caleb turned on the TV and began preparing his breakfast. A reporter was standing in front of a hospital. The camera cut away to show the crowds carrying signs and posters with a picture of Therian kneeling in front of Maddie with the slogan, Together we'll make it better. The reporter continued, He's expected to make a full recovery. The wounds from the bomb were superficial flesh wounds. That news is welcomed by those gathered here who regard him as a kind of savior. His message of peace from the Anunnaki was a beacon of hope to the world, which has been in short supply. The feed cut back to the studio. Caleb poured himself a steaming cup of black coffee from the percolator. Whoever is behind this assassination attempt has only amplified Therian's Babel initiative message, which has gripped the world's imagination as the first ray of hope after a very dark season in mankind's history. Many citizens are demanding their governments accept his offer of peace. Caleb heard a dog barking outside. He separated two blades of the blinds to see the cause of the commotion. The reporter continued speculating, the disruptive technologies that Therion has showcased could certainly be a motive for the assassination attempt. The old guard would have a great deal to lose, but we should make it clear the police have refused to speculate. Caleb's dilapidated trailer was parked in the middle of nowhere, at the edge of the Negev Desert. It wasn't pretty or even nice, but it provided a roof over his head and a place to get away from it all. Other dwellings were sparse, with his closest neighbor about two miles down the road. Caleb stepped outside. With his right hand, he tucked a pistol into a back holster, and with his left, he threw a piece of bread to the stray dog who was barking at the sky. Caleb looked up. An electric vertical lift helicopter hovered almost silently in the air above Caleb's house. Caleb had never seen anything like that before, so much for living in an undisclosed location. As it came in for a landing, the whirring sound of the blades became more audible, yet it was still remarkably quiet. The dog's bark was much louder, and Caleb shooed the dog away. The craft touched down slowly. As the rotors slowed, the doors opened and three armed men stepped out, followed by Alexander Therian. Caleb shook his head. Therian walked up to him. This was the first time Caleb had stood face to face with him. Caleb was about six feet tall, but he had to look up at Therian, who was a head taller. Aren't you supposed to be in the hospital? Caleb quizzed. You disappeared before I could thank you. He held out his hand. Alexander Therian. Caleb did not reciprocate the handshake. He motioned to the helicopter. Could have just called. He peered at the bodyguards. Therian motioned to them to wait outside. Caleb and Therian went into the trailer, and the compact space made Therian's physique look even larger. Caleb lifted clothes off the seats and dumped them on the bed. How'd you find me? Brigadier Daron is my friend. Caleb pointed at the coffee pot. No, thanks. Caleb, may I call you that? Caleb shrugged. Do you believe in fate or a higher power? Just in what I can see, not superstitions. And the UFOs? There could be advanced, evolved beings out there. So just a lucky coincidence, you were in the right place at the right time. Caleb didn't respond. Well, you were acting on intel, obviously. At any rate, I wanted to thank you personally. I owe you my life. Bravery runs in your family. Caleb reflected on that statement. Therian saw the picture of Amitai and Caleb together. You and your brother are decorated officers in the Israeli Special Forces. Multiple awards and commendations for bravery. Plus, you are a military intelligence specialist in Mossad's Kidon unit. Very impressive. Two heroes, really. Kidon is not in my official file. I make it my business to know the people I want to work with, Therian said confidently. But you miss that I am retired? Therian smiled and glossed over the comment. I've never seen anyone do what you did. I've heard rumors about the ghost that's been making trouble all across the Middle East, who was also highly effective, like you were that day. Heard of him? Caleb wasn't one for small talk. Why are you looking into my background, and why are you and the three amigos here? Trust. Caleb nodded. Therian pointed to the bodyguards. The best money could buy, but not enough. Even the best can be taken down by a surprise attack, you weren't. For someone not enhanced, your skill level is impressive. The assassins obviously didn't expect someone like you to interfere with their plans, hence my visit. Caleb wasn't sure about the not enhanced bit, but didn't want to encourage a conversation to go on any longer. 
He was greatly irritated that Brigadier Daron shared his location with someone without discussing it with him first. He would have to move again. You anticipated my attackers. I also know you've been looking into it. Talos, that's our AI, traced a digital signature back to you. Talos? Caleb thought for a moment. Oh, the Cretan giant automaton made of bronze who was to protect Europe from pirates and invaders? That Talos? Very good. You know your history well. Caleb smirked at the praise. He really didn't like being the one being traced, even if that thing had a cool name. If a professional hit team was hired to take you out, they all would have had the same training, and it would have been much harder for me to take them all on. Their leader had training similar to mine, possibly Russian Speznas. The others were Arabic, Spanish, American, and African. Their styles were different, but they came together for a common cause. No close family connections and nothing to lose. My gut says this was ideological, religious, but none have claimed responsibility. Ideological. Not sure if that's better or worse, Theron said. Worse. People not motivated by money or fear of death are very dangerous. Not the first attempt of my life, but this was different. Innocents were killed. What are you doing that people want to kill you? The dream of a new world is a nightmare to the rulers of the old. Caleb was confused. Therian took a seat across from Caleb. We are building a new world, a peaceful, prosperous world for everyone, not only the elite. No more wars, disease, poverty. No control by religious zealots and dictators. I saw the infomercial. Very nice. Hmm, skeptical. I get it. When you see New Babel with your own eyes, you will believe too. No one else has the technological capacity that we have. We're decades ahead. I can deliver on my promises to all who join the initiative. You won't recognize this world in a decade. You still haven't told me why you are here. Before the Anunnaki will help us evolve and realize our utopian dream, we humans need to settle some issues among ourselves first, like stopping Gurabin. Therian waited for a reaction, but Caleb maintained his emotionless face. So Therian continued, He can't allow the Babel Initiative to succeed because it will unite the world and he'll be on the outside. Before the UFO appearances and my announcement, Gurabin was treated like a king and his empire and power were quickly growing. The initiative will virtually eliminate the need for crude oil, and that is his only source of revenue. He's already unhappy with the Iraqis not joining him. There are others in his alliance who are more open to the Babel initiative, and that weakens his influence. You have that AI. You don't need me, Caleb challenged. You know more about Gurabin than anyone else, and with the power and help of Talos, you can finally stop him and every other threat to our world. I need the most brilliant people in every field to realize this dream of new world. I need your help to stop those who benefit from mankind's depravity, who want to keep their power and keep the world enslaved. I want you to head up Babel's security task force to help keep the world safe. And, of course, you'll be paid handsomely. Caleb shook his head. I'm afraid you're wasting time. I'm done with all that. Yet you didn't hesitate to save me from those assassins, and you spent time investigating them. You're the one hunting Gurabian. The collateral damage you've caused tells me you are determined to find him. Yesterday, four innocent people died. If it weren't for you, it could have been me too, and a little girl who's dreaming of a future. Don't you want to stop him before the next attack? Before the next Damascus? Caleb considered the proposal for a moment. Look, I know you're doing good things in the world, and that's great. You say you want to end all wars. I really hope you succeed, but I can't work for you. As a former Israeli intelligence operative, I cannot join a foreign government. I already contacted Brigadier Doron with a request to appoint you as an official military liaison for Israel to Babel. As I said, I'm retired, but I'm sure Brigadier Doron will be able to recommend someone else. Theron walked up to the photo of Amitai. Why did you retire? Was it Damascus? Caleb's face momentarily betrayed his pain. He didn't answer. Well, it's a shame, but my request was specifically for you. Even the brigadier admitted you were the best, and I'm not willing to settle for anything less. Theron's assistant knocked on the door. Theron looked at his watch. Unfortunately, I have another appointment. Thank you for your time, Captain Baruch. Theron walked out of the trailer, followed by Caleb. If you change your mind, I won't. Caleb said matter-of-factly. Theron smiled and shook Caleb's hand. He climbed into the helidrone and took off. Chapter 10. Tabernacle Dream. Old City, Jerusalem. 
We agree. We will share the holy site of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock as long as the structure is a tent, like when Israel came out of Egypt, the head imam said. Rabbi Israel Cohen's mouth hung open. He was in shock. Here he was in a poorly lit room in a building at least 800 years old in the Arab quarter of the old city of Jerusalem, with 10 Muslims and 10 Jews sitting across from each other. At the head of the table sat Alexander Therion. How had Therion arranged this? How could the Waqf suddenly agree to such terms after so many years? What did they want in return? Rabbi Cohen, Alexander nudged. Ah, uh, he was stolen. Somehow, now that it was being offered to them, it seemed too easy. Surely there had to be something more they were expected to do. Uh, we must have a real temple or no deal. Therian mused for a moment. The voice had been directing him for many years, and had always been right. He knew he could count on it this time, too. Rabbi, our Muslim friends make a valid point. When Israel came out of Egypt, they didn't have a physical building. It was just a tent. They used that for about 400 years before Solomon built the temple. Perhaps that is not too much to ask? Caleb stroked his beard. Therian had a point. But Jews had dreamt of rebuilding the temple for ages. How could he betray them now? Therion saw him thinking. The voice once again directed him. And he said, How long did it take Solomon to build the temple? Seven years, Cohen almost blurted it out. He had shared that fact with tourists every time they came through the Temple Institute in the old city of Jerusalem. Therion gently crafted his story. So, you are like King David. You've prepared for the building of the temple for many years. You have all the utensils, the vestments, and so much more ready to go. He paused and waited for more instructions from the voice of Enlil. What if we simply postpone the permanent structure for a mere seven years? In the meantime, I will pay for an elaborate and beautiful tabernacle to be erected on the site, and you and your Muslim brothers can learn to be neighbors again. Cohen stroked his beard some more. It was a clever plan. Everyone gets what they want. He wouldn't be agreeing to less, just doing this as a down payment. But wait, dare he ask? He looked straight across the table at the wakf and challenged. Why are you agreeing to this? The head imam stared back confidently. Our people have been praying fervently for your destruction ever since Damascus. He paused and stared at Cohen. He might agree to work with him, but that didn't mean he had to like him. Cohen could sense there was no love between them. Of course, the feeling was mutual. The imam continued. Then came the arrival. Many teachers, I included, wondered if it could be a sign from Allah that the end was near. Many experienced great fear unlike any time in their lives. Then shortly after the nuclear sites were shut down, thousands of our people, including myself, were visited by the glowing orbs. We were told, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, share the Mount of Al-Haram Al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary with the Jews. Faithful Muslims around the world received this same message. So, here we are, ready to make peace with the Kafir. Cohen was silent for several moments. The Imam calling him a Kafir, a pagan and disbeliever of Islam, did not escape him. The appearance of orbs all over the world and their ability to shut down nuclear sites was unlike anything he or the entire world had ever seen before. Judaism did not have an official teaching on whether aliens existed or not, though it wasn't against the idea. It would not be unfathomable for Hashem to create other worlds with other inhabitants. Perhaps he was directing them for such a time as this. In any event, Cohen had a real opportunity to realize the Jewish dream this was what they had been working toward for years, and now it was falling into his lap. How could this not be Hashem's will? He looked at his team sitting next to him. They all nodded. Then we accept your invitation and the tabernacle for which Therian has generously offered to pay. We will begin sacrifices shortly. Therian smiled. Enlil would be pleased. Now he just needed to wait for the son of Baruch. It was just a matter of time. Chapter 11, All for Israel, Jerusalem, Israel Prime Minister Eitan Baruch and members of his security council watched the news report on the assassination attempt in a small boardroom adjacent to the PM's office in Jerusalem. 
Hopefully they will find the guilty parties soon, continued the reporter. And some critics of the Israeli government have suggested that Israel itself might be behind this attack. It is hard to believe that the murder of the defense minister on the same day is coincidental. Eitan clicked the remote, switching the TV off. His face reddened with his hands clenched. He said, they blame us again. We all know it's Russia, but everything is always Israel. Why would we host the man and then kill him in broad daylight in front of everyone? Hmm? Obviously, they're saying we stage it to look like terrorists, which is absurd, of course, Brigadier Daron opined. They were all well-trained, Prime Minister Baruch countered. Brigadier Daron wasn't sure where the Prime Minister was going, but assured, yeah, but none of them were ours. Eitan stared out the window. Enemies in our house, he whispered to himself. What was that? Prime Minister Baruch looked back across the room. One seat was unoccupied, Leibovitz. Eitan was still very disturbed by the revelations of Leibovitz's connections with General Gurabian. Of all people, he would have never suspected him. Leibovitz served in the army at the same time as Eitan, just in another division. What made him turn? The thought that a minister of his cabinet, which he himself had appointed, had a hand in the death of Amitai, Israeli soldiers, and tens of thousands of innocent Syrian civilians, was a burden he could hardly bear. How was that missed by Israeli intelligence? Were there others? Who could he trust? Caleb had been right all along. There were indeed enemies in the house, and though Eitan had been against Caleb's rogue mission, the pressure he'd put on Gurabian's organization had exposed Leibovitz. For the time being, the only people in that room who had direct knowledge of Leibovitz's treason were Brigadier Daron and himself. As far as the world was concerned, Yitzchak Leibovitz was a hero who was killed by the same terrorists responsible for the attack in Jerusalem and likely Damascus. If news got out, there were traitors in the government, it would destroy public trust. The traitors had to be rooted out quickly, but quietly. Though he didn't approve of Caleb's methods, he knew if anyone could find that information, it would be him. He prayed to Hashem that he wouldn't lose another son in the process. Hatan shook his head in answer to Daron's question. Enough for today. I want a full intelligence report from each of your departments on my desk first thing tomorrow morning. Brigadier Daron, meet me in my office. Everyone filed out of the room while Eitan and Brigadier Daron entered the office. Daron shut the door behind himself. Eitan didn't wait a second before speaking his mind. They had inside information, where to hit and when. They had weapons, and they weren't picked up by the detectors. Don't you find that strange? Caleb suddenly burst into the office, with Gertie, the Prime Minister's secretary, running short on his heels. Who authorized the hit? Caleb demanded. I'm sorry, Prime Minister. Gertie was disheveled from trying to hold him back. He stormed in. Do you need me to... Eitan waved his hand. It's all right, Gertie. Shut the door. Hold my calls. Mossad tried to eliminate me, Caleb said. What are you talking about? Eitan's face contorted. This morning, two Mossad operatives blew up my trailer and almost me with it. Who ordered the hit? Eitan looked at the brigadier. Daron shook his head. Now he had to clean up Leibovitz's cowardice. If the man had done his job properly, none of this would be happening now. Are you sure it was Mossad? Why would they do that? Oh, they were Mossad. I recognized them from the Beirut mission six years ago. Why? I don't know. The Prime Minister's pulse rose at the news. Give me their names and we'll interrogate them, Daron said. Caleb shook his head. They didn't make it. Eitan moaned and answered, Daron, something is going on and we need to stop it. We need to know how deep this goes. Were those agents rogue or does it go up higher up the chain? If we can't trust our security agencies, we're in deep trouble. Leibovitz, Alexander Theron, and now Caleb? I want answers. Eitan turned to Caleb and asked, Do you believe there's a connection between the two attacks? I do. An hour before the attack, Alexander Theron came to see me. Brigadier, he said you told him where to find me. Did he tell you when he would come to see me? Could someone have been listening? Daron was about to answer. But he paused because the Prime Minister looked so alarmed by Caleb's question. Wait, you told him where to find Caleb? asked Eitan. Why are you even discussing Israeli operations and operatives with an outsider? Daron believed in Therion. Even if Eitan and Caleb never would, the world had changed and Israel needed a new friend since they could not count on the Americans any longer. And if Therion turned out to be a bad friend, it was good policy to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. 
Daron shook his head, defending himself as he said, I've actually known Alexander Therian for years. At the time, I was interested in exploring possible military applications of some of his tech. He wasn't interested, but in turn tried to sell me on the idea of demilitarization of nations through the application of technology. We didn't see eye to eye, but I found him interesting nonetheless. I thought it would be good to keep an eye on his activities in case his influence grew. We lost touch until a few days ago. He sees Gurabian as a major threat to his plans and to the world. He wanted to thank Caleb personally for saving his life. But somehow he also knew all about what Caleb has been up to ever since Damascus. He didn't get that information from me. He was offering his resources to Caleb to help us stop Gurabian. Caleb agreed. He invited me to New Babel where I could access their advanced AI system and other technologies to track Gurabian and bring down his organization. That's a good thing. When are you going? Daron quizzed. I declined. Why? I don't freelance, Brigadier, especially not to other governments. He's not a government. He's a businessman, a philanthropist. I vetted him personally. He is a friend to Israel, not an enemy. He can be trusted, and frankly, between the UFOs shutting down the world's nukes, including our own, and the rest of the world wanting to kill us, he is the best option we have. Caleb boldly countered. I disagree. I've done some digging. My contacts in Iraq say even though Therian wasn't politically elected, for the last few years he has really been the one in control of Iraq. The government kept a hush on it and created a large no-go zone to keep people out of the Shinar region and Babel. No contractors were allowed to leave during that time. In the meantime, there was major economic development happening in the rest of the country and government projects were booming, which was surprising considering the meltdown of the rest of the world was experiencing. The investment capital came from Therian, of course. As a result, the government gives him everything he wants without any oversight. No one really knows what's going on in New Babel. All they have are his assurances and his money. Daron was stewing over Caleb's attitude. Not many soldiers would get away with questioning him the way Caleb was doing. The UFOs were an unknown threat, and the only person who knew them was Alexander Therion. He tried to direct the conversation to the Prime Minister and said, He's improving the lives of the Iraqi people. That's what he's always set out to do, and not just for the Middle East, but for the world. That's exactly what the Babel Initiative is about. The world needs this. Israel needs this. Caleb hit back. That may be, but I'm not going to just take his word for it. I don't know him or his true intentions, especially as far as Israel is concerned. I won't just give away my intel. The last time I did that, half my unit was killed. Caleb paused for a second as he glanced at his father and continued, including my brother. I'll find Gurabi myself and I don't need AI to do that. Brigadier Daron's irritation turned to anger. You've been acting like a lone vigilante, leaving trails of bodies behind, and you're no closer to capturing Gorabia now, are you, Baruch? You're just lucky no one else has connected the dots back to you and to Israel. We have enough trouble as it is with the Damascus situation. Gorabian is growing too powerful. Can you imagine what he would do with New Babel's technologies if it fell into his hands? Most of the Muslim world is uniting behind him as if he's the Mahdi, and their number one priority is what? Wipe Israel off the map. Do you want to see a repeat of Damascus here in Israel? Because that's what will happen if he's not stopped now. If you agreeing to work with Theron will help us destroy him, you will do it, and that's an order. I'm no longer under your damn command, Brigadier. I don't follow your orders. And while I've been chasing Gorabian, Israel's traitors have still not been found. Why is that? The only reason we know about Leibovitz is because they decided to shut him up, and they didn't have time to clean up their mess. Daron's face turned red and he barked. I don't care whose son you are. You will address me with the respect I deserve. Do you understand me? If you want to turn your back on Israel and the army that's been your home for 20 years, then go. We don't need deserters. You're also no longer under my protection. Don't expect me to look the other way when you cross the line again. And we both know you will. Eitan allowed the tension between the two to play out for a bit. He knew a testing of ideas was needed. After the dust settled between them, the better idea would rise to the top. All right, enough. Daron is correct. Gurabi must be stopped. But Caleb's right too. We don't know much about Therian. It's not wise to make alliances with people we know nothing about. Which is why, Caleb, I think you should go. He invited you, no one else. Learn what you can about New Babel. 
There is already political pressure for us to join this initiative, but I need to know more. I am skeptical, but lest we forget, UFOs did in fact shut down our nuclear weapons and the nukes of the entire world. Theron claims he knows what's going on. Going to New Babel is the only way to get answers. And if it means you can find General Gurabi with his help, why not? In the meantime, we'll put special forces units on standby so they can act on your intel. Agreed? Doron calmed down considerably thanks to the PM's intervention. He looked at Caleb. We'll be ready, and I'll find out who was behind the attack on you, Caleb. In all my years in the military, I have never had a more gifted soldier under my command. I believe you could one day lead this army. You have the capability to stop our enemies, to protect our homeland. We are trusting our future into your hands. Don't let me down. Chapter 12, New Babel. New Babel Control Center, Iraq, days later. I know what you're thinking, Theron smiled as he read Caleb's reaction. Caleb was stunned. The scale of the operation was unlike anything he had seen in government facilities before, even in the USA at the height of its power. The second and third floors of Babel Tower were the operations center, the brain of the city, and the headquarters of Babel's intelligence and security network. The center section had a ceiling that was double volume in height, with a massive two-story high screen on one wall. The bottom floor was the operational center, and the upper level housed all the offices and intelligence briefing rooms. A series of transport tunnels joined the op center with the other facilities across Babel City and beyond. Each tunnel could be secured within seconds. Elevators were spaced out throughout this facility, each accessing different sections of the tower, depending on security clearances. The entire complex was built to withstand a direct thermonuclear blast. For all of Theron's talk about peace and ending wars, it looked an awful lot to Caleb like a high-security command center. It looks like a war room. It is in some ways, Theron said. This is our operations center where everything connected with our tallow system can be monitored and maintained. The whole infrastructure of Babel is powered by quantum computers run through Talos AI, providing us with intel that can be used to prevent crimes and violence. Info available to Babel Initiative members. Yes, right. Talos, the sentient automaton created to protect Europa? Well, it still looks like you are here to wage war. Wage peace, not war. The world has been blind due to the cyber attacks. Caleb nodded. There really were no surveillance and intelligence gathering capabilities like there used to be. Talos is an entirely new data system that can access all digitized information, much more powerful than the old internet ever was, Theron said. Every profile, comment, post, transaction, relationship, and communication that any person in the last 50 years has ever done through the internet is in there. Though the normal system of surveillance is not operational in large parts of the world, Talos actually uses a predictive algorithm to anticipate where problem situations are most likely to arise and who would be involved. Couple that with our own proprietary satellite system and surveillance drones, there is very few places on the planet where you can go, Caleb interjected to finish the thought, where we will not find you. He began to see how this could be very effective in finding Gurabian. Theron nodded at Antonio Mesmo, Dr. Malcolm Sears' right-hand man and main tech wizard. Antonio tapped on a keyboard, and with that, the giant screen split into multiple panels, each with the name of a country. One by one, the name was replaced by a live feed. Some screens showed wider views of cities like Paris, New York, and Hong Kong. Others showed closer views of citizens walking with facial recognition squares, tracking everyone. The security team applauded. With this, most crimes and violence won't even happen, because Talos would have anticipated it before it occurs. Minority report, said Caleb, still digesting the information. What's that? asked Antonio. Before your time, one of my favorite sci-fi films. I preferred the book, Theron teased. But instead of precogs lying in a tank predicting the future, we have Talos. And the more nations that join the initiative, the better it works. How about a demonstration? Caleb wanted to get a sense of the power it held so he could search for Gurabian. Antonio? The panel with the pedestrians walking down a road was maximized to fill the screen. Pick any of the people you see there. Caleb pointed at one, saying, with the backpack and black cap. Antonio tapped the control panel. The man's whole pedigree was called up on a floating panel, including his ID, name, age, occupation, 
medical history, civil and criminal records, earnings, closest relationships, and social credit score. All clear, remarked Antonio. He's a pretty clean guy, except for one citation. Caleb tapped on the panel. There was an orange flag next to the man's name. On the 2nd of February, 2022, he slipped into a public restroom on the outskirts of West Berlin without paying a credit. Therian chuckled, as did the whole security team. Send in the special forces now, he joked. He won't get away with that. Everyone laughed. Okay, we'll let it go this time. With a demerit, of course. Caleb smiled and nodded. The security team applauded. Therian tapped on the control panel in front of him. A world map showed up on the screen, mostly uniform and green, apart from a few nations who showed up as red, blue, or orange. Theron explained, The blue nations are in the process of coming online. The orange nations have given us partial access, and the red nations have given us no access. Malcolm Sear nodded. Immediately obvious was Israel and the East African Republic, as both showed up red. In South America and Eastern Europe, there were some blue nations. Egypt, Syria, Russia, and China were orange. We're almost there. Pretty soon, that whole map will be green. Therian turned to the rest of the team and said enthusiastically, Good job, everyone, and thank you. What you do here is incredibly important as we work hard to stabilize and secure our planet. Your diligent efforts will make the world a safer place for your children and the generations to come. He patted Darian, one of the young, nerdy-looking IT specialists on the back. Keep up the good work, Darian. Darian beamed with pride and surprise as Therian said his name. Therian turned to Caleb. See your eyed them with suspicion. Therian and Caleb left the center and made their way to the elevators. Everything I've seen here is very impressive, Caleb said. I'm still trying to get my head around it all, but what I don't understand is how General Gurabian and his organization have managed to evade the system. Amazing as Talos is, we are not yet using it to its full capacity. For now, it's about building a new interconnected network of computers, but its data is limited to what was already available on the old internet. General Gorabian has very cleverly built his organization off-grid. As far as we can tell, he has never been on the old or new internet in his life. That's why you're here. Your intelligence and knowledge of Gorabian will train Talos and enable the algorithm to build the profile more accurately. Then it will build a predictive analysis for any future movements and actions by the general. That's how you will catch him. In Talos' next phase, I want to connect people directly and to decentralize this technology so that anyone can use it. It will be a new living internet and unlike anything we've seen before. It will be so much more advanced than current systems that even someone like Gurabin will not be able to hide himself anymore. Dignitaries from around the world, representing many fields of expertise in all the major religions, disembarked from the large Airbus at the Baghdad airport, plus a plethora of reporters. Friendly crew members dressed in designer uniforms reflecting each of the cultures from which they hailed raised welcome signs in the language groups they represented. Each passenger was handed a little pouch containing earpods. Among the guests was Dr. Gavriela Levy. She had her long blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail like she was ready for business. She took the ear pods and slipped them into her bag. Thank you, she said as she made her way toward the maglev. You're welcome, said the hostess. Please continue this way to the platform. Inside the futuristic capsules, the passengers took their seats. The doors closed and within seconds the train accelerated at tremendous speed, yet the effects of it could hardly be felt by anybody inside. The end walls of the capsules became huge video screens showing a slideshow of images. The crew directed the passengers to insert their headphones. Chaim fumbled with the pods and after a bit of effort, finally got them to stay in his ears. An audio presentation began. Good morning. We are honored to welcome you, our guests, on this incredibly special occasion. Each guest heard the audio in his or her own language. The impact of the Babel Initiative is already being seen around the world. Former enemy nations have laid down arms and made peace. Under the new charter, the world is divided into ten zones, each represented by a leader for the particular zone. Electricity has been restored to most world regions using innovative technologies that don't rely on fossil fuels. The train sped through the desert. We're now entering the Shinar region, the only autonomous economic zone of its kind in the world, the voiceover continued. The train slowed gently and the occupants saw how the desert landscape transformed into green pastures and farmlands. Giant water-generating towers reached high into the sky. 
The train's screens showed video footage of an indoor vertical food growing factory with a New World farming technician overseeing an automated system with multiple pallets of fresh food moving along a flowing water conveyor system. Food shortages are being addressed through New World farms and food factories like these using both conventional and aquaponic methods. The food they produce is being prioritized to those in greatest need, but it won't be long before the whole world will be fed from mega farms just like these. The audio displayed Alexander Therion, along with other New World workers, unloading pallets of food from an electric self-driving supply truck, surrounded by laughing and cheering children from a refugee camp. Therion took a handful of delicious apples and tossed them into the crowds of refugees and children who laughed as they caught them. In the background, construction crews with the 3D printing construction machines were assembling rows of houses. Some poured concrete into a feeder controlled by a computer, which guided an arm to push the concrete out like toothpaste in the shape of the building, level upon level. Others used preformed pieces built in one of Therion's many factories, which were then transported to the worksite and snapped together like Lego blocks. For the families in this refugee camp and many others like it, these buildings will be life-saving, the voiceover explained. Soon they will exchange their temporary homes for new permanent homes. According to the New World Congress goals, hunger will be completely eradicated in less than five years. And how do they buy their groceries? All they need to purchase food, energy, clothing, anything really is this. The video showed a token. The icon is biometrically linked to its owner, so it cannot be stolen. It will be linked to your bank account. But it will also work on a social reward system in which you earn rewards for community service, volunteering, and even for just being a good neighbor. These rewards can also be used to make purchases just like money in the bank. The train passed right by one of the towers. The passengers marveled as they looked up through the glass ceiling of the capsules. The train sped up again and soon the city of Babel came into view. The passengers gasped in excitement. Construction of super cities has begun in each participating nation, with New Babel serving as the template. The screen showed giant 3D cement printing machinery, cranes, and construction crews at work levels all over the city. Each city had a unique design and surrounding landscape that reflected its culture and ancient roots. The construction of the first 10 megacities is well underway, the voiceover continued, already providing employment and accommodations to millions. In the center of the city, an unusually tall building reached high into the sky. Sunlight glimmered off the Babel Tower's windows. It was by far the tallest building on earth, an architectural marvel. In front of Babel Tower, a single large flag was raised, displaying the symbol of the New World Council. The train entered the city next to the ancient Ishtar Gate, beautifully restored to its original splendor. Parallel to the track ran a main road that circled the city. All the vehicles were electric and self-driving. One of the passengers excitedly pointed at something, and a number of other passengers joined in the excitement. On a separate track, a number of vehicles seemingly floated above the ground using some kind of anti-gravitation technology. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. The track rose until the train was on an elevated height above the city. The large windows gave an unobstructed view of everything below. Up close, the main tower was even more impressive. The train slowed to a gentle stop in the station of the magnificent tower building. The doors of the capsule slid open and the passengers were led out and directed toward the main building. The entrance hall was enormous. As the guests entered the main building, they looked around in amazement at the beautiful architecture and design, which was at the same time futuristic and historic. The design of the walls stylistically incorporated replicas of artwork and icons from ancient Babel, as well as cultures and civilizations from all across the planet. Display cases showed mankind's greatest discoveries and inventions from throughout the ages. Large interactive touchscreens displayed ancient documents and manuscripts. Above the screens were the words, The key to the future lies in our past. In the center of the room, a piece of artwork showed elements of all religions and cultures. At the center of the art piece was the Ushum Galu, a large seven-headed dragon which unified them all. The guests gathered around a platform in front of the art piece. The reporters were already busy filming and talking into their cameras. Then Alexander Therian stepped onto the platform, along with Dr. Malcolm Sear and a few others. Though he was naturally skeptical, Caleb had to admit that Alexander was truly making the world a better place. 
No one could have dreamed he would turn things around in such a short space of time. Theron was beaming with excitement. He waved at a few people in the audience he recognized. Welcome to Babel, the guests applauded. I am humbled and excited that you've joined us here today. Each of you was carefully selected and invited here based on your work history and reputation. Together, you represent the leading thinkers and pioneers in your respective fields, the best minds on the planet. The world today is in a desperate state, and if there's to be any hope for a future, it will come from those in this room. I really believe that. So we have not simply invited you here to show off what we've done, but to hopefully give you a vision of what can yet be done in the future if we work together. If we look around, we are reminded of the great accomplishments mankind has achieved over the ages. At least, these are the things we know about. The truth is, our greatest advances and discoveries have been hidden from us by those who have appointed themselves as the guardians of history, or should I say, gatekeepers. But that is no longer the case. Some were puzzled by these words. Others nodded in tacit agreement, happy to go along with the narrative. Under the guidance of Dr. Malcolm Sear and his team, we have recovered and deciphered many documents and manuscripts from ancient civilizations which show technologies far beyond what we have ever imagined. He pointed toward the sign above him. The key to our future lies in the past, which until now had been lost to us. We wish to share some of these discoveries with you today. Therian walked off the platform toward a doorway that led to an adjoining room. The guests followed. Large doors slid open to reveal the Babel Knowledge Center. Theron extended his arms in an invitation and announced, Welcome to the future. In the center of the large room was a six-story library of ancient books and documents encased in thick glass walls in a climate-controlled environment. It was beautifully lit and immediately drew attention. The rest of the Knowledge Center was filled with displays vastly different from the ones in the entrance hall. Some displays were holographic, some physical. The guests began exploring and people were drawn to the different displays that most interested them. One of the displays had a large boulder levitating off the ground. Another was a demonstration of atmospheric energy powering an electric motor. Yet another was a demonstration of sound wave technologies and musical frequencies affecting physical objects. Theron walked among the different displays, taking a keen interest in the reactions of the different experts of what they were seeing. Gavriella was drawn to a large, bright holographic display that showed a rotating DNA helix. She studied the structure intently. It was mesmerizing. There was something special about this strand of DNA. She felt chills go up her spine. Being in this place gave her a special peace. She knew that she was going to make a difference for all humanity. She didn't notice Therian walk up behind her. You notice it too, right? Gavi looked around, surprised by Therian's presence. What is that? I was hoping you could tell me, Dr. Levy. Recent warming caused some thawing in Antarctica and a scientific exploration that I sponsored accidentally discovered a frozen corpse estimated to be more than 5,000 years old. This DNA was recovered from the bones of that corpse. She looked at the hologram again, her eyes wide in amazement. At first it seems like standard human DNA, but this... She pointed towards something reaching into the hologram, a point of light attached to her finger, and as she pulled back, the image zoomed a bit larger. Realizing it was interactive, she used two hands to zoom and rotate the image. She pulled her hands back to release and then gestured to an area in the helix. It seems as if this DNA has been edited, altered somehow. Look how it's affected the branches of the helix beyond this point. There's a definite change. The branches seem increasingly thicker, stronger, I would have to study the sample directly to confirm, but this is remarkable. What else do you know about the corpse? Therian was enjoying the exchange. I am told that bone density indicates that this man lived a very long life, centuries even. Remarkable. Something happened to him, something that transformed, healed his DNA. We've hypothesized that something like this was possible, but no one has ever seen a real-life example of it. Do you realize that the ability to edit DNA in such a way could mean the eradication of disease? How is this possible? At that time, it is almost unthinkable. We are only now scratching the surface of molecular regeneration. It has been the main focus of my research for almost my entire career. We've come close, but yet to have cracked the code, 
And this could hold the answer. You have to publish this. The world needs this now. Theron smiled. If only all minds were this easy to convince. I'm very pleased to hear you say that, and I agree with you. I would love to share this information with the world, but right now there are many powerful interests who would want to prevent something like this being made available. Sickness, disease, and death is a lucrative business. They will suppress a cure through misinformation and legislation. That's the way their system works. I won't be put off, however. Their systems are failing. Soon the world will beg us for a cure, and we will gladly share it. But when that opportunity comes, it's crucially important for us to have perfected the science and cracked the code, as you put it, doctor. Then we need a way to deliver this to the population of the world quickly and efficiently. All the world, not only the rich and powerful. That is exactly why I invited you here, Gabriella. Do you mind if I call you that? Gabi smiled and still focused on the DNA, but his charisma was undeniable. It was obvious why the world was now beginning to revolve around his orbit. For years, everything had seemed so hopeless, but he was given a vision of something different. It was hard to trust anybody on a position of power. They all had their own agenda, but something about him just seemed different and genuine. He smiled back warmly. We have found solutions to so many problems, but a cure for all disease is the one we haven't solved yet. I've read your published articles and thesis summary in the Science Journal. It's clear that you are on the forefront of genetic research. I want to fund your research so that you can help us unlock the keys to longevity and health and the eradication of disease. You'll have full access to all my resources, the best labs, and the vast knowledge base in Babel's archives. You can have your pick of the best researchers and staff. Whatever you need, you name it. I'll make sure you have it. Gavi had tears in her eyes. She looked at the rotating helix again and then smiled. His offer was truly exceptional. It was surreal that after so many years, she would finally get a chance to make a real difference. A difference that wasn't just about a company's bottom line, but about transforming humanity to make it better, stronger, and able to live longer. I believe we could cure millions in Africa immediately with this information, if we had the right person. Would you be open? Would I be open? Gavi couldn't believe her ears. Her whole life had been leading up to this moment. All she ever wanted to do was to help people and to give them hope of a better life. Of course she would go. Dr. Malcolm Sear was walking proudly around the Knowledge Center. He and Theron had built so much in such a short time. He reflected on how true the key to the future lies in our past. Chapter 13. The Portal. CERN, Switzerland, four years earlier. Let's do it again, Malcolm demanded. He cared little about his aides being exhausted after working all week without a break. This was the 15th time today they were running the procedure on CERN's massive Large Hadron Collider. Malcolm had waited years to finally get the opportunity to work on the world's largest and highest energy particle collider, and now there was no time to waste. As busy as they were, his aides were fools who understood nothing, and Malcolm held no respect for them. After all, they cared little for what he was really trying to achieve. They, much like him, were just trying to advance their own agendas. They could be forgiven for that, but they didn't realize, nor could he tell them, the true intent of his research. Yes, they were willing to work as practical slaves just to put his name on their resumes, and so they should. He was the greatest theoretical and quantum physicist that had ever lived. Malcolm walked over to his computer and reviewed the formula. Every time he hit enter, the mass of machine sent subatomic particles in opposite directions in a smaller loop to gain velocity. The streams of particles then traveled into a circular tunnel 17 miles in circumference situated beneath the France-Switzerland border near Geneva. At the desired speed, the protons smashed into each other, creating 6.5 tera electron volts of kinetic energy per beam. Positioned around the crossing points were seven detectors designed to recognize different phenomena. However, Malcolm was not merely interested in discovering new particles. He tended to be the first to create an Einstein-Rosen bridge, or as commoners called it, a wormhole. His bridge would create a quantum entanglement between his realm and the realm of the gods. If the formula in the ancient Sumerian text was correct, Malcolm would establish a portal for the ancient gods to path through that they might bestow their knowledge, power, and abilities on him. 
Every time he fired the machine, he saw black dots appear in the air outside the large laboratory from some unknown realm. However, the process was not stable enough for the portal to open. He looked at his team. The bags under their eyes reflected the long hours he had demanded they work. He looked at the clock. It was 10 p.m. He decided they might be more useful to him if they got some sleep, so he dismissed them to their dorms. With everyone else gone from the lab, he turned to renowned ancient Near East scholar Dr. Isabel Markov, who had personally given him the data. Being the top ancient Near East scholar had made her invaluable for his purpose. In an accusatory tone, Malcolm barked, Something is missing. The portal wants to open, but it isn't stable. Isabel wrapped her fingers on the desk. She was growing impatient. She spent so many years working toward her goal. This had to work. She had also wasted years with Malcolm pretending to be his lover. She didn't care for his chubby fingers or for the extra skin bulging over his collar. They stood about the same height. He had 5'9 and one half, and she had 5'8. She much preferred taller men. She was wasting her incredible beauty with him, a woman who could have any man on the planet worshipping at her feet, as they should. She smiled at him, but it wasn't love that she was seeking. Sharing a bed with him was a small price to achieve the big reward she wanted, and she would get what she wanted. She always did. This collaboration was much like an Anschluss with Sander. She was the one who had done the research for Sander to find Gilgamesh. Without her, he would have been completely lost. She tilted her head and her eyebrows raised as she remembered that Sander did keep the bargain and shared the elixir. Now at 60, she didn't look a day older than she did those years ago in the tomb. To be 25 forever was delightful, but to become the goddess Ishtar was her greatest ambition. Darling, Ati me pete babka is the correct phrase, she said sweetly to Malcolm. Chaim translated himself when we were on site. Then you and I converted the Sumerian cuneiform into their numerical equivalent. It must be correct. Malcolm reflected for a moment. The ancients didn't use modern scientific language, though once their knowledge was properly transited into modern scientific vernacular, it proved impressive and useful. Despite not having computers, they somehow cracked the code to open portals to other realms. Then Chaim didn't give you everything, he scolded. Isabel erupted with anger, but decided to hide it. How dare he talk to her like a little girl? She would endure his chiding for now. She would keep her eye on the prize, but she would have her revenge on him for that statement. Malcolm walked to his desk and picked up the phone, hoping his old friend Chaim ben Emmet, professor at the Hebrew University, could help. He looked over at the lovely Isabel. He realized he should keep his love life a secret because Chaim might not agree to help if he knew they were together. Chaim might be jealous that the better of the two had the love goddess. He punched in the number and the phone rang. Chaim, I have a question, Malcolm said without emotion. Malcolm, is that you? Oh, it's good to hear your voice, old friend. My, it is late. What time is it? Where are you? Malcolm smiled, sensing his scheme might work. Chaim continued talking while putting his slippered feet up carefully on his desk so as not to disturb the many books and stacks of papers. So I hear you're a bigwig at CERN. I always knew you'd go far. Wow, how many years has it been? Fifteen? Twenty? Yes, well, it seems we've both done well, Malcolm answered, not wanting to chit-chat if he didn't have to. You became the world-famous ancient Near East expert, like I always knew you would. You haven't retired yet? Chaim quizzed. Retire? Never. But I am close to reaching my goals. Isabel was listening through an earpiece and winced at that admission. Chaim was no idiot. He might figure something out. Well, we never retire, but we do change direction. But you haven't destroyed the world yet, so I guess it is going well. Chaim chuckled at the inside joke they used to tell during their undergraduate days. Listen, old friend, Malcolm hoped a little buttering up might help. The reason I am calling you is we need your help. Check your email. I just sent you a symbol we can't make sense of. Isabel bit her lip at yet another slip. She was sure Chaim would not help if he knew she was involved. I'm always glad to help an old friend, Chaim said as he opened the email. He looked at the cuneiform symbol with two parallel lines with a triangle at opposite ends. Hmm, yes, that is the logogram of Enlil, Lord Wind, Kur Gaal, the great mountain, the great dragon, divider of heaven and earth, holder of the tablet of destinies. Malcolm cut him off. Ah, yes, I, I knew you would know that immediately. I am also aware it means Enlil and all his epithets. 
could there be anything that I'm missing? Tell me everything you know about that symbol. Chaim slowly exhaled and with professor's tone began, Well, it is interesting that Enlil is how it was rendered to the general population, but the scribes pronounced it Oog. However, the actual spelling of the name of the logogram is different. He spelled it out B-A-D, pronounced Bad, rhymes with Sad. Ironic, isn't it, that it looks just like the English word Bad? Anyway, that particular form is a reduplication, Bad, Bad. It means death and enmity. Isabel's eyes got big as saucers, as if Chaim had just given the winning lotto numbers. She waved at Malcolm. He understood that it was all they needed, but Chaim continued on, lost in thought. You know, it's interesting how much that symbol conjures up. It is also related to Nergal's planet. Well, you know, Mars, if I recall, according to astronomical omens. Uh, Mars spreads death when he rises up or flares up. And the tentative etymology of Salbat Anu, or loosely translated as the planet which spreads plague. There was silence on the phone for a few moments. Are you there, Malcolm? Oh, yes. Sorry, my friend. Just taking notes. Thank you. I think that is all we need, Malcolm snipped. Isabel frowned again at Malcolm. He was a brilliant scientist, but had lousy interpersonal skills. However, he was useful for her goals, for now. Not taking the hint, Chaim pressed. What is this for, if I may ask? Does this have something to do with your belief that the ancients were opening wormholes? Quantum entanglement and wormholes, to be exact. Thank you. You've been useful, Malcolm said, and hung up the phone. Chaim hung up, leaned back in his chair, and stroked his beard. Had he shared too much? Chaim shuddered. Malcolm was a genius, and he might just bring about the end of the world. Hopefully it was nothing, but who was Malcolm working with? I hope he doesn't figure out who we are, Isabel glared for a moment. Malcolm's head sank. But don't worry about it, sweetheart, Isabel said flirtatiously. Malcolm was a big fish, and she didn't want to let him get away now that they were so close. He was the key to her throne. She leaned into him so he could feel the warmth of her beautiful body. Let's see if it works. Malcolm and Isabel turned to his computer and inserted the new values that his old-fashioned but useful friend had just revealed. He typed B-A-D, BAD, into the software, which then converted it into usable computer code for the Large Hadron Collider to work. He ran the simulation and nothing new happened. He looked at his notes and saw reduplication. So this time he entered the value BAD. He pondered the translation, enmity and death. It was curious indeed. He couldn't help but think of the last time he heard the word enmity during his time as a Jesuit priest in regard to the eating of the forbidden fruit and the resulting enmity between the serpent and the woman. He had, of course, stopped believing in the God of the book. Well, yes, he existed, but not as the all-powerful being he was made out to be. Malcolm knew there were other beings, and hopefully this new data would allow him to contact them. Isabel wished he would share more of his thoughts with her. The software converted the new values into the program and ran the simulation. While they waited, Malcolm was both weary and hopeful. The monitor displayed the message that the simulation was a success. They grinned at each other. He looked at the clock and stated the obvious. This kind of test should wait until we have our full staff on hand. Isabel tensed up a little and coaxed. But many scientists have had to follow their hunches and sometimes just go for it. Malcolm jerked his head and snapped. But going alone could likely put my job in jeopardy. As I put her hands on his shoulders, she began massaging them deeply, releasing his tension. Humanity needs hope more than ever right now. If we have the correct formula and we open the portal, then history and humanity will forgive you. Indeed, you will be considered a hero for your courage. He navigated with his mouse to the window that controlled the LHC. The software compiled the values into the LHC. The cursor blinked. This was it. Malcolm paused. Isabel beamed with anticipation of what their success would mean for her. You were about to make history, darling. He clicked the mouse and waited. The LHC fired. Energy started intensifying. Then the building shook violently for several seconds. Coffee jiggled to the edge of desks and crashed to the ground. Computer monitors fell over. He began to wonder if he had just caused his own death when suddenly a black spot with the size of a man's fist manifested in front of the LHC. It then grew to the size of a pizza and then a patio umbrella. He smelled something like sulfur emitting from the portal and bluish, greenish lights shined through into the building. He had done it. He had opened a gateway of the gods, a door between the dimensions. Just as he started walking toward it, the earth again shook 
and the portal started closing until it vanished. Why did it close? There's still something Heim was not sharing. By now, the support staff on the premises came rushing into the lab, all saying, Dr. Seer, are you okay? Yes, thank you. I'm fine. That was quite a shaking, huh? He had done the impossible, but had nothing to show for it. And where was Isabel? Just then, the managing director entered with her hair disheveled, which was unlike her. She normally had a very professional appearance with her hair impeccably arranged. Clearly, she had gone home for the evening and had rushed back when she felt the earthquake. She looked disapprovingly at Malcolm and said, Our systems indicate that you ran the LHC with no oversight whatsoever, and it just so happened that we were at the very epicenter of a 5.9 earthquake. The international community will want answers, and the board of directors is going to have my head for this. I have no choice but to put you on leave until the situation blows over. Director, Malcolm started to defend himself, but then stopped. The only good thing about getting older was the greater wisdom it afforded, and he knew offering an explanation at the moment would not be fruitful. She was just like those in the church. They purported to encourage free thought, but only so long as it agreed with the established doctrines. Science was about exploring new horizons, at least until the bureaucracy got involved. He stared at her for a moment and then acquiesced, as you wish. He took his notebook, grabbed his coat, and went toward the elevator to exit. Malcolm entered his house and locked the door behind him, as was his habit, though it was unnecessary in Geneva. There are more handguns per capita here than in America, but the Swiss had a different way about them that simply did not invite much violence. After putting his things down, he poured himself a glass of wine and went to his armchair to meditate on the day. He and Isabel had come closer than ever to fully opening the portal. What happened? He took out his notebook and flipped it open to examine his notes. What had he missed scientifically? Though, frankly, his bigger problem was not just the science, but now keeping his job. He knew he could count on the director general to forgive him. However, it was the chairman of the CERN council who was already suspicious of his research and of his intentions. Once the council realized that his opening of the portal had caused two quakes, there was little question he would be suspended or fired. Then he would be without a job and without funding for the greatest discovery of human history. As he turned through the notebook, he noticed a streak of light come across the page. He lifted his eyes to see its source. A bright light was coming from outside. He was surprised because here he had never seen a helicopter hovering like sometimes happened in the States. He went out onto his deck to get a good look. In the sky, he saw what looked like a squadron of perhaps 30 orbs hovering overhead. They were not moving or making any noise. Their shapes resembled a tic-tac breath mint. They were self-luminous and lit up like Christmas trees. Suddenly, two of the craft bolted up tens of thousands of feet in the air. Seer lost sight of them for a few moments until he craned his neck and saw them. They were at around seventy to 80,000 feet. They traveled to that height in less than a second and a half and remained there for several seconds. Captain Johansson felt goosebumps again as she gazed down upon the beautiful planet below her. She just couldn't get over the fact that she was on the International Space Station. She loved staring at the blue ball for hours in her free time. She could make out the lights of Europe below her. In her line of vision, there appeared out of nowhere at least 30 glowing orbs. The source of their lighting somehow felt organic, like the bioluminescence of fish, rather than that of electronics and technology. UFOs were not heard of, but they still carried a stigma for anyone who reported them. She opened her mouth to call her fellow astronauts to come see when suddenly the orbs dropped down into the atmosphere, apparently over Switzerland. With restraint, she closed her mouth and went back to enjoying the beautiful view. Malcolm was astonished. Just as fast as the two orbs had ascended, they descended back to the squadron and retook their places. There was no sonic boom, and they appeared to stop on a dime. From what he was able to see, they had no wings, propellers, jet engines, and no exhaust. As a scientist, his curiosity was truly picked. How were they controlled? How were they navigated? How could the beings in them survive such incredible G-forces? He quickly guesstimated the forces to be 10 to 50 times beyond the tolerance of anything humans had ever built. He wondered how the vehicle itself could survive the crushing forces generated by that kind of acceleration. He had heard the many reports of UFOs, but now that he was seeing an entire squadron for himself, he had no answers. Then one of the orbs moved closer to him. He felt the blue light of the craft envelop him. It was a cold, unfeeling light. Then the odor of sulfur filled his nostrils. How odd, he thought. These craft felt more metaphysical than physical. He had never felt anything like it in all his years of science. 
It reminded him of his early days in seminary when he actually felt a connection to the God of the church. He remembered the pleasant feeling of a higher being reaching out to make a loving and compassionate connection with him. Yet this was altogether different. He felt a banal and primal power wanting to attach itself to him. His intentions were masked and hidden. He felt no love or compassion whatsoever, but he liked the feeling. It felt like business, progress, power. Before he could finish processing these thoughts, he found himself in a white room. In front of him were several luminous humanoid beings standing at least 10 feet tall. They were dressed in long, flowing gowns. He felt the same steely, cold, and dark primal power emanating from them. He loved the sensation. This is the solution he knew would make the world a better place. But unlike the church taught, it would never evolve by weakness and love. Rather, it required the raw power he felt coming from these beings. The towering beings didn't speak with their mouths, but he sensed they were communicating with him. He found himself in the midst of a type of hologram. Looking up, he saw in the sky millions of tic-tac-shaped light beings descending at great speed toward the earth. His mind cleared and he felt their story. They came to earth at great sacrifice to themselves to protect humanity from the other advanced beings. Even without words, he knew their mission was to protect us from humanity's enemies. He searched his mind for who those enemies could be. His mind raced through his years of studies. Somewhere inside, he felt sure that he knew the enemies they referenced. Then the answer came to him. Their enemies were the same as his. The names might be different, but the enemies were the same. They hated them, and so did he. We are the true masters of Earth. We have been called Anunnaki, watchers, ancient aliens, gods, and more. We have stood watch over the sons of your people for many ages. We are coming in great numbers, not with any intention of harm, but to rescue Earth from pollution and nuclear explosions. He heard the voice in his head and looked over to the being communicating with him. Malcolm responded in his mind to the beings, Who are you guarding against? You know, you once served him until you saw the light. Sierra furrowed his brow. The church had judged these beings who were looking out for humanity's interest to be demons and evil those beings who served the church's God, who were clearly hostile to humanity, the church called angels. Yet had the church made the world a better place, any love he once felt for her God was gone and replaced with only contempt. In his estimation, many of the wars, conflicts, poverty, and superstitions against medicine and science were caused by the church. The humanoid being continued explaining, our battle against humanity's oppressors is not over. We believe they will soon attempt to wage an existential war against this planet. It will bring great chaos and turmoil with nations rising against each other and increasing earthquakes. It will seem as though everything is falling apart and cannot be put back together. Earth is shaking itself free and a certain realignment or adjustment period is to be expected. We have raised up a man to bring humanity together with one mind and one purpose. He, with our help, will defeat Earth's oppressors. We will do all we can to fight, but we are limited in our current form. Our breeding program with your species has not been enough. So long as the dimensional membrane remains, we cannot give you our full aid. We exist as ghosts in your realm. This is why we have called you here. Malcolm felt a swell of pride as these beneficent beings would choose him to help them. His thoughts returned to his former affiliation. The son of Mary never did anything to help humanity. He taught some moral lessons for a few years and then died a shameful death. He and his so-called father worked to enslave humanity. These beings were the very ones he had been seeking. It was for them that he wanted to open the portal. They could help mankind be free from the shackles of her oppressors. Malcolm assented, what must I do? Open the portals at all costs. Once it is open, we will fight against the oppressors with full force. The being transmitted with a tone of urgency. A persistent knock on the door roused Seer. He found himself outside on his porch. The craft were gone. As he walked to the door, he wondered if it had just been a dream. He opened the door, and there before him was a man who appeared to be in his early forties. He was tall and well-built. He had dark hair and a square chin, and began quickly. Dr. Seer? Yes? I would like to fund your research. Oh, Malcolm responded, but thought it odd that no words were coming to him. There before him stood Alexander Therion. He couldn't believe it. These beings acted faster than the church's God. Alexander noticed the shock on his face and chuckled. Dr. Seer, may I come in? 
Why, yes, Malcolm said, finally snapping out of his stupor. Yes, yes, please come in, he motioned. They both went to the living room and took a seat. Oh, would you like some tea? Malcolm started to get up to show his hospitality. Never mind, Alexander said hurriedly. They have spoken to you. It means we are entering the final phase. Final phase? Malcolm questioned. Enlil has sworn to protect Earth from her enemies at all costs, Alexander said boldly. Oh, yes, her enemies, Malcolm repeated as he was putting the pieces together, but was still shocked at how quickly the pieces were coming together. Alexander again pointedly continued, You will never obtain stasis to open the portal here in Switzerland. It isn't just technology you need, but location. We must build them a gate in their ancient locations. I've already purchased the sites. Alexander stood up and walked toward the door. Malcolm remained seated, not sure what he was supposed to do. Alexander summoned, Come, doctor, we have much work to do. What about my flat? I've already taken care of that detail. Three of Alexander's people showed up outside the door. Malcolm and Alexander made their way to the roof where Alexander's stealth helicopter was waiting. They climbed aboard and flew away. Chapter 14, Old Secrets, New Babel Library Chaim's eyes scanned the shelves containing the ancient manuscripts. He smacked his lips and tried to take it all in. He was obviously overly excited. One large binder was entitled Sumer Codex Three. He pulled a special pack of wipes from his pocket and cleaned his hands thoroughly so he would not leave an oily residue on it. He reached for the codex and gently pulled it from the shelf. He looked around and went to a large desk in the center of the room where he laid the manuscript down and opened it carefully. Inside were fragments of ancient Sumerian writings. Chaim put a monocular magnifying glass to his eye. He leaned in and closely scanned the document. Excuse me, sir, you can't be in here. Chaim looked up with the monocular still pinched in his eye socket. It took him a second to realize why his vision was blurry. He removed it and after blinking his eyes a few times, managed to focus on the young man standing in front of him. What did you say? asked Chaim. You can't be in here, answered Caleb. Chaim had a mischievous glint in his eye. And yet, here I am. Caleb didn't appreciate wise guys. This area is off limits due to the fragile nature of the documents. The door is usually locked. How did you get in here? Chaim smiled. The key. Caleb was confused. Key? Chaim pointed to the words above the door. The key to the future lies in our past. Caleb grew annoyed. How dare this guy? You need to leave now. Dr. Malcolm Sear appeared from behind one of the shelves, carrying another heavy binder. It's okay, Captain Baruch. He's here by my invitation. Chaim, thank you for coming. So many years. He put on his best face. He didn't miss the old friend. That friendship ended a long time ago, and frankly, he was glad to be rid of Chaim. In his younger days, they both shared an appreciation. Well, to be fair, they shared a love for ancient religious texts. But then Seer had seen the light and never looked back. Sadly, Chaim couldn't or wouldn't let the truth enlighten him. He clung to those old-fashioned, worn-out ideas. Where did he get those from? Did he have power? Did he have money? Was Chaim really going to change the world? Would he leave any kind of mark on the world? Malcolm Seer walked up to Chaim, who rose to greet him. Malcolm Seer, you look old, Chaim chuckled. Seer, the younger of the two, just shook his head. The sooner he could be done, the better. He would not have called Chaim, but he was, indeed, the best there was. Listen, did you cause the earthquake after our conversation? Chaim quizzed. Seer glared at him. I don't know what you're talking about. Seer turned his head toward Caleb. I'll take it from here, Captain Baruch, he said dismissively. Chaim suddenly realized something. Baruch, Captain Baruch, Captain Caleb Baruch. Caleb nodded. That's right. One of Israel's greatest heroes. I am Chaim ben Emmet. I knew your parents well years ago. Your mother and I grew up in the same kibbutz. It immediately picked Caleb's attention. Seer could see Caleb was about to ask a question, but cut him off. If there's nothing else, Captain Baruch. Caleb nodded. Pleased to meet you, Professor. I'll see you in the future, Caleb Baruch. Chaim said with a smile while pointed to the sign above the door. Caleb smirked and exited the library. Caleb descended the stairs from the library. He needed to find Therian and relay what he had discovered. Talos, where is Therion? He turned the corner and saw Therion and a woman walking ahead of him. Never mind, he commanded. The woman was that he could only see her from the back, but it looked like her, blonde hair and a ponytail, roughly her height, with a stunning figure. Caleb felt a rush of emotion. How he missed her. He was certain she was the one he had seen in the auditorium. His mind raced. Should he call her name? 
How would she react to seeing him? His mind flashed ten years earlier. Caleb, I am wearing your ring because I want to marry you. You know I'll never get another opportunity like this. This fellowship with MIT will literally change everything for me, and my research can make a real difference to so many people. You've had many great offers from the defense industry in the U.S. We can build a real life there. You don't need to join the special forces. Gavi, you know this is my life. It is what I'm good at. He sensed she wasn't buying that. No, Caleb, it's far more than that. You're trying to prove something. She didn't want to hurt him with her words, but now, before they got married, was the time to say it, not later. You are still that little boy trying to prove that you were worth Israel's love. You have served your country well now for 12 years, far longer than most. We have a real chance here to build something great. So you're saying you're not going anyway, he asked. Her expression gave him the answer. Caleb knew there was nothing further to say. He turned toward the door. How could she do this to him? Why should he have to choose between her and his country? She purported to love him, but if she loved him, then she would understand. She walked over to him and put her hand on his shoulder. She had tears in her eyes when she said, I love you, Caleb. You don't have to prove yourself any longer. Commit yourself to me instead of to your sense of duty. Caleb's heart was aching from the decision he was being forced to make. She had no idea how much Israel needed him and how much he needed Israel. He stiffened his neck and clenched his jaw. He extended his hand to the doorknob and turned it. Gavi started weeping even more than before. No, Caleb, don't go. I don't want you to go. I just want you to be with me. It would be better. I know it will. Don't go. Caleb pulled the door open and walked out. Caleb? Caleb? Caleb snapped out of his memory and saw Gavi staring at him. He was at a loss for words and tried to act surprised. What, what, are, what are you doing here? His voice betrayed his pleasure in seeing her. Oh, never mind. Of course, it makes sense you're here. He glanced over at Therian while saying, The best in the world, right? He paused, unsure of what to say after their last interaction. She could tell he was a little nervous to see her. Hello, Caleb. Her eyes narrowed and her demeanor changed. He was just as handsome as when he left. She had always admired his toned body, muscular legs, and rugged face. She had liked combing her fingers through his thick, dark hair and had loved staring into his brown eyes. The problem was that he was broken. The problem was that he had broken her heart when he left. Therian noticed the mood. You two know each other then. We've met, Gabrielle said, quickly summing up their past. Well, Caleb, I was just on my way to show Gabriella our labs. Of course. Can I talk to you for a moment? Caleb and Therian stepped to the side. Gabriella was content to look at the ancient Mesopotamian art hanging on the walls. Caleb gave a quick glance back at Gavi, but she was turned away from him. I've picked up some communication about another attempt on you, perhaps even Babel City. Credible? Seems legit. It matches the activity shortly before the attack in Tel Aviv. Garabian's definitely planning something. You don't know when or where yet. No, they're careful. But there were some slips, which is how I managed to get this. I'll keep monitoring and we can increase security around you and around the city. I think you should postpone the Mount Hermon summit or move it to a more secure location. What? Theron cocked his head to one side and narrowed his eyes. He appeared shocked. Absolutely not. It has to be Herman, and I'm not postponing. The world cannot afford to wait any longer. You are the best there is, and you have the best team on the planet. I'm not going to live in fear of some potential attack around every corner. Caleb respected it, but didn't agree. I found something else. There's another group. They go by Remnant. I can't find any connection to Garabian at this point. I couldn't trace the source yet. It seems random from all over the world, yet the messages have similar patterns. Caleb read off his tablet. Enemy, not human, stronghold, mighty weapons, destroy stronghold, resist, will flee. Therian's brow went up and his face showed sudden signs of interest. Remnant? Find out everything about them, leaders, goals, vision. They might be against the Anunnaki who are here to help. Theron had been quick to dismiss Caleb's concern about Gurabian, a known threat, yet he was unexpectedly interested in Remnant, an unknown threat. Caleb wasn't sure what to make of it. I'll look into it. Perhaps Stronghold is a reference to New Babel. I'm not sure what weapons they're referring to. They might just be harmless fanatics or kids. Not sure yet. There's no record of any group by the name actually doing anything. Don't underestimate anyone. Just find them. Caleb had interrogated many enemies in his days. He could sense something in Therian's demeanor, but couldn't put his finger on it. Well, can you read it? 
Chaim was focusing on a section of the document. His lips moved in silence. Seer peered over his shoulder. He was watching intently when he said, I haven't been able to crack it, and neither has anyone else. Not even the experts at the Vatican. Chaim didn't even hear. He was too focused on the document. Where did you find this parchment? I haven't seen it cataloged in any repository. Seer looked at Chaim suspiciously. That's not important, is it? Well, it would help to decode the document if I understood the context. Seer was silent for a few but long seconds. The silence was palpable. Finally, he pulled the document away from Chaim and closed the folder. It was worth a shot. Thank you for traveling all the way here, Professor. I hope I didn't waste your time. You'll be well compensated, of course. Chaim was surprised by the sudden reversal. Professor, what's going on? Malcolm, do you want my assistance or not? What is it you're hoping to find in that parchment? Seer didn't answer. Chaim looked back at the displays in the main hall and said, Did you ever think the ancient knowledge was hidden from us for a reason? Oh, I know the reason. So that he with all knowledge may enslave those with none. To know is to be free. I will not be a slave. Good day, Professor. Chaim stood up slowly. Goodbye, old friend. Chaim said as he began walking out and then stopped in his tracks. Ah, I almost forgot. He said as he returned to the desk and picked up his monocular. I'd be lost without it, Chaim added with a smile and put it in his top pocket. As the door to the library closed behind him, a clear locking sound could be heard. Chaim looked back through the glass and the door at Seer staring at the parchment in his hand with a deep frown on his face, and Chaim was sad for his old friend. Old City of Jerusalem, a week later. Asher, come in, Chaim said without getting up from the midst of his many books on the ancient Near East. Hebrew, Sumerian, Akkadian, and more. One second, I'm trying to solve this translation. He had been working on deciphering what he had seen in the Babel Library for over a week. Asher came in and stood in the doorway of Chaim's apartment. Chaim finished and helped his young and awkward friend get settled at the table. You know, when your father asked me to tutor you for your ancient history elective, I was reluctant. I retired from teaching. Chaim made them both a tea with milk and honey. He put an extra honey just like Asher preferred. But I made an exception since your mother was a childhood friend of mine. Chaim winked, but Asher didn't smile. I've been fortunate to invest my time in something I care about. But the more one learns, the more one realizes how little he actually knows. Well, I never dreamt that you would also become my teacher, young Asher. The way you've seen patterns and codes in the ancient texts opened a whole new world of understanding for me. Now look at my study. Ha <laughs> ha. I look like a madman. Chaim belly laughed as he motioned to the strings that were crisscrossing maps and documents on the walls of his study. Asher didn't understand the joke. Anyway, I need you to look at something new I found, Chaim said as he pulled out a picture of the ancient clay tablet seer had shown him at the Babel library and set it on the table. He chuckled and took his monocular out of his pocket. My little secret. Not a magnifier, but a camera. An old Mossad friend, long before your time, gave this to me. Anyway, it has Sumerian numbers 1 to 36 on it. 666, Asher stated, having done the math in his head. Huh? Chaim did not follow what Asher was getting at. Arithmetic progression. Oh, Chaim was never really great at math. It had been a long time since he had reviewed such things. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. Chaim cut him off, saying... Oh, if you add each number from 1 to 36, they equal 666. Is that significant to you, Professor? Chaim didn't know what to say. It was interesting and a detail he'd never considered. Was it significant? Well, it, it might be. It, it might be. Chaim started formulating what it could mean. He walked over to a bookshelf, pulled off one of the many books, and, and quickly flipped open to a page. He read the words, Let him who has understanding calculate the number. He glanced back at Asher. My boy, you have understanding, I dare say. You're really smart. What is the amulet for? Ah, well, this was found in the tomb of Gilgamesh. In fact, he was holding it when they found him. Though some people think it is just a simple amulet, I believe it holds far more significance. Based on my research, it is the Tablet of Destinies, said Chaim, who had again lost himself in his web of potential conclusions. Based on what he had just learned, he forgot that Asher was even there. What did the Tablet of Destinies do? Oh, yes, I suppose I ought to share that. Chaim realized he was being the absent-minded professor. In ancient Sumer, Enlil's authority was embodied in the Tablet of Destinies. The holder possessed the power to decree fates. 
It was one of the cosmic bonds that chained together the various parts of the Mesopotamian cosmos. It was a bond of supreme power. Holding the cosmic bond was a privilege that conferred absolute control over the universe onto its keeper. For some reason, Enlil conferred the Tablet of Destinies on Ninurta. In fact, Chaim was connecting the dots as he shared with Asher. Ninurta was authorized to act with Enlil's authority and to ratify decrees. Chaim walked back to the first book he had picked up. The dragon gave Ninurta his power, throne, and great authority. All Chaim's blood left his face, and he became pale. He wobbled, causing Asher to try to steady him. Are you okay, Professor? Okay, I will be fine. It, it is the world I'm concerned about. I can't believe I didn't see this sooner. Of course. The dragon gives him his authority, and with that he demands the entire world submitted to the dragon's authority. Could you repeat that, Professor? Asher didn't follow all of Chaim's mutterings. Wait. Chaim thought of one more piece of the puzzle that he'd been working on all these years. I wonder. His voice trailed off. All those years ago, he muttered to himself. He went to another bookshelf and pulled off Sumerian grammar. Reduplication, intensification of the adjectival idea. He moved his finger down the page and barely whispered to himself. When the logogram bad bad reduplicated is written goog and means hostility, war. He then went and picked up the first book. When Gog comes against the land of Israel, he went and sat down. I didn't reveal that to her. Reveal what to who? Asher quizzed. If they figure it out, it's the end of the world. We must tell Remnant. Chapter 15, Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon, Israel. From where Caleb was standing, there was a clear vantage point in all directions of Mount Hermon. The crisp fall air and cloudless sky provided good visibility. He scanned the surrounding hills and snow-capped peaks. The weather forecast for the day was good, allowing for easy helicopter flights for the dignitaries. Although at over 9,000 feet in altitude, things could change quickly. Caleb and his security team, all dressed in padded jackets and overcoats, patrolled the perimeter of the airfield adjacent to Mount Hermon. Autonomous drones equipped with thermal sensors circled the perimeter of the mountain. Any detection of movement or thermal signatures was directly relayed to the mobile command center manned by members of Babel's security team, each hand-picked and vetted by Caleb himself. He looked through the binoculars and then through the security cameras. There was nothing. No one was here that shouldn't be here. Why did Therian insist upon having the meeting here? Reggie asked. He was also a veteran, though not as senior or experienced as Caleb. Seems like this would have been an easy target for Gurabian if he wanted it badly enough. There are so many other locations that are a hundred times more secure. Reggie was right. Caleb had studied each of the many military battles that he had seen fought on Hermon over the years. It was vulnerable because of its strategic value to Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and even Jordan. During the Yom Kippur War, Israel had suffered devastating losses when Syria had temporarily captured the mountain from Israel. Every strategic success and failure had been analyzed down to the minutest details and stored to memory. This location made no sense at all, but he didn't say a word. He understood war the way a chess grandmaster understood the game of chess. That knowledge had led him and his unit to many successful military missions, often against overwhelming odds. He had never lost a man, had never failed to achieve an objective until Damascus, and it haunted him still. The man responsible for Damascus was General Gurabim. He, too, was a son of war, and every day his power was growing. While the world talked peace, peace, Gurabim was planning its destruction in order for him to reshape it into his vision of what it should be. What better way to do it than attack a gathering of all the major world leaders in one place? It doesn't make sense to me why Therian would invite everyone here. We are high up, but that doesn't make it easy to defend if Gurabin were to send in a small group. We're good, but we might not be that good with all the hills and peaks, Reggie shrugged. Well, let's just hope Gurabin doesn't figure it out and doesn't like the cold, Caleb winked. There is something about this location that has some symbolic value to Therion. He wouldn't compromise no matter how much I pleaded for a different locale. The newly built Kasar Antar International Heritage Center was named after the ancient pagan temple that was the highest temple structure in the ancient world. The ruins were encapsulated and preserved inside the new building. Therian funded its construction under the guidance and direction of the famed spiritualist and socialite, Dr. Isabel Markov. 
Though Therian had never publicly shown any clear affiliation or devotion to any particular religion, it was unclear whether he was a spiritual person, but he had funded restorations around the globe of religious shrines and temples of various religions. Indeed, he had amazingly brokered a deal for the tabernacle to be erected on the Temple Mount, in the very place where many rabbis and academics believed it to have stood. The beauty was that it didn't affect any of the Muslim holy buildings. Getting Jews and Muslims to agree on anything, let alone the Temple Mount, was nothing short of a miracle. You know, Caleb looked at Reggie, I am thinking Therian might have good reason to have it here. This place holds no great significance for any religion, really. It is theologically neutral. Caleb had noticed that the size of the auditorium, the great hall in the center, indicated that the building was to be a venue for conferences or meetings to host a fairly large audience, something he had found odd for a facility so far out of the way. Clearly it had little to do with tourism. Isabel Markov apparently also spent a lot of her time here. Here they come, Reggie noted the first of the world leaders to arrive. Then one after the other they came, some in helicopters, others in bulletproofed SUVs and limousines, each with his or her own contingency of personal protective agents. They were allowed for each. Added together, that amounted to a small army of armed agents on the mountaintop. Altogether, 72 world leaders arrived, including Prime Minister Eitan Baruch. After the failure of the UN General Assemblies and Security Councils to prevent the so-called altercation between the US, Russia, and China, a new alliance of nations had been formed. The 72 leaders were from all the major nation-states and represented the interests not only of their own nations, but of their regions. Caleb did a last-minute check of the building. He didn't like the idea that none of his men could be stationed inside, but that was the agreement that was made with all the government's security agencies. He was able to monitor the proceedings from the command unit's monitor and on his own monitor. Cameras were checked. The tech guy gave the thumbs up. Caleb stepped outside while lifting his radio to his mouth. All clear? We're good to go. Caleb looked suspiciously at the men in suits and long coats who were spread out between his men and around the perimeter of the building. They all had on shades because of the bright reflection coming off the snow, so it was difficult for him to read their expressions. And while he had a list of IDs, the shades and upturned coat collars of some did make clear identification more difficult. Caleb looked at one of his men, who subtly acknowledged his concern and tapped a finger on the trigger of his automatic rifle, indicating that he'd be ready if need be. Caleb also put his sunglasses on as he walked toward the helipad. The heli-drone came into view and landed on side of the landing pads, preparing for the meeting. Caleb waited for the blades to slow down and walked to meet Alexander Therian. Therian seemed quite pleased as he surveyed the other vehicles and helicopters. Everyone in? They're waiting for you, answered Caleb. No weapons inside. So you and the men can stay outside along with their security details. If there's any issue, you'll be alerted right away. I don't like it, but I have done a thorough check of the building. It's clean. I have sensors and cameras placed inside and hidden around the mountain on any possible access route. Drones are monitoring from the sky. Because of the Israeli Prime Minister's attendance here, Israel is also closely monitoring air traffic. If Gurabin attempts an aerial assault, Israeli Air Force will intervene. Therian smiled. I knew we were in good hands with you. After today, General Gurabian's position will be significantly weakened. Peace will prevail. Caleb smirked. How many times have I heard that one before? I'll accompany you inside. If there's no problem, I'll step outside again and shut the doors until you're done. No one in, no one out. Therian looked around at the snowy mountaintops and took a deep breath as if bolstering his resolve. They walked down toward the temple. The men in suits watched them closely as they walked past. Caleb in turn looked at them. Where's Seer? asked Therian. Caleb replied, inside with their device, some kind of hollow projector? He wouldn't discuss it with me, and neither would his guy Antonio. Theron and Caleb entered the building and made their way toward the main hall. Along the walls were various artifacts and illustrations of an ancient deity that was once worshipped there. They walked past lecture rooms, exhibits, an archaeology lab, and what looked like a prayer room of some sort that was lavishly decorated. Inside, priestesses were chanting and burning incense to a statue of a god. Caleb felt nauseous from the smell of the incense. The whole business was very strange. What kind of summit was this? The auditorium itself was round, and the circular seating descended down to a platform positioned right in the center of the room. There weren't many seats, 72 to be exact, comfortably spaced. The auditorium was big enough for 10 times that number of seats, but only 72 seats were installed. It is more like a council than an audience, Caleb thought. A walkway led from the stage to a tunnel and the rest of the facility. 
The roof above the auditorium was a large glass dome. The opacity of the glass could be controlled and darkened to preference. Around the perimeter of the room was a series of polished black stone columns. Atop each column, an artifact had been mounted and enshrined in light. It was impressive for sure. Something had changed inside the building since Caleb's inspection, but he couldn't put his finger on it. His heart raced and his hair stood on end. The atmosphere felt heavy and the air itself seemed dense. Come on, Baruch, get your head in the game. The columns were arranged in a circular fashion, resembling something like Stonehenge. Right in the center of the columns, directly aligned with the platform in the center of the auditorium, was a larger column with an artifact inscribed with ancient writing. As Caleb and Theron came nearer, Dr. Malcolm stepped out from behind this center column. His excitement was evident. His mouth was moving as he read the words on the inscription, According to the command of the great bull god Batios, those swearing an oath in this place go forth. I still can't believe it's here. I don't know how Isabel did it. It's remarkable. See your pause for a few seconds at the inscription. It was the actual stele discovered by Charles Warren in the 1800s on that very spot and which had been on display in the British Museum. Seer leaned over to take a closer look. Remarkable. He was giddy with excitement. So many years had led up to this moment. He reveled in how far they had come. They had cracked the code to open the wormhole and create a quantum tunnel. They would finally open the portal, once opened by the ancients, and invite the gods to come through. Gods was such a problematic term. They were advanced and powerful beings, yes, and mankind had the opportunity to become like them with enough science. Yes, humans would one day evolve to be like them. Nothing would be impossible, just like Theron had said. Actually, the more Seer contemplated the word God, the more it resonated. It was growing on him. That was the right word. The Catholic Church had promoted God and Jesus, but they were weak. Their compassion and love were hindrances to progress. He would gain the power and show the world what a true God looked like. People would bow to him, and, and he would give them what they needed. But love would be absent from that equation. A large focus wall in the front of the auditorium showed an exquisitely carved wooden frieze depicting what seemed to be winged beings descended from the sky. Below them was a group of women reaching toward the descending beings. Seer stared at it some more. Soon he would be the ascended one. Women would throw themselves at him. He wasn't stupid. He knew Isabel was just using him to get her own desires. She was ravishingly beautiful, and though she never confessed... He knew she was much older than her body looked, just like Therian, who in reality was aging away. What he craved more than anything was knowledge, the hidden knowledge of the universe, knowledge that would unlock untold power. But he was running out of time. Once he was a god, that would all change. He would have whatever he desired, and no one would stop him. On the platform, a group of musicians were arranged in a semicircle. The strange music and rhythmic beating of traditional drums added to the eerie atmosphere there was going to be some kind of ceremony or performance for the attendees. The dignitaries and world leaders were seated, filling most of the auditorium seats. Caleb looked at Eitan, who at the same time turned to look at him. By the frown on his face, Caleb could tell his father was just as uncomfortable with everything as he was. Unlike Caleb, Eitan was deeply religious, something for which his detractors had often criticized him. As an Orthodox Jew, he didn't partake in ceremonies of other religions, Perhaps a cultural performance didn't count as religion, but it sure felt religious. Therian turned to Caleb. It's about to start. Caleb nodded and turned to leave. Seer walked off in another direction. As the drums beat, a line of dark hooded figures, each holding a bowl in his or her hands, came walking onto the stage. They too formed a half circle, but tighter than the musicians. The figure in the center had a bright red cloak. She stepped into the center of the platform. She pushed her red hood off. It was Isabel Markov. Her beauty and alluring manner drew the attention of everyone there. When Isabel saw Therion, she acknowledged his presence with a nod. This was to be Therion's day. But her day was coming. It was just a matter of time until she would be the greatest goddess of all time. She would become even greater than Enlil himself. Though she had to be patient for now. She had to play the game, ride the backs of others to the top, and then take her place. Any false move now would be her undoing. But she knew the game and she was doing a wonderful job at it. They thought they were calling the shots when in fact she was. After all, who is really in control, the horse or rider? The horse is far stronger, but the rider is far wiser and controls the beast he rides. Didn't she also control the beast she was riding? Caleb exited the building and shut the doors behind him. He tapped a code on a panel and the doors locked. He looked around at all the men in their positions. The tension was palpable between him and the suits, 
each scoping the other side out, hands wrapped around their weapon grips, ready to use them in an instant. Many of them were former enemies, but for the day, compelled to work together to protect their leaders, Caleb spoke into his radio. Alpha team, status? A team of Caleb's men patrolled the wider perimeter. From their vantage point, they could see all around the mountaintop. All clear, came the reply. No one enters or leaves this location without clearance, understood? Copy that, Charlie Bravo. Everything seemed quiet. Caleb checked with each of his teams, tested the camera feeds on his tablet, and all was good to go. The routine took him about 20 minutes, and he would repeat that until the event wrapped up and everyone felt safe off the mountain. Isabel Markov raised her hands. The music and beat of the drums intensified. Ati me peta babka, she shouted three times. As she brought her hands down, a column of smoke shot up into the air. The hooded figures encircled her and rhythmically repeated the chant over and over as they shuffle-stepped to the beat of the drums. Out of the corner emerged a metal bull at least six feet high. Its eyes glowing red and mist came out from its nose. Eitan looked at it suspiciously. It looked exactly like the ancient god Baal or Molech. Ati me peta babka, ati me peta babka, ati me peta babka. Her magic was flawless. She knew Enlil would indeed open his gate for her. Eitan felt sick to his stomach. He could feel the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. The air smelled like sulfur, and there was an oppressive weight in the room as it suddenly turned cold. He looked around at the other world leaders and was surprised that they seemed to be totally enthralled by the performance. He had long wondered about the fascination that the otherwise atheist European nations had with occult rituals and ceremonies at inaugural events. Perhaps to them it was just an entertaining reminder of their primitive past histories. For him, as an Orthodox Jew, it just didn't sit right. He looked back at the door and wondered if it would draw attention were he to just slip out just for the duration of the ceremony. The music and sounds built to a crescendo. The bull had been doing different gyrations, demonstrating that it had been set free by the dancers. Just as Eitan gripped the front of his armrest to get up, the music suddenly stopped. The attendees clapped their hands. The hooded figures and musicians turned and exited the room. Eitan paused for a moment and the lights came back on. He relaxed into his seat. Isabel stepped forward, bowed down to the metal bowl, and said in ancient Sumerian, Ata Kurgal. Enlil was indeed the great mountain. He deserved her admiration. He had stood up to Elion from the beginning and had won. She then stood up and addressed the leaders. Welcome to the temple of Inanna on Mount Hermon. I am grateful and humbled that you accepted the invitations to meet here on this historic location. This will be a day that will be remembered for generations to come. Our Mother Earth is wounded, and she needs our help to heal. The energies are aligned in our favor as we unveil a plan for a prosperous and peaceful future for all humanity, and indeed for all life on this planet. This is the new dawn. She needs Baal to manifest. That is why we are here. Alexander took his place at the podium. Everyone in the room stood and cheered for him. Eitan Baruch ever so slowly brought his hands together, Haley wanted to keep up appearances. Therion bowed his head in thanks for the reception and acknowledgement. He raised his hand. Please, take your seats. The applause slowed down and the dignitaries took their seats. Therion looked at the temple walls. Thank you to my friend and advisor, Dr. Markov, for arranging this event. I must compliment you on this temple restoration. It's magnificent. Thank you, Isabel. Isabel smiled and nodded in appreciation. Therion continued. You are all here because your people have sent you here to find answers about the Anunnaki, what they are demanding of us, and how joining the Babel Initiative will bring peace. You've seen for yourselves how Babel and the tech the Anunnaki want to share will change the world. It is the future. If we lay aside national interest for global interests, we can make heaven here on earth. This location, this temple, in fact, this very spot where I'm standing, was where an incredibly significant event happened millennia ago that shaped our days. It set us on a course of discovery and innovation unlike anything we could imagine. Technologies were developed so advanced that modern academia could only dismiss it as myth and legend. We all know the stories, Atlantis, Lemuria, and many others that were lost to history. And of course, there are the ones we can still see like Machu Picchu, the pyramids of Egypt, the Aztec ruins, Mayan temples, and so many more all testaments to an era of greatness in our development as a species. Archaeologists and scientists today still marvel at the ingenuity of construction, the sophistication of their astronomy, and their grasp of advanced mathematics and math sciences, some of which we're still grappling with in our modern era. Are astounding. Therian pointed at the frieze. 
winged beings hovering in the air above the group of women reaching toward the alien visitors. The beings looked magnificent. The rest of the frieze was made of wood, but the beings were an ice blue color made of resin. A light shined through them, adding to their otherworldly energy. So what event, what happened here? asked Therian. On this mountain, the Anunnaki, the ancient aliens, descended and started helping us become gods. The Babel Initiative is not just about better crops and tech, but about changing us. We must come together for the good of humanity and lay aside our national interests. The time has come to lay down weapons and beat our swords into plowshares. Eitan was familiar with the Torah's account of events that transpired on the mountain. In his religion, it wasn't a very positive story. He stared at the frieze on the wall and could swear he saw movement in it. This meeting was not going in a good direction. Something felt terribly off. He sensed a presence. It was cold, dark, malevolent, and immensely powerful. It wasn't the power one felt when standing next to a nuclear weapon, or even when speaking as the leader of a nation. No, this felt raw, primal, spiritual. He raised his hand. Prime Minister Baruch, you have a question. Prosperity and peace are all Israel has ever wanted since our birth as a modern state. To quote one of my predecessors, if our enemies lay down their weapons, there will be peace. But if Israel lays down its weapons, it will cease to exist as a nation. Even here among us today, there are many who wish for our annihilation. How can you guarantee such a treaty? There is a growing threat in the Middle East being driven by a madman whose power grows daily. Do you think he will just lay down arms? Theron nodded. Indeed, Prime Minister Baruch, how can we guarantee the security of the signatory nations? The UN, despite its best efforts, could never achieve that. Wars and conflicts have almost destroyed humanity and has brought the great powers to their knees. How do we neutralize a threat like Nasi Gurabian and his forces? How do we prevent another Damascus? This is exactly the reason I requested your presence here today. The same Anunnaki who have gifted us with the knowledge and technology for Earth's new era are the same ones that recently disabled the most advanced military systems in the world. Your most secure systems, not to harm you, but to demonstrate their capabilities and to get your attention. If they meant us harm, we would obviously have no chance, as our weapons and technologies are primitive in comparison. With their help, the world will be disarmed. We will become a united people, and there will no longer be anywhere for someone like General Gurabin and his followers to hide. The Babel Initiative is the only option for a peaceful and prosperous future for all, and yes, your security is guaranteed. But don't just take my word for it. Therian stepped aside. He lifted his hand as a signal. Dr. Malcolm Sear and his assistant Antonio Mesmo stood behind the platform, computer tablets in hand. From his tablet, Antonio darkened the skylight and the interior lights in the room. On his tablet, Dr. Sear typed a command, and in the center of the platform, a large glass cylindrical chamber began to rise until it reached 20 feet in height. The chamber lit up. This was it. This was the first step to becoming a god. Why they had to do it all at this godforsaken destination seemed unwise, but Isabel had insisted, and Theron had agreed. Isabel and the musicians took their positions around the platform. The drummers began a rhythmic beat. Isabel had practiced repeatedly, carefully pronouncing each syllable as Chaim had taught her. Bad, Engura, Usmi, Kurgal, Anaku, Inana, Belet, Etsetim, Kiam, Parsusa, Salamu, Rabum, Peta, Babkama, Luruba, Anaku. The choir echoed, chanting the ancient Sumerian phrase. Chaim had taught her until he had become suspicious of her goals. He had long since cut off communication. Oh well. He had been just a useful tool. No one knew the ancient perfectly since it had never been heard spoken by a native speaker. But enough was known, using comparative linguistics and philology, to come awfully close to the real thing. She loved the meaning of the words, Enlil, house of the Lord, whose return is triumphant, who shows the way to his great mountain house. I, Inanna, mistress of the netherworld, am become black. Tremble, shake with fear, open the gate for me so that I can enter here. Chaim became shifty when she asked about the specifics of the translation. She sensed he knew more than he was telling her. But regardless, this would work, and soon she would rule the world, starting with Babel. The ground shook, then electrical currents lit up invisible waves of light that flashed and spun at high speed in the chamber. The brightness of the light increased to almost blinding intensity. Whoa! Caleb steadied himself against the shaking of the earth. 
He heard a loud noise coming through his comms, like electrical interference. He tried adjusting his radio frequency. He saw some of the others touching their ears and adjusting their comms units as well. Caleb pressed the call button. Romeo 1, did you feel that? What's going on with the comms? He heard only static. Romeo 1, come in. There was no signal. Inside the mobile unit, Reggie was trying to get the signal back. The monitors flickered on and off. Charlie Bravo, come in. He adjusted the dials and tapped the computer's keyboard, trying to get the signal back. Inside the auditorium, all the people shielded their eyes. Isabel looked back at the image on the wooden freeze and got excited. The world leaders looked around at each other, concerned and nervous. The light rays inside the chamber seemed to bend and take on a shape of sorts. And then in a moment, the shapes fully appeared. Some of the world leaders were so frightened, they jumped to their feet. It was a living being inside the chamber, about 15 feet tall, staring straight at them. It spoke, Greetings, leaders of humankind. Do not be afraid. We are friends. We are here to unite humanity once and for all. Join us. Therian and Isabel beamed with anticipation. The world leaders trembled with fear. Therian began to stare at the representative for each country. The first nodded to join. Therian trained his eyes on the next, who likewise nodded. Therian's gaze eventually came to Eitan Baruch. Eitan's heart raced and his palms grew clammy. Knots formed at the pit of his stomach. All eyes were upon him, including those of the gigantic visitor. Eitan hadn't prepared for this pressure. He wanted peace for Israel and the world, but what were the terms? He recalled Doron telling him that very day that whatever the terms he believed Israel should agree, and he trusted Therion. But something seemed off to Eitan. Who was the visitor? Should he agree? Was Hashem leading him in this direction? We can count on your support, right, Prime Minister? Isabel asked. Caleb ran toward the mobile unit. He noticed the sky rapidly turning from clear blue to dark gray, with clouds rolling in and swirling in odd patterns. Suddenly a powerful gust of wind blew across the mountaintop in the direction of the temple, knocking Caleb off his feet. One of the suits near the temple got slammed into the wall. Others kept their footing with significant effort. Caleb jumped up and ran to the mobile command vehicle. He opened the door, but a gust of wind smashed it open against the side of the vehicle. With heroic effort, he shut it behind himself. Just before he did, Caleb noticed some of the helicopters being pushed by the wind. One began tipping onto its side. Reggie was frantically trying to get the signal clear. The screens blinked on and off. The vehicle was swaying from the wind pressure. What's going on out there? Is it a tornado? I don't know. It just came out of nowhere. Caleb tried to make out what was going on in the meeting, but the signal was too faint. Wait, what is that on the platform next to Alexander? Then the signal was lost. Get it back. Try as he might, Reggie could not. It's gone, Cap. The system's down. He began to hear a rumbling sound. The van started shaking from side to side. Reggie grabbed onto his desk to keep his balance. Caleb opened the door of the van and saw everyone being shaken. At that moment, a powerful lightning bolt struck the top of the building. The skylight dome of the building was instantly clear again. The electrical surge had shorted the electronics of the building. Inside the auditorium, everyone was looking up at the skylight. Therian and Malcolm Sear glanced at each other. Sear shrugged his shoulders and shook his head. He was sure his technology was not causing that. It had to be a strange anomaly. Therian looked up at the skylight that had grown ominously dark. Lightning flashed, and for a split second, it seemed like there were two figures on the roof looking down at them through the skylight. The being in the chamber was also looking up. Isabel was confused. The earth began quaking again, causing some of the decor to fall. The frieze on the wall split and broke apart. In the prayer room, the priestesses ducked for cover. The statue of the goddess Inanna, to which they were attending, came crashing down onto the floor, decapitating its head and severing the legs. The soldiers and private security teams all tried to keep their footing while the earth quaked. The shaking increased in intensity and severity. Large cracks appeared in the walls of the temple. The mobile command unit shook fiercely. Monitors fell out of their brackets. Caleb and Reggie hung on to anything they could get their hands on. Reggie's head bashed against a mounting bracket, and it began bleeding. Caleb tried to reach him. Reggie, are you okay? Reggie nodded while stopping the blood flow with his hand. Come on, get out of the MC. It's safer outside. Right then, the shaking stopped. One of the monitors cleared up and showed a clean picture. Wait, what is that? Caleb saw some kind of light vortex in the front of the main hall. In the middle of the vortex were what looked like two men and something else. But the brightness of the light made it difficult for the cameras to distinguish. Caleb switched to another angle and saw that his father and some of the other dignitaries were on the ground, shielding their heads. Caleb yelled, This is an attack! He turned and leaped out of the MCV, running toward the main entrance of the temple. Chekhov, the lead Russian agent, yelled at Caleb, Open the door! Caleb nodded and punched in the code, but it wasn't working. The pin pad was dead. 
He tried again. Chekhov was impatient. Open it now. The pad's not working, replied Caleb, not phased by the Russian's manner. Then we break it down, said the Russian. Caleb agreed. This was the attack they had expected from Gurabian. They needed to get inside. The door was built with reinforced steel, which to Caleb had seemed strange for a building supposedly built as a museum. Caleb motioned to Staff Sergeant Davidi. Davidi, C4, now! The wind picked up again, and the sky turned electric with sheet lightning, which lit up the sky in bright flashes of light. Bolts of lightning hit the mountaintop around the temple repeatedly. Davidi raced over to Caleb with the explosives. What the hell is going on here? This isn't like any storm I've ever seen. I don't know, some kind of weather or energy weapons. We have hostiles inside. Blast the door now. Davidi was shocked by the statement. How? One powerful bolt struck a helicopter, and the charge jumped to two or three other helicopters, causing them to explode and burst into flames. The wind blew the oily smoke toward the temple, enveloping all the soldiers in a thick smog, making it hard for any of them to see. Caleb covered his mouth with his cuff. The ground began to shake again and almost knocked him off his feet. The eyes of everyone inside were focused on the two men who had appeared from the light vortex. Though they looked to be older, with gray hair and beards, their bodies seemed strong and agile. The being in the chamber had disappeared. Isabel stepped toward them and said, Are you loyal to Enlil and the goddess? The taller of the two looked at her, and the way she was dressed, he didn't appear to be impressed. Isabel pointed to the cracked frieze on the wall and demanded, Are you Anunnaki? The two looked at each other, disgusted by the suggestion. One of them pushed past Isabel and walked straight up to Eitan, who was still on the floor. This one spoke to Eitan. Zot brit mavit ben Israel. Ein lecha chelek mize. Eitan was surprised by the words. What did this being mean by, This is a covenant of death, son of Israel. You have no share in this. How did he know Hebrew? He looked at them and asked, Who are you? Are you Jewish? Therian was strong and athletic with proficiency in mixed martial arts. He charged at the first one, shouting, Get away from him! The other raised his hand and sent Therian flying through the air. He crashed down between some chairs, hitting his head in the process. Everyone was afraid. The being turned his attention to the world leaders. His intense gaze and piercing eyes were intimidating. He addressed them, Bachar et mi tisharet et elyon o et ha nufal. Etan again wondered what they meant. Choose whom you will serve, Elyon or the Fallen. Etan knew that by Elyon, they certainly meant Hashem. No one in Israel called Hashem God by that title anymore, but it still held true. Due to tradition, they simply called him Hashem, the name. But he was the Almighty Elyon as well. Then the first raised his staff and warned, Tseu mi bavel, o chu chelek be makoteha. Etan was again stunned by the words, Come out of Babel, lest you receive her plagues. One of the two slammed his staff on the ground, and the vortex of light appeared again. As quickly as they had appeared, they disappeared. Moments later, a section of the roof collapsed onto the platform, demolishing the glass chamber and platform beneath it. Outside, Caleb was coughing from inhaling smoke. He looked around, trying to find his men. Davidi! I'm here! Davidi said and walked up to Caleb. Blast the door! We need to get in there fast! Davidi pulled a few packs of C4 from his backpack and began applying it to the doorframe. As Caleb watched him through the smoke, he noticed two bearded men dressed in sackcloth coming from the temple and walking right past him. Unaffected by the wind and the smoke, Caleb pulled his pistol and ran toward them. Hey, stop or I'll shoot! They stopped and turned back. A thin veil of smoke passed between them and the strangers disappeared. What the? The storm quieted down and the earthquake stopped. The sky cleared up as if nothing had happened and soon it was a clear blue sky again. The wind calmed to a breeze, and the smoke began dissipating slowly. The only evidence of what had happened was the burning helicopters and the damage to the building. Caleb looked around to see if he could find the two strangers, but they were gone. Around him, the men were picking up their rifles and tools. Davidi pushed a button on his remote detonator, and the door hinges blew, bringing the door down in the process. Caleb stepped inside, followed by the others. Chapter 16 Find Remnant. Babel Tower. The elevator doors opened and Caleb stepped into Therian's office, which took up most of the second highest floor of Babel Tower and had an incredible 360 degree view. Therian's penthouse suite was on the floor above and above that the landing pad for the helidrone. It had been several weeks since Hermon. After the smoke cleared, everyone packed up quietly and went home. Caleb inquired, but no one was talking. This was the first time Therian had wanted to see Caleb. 
Therian's aide met Caleb and motioned to Therian, who was standing at the window into the Iraqi desert. What do you see, Caleb? Caleb gazed at the incredible view for several moments. Where there had once been just sand, now there stood vertical farms, water harvesting technology, homes, roads, buildings. I see progress and hope. Progress and hope, yes, exactly. After millennia of religious bigots trying to push us down and stop our evolution, we are finally making progress, and it is bringing the world hope. And do you know why we are making progress? Caleb hesitated. Therian handed a book to him and said, Read that. Caleb opened it to where the bookmark was. A sentence was highlighted on the page. If they can accomplish this when they have just begun to take advantage of their common language and political unity, just think of what they will do later. Nothing will be impossible for them. Caleb closed the book, surprised, and said, I didn't think you believed in the Bible. Believe? Theron quizzed. Believe is such a broad word. I happen to disagree with the author on many points, but notice that even the God of Abraham acknowledged that with one tongue and unity there is nothing we can't do. Nothing is impossible. But notice what happened in the next verse. Caleb wasn't sure what to make of this, but he opened it back up and read, Come, let us go down and give them different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. And that way the Lord scattered them all over the earth, and that ended the building of the city. Theron explained, There are many forces that would like to destroy what we are building. I need to know that I can count on you to help me protect this progress. I just want to bring peace and prosperity to the world. I regard the Anunnaki choosing me as leader to be a great responsibility. Sadly, there are many religious zealots who would love to see all of this crumble. Caleb thought about all the religious factions within Judaism, about Islam, and the Christian who had killed his parents. A truer statement could not be said. Many of them are true believers in the very book you were holding. I know they mean well. They think they are truly making the world a better place. The man who killed your parents thought he was making the world a better place. Caleb's face turned red. He was shocked. How did Therian know this? I know everything about you, Caleb, remember? I said that I like to know about those who work for me. Talos told me the details. I know that your parents were Russian Jews who were killed for merely being Jewish, killed by a Christian, no less. The so-called God that your parents believed in failed them. That is what makes us different. We do not put any faith in the so-called supreme being, Elyon, Hashem. It matters not the name one calls him or her or it. Why trust in a being who continually fails the worshippers? Amir Atta was also a misguided believer in his God, who failed him too. Caleb looked Alexander in the eyes. His palms began to sweat slightly. Theron even knew about Atta? How did he know that? No one knew that. He had covered his tracks and destroyed the evidence. Even when he had searched Talos, there was nothing. Don't worry, your secret is safe with me. I won't tell the Iranians, who would love to kill you, and I won't tell the Israelis, who would court-martial you for conducting national security without their authorization, and I won't tell Interpol, not that they could do much. Caleb continued staring out the window. He was uncomfortable with the direction things were going. Therian had something he could hold over him, and he didn't like being in that position. He felt very exposed. Therian approached Caleb and put his hand on his shoulder to comfort him. As for your biological parents, they were good people who were simply misguided by traditions, myths, and legends. It wasn't their fault. They were the product of their parents. Caleb did agree about religious fanatics who killed in the name of their god, and Therian had a point about his biological parents. It wasn't their fault. They were duped into believing what they did. But you, Therian nodded repeatedly, hmm, you've overcome the superstitions passed on to you, he said with a sympathetic voice. He wanted Caleb to know that he cared. He understood. Even your adoptive father, Eitan, and the whole family thought you were a black sheep for not believing in their God. Yet you stood strong on your conviction because you knew it to be, he searched for the right word to make the most impact, primitive. Normally, Caleb would not have appreciated Therion's empathy, but he knew so much about him and yet didn't judge him. In fact, Therion congratulated him for blazing his own path and truthfully, it felt good to be accepted. I might look young, but I am old enough to be your grandfather, Caleb. Caleb was confused at that statement. What do you mean by that? I want you to know that I trust you and am counting on you, Therian paused for a moment. He wanted this moment to sink in. So many years had led up to this moment. He looked at Caleb tenderly like a father would look at his child. In a sense, he had helped develop Caleb in foundational ways, 
ways to which Caleb was oblivious. Caleb had no idea who he really was or the role he would play. Therian turned toward his desk and continued, But listen, unhinged religious fanatics are why I called you here. He reached for his phone and called his phone screen onto a large display. I received more intelligence on Remnant. They've been sabotaging a lot of work done by non-governmental organizations and UN humanitarian missions. Their influence is growing, and they've managed to do that mostly off-grid. It seems they're becoming a real threat, and I need you to stop them. A symbol appeared on the screen. It was the letter R with a stylized upward arrow. Antonio Mesmo found this symbol in a thread discussing Remnant. It was accidentally leaked by one of their members. The comment was later removed, but Antonio discovered it in an old dark web archive. I need you to find these people quickly. And when I do, then what? Alert Talos, and we will do the rest. Therion started heading for the roof where his heli-drone was waiting. I must be going. The United Nations has called for an emergency meeting of the General Assembly. Tomorrow they will be voting on adopting the Babel Initiative as the new official United Nations Charter, and I want to be there when they do. I'll be having some important meetings today before the vote. And what are the two strange men we saw in Hermon? Therion gazed at Caleb for at least ten seconds and countered, Do you have a lead? Caleb didn't know what to say. Since he knew about Amir Atta, then he might be open to this possibility. Amir spoke of two coming to judge Israel and then mentioned the Mahdi and his companion. I thought it might be just religious fanaticism. Oh, it was fanaticism indeed. However, there are also powerful forces at play. The Anunnaki have come in peace to help us. However, there are other forces who want to destroy Yes, I think Atta gave you an important clue. Talos, Alexander, some of the AI. Yes, Alexander. Could there be a connection between the two beings Caleb saw in Hermon and the Mahdi and his companion? Yes, there certainly could be, Talos answered promptly. The messianic figure in Islam is the Mahdi, the guided one, who is thought to be accompanied by the Muslim version of Jesus. These two are said to bring Islamic peace and justice and restore Islam to its rightful place in the world. And Talos, what attitude would those two have toward Israel? It is said that they will destroy Israel and kill every last Jew. The rocks and trees give away their position so that true Muslims can kill them. Thank you, Talos. Whether they're working for Garabian, we do not know. But whoever they are, they do not seem to have peaceful intentions, Therian surmised. Talos, could there be a connection between the two strangers and Remnant? Yes, there could be. Both groups exhibit strong religious and cultic tendencies. Many within those two groups are against science, man's evolution, and peaceful coexistence. There it is settled. Remnant and the two strangers are religious fanatics who would love to see the destruction of Israel. I really must be going, but I trust you will do your utmost to root out this remnant group and find out how they are connected to the two strangers you witnessed. Caleb sat down in front of the transparent OLED display. Talos didn't require constant human input, so there was no need for staff to work after hours. Caleb was alone at the control central in the Babel Tower. He pulled up the closed-circuit TV footage from the Mount Hermon Temple Museum for clues on what happened. There were 12 view angles of the main conference room, each from a 360-degree camera, which allowed the video to be rotated in any direction. A second monitor showed satellite images of weather patterns over the Mount Hermon region with time codes synchronized to the Temple Museum cameras on the first screen. His conversation with Therion earlier raised more questions. Was Therion hiding something? He didn't deny the appearance of the two, but neither did he volunteer the information. Nevertheless, Talos had confirmed there was a highly probable connection between the two and the Mahdi. Somehow they might be related to Remnant. He didn't mind letting religious nuts live out their odd existence, but when their hatred of Israel turned into violence against his homeland, then he needed to intercede. Caleb reviewed the footage and saw Seir and Antonio place their device in the room. It was not clear what they were doing, but they were busy for quite some time setting it up. The footage wasn't all that clear, as there was significant breakup. The electrical surges had damaged some of the hard drives and for some cameras, It was only the camera's onboard memory that was usable. He fast-forwarded the footage to the events leading up to the so-called storm and earthquake. Isabel Markov had finished her performance, then Therian spoke. Because there were no microphones allowed, he couldn't use audio. He got to the part where the glass chamber rose from the platform. 
the light shining from it blew out the camera, so it was useless for seeing anything. On one of the angles, he saw the audience react to whatever they were seeing. He was intrigued. The footage started distorting and breaking up. Caleb leaned back in his seat, rocking for a few moments, trying to figure out what he saw. While pondering, he noticed a tiny green light next to his screen's camera. He looked around at the other screens that didn't have the green light, except for the screens pointing in his direction. He scrutinized the different cameras mounted on the walls and ceilings around the room, but their black domed covers made it impossible to say which way they were pointing. Caleb slowly reached for the keyboard and quit the app he was using. He ejected a small chip from the side of the screen and put it into a little case, which he slid into his pocket. He got up and walked to an elevator. A display panel lit up with a digit 66 displaying for a second and then went blank. Good evening, Caleb, spoke the voice of Talos in its eerie, calm tone. Working late tonight? Caleb sighed. Ground floor. You selected ground floor. The elevator descended speedily. The lights of the building blurred as they zoomed past the glass walls of the elevator. The display showed the rapid descent of the digits. After a few seconds, the descent slowed and came to a stop on the 18th floor. 18th floor. The doors opened to show Seer waiting. Going down? asked Seer rhetorically. Caleb nodded and Seer got in. Good evening, Dr. Seer. Working late again? Seer smiled. Yes, Talos, as usual. Caleb said nothing. For a few moments... <clears throat> For a few seconds, there was only silence in the elevator. Close call on Mount Hermon, wasn't it? Twenty dead, I'd say that was more than a close call for them. Seer processed Caleb's statement before responding dispassionately. Yes, that was unfortunate. I suppose we were lucky. Was it luck? asked Caleb. There was just something about Seer that bothered him, and he couldn't place his finger on it. Seer's eyes narrowed as he tried to interpret Caleb's insinuation. The elevator came to a stop. Ground floor, announced Talos. The doors slid open. Caleb gestured for Seer to walk ahead. Oh, this isn't my stop. Seer stayed put. Caleb stepped out. As the doors began to close, he heard Seer mumble something. You selected subfloor 100 and... With that, the door shut, and Caleb wasn't able to make out the floor number. Caleb wondered about it for a moment, and then made his way to the maglev. As Caleb stepped onto the maglev, a facial recognition system automatically scanned and registered his iris and facial profile. The computer ran a quick analytical scan of Caleb's data. Caleb's flight booking showed up with his destination, Tel Aviv. Flight 153 to Tel Aviv will depart as scheduled in 33 minutes. Please have your Babel Pass ready for inspection, instructed Talos. Caleb opened his phone and Pass appeared on the screen. Skies over Israel are currently clear with a weather watch warning for a storm front moving in from the northern regions. Caleb sighed heavily and stared out the window into the dark night. The brightly lit tube train cut through the dark desert landscape at high speed. Chapter 17. Messengers. Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Tio, mira el perezoso, Pablo's little nephew said for the fifth time. Many parks in Santa Cruz, Bolivia had sloths, and while they were cute creatures, Pablo just didn't have the time to indulge Carlito. He focused on responding to his boss's email. He needed to keep his job even more now to help his sister, since Carlito's father was no longer part of their lives. His sister would return from her appointment soon, and then she and Carlito could look at sloths all day long. The world had changed since Damascus and the UFOs and the Battle Initiative, but he still needed to keep his job for now. Tio! Pablo ignored him again. Tio! Carlito continued pestering, though his intonation was different. Pablo picked up on that fact, just like he knew when his cries were serious and when they were frivolous, which he figured was pretty good for just being an uncle. Still, he was almost done with the email. However, he sensed something more than just sloths and trees. He felt a presence that demanded his attention. It felt ancient, heavy, powerful. He noticed that the shady plaza got brighter so that even the backlight on his phone did not make up for the difference in lighting. When he finally lifted his head, there before him were two men standing in the middle of the plaza. They appeared to be human, but like none he had ever seen before on earth, they were clothed in humble fabric which reminded him a little of Los Jedi that he saw in his favorite sci-fi movie when he was a kid. Their faces radiated light. They were not as bright as the sun or even a car's headlights, but more like the glow of a bioluminescent fish he had seen when he and his sister took Carlito to the aquarium. They stood tall, at least two meters, certainly much taller than the average Bolivian. Pablo somehow knew they were powerful. 
They didn't seem to have ripped muscles like Carlito's father, which his sister appreciated in men, but more like he couldn't put his finger on it. It was a power not of flesh and blood, but something else. He could feel the power in his spirit. That was it. They reminded him of the pictures of angels he had seen when he had visited La Iglesia, but they felt more alive and energetic than anything he had seen in church. By now, a huge crowd had gathered. Those driving simply stopped and got out to look at them. There were probably 1,000 people packed into the plaza. Many had taken out their phones to record these two strange figures. One of the two, Elias, looked at those before him. Being back with mortals reminded him of his former life. The smells of the market, pollution, and the pungent odor of degeneration. Everything in this plane of existence was literally falling apart, unlike the pure fragrance of Elion's city. But mankind's depraved, twisted wickedness had only added to the stench. A warning of the coming judgment was the most merciful gesture he could make at that moment. He is coming to judge the earth. Stay out of Babel, lest you share in her errors, and lest you receive her plagues. Earth is polluted by those who dwell on it, who have broken its laws, who have disrupted its order and have violated the sacred and eternal way. He stopped speaking and looked at the faces of the Bolivians. Many here would receive this warning, but sadly, many on earth would not. He knew this message of mercy would be interpreted as oppression, hatred, and bigotry. But that was so far from the truth. Elion had only the deepest love for the sons of Adam. Yet at some point, he had to say, enough is enough. The man reflected on how he had called on people millennia ago to stop sitting on the fence. They needed to choose their allegiance. They could not serve Enlil and Elion at the same time. They were two diametrically opposed options. Enlil was full of darkness, hatred, and lies. Elion was pure light, love, and truth. Pablo at once knew the language they spoke was not Spanish, for it lacked the rhythm. Yet he found himself able to understand it. He knew exactly what they were talking about. Fear flooded his mind. He just knew in the core of his being from their few words that they were speaking truth. He thought of all the things he had done out of greed. His heart sank, thinking that this was the final judgment. He wasn't ready. Just then the other man who had been silent began speaking. Therefore a curse, like a cancer, will ravage the earth. Those who dwell on the earth will pay the price for departing from Elion. Come back while there is time. They finished speaking, started walking a few meters, and disappeared as if they had walked into a dimensional portal. Jindala, Africa Zahara's feet moved swiftly over the East Africa Republic's dirt paths. She looked at the moonless, starry night. It was beautiful. Just then she felt her stomach rumble. Oh yes, her stomach. She took a small piece of dry bread out of her coat pocket and put it in her mouth. It was the last bit she had, and it would be enough. She was only 18. Her young feet were hurting after walking three days, but it would all be worth it once she reached the compound. Things would be different. She neared the top of a hill and looked down, and in the distance, several miles away, she saw the flickering of lights. She was sure that was it. Suddenly, her feet felt light with a spring of each step. If everything they said about it was true, then she would finally be home. She picked up her pace slightly when she noticed a light pass quickly over her. Then another, and another passed over in quick succession. She finally looked up and saw illuminated objects coming at her. They flew over her head and stayed above her. The light from one orb then enveloped her. It was a steely, cold, and dark kind of light. She felt a primal power emanating from it. She didn't like it at all. She tried to run, but strangely, her feet would not move. In a moment, she found herself in a room on a cold table. Her body was paralyzed, and she could not move a muscle, not even her neck or head. She breathed quickly. Her eyes grew wide as a ten-foot being walked over to her and laid its hands one over the other on Zahara's body. Then another similar being came and stared in her eyes. She could feel the being's mind in her own. It was probing for something. Zahara hated what they were doing. Fear gripped her, and not able to move her lips, she simply cried out in her mind, Wa Milele, the Eternal One. Then Zahara found herself standing outside the compound. How had she gotten here so quickly? Had she just dreamed that strange encounter? She looked to her right and her left and saw nothing. She then turned around and stared down the path. In the darkness, she thought she saw two faintly glowing objects in the shape of men, her eyes ached after the being had stared into them, so she rubbed them to try to focus better. 
When she looked again, they were gone. Just then the gate opened and a woman greeted her. Zahara, we have been expecting you. She was in shock. How could they have been expecting her when they didn't know she was coming? She smiled. It all made sense. She knew she was home. Cairo, Egypt. Abdal stared at Camilla, his new bride, wondering why Allah had shown him so much favor. Her name meant perfect, and indeed, he thought she was. The late evening sun brought out her beautiful facial features. Her black hair glistened. She was kind and thoughtful. Her only fault was spending too much time on knick-knock, especially when they were together. Habibi, my love, look at this video from Bolivia from two days ago. Though he didn't care for social media, he found himself gravitating to the app more and more because of the UFOs, New Babel, and the appearances of strange men showing up around the world. Just as he started to watch the video, the two men stepped through what seemed like a door into the souk, where they were drinking coffee. Just like at other times and in other places, their presence demanded attention, and the hundreds of people enjoying the evening immediately took notice. Salam alaikum, one of the men said. Once again, the language they spoke was not Arabic, but Abdal and Camila were able to understand. Their eyes were fixed on the two. Turn from your ways. The arrival of Earth's king is near. The arrogance of all people will be brought low. Their pride will lie in the dust. He will rise to shake the earth. His enemies will crawl with fear into holes in the ground. They will hide in caves in the rocks from his terror. Stop putting your trust in mere humans. They are as frail as breath. How can they be of help to anyone? They repeated what they had said in Bolivia and left in the same manner, though one of them touched Abdal on the shoulder before disappearing through the portal. Abdal found himself transported into a different realm. Standing before him were the two. Their eyes were full of compassion. Strength filled their radiant faces. One of them spoke to him, Son of Gamal, ages ago Egypt's king imagined he was a god. I was Elion's prophet. I warned him to bend his knee before the true king of heaven and earth, but he refused, and Egypt suffered a terrible defeat. Her waters turned red, her crops and livestock were destroyed, her firstborn were killed, and her king and army were overthrown. Warn your people, lest a judgment worse come upon her. Will you shepherd your people? Abdal! Abdal! Abdal felt himself come out of a trance, and Camilla's beautiful face was staring at him. Are you okay? Aywa, yes, I'm fine, he said, trying to regain his composure. What happened? He touched me, and I heard someone ask, Will you shepherd them? And I said, Anahuna, here I am. Abdal stared at her, amazed at what he had done. I said, I would. He looked at the hundreds of faces looking at him like they needed direction. I am here. I know what to do. Chapter 18 Peace Initiative New York City, USA. Secretary General Maria Kovach considered her words carefully before speaking at the UN headquarters in New York City. The United Nations has served the world for almost a century. Our charter holds as its goal the eradication of all war, the protection of human rights, and the elevation of humanity through a common vision shared by the nations of the world, the United Nations. So many have worked tirelessly and sacrificed so much to that end. Sadly, the last wars have shown us that we have failed. The world is more divided and broken than ever before. As leadership of the UN, we asked ourselves if the time and purpose of the United Nations had not run its course, just as was the case with the League of Nations before the founding of the UN. The ambassadors reflected on the historic moment they were witnessing. Their lives were all about to change. Today is a day of sadness, but also a hopeful day for something new that will rise from the ashes, something better that will take us into the future with new hope and purpose. I had pondered long and hard about what organization could replace the UN and how it could improve on our work. When Alexander Therian presented his Babel initiative, I immediately knew. World transforming technologies in exchange for guaranteed disarmament, which nation would not accept that? Though Mr. Therion had no such ambitions, I approached him personally about raising up a new system or organization with the Babel Initiative as its charter. Many of our leading nations have already individually joined the Babel Initiative and are seeing the benefits of it. Now that opportunity is open for every nation. Each of you has had time to study the plan in detail. 
for the last time you will vote as part of the United Nations to either adopt or reject the Babel Initiative. Mr. Speaker, the Speaker of the House adjusted his microphone. We are now going to vote on Resolution 616, the Babel Initiative. Will member nations please use their voting pads to indicate their decisions? Green in favor, red against, and yellow abstention. We now proceed with the vote. An African delegate, President Lloyd Shivambo from the East African Republic, jumped to his feet and said, Wait! I beg you! Please consider carefully before you vote. We are voting now on a resolution that will mean the end of our sovereign rights as nations, if it is accepted. We cannot allow that. There will be no turning back from that decision. Alexander Therion, who was observing, stiffened his lip at the comment. Seated next to him was Isabel Markov. She patted him on the back. Member Shivambo, the speaker responded, your voice has been heard. Please don't interrupt again or you'll be placed under censure. No, I cannot be silenced. For centuries, Africa has been exploited and abused by outside nations and empires. They all said they were going to make the world a better place. But all they brought was suffering and misery for the people of Africa. We will not allow this resolution to be forced on our people. Two plainclothes UN security members made their way toward President Shivambo. He threw up his hands, turned and walked out. Across the room, a few other diplomats from other nations joined him in the walkout. But the majority stayed. Therian adjusted himself in his seat. He was perspiring. He looked around, concerned about more interruptions. The speaker scanned the hall and announced, The voting will now commence. An electronic board with the names of all the member countries lit up as the votes registered. Most of the votes were green, in favor of the resolution. A few were red, among them was Israel, and a few voted yellow. The votes are in, and the majority are in favor. Resolution 616 has passed. The delegates cheered and congratulated each other. Those around Theron congratulated him and cheered on. The speaker leaned into his microphone again. Mr. Alexander Therion, please come and say a few words. Most of the delegates rose to their feet, clapping as Therion made his way toward the speaker's podium. He was overcome with emotion. Therion stood tall and said, Thank you. Thank you for trusting me and for believing in our future. To all the nations that voted in favor of the Babel Peace Initiative, I thank you. For those that voted against it or abstained, our hands of friendship always remain open in a spirit of brotherhood. In time, we hope you will join us. This initiative has been named the Babel Peace Initiative, but it's not just for Babel. This doesn't belong to me. It is our united legacy. It belongs to all of us and all the generations to come. Peace on earth and goodwill to all. The delegates cheered again. Secretary General Maria Kovac walked up to the podium and leaned into the microphone in front of Therion. She gestured with her hands for everyone to settle down. Can I get everyone's attention, please? The delegates quieted and took their seats again. This is a historic day. It has been my great honor to serve you as the Secretary General of the United Nations. The attendees applauded. Thank you, thank you. Now we are entering a new era, and we need a visionary to lead us in that. I propose that there can be no one better to lead us into this new future than Alexander Therion himself. Theron reacted in surprise as the Assembly of Nations cheered once more. The display board began lighting up again. Delegates enthusiastically pressed the green buttons on their voting pads as most nations spontaneously voted in favor. A week later, the national flags of all nations were lowered and removed from their flagpoles in front of the UN's former headquarters. The doors of the UN towers were shut and locked. A UN security officer tugged on the glass entrance doors to confirm its closure. He pulled his collar up to shield himself from the cold and walked away. Chapter 19. Poor Africa. Weeks later. Beth Simpson, British News Network anchor, reported live from their London studios and said with alarm, Most recent reports show the deadly outbreak has now spread across at least two provinces of the East African Republic, already claiming thousands of lives. The EAR's poor living conditions and a lack of proper sanitation is not helping. Doctors fear it's going to get a lot worse unless something drastic is done soon. President Shivambo has, to date, refused intervention by the New World Council and is adamant about not joining the Babel Initiative. On the steps in front of the East African Republic government building in Jindala, President Shivambo was surrounded by journalists. We are asking the public to stay calm. Don't believe everything you see on TV. We have everything under control. Our medical personnel are dealing with the virus. A reporter yelled out, Mr. President, 
How do you respond to those who say you brought this upon your people because you refused help from the New World Council? Irritated, the president responded. At what cost will such help be given, hmm? Our nation existed for thousands of years before this crisis and will continue to exist as a strong and independent people into the future. Most of the world has sold their sovereignty for a pot of lentil soup, but there remains a remnant who will not bow to pressure. And they assure me, even if we are just a remnant, we are on the right path. The reporter kept pushing. Mr. President, is that not? President Shivambo turned and walked up the steps. A bodyguard's hand covered the camera. The camera operator tried to get the shot, but the lens was pushed away. The bodyguard put out his hand. No more questions. Thank you. Babel Tower, Iraq. The frame paused. Therian looked at the members of the New World Council. Also present were Seer, Isabel, Antonio, and Caleb. Therian said, People are dying. We have to do something. The New World Council African governor spoke up. What are the options? Do we invade? The idea sounded great, but Theron could not risk such a careless move at this phase of the plan. Still, trying to persuade people was often a losing battle. They frequently didn't know what was best for them. Serving Enla would bring them such freedom, but for now he would need to lure them to the light. Theron said, no, not that. It is to happen by diplomatic means. President Shivambo refuses our help because he is convinced that we threaten their sovereignty. We must assure him that is not the case. He must listen to reason. I'm afraid it won't be so easy, said Seer. Everyone turned to look at him. Seer continued, You heard the president mention the words they and remnant. That is no coincidence. Talos has correlated the appearances of two strangers around the globe to be connected with the terrorist group known as remnant that is growing in influence in that region and elsewhere. They are also connected to the disappearance of thousands of people all over the world. You're dealing with that in your region, so you'll know what I'm referring to. Caleb reflected. It made perfect sense. That must have been what Amir Atta meant. These two individuals were working with Gurabian, of course. Atta assumed them to be apocalyptic messengers of his deranged god, though he hadn't gotten enough information from him. Killing Amir had been strangely fulfilling. At least there was one less religious fanatic in the world. Caleb spoke his thoughts out loud. Could these two be the same two that were on Hermon? We believe so, Seer said as he tapped on his tablet device, which opened a holographic world map in the center of the room. It was the same map with color-coded regions that Therion had viewed previously. Seer began, not long ago, most world regions were in the process of joining the Babel Initiative. Seer tapped his tablet again and the color scheme changed. Due to the mysterious appearances of these two individuals, there are more nations and regions that have turned red. Immediately obvious was Egypt, Israel, Syria, Jordan, and the East African Republic, who form a red block. In South America and Eastern Europe, there are a few red nations, such as Bolivia and a few others. Russia and China are orange. Therian's eyes narrowed. His face turned a deep red. This can't be right, he exploded. I had more support than that. It should all be green or blue. Seer said, we believe it's remnant and these two mysterious figures. All these regions show activity related to them. Theron looked at Caleb. Did you know about this? Caleb, embarrassed by the question, stammered, Um, it seems Dr. Seer has access to some information that I do not. Theron looked at Seer, surprised, and ordered, Malcolm, give Caleb everything you have. I am losing my patience here. For this to work, we need global unity. Every country must join the initiative, or it doesn't work. I will not allow this to fail, not when we're so close to achieving our goals. He looked at the ten New World Council members. I expect each of you to manage your regions. The people need to see what we're doing so that we don't get swayed by fanatics. I offer them the best life they could ever dream of, and they're still turning on me, on us. Sometimes people don't know how to choose what's good for them. Sometimes the choice needs to be made for them. He looked at Caleb and at the council and said, Thank you. Let's get this sorted. Please leave us now. I need to consult my security chief. Everybody except Caleb left the room. Caleb walked over to Therian. Caleb, how is it that Malcolm has information you don't? Caleb hesitated but answered, I'm not sure. I'll check with Dr. Seer on that. Perhaps there is an error in my security clearance on the system. Hmm, yes, sort that out right away. It's become a matter of life and death. Remnant must be stopped now. And these two individuals, what did the Israelis say about them? I don't know yet, but I will make contact. They will share any intel they have. Theron rubbed his forehead and said, Unless Israel is sympathetic to Remnant, Caleb was taken aback by the accusation. 
I don't believe that. They are not against New Babel. In fact, Israel is very open to cooperation with the New World Council and with you. But Israel just isn't ready to give up its independence yet. Therian was obviously triggered by Malcolm's report. They were the first nation to reject the Babel Initiative when your father refused to sign it. That took me by surprise. If Israel had joined, those nations would follow, including the EAR. What are they waiting for? Another Damascus? Caleb didn't answer. We could have heaven on earth right now if they would join. What is it with your people? Here I offer them the peace they've always longed for, but they still reject it. Right now, Jews are worshiping on the Temple Mount because of me. No other leader has achieved that. For the first time in history, Israel has a real chance at peace. Or maybe they prefer war. Is that it? All I want is a world at peace, and I assure you, I will have it, no matter the cost. You need to find remnant and stop them, or I'll get someone who will. Therian turned and walked out. Caleb was surprised by Therian's outburst, which was so unlike him. But he didn't take it to heart. It was obviously hard for the man to accept that some people wouldn't want his help, even though they desperately needed it. Caleb looked up at the pause screen and was about to switch it off when he noticed something. He grabbed the remote tablet and advanced the video one frame at a time. He zoomed in on the screen. His eyes grew wide. In the background, he saw the two men who had caused the havoc on Mount Hermon. He needed answers and needed them fast. He didn't trust Seer and his sidekick. He knew just the person for the job. Chapter 20, Brothers United, Jerusalem, Israel Under a flickering streetlight, an aging bus pulled over at the bus stop on Jerusalem's east side. In the dimly lit, plastic-walled bus stop, a young Ethiopian Jewish girl sat on the lap of her Arab boyfriend. They whispered and giggled in soft tones. A beggar held out his hand in hopes of a coin or two. The young Arab man dropped a coin in his hand and then shooed him away. The couple laughed and returned to their business. Caleb stepped off the bus behind an old man in workers' clothes. He looked up at the block of housing units in front of him. It was square, colorless, and unimaginative, a stark contrast to his apartment in New Babel. A cat ran in front of him. He loved cats. Jerusalem was full of them. He would have knelt down to pet it, but he was in a hurry. Caleb walked down the passageway past some thugs who were checking him out. He paid them no mind. Caleb's strong build and short-cropped military hairstyle was intimidating. They looked at each other but decided not to try him. Caleb walked up to the door of apartment 144 and banged on it with his open palm. Asher! No answer. Asher! He banged harder. Still no answer. Next door, a baby started screaming. After the third time, the neighbor opened her door and came into the passage, holding her screaming baby. She was irate. You idiot! She shouted in Russian, which Caleb knew well. What do you think you're doing? You woke my baby! The other neighbors shouted out their window. Shut that baby up! We're trying to sleep here! You shut up before I make you shut up! It's this idiot who woke my baby. Caleb wasn't prepared for the drama. He was ready to take on any dangerous thug, but not screaming mothers. I'm sorry for waking your baby. I apologize. You will be sorry if you do that again. Don't go banging on doors in the middle of the night. What were you thinking? The thugs down the hall snickered to themselves. The woman's elder daughter came to help with the baby. She took her little sister from her mother and put a bottle in her mouth and then took the baby back inside. Finally, Asher opened the door. Even though it was late at night, he was cleanly shaven with hair neatly combed and a side part, wearing comfortable but neatly pressed clothing. He was a skinny man in his late 20s. Around his neck were what looked like gaming headphones. He looked at Caleb, showing little reaction to the commotion going on. Hello, Caleb. Your friend here woke up my baby, the woman continued to her tirade. I'm going to report you to the supervisor. Asher looked at the neighbor and smiled politely, not really affected by her outburst. Evening, Mrs. Pavlovsky. Did you see there's a button missing on your jersey? In a huff, Mrs. Pavlovsky turned around and went back in her apartment, mumbling to herself. Asher looked at Caleb. Hello, Asher, can I come in? Yes, Asher closed the door behind them. Asher's apartment was small, but very neat, with little furniture or decoration, only the necessary things. Everything had its place. Against the wall was a desk with a computer. Next to the desk was a bookshelf with books perfectly arranged according to size. The only light in the room came from a lamp that sat next to the sleeper couch and from the glow of the computer screen. A computer game was in progress. Asher flipped the light switch in the kitchen. How are you doing, little brother? I haven't seen you in a while. Eleven months, two weeks, and three days. That long? Asher nodded. You missed Pesach last year. Abba was expecting you. Yeah, I was, um, busy. Caleb looked around the apartment. Were you sleeping? Asher looked back at his computer. No. 
I'm sorry I came without calling first, but I need your help with something. Caleb pulled the little pouch from his pocket and popped the optical chip out into his right palm. Asher inserted it into the reader on his computer and scanned through the camera angles. Looking at the footage again, Caleb became doubtful that it would provide anything usable. A lot of the footage is blown out and distorted, especially when the energy spikes happened. I thought you could recover some details. There's no sound, however, except for we got in the comms. I can generate the sound through vibrational analysis. What's that? Asher enlarged the banner on the shot and zoomed into a corner of it. He launched some software on his computer. This software can detect the vibrations from video images and convert it to sound. Anything like a leaf, clothing, paper. If it's a clear enough shot where the vibrations can be observed, it can be converted to sound waves, like this. Asher played the video of the banner. The computer generated a mumbled sound. Caleb was amazed at his brother's skill. I'll have to spend some time with it to clean it up. It's also pretty simple to generate text from lip movements. That's just motion tracking and rotoscoping. The text will then be converted to voice, either a generic computer voice or if there's enough samples of the actual person's voice, then an AI-generated version of their voice can be created and synchronized to their lip movements. Incredible. What about the video? With all the different camera angles, I might be able to construct a partial hologram. It all depends on how much information was lost. Caleb considered everything Asher said. Asher, look at me. Asher turned to him. This is especially important. No one can know about this. You can't be connected to any network while you're working on this for me. If you do, Talos will know. Talos? Asher got overly excited the moment Caleb mentioned it. Are you using Talos? Oh, can I come see it, please? He begged. How do you even know about it? It's top secret. Wait, no, don't tell me. I don't want to know. You can't come right now. Talos hasn't been launched to the world yet, but when it is, you can come see it for sure. But for now, Talos cannot know what we're doing. This is for your eyes only. Understand? Asher nodded. I'm serious, Asher. This needs to be offline. No one can know about this. No one. Do you understand? I heard you. No one can know. Got it. Why are you repeating yourself? Caleb looked at Asher, concerned. You're kidding, right? Remember when you hacked into Mossad's mainframe? If it wasn't for me and the fact that you were Eitan Baruch's son, you'd be locked away or worse. Abba wouldn't let that happen. Besides, I wanted to know what happened to Amitai, and no one would tell me, not even you. Anyway, I was younger then. Caleb frowned. Your secret's safe with me, Asher reassured. So what do you think? It is rendering. 70 minutes. Asher got up from the computer and walked to the kitchen. Wait, you were already doing it? Asher walked back from the kitchen with some pitas and hummus. They sat down at Asher's table and ate in silence for about 20 minutes. Sander Schwartz is over 125 years old, Asher said unexpectedly. How do you think he is still alive? Kayla was taken aback. He had no idea what his brother was talking about. He was not much of a conversationalist due to the Asperger's. Caleb tried to quickly connect the dots to get a sense of where Asher was going. Little brother, I've never heard of a Sander Schwartz. I love you, but you've been spending way too much time on conspiracy sites. Asher was annoyed and didn't talk for another 15 minutes. Caleb knew the game. He just had to wait, and Asher would be fine. He was born Alexander Schwartz, 1922, but always went by his nickname, Sander. Asher stated, again in a very matter-of-fact manner. He served in the Nazi party before being inducted into the SS directly under Heinrich Himmler himself. He was the interface between Dr. Death and the death camps. They were looking for the elixir of life, first mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh came to fear death in his own declining years, and he sought out Utnapishtim, Noah in our tradition. Gilgamesh was directed to find a plant at the bottom of the sea, but it was eaten by a serpent before he could do so. What people don't realize is that the epic is a cipher. The serpent is the one who always had the elixir, and Gilgamesh mingled with him. Caleb was always impressed by how much his little brother could memorize, but he wasn't always impressed by the conclusions. What does this have to do with me, and why are you telling me this? Asher looked at Caleb drolly, but disappointed. You really don't see it? No, little bro, I don't. His little brother had a way of taking unrelated facts and weaving a ridiculous story out of them. Sanders Schwartz managed to evade the Allies was never brought to justice. He was brought to the U.S. by Operation Paperclip, where his knowledge of the occult and Nazi tech was put to use. He dedicated much of his life to hunting for the tomb of Gilgamesh. He found it in 2003, at the ripe old age of 85. He synthesized Gilgamesh's DNA into an elixir and started looking younger. Asher showed videos and pictures from a folder on his computer. Look here. Asher pulled up a picture of Sander two years after finding the tomb. Now do you see it? Caleb noticed a significant difference in apparent age but remained skeptical. 
little brother, he does look younger, but that could be for so many reasons. Sometimes when people are sick, they look older, and then when they get healthy, they look younger. Asher stared at Caleb for a minute. You said it. He looks younger in this photo because he is healthier. How did he get healthier when he was getting older? The answer is that he took the elixir. This is the last photo we have of him. He just disappears after this. Caleb stumbled for words. Well, he probably died after that, and the family just didn't release the photos. And people say that I am not well adjusted. The truth is staring you in the face, and you refuse to see it. The elixir restored his youth. Neither of them said a word for what seemed like minutes. Caleb frowned. He'd heard some crazy conspiracy theories before, but this was a new one. Asher rolled his eyes at his brother's obvious skepticism. He typed a few keystrokes. An old black and white photo popped up on the screen. It was a group of Nazi officers in a photo along with Adolf Hitler. Asher zoomed in on one of the faces. The photo was blurry at first, but with the click of a button, it cleared and sharpened. Caleb's eyes widened. Does he look familiar? asked Asher. Caleb marveled at the resemblance to Therion. But of course, it was not possible. Sander Schwartz showed up again out of nowhere right after the economic crash of 2008. But he resurfaced as Alexander Therion, not Schwartz. And he, of course, looked much younger, early 40s. Asher pulled up photos of Therion wearing sunglasses and slightly out-of-focus photos. In all the early photos, he tried to hide his face as best he could, and he mostly succeeded. Caleb remained quiet as Asher took a breath to continue his pitch. No one knows where he came from, but he had stock in tons of companies. He used those assets to build the biggest personal wealth the world has ever seen. He's worth trillions. According to my sources, much of it was gained through unsavory means. Here, this is one... Here, this is the only photo we have of him from about 10 years ago, and here he is today. See how he hasn't aged a bit? Now do you believe me? It is impressive what you have put together. I admit that there is a resemblance between Schwartz and Theron, but a doppelganger doesn't equal the same person taking an elixir. Maybe they are just related. Look at this, too. Asher pulled up a picture on his computer of a square tablet with six rows and six columns of Sumerian symbols on it. Theron found this with Gilgamesh. Asher looked at Caleb, waiting for a response. Caleb looked at it cautiously, but not sure what to think. Asher pressed on after Caleb said nothing. This is the Tablet of Destinies. Whoever holds it has Enlil's authority on the earth. I discovered that each of the symbols equals a number from 1 to 36. Then I performed an arithmetic progression. You are the math genius, little brother. Remind me what that is? Caleb loved Asher, but sometimes he could just be over the top. His Asperger's disease didn't slow him down from doing a lot of research, but it didn't help him stay away from conspiracy-ridden sites. When you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on until the last number, which is 36, do you know what that equals? Caleb smirked, not knowing the solution off the top of his head. It equals 666. Asher looked at Caleb, expecting him to be surprised. Caleb shook his head and Asher picked up the clear sign. Asher turned his back to Caleb and went to the computer. He pulled the thumb drive from his computer and handed it to Caleb. Chaim sees it and agrees with me. Asher started pulling up the footage on the computer, still visibly upset. Caleb knew it was best to let him cool off a bit. The footage started playing. I took my holographic projection system to Chaim's to help with some of his research. This monitor won't render a holographic display. What are you looking for? Asher asked. Some guys dressed up like Bedouins that I saw in Mount Hermon thought I imagined things, and then there they were in East Africa where the outbreak is happening. They must be part of the remnant led by Gurabian. Asher nervously rubbed his forehead. Remnant? Caleb didn't have time to get into it. His brother wouldn't care anyway. Forget I mentioned it. Asher's eyes scanned left to right as he processed a thought. I can't help you, brother. Caleb was confused. What, what do you mean? What happened, Asher? Asher shook his head. Caleb ran his hand through his hair in frustration. While staring at the ground, he saw Asher's half-open backpack on the floor. Barely visible was a credit card-sized token with the remnant symbol on it. Caleb grabbed the bag. Asher got scared and grabbed the bag back, leaving Caleb with the token. Asher held out his hand. Give that back. It's mine. Caleb pulled it away. Where did you get it? What does this card do? It's my access card. Give it back. Access to what? Asher was getting upset. Give it back. Caleb tried to stay calm. Asher, I'm just going to ask you this once. You need to tell me the truth. Are you part of Remnant? Give back my card. Caleb waved the card with the Remnant logo. He was getting angry. What does this give you access to? Put it down, Caleb. It's mine. You need to go now. Asher got up and started pacing. Caleb grabbed Asher by his shirt. Are you part of Remnant? Tell me the truth. He slammed his fist into the wall. Damn it, Asher. Tell me. Did Chaim get you involved in this? 
I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Asher was completely overwhelmed by the intensity of the situation. He started flapping his arms and shaking his head. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Caleb realized he had gone too far. He let Asher go. Okay, okay, calm down, calm down, Asher. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay? I shouldn't have done that. Asher retreated from Caleb. He was obviously in flight mode. You should go, go now. You should have called. Caleb lifted his palms to Asher. Okay, just listen to me. Remnant is extremely dangerous. People are dying because of them. Do you understand that? Are you part of them, Asher? Are they using you to help them? Are the two part of them? You recognized them, didn't you? You should go now. Go now. Go now. I'm your brother, Asher. I'm just trying to protect you. Asher's mind was racing. Brother, protect me. Protect Amitai. Did you protect Amitai? No, Amitai's dead. Amitai's dead. Caleb's temper flared again. He smashed his fist under the counter. Asher jumped back and ran into the bathroom, slamming the door shut behind him. Caleb heard the sound of the latch as Asher locked himself in. Damn it, Asher. He walked up to the door and was tempted to kick it in. He could hear Asher had turned the taps on and was humming loudly. That was Asher's coping mechanism when he felt overwhelmed. He knew that Asher was in the bathroom, firmly covering his ears and wouldn't hear anything he would say until he calmed down. Any aggressive action he took would just make matters worse. Caleb would have to come back another time, perhaps with Ahava, and speak to Asher again, calmly. She had a way with him. But Asher needed to understand that he was getting himself into real trouble. He had no idea what he was really dealing with. Caleb walked back to Asher's desk. He picked up the backpack and looked inside. He pulled out a computer game sleeve. The game's name was Remnant Rising. The same logo was on the game. It's a game? He read the back of the sleeve. The enemy is here and it's not human. Fear not, for our weapons are mighty. We will destroy this stronghold. Resist the enemy and they will flee before you. Rise up, Remnant. Your time has come. Includes access card to unlock advanced levels. He was about to put the game sleeve down when something caught his eye. Game design, A-B. A-B, Asher Baruch. Asher designed the game. It's a game. Caleb shook his head. He put the access card and game sleeve back into Asher's bag and skillfully placed it back where it was. He noticed a card with Chaim's phone number. He scribbled a note on a piece of paper and then left, shutting the door behind him. Still, something didn't add up. He needed to find out more. Asher mentioned that Chaim believed him. The old man seemed like a history nut, but perhaps he would have the answers he needed. Chapter 21 Cursed Mountain Old City, Jerusalem Caleb knocked on Chaim's door. With just a little info, Talos was able to tell him the address with ease. The door opened. Chaim peered out and saw Caleb. Caleb Baruch, good morning. What brings you here? My little brother. Caleb didn't want to say too much. It was always wise to reveal as little as possible until more information was needed. Oh, well, please, come in. Caleb walked in. Chaim's home was cluttered with stacks of books, scrolls, charts, and maps, filling every available counter, table, coffee table, and bookshelf. He was clearly in the middle of an extensive research project. That's a lot of books. Chaim looked around his living room. What, this? These are the ones I couldn't fit into my library. He pointed toward another room. I know, I know. My dear wife managed to keep me in check, but since she passed, he shrugged and then lovingly touched a photo of her on the shelf, giving a sweet smile as he did. Forgive me, my love. I'm lost without you. Professor Asher told me you two have been working on some projects together. Caleb knew starting with honey was better than vinegar when trying to get information. I was just at his house last night and he compiled this for me. He thought you might be able to help interpret it for us. Even if Remnant was just a game, the two that he saw in Hermon were real. He needed answers at any cost. Oh, yes. Here, let me clear some space. Chaim moved the living room furniture back as far as possible. Uh, the space is limited, so you won't be able to move too far. Chaim walked over to a cabinet and took two hollow visors from it. He handed one to Caleb and kept one for himself. In his other hand, he held the control unit. When Asher first showed this to me, I was amazed. I have never seen anything like it. Years ago, we used virtual simulations of the temple and Mishkan for immersive study, but it was nothing like this. This is like time travel. Okay, now to switch on. He tapped on the sides of the cube, but nothing happened. Asher did show me, but I can't remember now. Caleb knew the device. This is a hollow vision system. We use them for mission simulations all the time. Here, let me help you. Asher was running simulations for me in my research on the Tablet of Destinies. It's amazing the secrets it holds. He thought Caleb might be intrigued and was surprised when there was no reaction. Chaim handed the cube to Caleb. Caleb touched the four corners simultaneously, which powered the cube. Blue lights illuminated the touchscreen buttons. 
It requires input. Here, Asher gave this to me. Caleb gave him the thumb drive. Chaim took it, fumbled with it, and finally inserted it into the drive. Both visors lit up as the video started playing. Freeze frame, commanded Caleb. The video paused. Caleb looked around the room. Now for sound. Asher had a way to generate sound from images. If he were able to do that, it would be helpful. We would normally use an immersive surround system. Do you have any kind of audio system that connects to this? Chaim pointed to a hat hanging on the wall. Uh, yes, they're behind you on the wall. He walked over and moved the hat to reveal a stylish round speaker. On the opposite wall, there was another with a prayer shawl hanging from it. Chaim removed the cloth. Asher installed that for me, too, Ike, but I must confess I haven't been able to use that either. It's a nice place to hang my hat, though. Caleb powered the speakers. He placed the cube on a nearby coffee table, dimmed the living room lights, and then put on the visor. Chaim also put on his. Instantly, they were transported into the Mount Hermon conference hall. I still don't know how Asher did this, marveled Chaim. It's as if we were there. It is incredible, agreed Caleb. He actually joined all the 360-degree camera angles into one complete 3D environment. Play video. The video began playing. Caleb looked around the room at the dignitaries and at Isabel Markov in the front of the room. Isabel raised her hands. The music and drum beat were garbled. Ati me peta babka, she shouted three times. Uh, that's Sumerian she's speaking, Chaim explained. It means gatekeeper, open your gate for me. Isabel continued her ritual. The ritual they're doing is a summoning of a deity. They are summoning the gods through a portal. Yes, it's all quite strange, agreed Caleb. I'm really more interested in what happened later. Fast forward 32 times speed. The video strolled through the rest of Isabel's ritual and Therian's presentation. Then the glass chamber started rising from the floor. Stop. Here's where it started. Play normal speed. The video continued. Caleb and Chaim watched as the glass chamber rose to full height. Isabel and her followers were doing a ritual again. The light beam streaked through the chamber. It was too bright to make out anything inside the chamber. Both men turned their view away from the chamber. Decrease image exposure, Caleb commanded. Increase clarity. A text message popped up at the bottom of the screen. Adjusting exposure. Increasing clarity. The image darkened around the chamber so that the light shining from within the chamber became more definable. Even so, the light made it difficult to see clearly. Caleb thought he saw something in the midst of the light. Freeze! Two times zoom. They stared at the chamber. Caleb said, Is that a face? Slow advance. The video advanced in slow motion, and then they saw the being in the chamber in full view. Freeze! Chaim was fascinated by what he saw and exclaimed, They have summoned an Anunnaki. But which one? Caleb looked around the room at the frightened expression on the leader's faces. Play enhance audio. The video played but started glitching. The simulated audio was unclear. It sounded like a sentence, but it wasn't in a language Caleb knew. Chaim recognized the language. I recognize some of the words. It sounds like a greeting. The video proceeded. Flashes of light and image distortion made it difficult to continue. The video feed flashed on and off. It remained off a few seconds leaving Caleb and Chaim in a darkened living room. Suddenly, the image was back on with bright flashes of light. They saw how everything began shaking wildly and people fell down. In the midst of the chaos, Caleb noticed something, and the video blacked out completely. Go back 10 seconds. The video jumped back 10 seconds. There was a flash of bright light, and two silhouetted figures were standing in the smoke. Freeze picture. Zoom. Caleb leaned in. That's them, the strangers I saw in Hermon. Who are they? Chaim removed his visor and turned the lights back on. Caleb removed his visor as well and looked at Chaim. What do you know about this, Professor? Why did Asher come to you for help? What did I just see? What was that creature? Was it real or a hologram? Chaim just stood there, not saying anything. Well, can you help me or not? Caleb started to get impatient. He had a feeling he was just wasting his time. This old man was far too gone into his ancient fables mixed with odd conspiracy theories. Have you ever gotten pulled over for going too fast? Chaim finally spoke. What does it have to do with anything? Everything, Chaim pressed. Sure, I guess, yes, Caleb admitted cautiously. The person who pulled you over, do you think you could have fought them and gotten away? In other words, were you a better fighter in every way than that person? I know you have quite a reputation. Well, sure, but it wasn't about who was better skilled. I stopped and took the ticket because they had the authority. Bidiuk, exactly right. It isn't who has more strength, but who has the authority or legal right to do something. So you were telling me that these two strangers have some kind of legal authority to do what they did? Hermon is a strategic place to Israel, yes? 
Yes, of course, Caleb said in a matter-of-fact way. Well, it is a strategic place to other forces as well, very ancient forces that laid claim to that mountain eons ago. Chaim glanced at Caleb, who appeared still interested. The very name Hermon means imprecation. That is an oath to curse oneself if something is not done. Ancient beings came down on that mountain ages ago and established themselves as the rulers of this planet. They held legal authority for thousands of years. But then another came, challenged their legal authority, and won. The two strangers work for the one who holds legal claim to it. Therefore, the entire summit ended the way it did. I will try to put this in language you can accept. Chaim paused to think about his words carefully. It was obvious that Caleb understood the concept but rejected the premise. There are forces in play that may or may not be unleashed depending on what Israel decides to do, and you have a part to play in that. So are they friend or foe? Hmm, Chaim pondered how to answer. That very much depends on who you serve, Caleb Baruch. So who does Remnant serve? Caleb threw it out there. His years of experience interrogating captured hostiles taught him how an unexpected question could reveal a lot in the reaction of the interrogatee. However, Chaim's reaction seemed to be more one of confusion. Who? Doesn't matter. That's all you can tell me about the two? Nothing more? Chaim shrugged and shook his head. Caleb considered whether he should press him for more, but he sensed that was all he was going to get for the moment. Caleb got up and headed for the door. Thanks anyway, he said and let himself out. Chapter 22, Just a Game, Therian's Office, Babel Tower Caleb stepped into Therian's office. Light glistened through the mammoth windows of the Babel Tower. He saw Therian standing in front of a wall of TV screens looking at the images coming from Africa. A crying mother carried her limp child through the streets. Therian's eyes were red with tears. In his hand, he held a drink. Caleb was moved by his reaction to their plight. He certainly didn't seem like the monster that Asher's conspiracy sources had painted him to be. If only they had trusted me. This could have been prevented. Now millions are dying. Is this Remnant's doing? Those two charlatans! In a fit of fury, Therian threw his glass at a screen, shattered both the glass and the screen. He spun around and glared at Caleb. Why haven't you found them yet? I have given you the best surveillance system on the planet, and you still haven't found them. I'm not sure what to think. Are you just incompetent, or are you complicit? Caleb shook his head and said, There is no remnant. Theron was confused. What? What are you talking about? You heard what Seer said. They are in all the countries opposing me. I did look into it. It's a computer game, played by only a few advanced computer geeks, a closed community. Like the characters in the game, players identify themselves as remnant. The chatter we picked up was only references to the game, stronghold, the weapons, all of it, gameplay. Theron leaned onto his desk, looking uncharacteristically unsettled and disturbed. Names, how do you know this? What? Caleb wasn't sure what Theron was asking. The names of the players, I want their names. They're just some smart kids having a bit of fun. They're harmless. I don't believe it. They invaded the best security agencies in the world and even our Talos. I need to know how they did that, game or no game. I'm convinced Remnant and the two strangers are all related to Garabian. I want their names, you understand? Therian eyed Caleb for several moments. Would he break? Would he actually do Enlil's bidding? Time would tell. Something about the chilling way in which Theron made the request unsettled Caleb. I just have their game handles, but I'll look into it, he lied. Theron knew he lied and was happy about it. Good. Actually, you know what? No, I'll get Antonio to take care of that. I need you in Africa now. Theron looked at one of the muted screams where President Shivambo was speaking. Caleb was confused. Africa? Why? A few weeks ago, Dr. Gabriella Levy traveled there with a medical team from Doctors Without Borders. She's been testing her treatment protocol in the hope that it will lead to a cure. On hearing Gavi's name, Caleb immediately paid attention. The news upset him. What? Is Gavi there? She insisted. I couldn't persuade her otherwise, but I'm sure that doesn't surprise you, does it? No, it doesn't. When I met her, she was just out of medical school, volunteering at a battlefield hospital, treating victims from both sides, soldiers, civilians, anybody that needed help. It was a dangerous place to be, especially for a young woman as but- uh, as for a young woman her age. She was exposed to all the horrors of war, but she was incredible. Theron was pleased to hear that. Then we are privileged to have her on our team. The treatment is still experimental, based on some of the discoveries we have on display in the Knowledge Center, but she was confident she could convert it into something stable that would change the world forever. 
Gabriella is close to a breakthrough, but I have concerns. I have reason to believe that she may have been recognized by one of the doctors there. If she's discovered and her research falls into the wrong hands, it will be a devastating loss for the people of the EAR and the rest of the world. We need to protect her and her work from Remnant at all costs. Caleb didn't need much convincing. When do I leave? My plane's waiting. Caleb lifted his phone to dial. I'll assemble a team right away. Theron shook his head. No, just you. More than that will attract attention. You'll do a high altitude drop tonight. Everything you need is on the plane. Good luck and take care of Gavriella. Oh, by the way, Caleb said as he turned back, does the name Sander Schwartz mean anything to you? Of course it does. Caleb was surprised. Perhaps his little brother was onto something after all. Conspiracy sites are filled with theories about me. I hope I don't need to tell you about how such sites can invent things out of whole cloth. Caleb turned red. Thought so. He was mad at himself. Why did he even ask? Asher and his crazy theories. Caleb turned and walked back to the elevator. Alexander turned back to the screens. Talos. Yes, came the reply. Summon Antonio Mesmo to my office. Caleb heard that and was concerned. His brother might be into way too many conspiracies, but he was still his little brother. He tapped Asher's name onto his phone as he entered the elevator. Ground floor. Thank you. Going down. Asher wasn't answering his phone. Come on, Asher, answer. Talos responded instead. Asher Baruch is not available at present. Would you like to leave a message for him? Uh, no, no message. The elevator reached the ground floor. The doors opened and Caleb was about to get out when he stopped in his tracks. Actually, Talos, take me to Dr. Sears' lab. Sure, shall I let him know you're on your way? No, that's fine. I just need to pick something up. As you wish. Going to floor 18. No, wait, not that one, the other one. Talos was quiet for a few seconds. To which floor would you like to go? Caleb thought for a second. Basement levels, the lowest floor. Again, Talos was quiet again. I'm sorry, Captain Baruch, you do not have clearance. I'm head of security, I have full clearance, now take me down there. Please wait while I connect you to Dr. Seer. Caleb's phone began to dial a number. He canceled the call. Never mind. Caleb stepped off the elevator. Chapter 23, Doctor in Danger, Jindala, Africa. A green light illuminated. Caleb was tapped on his back. He jumped from the plane into the darkness, protected only by high-altitude skydiving gear. Jindala was a sprawling African city with some low-rise office buildings in between large informal settlements, spreading as far as the eye could see. From these settlements, thousands of smoke columns rose into the air. A few miles outside the city limits, there was a large, tented camp with a barbed wire fence surrounding it. A van pulled up to the gate where a camp guard stood, hands raised to stop the van. With an old AK slung over his shoulder, the driver handed over his papers. New shift of doctors and nurses, he said in a local Swahili dialect. The soldier put his head through the window and noticed Caleb, who, like the others, was wearing a surgical mask. Who's that one? Papers! The driver looked at Caleb. He wants to see your papers. Caleb took some documents from his satchel and handed them over. The driver took the papers and got out of the car. He glanced back at Caleb. The camp guard studied the passport and papers. Dr. Abdul Farouk, Cairo, Egypt. He snapped his fingers at another guard who brought a clipboard with a list of names. He scammed the clipboard and shook his head. There is no Farouk on my list. Caleb could speak broken Swahili. He opened the window to speak. Excuse me, sir. The guard looked over at him. Caleb switched over to English. There was no time to send a list. It's an emergency and I'm a specialist. Defense Minister Mulinde requested urgently that I come. The guard wasn't buying it. I don't care if the president sent you. Your name is not on the list. The van driver threw his hands in the air. Are you crazy? The disease might be airborne and if he can't stop it, we'll all die. But who do you think will get it first? The guard's eyes grew larger. He looked back at the camp with a very worried expression. He quickly handed over the passport and shouted back at the second guard. Open the gate. Let them through. The van drove through. From the gate, the van drove up to a second fenced-off area with a building in the center. The doctors and nurses disembarked entering the building. Caleb handed the driver an envelope. He pulled out a stack of bills and smiled. Inside the hospital compound, the doctors and nurses exit a sterilized area wearing hazmat suits. Caleb wore one, too. From the changing rooms, the doctors moved through to the next gate toward the hospital. In the entrance to the hospital, Caleb saw rows of dead bodies, dozens of them, covered with sheets. Some of the sheets had been partially blown off by the wind, revealing an arm or a leg or part of a face riddled with sores. Several bodies were being carried out on stretchers. 
As one stretcher was carried past, Caleb could see the feet of a young child. It was a disturbing sight. They were led toward the trauma unit. Inside the trauma unit, patients were attended by doctors and nurses in hazmat suits. Caleb looked around, but it was difficult to recognize faces through the hazmat suits. He walked up to a nurse with her back turned to him and tapped her on the shoulder. Excuse me, have you seen Dr. Simon? As she turned, he saw it was Gavriella. Gavi, I mean Dr. Simons. Caleb felt awkward. He almost blew her cover. That was not like him. Get a grip, Baruch. Gavi frowned at Caleb. She had dark rings around her eyes. She looked around at the new shift of doctors and nurses that had arrived and indicated with her head that he must follow her out of the room. They walked into a decontamination area. She pointed to a spot. Stand there. Their hazmat suits were sprayed down, after which they walked into the changing room and unzipped their suits. Gavi lifted her headpiece. What are you doing here? Caleb removed the covers off his boots and hung the suit on the hook. Alexander was concerned about your safety. He sent me to protect you and your work. I don't need protection, she said. It's better that you go. If you are discovered, it will blow my cover, and I'm so close to a breakthrough. I won't be discovered. This isn't my first undercover mission, you know. Alexander has intel that your cover may have been compromised and that both you and your research are in danger. I'm going to make sure you get back home safely. Gavi's hung head forward, strands of her long blonde hair that had come loose from her ponytail hung across her face. Caleb looked at her. In spite of her the exhaustion, she still looked beautiful, just like all those years ago. You look exhausted, Gavi. You need some rest. She shook her head and said, I've lost count of how many patients have died under my care. Many of them were kids. Her chin quivered ever so slightly and her lips pursed. She tried desperately to contain her emotions. She was a strong woman and hated to show her vulnerability. I came here mainly to do research to find a cure, but they were so desperate for doctors I had to help. These people need a miracle. I'm going to make sure they get it. Gavi leaned back against the wall. Tears welled up in her eyes. She wiped her face with the back of her hand. You're no good to anyone if your body breaks down. Gavi stood up. I want to show you something. She walked out of the room and he followed her into the rest of the hospital. Through glass windows, he saw patients at various levels of infection. She stopped at one of the rooms. Inside were a few women and some children. They looked weak, but not as sick as all the others Caleb had seen. A little girl recognized Gavi and waved excitedly. Were they recently infected? Gavi shook her head, and there was a glimmer of a smile. No, by now everyone in that room should be dead, but they're not. All indicators are that they are getting stronger, not weaker. Caleb was amazed. Is this your treatment, so the cure works? Yes and no. That is, it works for some, but not all. That is what I have to figure out. For some reason, it has the greatest success with children and their mothers, who are desperate enough to try anything. So far, only a few have agreed to the treatment. Local doctors advise their patients against it because of its experimental status, I have tried administering it regardless, but it's been counterproductive. Those who take it but are resistant show little to no improvement, unlike those patients who willingly take the treatment. Strange as it may seem, it only seems to work if they believe it will. Like a placebo? Gavi shook her head and corrected. This isn't a placebo. It's a real treatment that heals the body at a genetic level, regenerating dead cells and repairing DNA. It is an incredible breakthrough if it works. I just have to figure out how to make it work for everyone to determine if the regenerative effects are permanent or temporary. I've asked for a meeting with the Minister of Health in two weeks. If they continue to heal, it will go a long way toward proving its efficacy, and I will offer this treatment to the government of the East African Republic. It may be the best chance of saving their nation from this disease that came out of nowhere. Are you sure you want to do that? How will you protect your research? I haven't spent my life doing this research so that I or anyone else can get rich. This can be an answer to all diseases, and everyone will have access, rich or poor. No one needs to die of heart disease, cancer, or some terminal sickness again. That was my deal with Alexander Theron when he invested. He seemed happy about my proposal. Caleb wasn't surprised. That sounds about right. From what I see, he's really serious about fixing the world, and he's doing quite an excellent job of it. It's a shame this president doesn't trust him. Look how the people suffer, Caleb pondered for a few seconds. So this can really cure cancer? Gavi nodded. Potentially, yes. If only my mother had had this. Yes, and my father. I couldn't save them, Caleb, but I can save other fathers, mothers, brothers, children. 
You can thank Mr. Therian, but I'm not leaving now. You can thank him yourself when you see him. He wants me to protect you in your research, and that's just what I'm going to do. So you best get some rest so you can complete your work. She scrunched her face and slowly nodded. The van dropped the day shift of doctors and nurses in front of an alley between some dilapidated buildings. Caleb slung his bag over his shoulder and Gavi hers. They walked down the alley toward her unit. Gavi turned to Caleb. Where are you going to be staying? I can't keep you safe if I'm not near you. All right, but you'll see. You're really wasting your time here. The government knows we're here to help their people, so they've assigned guards to watch over us. If there's trouble, they'll have the police here in minutes. I've had no trouble so far. The people here were thriving until the virus came. They haven't been even affected by the drought, nor by what we call the plagues that are sweeping the world. Anyway, just try to be somewhat discreet. We don't want my colleagues to get the wrong idea, she said with a wink. Trust me, I've got good reason to be here. We picked up some real intel. Your work has caught a lot of attention, and not all of it is good. So either come back with me or I stay. I have an old contact in the security services here. I'll talk to him tomorrow just in case we need backup. Any incidents with two strangers here? The two who? That's a no then. That was good, but Caleb was surprised. The report stated that they had been all over the world and had caused problems in many countries. It seems strange that there should not be any issues here. She opened the door, and Caleb saw it wasn't a big room. and had a single bed, a side table, a desk, and chair. There was also a basic room with a toilet, low-pressure shower, and a plastic makeshift sink with a single tap. It was one of the luxury units. Caleb smiled at that. Every unit had a two-hour allocation of electricity per day, but frequently there would be no power. There was a small kitchenette with a two-plate gas stove and a pot. He tried to imagine where he was going to sleep. Gavi laughed, and for a moment it made her fatigue disappear. I'll move my bags under the bed and make some space for you on the floor. You can use the seat cushions. Tomorrow we'll find out if there is another unit with two beds available nearby. Caleb agreed. Probably a good idea. So where do you eat? There's a cafe in the market that's pretty good. She led him through the bustling night market. Caleb looked around. I don't know. There could be hostels on every corner. She didn't stop walking, so he followed. They walked through a narrow opening between buildings, and Caleb insisted he go first to protect Gavi. He continued looking from side to side and in front and behind. His arm suddenly started flailing in the air. Ah, yuck! Get it off me! Gavi caught up to him to see what was the matter. Caleb was still flailing his arms, but she could see nothing. Then she saw him pulling off a spider's web off from his face. She started laughing. I thought you weren't afraid of anything. Caleb frowned. Afraid of a little spider? I was just starting to feel safe with you here, but now I might have to protect you. Caleb smirked. Funny, he said flatly. Gavi laughed. It was so fun to tease him and watch how his ego was easily wounded. That ego helped kill what they once had, but still, he was a good man. She didn't press the matter. Caleb quickly changed the topic. You wouldn't know this nation is dealing with a deadly plague. They're carrying on as if it's life as usual. If they saw what I saw today, they never would leave their homes. Life is a fight for survival here, plague or no plague. So every day is seen as a gift. I really appreciate that about them. Caleb said, with such poverty, it's hard to understand why they resisted becoming part of the new world. Surely it would change everything for these people. You wouldn't be forced to treat dying people in a rundown hospital. They would have the best care and resources available. I don't trust anything, but I've seen for myself the amazing transformations that have happened with the Babel Initiative. Caleb was slightly surprised at his own words. He went to Babel to keep an eye on things, but he'd become a true believer. Gavi nodded and said, I know it was hard for me to understand as well, but I've learned they are a proud people. They've survived slavery, colonialism, economic and military, and brutal dictatorships that were supported by Western powers. They're a poor nation, but they're free now. And from what I can see, the president's really got his people's interests at heart. He won't surrender their independence easily. They arrived at Jumba Cafe, named after the owner. Jumba smiled broadly when he saw Gavi. Welcome, Dr. Simons. Who is your friend? Is he a doctor too? Yes, this is Dr. Farouk, Abdul Farouk, from Cairo, Caleb interjected. Welcome to Jindala, Dr. Farouk. Do you eat goat meat? Welcome to Jindala, Dr. Farouk. Do you eat goat meat? Unfortunately, I'm not persuaded Dr. Simons to try it. Gavi shrugged. I'm vegan, much to Jumba's dismay. Caleb smiled. Yes, I do eat goat, of course. Wonderful. Then I suggest our specialty, Nyama Tidyoma. Caleb looked at Gavi for information. It skewered, co 
it skewered cubes. It skewered cubes of goat meat with rough salt. She explained, "You'll like it." She always knew what food he would enjoy. That thought made him happy and a bit sad at what they had lost. Sounds good. That's what I'll have. Jumba went off to prepare. Gavi looked at some musicians playing close by. Caleb stared at her. She turned back unexpectedly, and their eyes met for a second before she looked down. Strange how our paths have now crossed again after all this time. How long has it been? Fourteen years? Fifteen years and five months, Caleb chuckled. I sound like Asher now. You know, when he was a kid, he had a big crush on you. It didn't matter to him that we were... Caleb caught himself. He was on an important mission, not a date. Gavi smiled and looked away. She thought about the good times too, but then remembered the pain of their breakup. Caleb suddenly remembered about Asher. Asher! He walked up to the counter and waved to get Jumba's attention. Yes, sir. Do you need anything else? Do you have a phone I could borrow? My battery's dead. I'll pay for the call. Jumba pointed to a makeshift call center across the street. I use that one. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Just pay the woman sitting next to the phone. Caleb nodded. He walked back to their table. I have to make an urgent call. I'll be right back. You can use my phone. I've got signal here. No, I'll explain later. She assumed he didn't want the call to be monitored. She watched as he crossed the road. He was as good looking as ever, even more than she remembered. Caleb had to wait a minute for someone to finish their call. He looked around at all the people going about their business. Through the crowds, he could see Gavi receive her food. She smiled and thanked Jumba. The other person hung up and Caleb stepped up to the phone. The phone's owner tapped a pin on a little keyboard and nodded to Caleb. Before he touched the receiver, she indicated that his hands needed to be sprayed with an antiseptic spray. While he was sorting that out, she sprayed the phone too and then handed it to him. It was a weak attempt to enforce some kind of safety measure when, in reality, nothing could protect people from the virus if it got out of the quarantine zone. The phone had a dial tone. That was a good start. He dialed a number and waited. But after a minute, someone picked up. Hello, Asher? It's Caleb. Can you hear me? Asher? Caleb? Is that you? The shoddy quality of the line and the noise of the market made it difficult to hear. Yes, it's Caleb. Asher, there are people looking for the players of your game. Say again? Remnant, the game. They're looking for the players. Who? It doesn't matter. You need to clear your tracks or they will find you. I will talk to you when... The line disconnected. Caleb looked at the phone lady. It disconnected. Can you get it back? The lady tapped on her keyboard and then shrugged. Just great. Well, it will work again. The lady shook her head. She showed Caleb an amount due. He took out a few notes and paid her. Caleb crossed the road and weaved his way through the crowd. He bumped into a man wearing a hoodie. Sorry, excuse me, said Caleb. Caleb couldn't see his face clearly, but could see by his skin tone that he didn't look native. He found it odd that the man would wear a hoodie in such warm weather. The man stepped aside and let Caleb pass. Caleb arrived back at the table. He turned to see if the man was still there, but he wasn't. What are you looking at? asked Gavi. Nothing. It doesn't matter, he said as he took his seat. The food looks good. He began eating. Gavi saw she was not going to get a clear answer and continued her meal. Caleb and Gavi walked back toward her unit. The silence was a bit awkward. Caleb spoke first. About what happened between us. What I did, I'm... I'm... Caleb, what happened is history. I'm not going to lie. It took me a while to deal with it. But when my father died, I understood a bit better. Your loss of your mother when you were so young, well, grief does mess with you, and in some way, it shapes who we become. Anyway, in the end, it was for the best. It allowed me to focus on what's really important, my work. And obviously, you haven't done too badly for yourself either. As they passed through the alley toward the residential units, a shadow moved, but they didn't notice. Caleb wasn't in the mood to talk about his mom. He'd rather change the subject. Your research, is it secure? It's under heavy guard at the field hospital. The president has appointed some of his elite units to be there 24-7. He knows how important it is to his nation. I carry a partial backup with me everywhere I go. Even if someone does get access, they won't understand my notes without me there to interpret them. But as I said, as soon as I've solved the problems in the formula, I'll make it available freely to all, so there will be no need to steal it. They reached the unit, and they were about to enter when Gavi stopped Caleb. Wait here while I change into my pajamas. Caleb nodded. She closed the door, and a few seconds later, she opened it again and handed Caleb his bag. There's a communal bathroom on the second floor. You can go change there. Caleb climbed the stairs to the second floor. The bathroom was at the other end of the corridor. Though it was late in the evening, many people were still awake, playing music, drinking, chatting, and laughing. Gavi heard a knock on the door. She was dressed in sweatpants and t-shirt, ready for bed. Coming, are you back so quick? 
She tied her hair back in a ponytail while she walked to the door. Grabbing the key from the table, she started to insert it in the deadbolt lock. With the other hand, she gripped the doorknob. But suddenly the doorknob shook as someone on the other side tried to force it, which frightened her. Who's there? The next moment the door was kicked, cracking the wood around the lock. But the lock somehow held. Gavi grabbed the chair and jammed it under the doorknob. The attacker kicked the door harder. She quickly moved all the furniture she could against the door. Go away! I have a weapon and I'll use it! Gavi grabbed a steak knife from the counter. He kicked again, breaking the lock and slightly moving the barricade. Gavi dropped to the floor and pushed with her back against the bed and her feet against the wall. She braced herself for the next blow. It was quiet for a few seconds. She strained to hear for any movement. Gavi looked up to the window on the other side of the room, concerned that the assailant might go around and try to get through there. It was still quiet. Was he gone? She released her breath. As she did, another powerful hit smashed the door. The force was so hard it managed to lift Gavi off the floor. She looked back as an arm reached in and grabbed hold of the chair wedged behind the door. Help! Security! Help me, somebody! Caleb! shouted Gavi as loud as she could. Just as suddenly, the pressure was gone, and she sank back to the floor again. She could hear footsteps as the assailant ran away. Someone must have been coming. The door handle shook again. Gavi screamed as loud as she could. Gavi, open the door! It's Caleb! She sighed with relief. With one hand, she pulled the bed and other furniture away and opened the door. Are you okay? Caleb asked, although he could see Gavi was clearly shaken. In her hand, she gripped the knife so hard her knuckles were white. He gently touched her hand and, as she relaxed, took the knife from her. What happened here? He saw the damaged doorframe. Gavi turned and went to the kitchen to calm herself. Caleb stepped back and looked up and down the alley, but it was all clear. You said there were open units? We'll find one for tonight, and tomorrow we leave. He closed the door behind them and drew his pistol from a holster. Gavi paced back and forth, shaking her head. No, no, I, I can't leave. My work isn't done. You'll have to continue your work from the lab in Jerusalem or Babel. Whoever did this will be back. I suspect Gurabians behind this. They won't stop until they have what they came for. But I'm so close and my patients are doing so well. I can't leave them now. You won't help them if you're dead or kidnapped. Well, that's why you're here, isn't it? It wasn't going to work on him again. I have no idea what I'm dealing with here or how many and I have no backup. I will get you out of this country alive, but we must leave first thing tomorrow morning. You can go. I'm staying. Damn it, Gabriella. Stop being so stubborn. I'm trying to protect you. Then protect me if you must, but don't expect me to just turn my back on everything I've worked for and to abandon my patience. Unlike some people, I don't walk out on those who trust me. That statement hit Caleb like a shot between the eyes and it pained him. This is not about me, Gavi. Our position is compromised. It's obvious your cover is blown. If Gurabian's people get hold of you and your research, they will turn it into a bioweapon and use it all over the world. Multiply what you're seeing here by hundreds of millions. And trying to save a few, you may endanger many more. Gavriella, these people are brutal. Worse than ISIS ever was. They don't care how many innocents they kill to get to you. So staying here will not only endanger you, but others as well. I failed to protect my brother and he died. I won't fail again. We will return to Babel and regroup. From there, you can contact the EA government and discuss your findings. If the president really cares about his people, like you say, he will allow you back with full support and I will bring a team. Gavi knew Caleb was right. Okay, but I need to get my files from the hospital first and leave instructions for my patient's care. It's too risky. They can't do much with those files if they don't have you. We need to leave first thing in the morning. Let's get our things and go find another unit for the night. Chapter 24, Super Soldiers Millions of balls of light descended from the sky in a flash and landed in a brutal wasteland of volcanoes. The landscape was dotted with lava lakes with scorching, stifling air filled with deadly gases. Bubbling sulfur pits and multicolored acid ponds emitted a foul stench. The lava lakes hit the faces of shadowy, contorted, hideous creatures who looked worn out, used, and cold. The intense heat of the place offered no comfort whatsoever. Caleb watched as a massive pit opened and the beings jumped in as fast as they could, shrieking with excitement as they descended. Then after several moments, they emerged from the pit as beings with a pale blue light and with a sterile and hollow beauty. They all turned to look at Caleb. Their eyes pierced him. A cacophony of sounds emerged from their lips. We are his army to command. You can't run, son of Baruch. It is your destiny to exalt him. 
Caleb started running but couldn't get away. He felt their cold, steely hands take hold of him, and they began dragging him down. He screamed, but no sound came out. He went black. Jindala, Africa. Caleb woke up screaming with pistol in hand, sweating profusely. It was just a dream. The sun had risen over Jindala, and there was already a bustle of people and traffic filling the streets. Caleb noticed Gavi was gone. She left a note. He picked it up and read, Meet me at the hospital. He jumped to his feet. No, no, no! He grabbed his bag and opened the door to the unit, which was on the second floor of the building. He saw there was a commotion in the alley and closed the door to a sliver. He saw the building's supervisor and two police officers looking at the door of Gavi's unit that had been damaged the previous night. Another police officer questioned two nurses that were working on Gavi's shift. Other doctors were talking with each other. Caleb looked through the slit of the door to make sure the coast was clear, then opened the door. Keeping as close as possible to the wall, Caleb walked briskly along the corridor toward the furthest flight of stairs and quickly made his way to the ground floor. As Caleb exited the staircase, he turned toward the road. Dr. Farouk, there you are. Caleb turned around to see who was speaking. It was one of Gavi's colleagues from the hospital. We were worried about you and Dr. Simons. Caleb turned around, trying to avoid drawing too much attention. I'm fine. Why were you worried? The doctor frowned and looked back at Gavi's unit. Weren't you with Dr. Simons last night? Somebody reported a break-in, but she was missing. Have you seen her at all today? Uh, no, I think she was going to the hospital this morning. The hospital? Oh, didn't you hear? The hospital was attacked during the night. Criminals stole some of the computers and files, killed the guards, two nurses, and some patients. Thankfully, most of them managed to get to safety, but apparently the terrorist booby-trapped a section of the hospital with explosives, so we can't go back there today until they've secured the premises. That's why the police are here to question us. Caleb was processing all the information as fast as he could. Patients were killed? Where? Was it in the trauma unit or the wards? Why does it matter? They're all... The doctor suddenly realized something. Actually, the section of the hospital that was attacked was where Dr. Simons worked. They were her patients. Caleb turned and began running toward the main road. The Spanish doctor called after Caleb. Wait! The police want to talk to you! The doctor turned back to the police. Officer, over here! When he turned back, he saw Caleb had turned the corner and was out of sight. Caleb ran down the main road to see if he could find Gavi. He lifted his phone to his face, unlocking it. He tapped a button. The caller ID on the phone read, Security HQ Babel. Hello, Caleb Baruch, answered the voice of Talos. I need a location on Gavriela Levy's phone now. Send me a live pin. A few seconds later, the pin came through. Caleb put on a pair of shades with a HUD display and, and in-ear headphones. The route map came up in the display and the audio navigation began as Caleb started running in the direction of Gavi's signal. Caleb saw an old 2010s model off-road motorcycle. He jumped on and took him a few seconds to adjust to the old tech. Just as the owner spotted him and ran toward him, he found the kickstart and stepped down on it to get the bike going. Right then, police officers and the Spanish doctor came running from the alley in pursuit. The Spanish doctor pointed Caleb out and the police ran toward him. Caleb got the bike into gear and started off down the road. He struggled a bit with the manual clutch, but before his pursuers could catch up to him, he was off, leaving them behind. The cops ran back to get their vehicles. The owner of the bike yelled at Caleb as he sped down the road. Gavi saw her phone ringing. It was Caleb. She rejected the call. It rang again. She turned it off. She then looked around the taxi van to see if anyone was staring at her. Caleb shouted into his Bluetooth mic, Dial Gavriela Levy. The call went straight to voicemail. Access Gavriela Levy's phone and activate perimeter speakers. Enhance volume. Accessing Gavriela Levy's phone, activating perimeter, replied the voice of Talos. Everyone in the taxi got a jolt as Kayla's voice came simultaneously over all the phones and car radio in the taxi. He spoke in Hebrew. Gavriela Levy, answer your phone. Gavi answered the phone. How did you do that? Actually, never mind. I told you to meet me at the hospital. I have to. Your patients have been killed, Gavi. They have your files. The hospital was attacked in the night. Gavi gasped in horror, shaking her head in disbelief. No, no. Now all they need is you. If I can find you, so can they. I'm on my way to you. You need to get off the vehicle you're in. There's a busy intersection two kilometers from where you are. Get off there and leave your phone behind. Find a spot to hide in the market somewhere out of sight. I'm on a motorbike. I'll be there in five minutes. Caleb found a gap in the traffic and opened the throttle. The police came speeding around the corner on more modern hybrid electric bikes. Caleb expertly weaved his way through traffic and pedestrians, allowing him to extend his lead from the pursuing cops. He turned off the main road and took a detour to throw them off his track. 
The van pulled over at a stop. A few people got off and two got on. Sitting on either side of Gavi, one of them was a man with a hoodie. Gavi looked around nervously. Excuse me, driver. How far to the big intersection? I want to go to the market. The driver looked at her in the mirror. You don't want to go to the hospital anymore? Uh, no, just the market. How far is it? Not far, the driver replied. He, he turned off onto a side road and started heading away from the main road. No, no, you're, you're going the wrong way. I, I want to go to the market on the main road back there. Don't worry, don't worry. I take you to a better market, better prices, the driver said laughing. He started an animated conversation with his co-driver. The man in the hoodie glanced sideways at Gavi. So did the woman on her other side, but she didn't notice. Gavi was getting anxious. No, excuse me. I want to go to another market. Please take me back. I'm meeting someone. Their conversation in the front was loud and they didn't react to her. So she wasn't sure if they heard her. Gavi lifted her phone to call Caleb. The man in the hoodie reached for her phone, but he misjudged Gavi's reaction time, which was quick, and she snapped the phone back. Caleb was speeding toward Gavi. In his HUD, he could see her tracker had changed direction away from the intersection. In the background, he heard the police sirens approaching. Overhead, he noticed a helicopter following him. He saw a covered market and cut through there. Civilians quickly moved out of the way. Caleb reached into his pocket and took out a roll of cash. He threw it in the air behind him. As it floated down, the people in the market grabbed and fought for their share, blocking the way of the pursuing cops. A woman on the other side of Gavi grabbed hold of Gavi's hand that was holding the phone. Gavi slammed her body into the woman. She saw the hooded man come at her, so she kicked her knee up and struck him in the chin. The woman grabbed at the phone again, and at that time, she succeeded. She threw the phone out the window. No! shouted Gavi as the phone smashed under the tar road. An old truck drove over it, smashing it. The locator signal on Gavi's HUD disappeared. He reached a crossroad and wasn't sure which way to turn. He looked left and right, but couldn't see anything that would help to find Gavi. The man of the hoodie managed to grab hold of Gavi's arm while the woman grabbed the other one. Gavi realized the driver was in on it because he didn't react at all to what was happening to her. Stop fighting. We don't want to hurt you, said the woman. Please stop. Gavi didn't trust them, but she stopped struggling, waiting for an opportunity to flee. In the struggle, the man's hoodie pulled back from his face. He was a young man, probably not more than 20, Gavi guessed. He carefully let go of her wrist. The young man leaned forward and spoke to the driver. Cross the intersection, turn down the next road after this one. The driver nodded. Gavi suddenly pulled her other hand loose and took a swing at Hoodie Man, who lifted his arm just in time to block the blow. Gavi kicked the driver behind the head, causing him to sideswipe another car. Aye, he shouted as he almost hit the pedestrian. Gavriella, stop, shouted the woman. Gavi turned in shock when the woman said her name. How do you know my name? We'll explain later. I'm sorry we startled you. We had to get rid of your phone and had no time to explain. They will find you. Who are... As a taxi entered the intersection, another vehicle smashed into the side of it, pushing it sideways into another taxi. When the taxi came to rest, Gavi pushed the woman off her, but she had taken the brunt of the hit. Normally, Gavi would have checked her condition, but she just wanted to get out as fast as she could. The driver was unconscious. The young man was struggling to wake up. Gavi tried to get through a smashed window when he grabbed her jacket. Wait, they're after you. We are here to help you, to take you to safety. Gavi did a quick assessment of the man's condition. His leg was pinned between two seats. She decided to help him get free. She noticed he was bleeding where a piece of metal pierced his side. As she looked through the window on the impact side, Gavi saw three men get out of the large Humvee that rammed into them. By their build and posture, it seemed they were military. The big one had dark hair and a beard, Iranian, she thought. The other two had shaved beards. Their complexions were Caucasian. Crowds began to gather around the accident site. One of the three men fired some shots into the air, causing the people to scatter in fear. Gavi's heart raced. She looked at the young man. What's your name? Yaikubu, said the young man, wincing in pain. Yaikubu, hold on. Caleb stopped the bike at the intersection. Come on, Gavi, where are you? He looked around for any clue to Gavi's location. From the next road ahead, he saw black smoke rising into the air and heard the gunshots. He spun his bike around, drew his pistol from its holster, and sped toward the smoke. Not too far above him, he saw a drone. He fired a shot at it, but missed. Gavi pushed against the seat and yanked to free Yaikubu. The assailants headed for the window. The driver came to and reached for a pistol. Shots rang out and the driver fell dead onto the steering wheel, causing the horn to sound. Gavi saw one of the assassins aim her weapon at them when another shot was fired, knocking the man back. Caleb rapidly fired shots at the assailants, fatally wounding one in the head. The other two ducked for cover and fired back. 
The bullets hit the bike. Caleb swerved and directed the bike onto the sidewalk behind the cover of parked cars. Caleb saw Gavi and Yaikubu run away from the accident site with one of the assassins in pursuit. The other assassin ran onto the sidewalk straight at Caleb, firing his weapon. One bullet grazed Caleb's shoulder. Another hit the bike's tire, causing the bike to swerve and lose control. Caleb and the bike smashed into a vegetable stand, and he lost his pistol in the process. With the shot still coming, Caleb jumped up and ran between some tin shacks for cover with the gunman in pursuit. Overhead drones tracked the action, one on Caleb and the other on Gavi. In the distance, police sirens could be heard. Caleb looked for cover from the drone. As he ran, he whipped out his baton and extended it full length. He ran down a narrow passageway between the shacks. The skinhead assassin lost sight of Caleb. He stopped and tapped on the side of his sunglasses, activating his HUD. The drone scanned the area for any sign of Caleb, but the overhanging tin roofs hid him from view. The assassin heard a sound and pointed his weapon in that direction. He moved slowly closer. The next moment, Caleb flew out from behind a shack and smacked the gun from the skinhead's hand from with his baton, and with swift moves smashed the man hard in the head, cracking his skull. Then rapid succession, his arms, knees, arm again, and full on in the face, knocking the man out. Caleb had broken the man's kneecap and forearm, neutralizing him. He quickly checked the man for any identification, but couldn't find any. He picked up the weapon and started running in Gavi's direction. As he did, he tried to arm the pistol, but it was biometrically locked and thus unusable to him. He threw it into a nearby sewer. A gunshot rang out. Caleb heard Gavi scream from beyond the shacks and he set off quickly in her direction. He ran into a dead end and had to redirect. This happened a few times and Caleb's frustration grew. He found himself in the middle of a tin shack maze with no idea how to get out. His only option was to go up on the roofs. Caleb saw a wooden crate next to one of the shacks. He ran, stepped onto the crate, and climbed onto the roof. As he began running across the rooftops, the drone locked onto him and again followed him. The skinhead woke up. His eye was bloodshot, his nose and mouth bleeding from Caleb's beating, and his hand contorted from broken bones. With his other hand, he felt his knee and winced in pain. He reached into a pocket and took out a case with an auto syringe and a vial filled with some kind of liquid. He jabbed it into his chest. His face contorted as he gritted his teeth. Arr! His eyes were wide open and the bloody-eyed pupils were fully dilated. After a few seconds, the bloody eye turned white again and his pupil constricted. His jugular veins bulged. He creaked his neck and stretched out his arms, forcefully pulling it back into place with the opposite hand. Gavi and Yaikubu tried to get away from their attacker, but he was gaining on them fast. Yaikubu was limping, which slowed them down. He pointed up the road. There, the factory! They ran into the abandoned factory. Their pursuer was about 20 paces behind them when they slammed the door shut. He kicked the door hard. They quickly locked the door from the inside. Gavi and Yakuba ran deeper into the building looking for a place to hide. Multiple shots were fired at the door lock. Caleb hopped from one rooftop to the next, making his way toward the dirt road where he had last heard Gavi. He looked over his shoulder and was stunned to see the skinhead literally bounding across rooftops at such great speed that it took Caleb off guard. The man was obviously enhanced. Caleb sped up, trying to get off the rooftop before the assassin caught up to him. He saw a gap and jumped back down between the shacks, running toward the road. Caleb zigzagged in between the shacks to try and lose him. He saw a narrow passage leading to the dirt road. He listened for the sound of footsteps on the rooftops, but there was nothing. The only sound he heard was the street noise and bleeping of taxi horns. Caleb gave a quick glance over his shoulder and then sprinted toward the street. The next moment, the skinhead flew down in front of him. Caleb swung the baton at him, but this time he was much quicker. He grabbed the baton and ripped it from Caleb's hand and in one move flipped Caleb out onto the street right in front of an oncoming SUV. Caleb jumped into the air just in time to avoid his legs being crushed by the SUV's bumper. His body slid across the hood, smashing into the windshield. He fell onto the road dazed. The assassin came charging at him. Caleb rolled onto the SUV and out the other side, buying himself a few seconds. The gathering crowd slowed the assassin down. He stormed through them to get to Caleb, shoving some of the women in the process. A teenager saw his mom fall to the ground and ran to assist her. Her head hit the ground quite hard. Mama, he shouted. She was unconscious. Mama! Caleb was on his feet, trying to gather his momentum again. But before he could run, the man was right by him. He punched at Caleb, but Caleb managed to deflect the blow, redirecting his fist through a car window. Caleb kicked the man's knee so hard that a snap was heard. He followed this up with a rapid elbow and back arm blows to the man's neck and head. Caleb twisted and locked the man's elbow in a painful grip and thrust his open palm toward the man's nose, but the skinhead grabbed his hand. 
Caleb was surprised. He twisted down hard on the other hand, but the skinhead powered through the lock grip, pulling Caleb into a forceful headbutt. Caleb slumped onto the ground. The man again snapped his knee into place and got up. Caleb saw how the cuts on the man's head healed in front of his eyes. What the? The assassin walked over to Caleb, who was still two days from the blow to resist. He grabbed Caleb in a headlock, and Caleb knew what was coming, because he had used the same grip a few times in the past to end an enemy's life. Is this how it ends? With all the strength he could muster, he threw himself back to break free, but the grip was too strong. Oh, God. As a man was about to twist Caleb's neck, a rock hit him hard in the head. He staggered back and then recovered. A second rock hit him, and then a third. An angry mob had gathered in the street, carrying sticks and stones and glass bottles. They saw the wound on the man's head heal, and for a moment they were afraid, stepping back. The teenage Swahili boy, whose mother had been hurt, pointed at her attacker. Matu Pepo! Man demon! With that, the crowd attacked. They gave Caleb the opportunity to crawl away. He wiped the blood off his nose and got up and stumbled into the direction that Gavi had fled. Behind him, the crowd was keeping the skinhead busy. Little by little, Caleb picked up speed, but was uncertain which way to go, and then saw the drone hovering above the abandoned factory. The big man walked determinedly, pistol in hand, through the factory, scanning for any sign of Gavi and Yaikubu. Gavi and a weakened Yaikubu crawled between the factory machinery as silently as they could. The big man's footsteps were slow, but the squeak of his boots was unmistakable. It wasn't clear if he was coming in their direction or moving away. They lay as still as possible. Yakubu was sweating and breathing heavily as he battled to cling to life. Gavi's hands were bloodied from trying to stop the bleeding. She put her other hand over his mouth to dampen the sound of his breathing. Gavi strained to listen for the footsteps, but couldn't hear anything. He must have gone another direction. We have to move, she whispered as softly as she could in Yakubu's ear. He shook his head. No, he's coming. We must stay here. Who's coming? Nobody knows we're here. The next moment, the big man stepped out from behind the counter they were hiding under and pointed his pistol at them. Gavi's body shuddered in fright. I need some information from you, Dr. Levy. He spoke with a strong Eastern European accent. He towered over her, and from where they were, he looked like a giant. I'm not telling you anything, she said defiantly. He fired a shot into Yakubu's knee. Ah! Yakubu writhed in pain. Gavi screamed. Next, he aimed at Yakubu's head. Please don't, Gavi pleaded. Yakubu moaned. I need the information. It wasn't on your computer or the files. Gavi looked at Yakubu, tears rolling down her face. You, you killed my patients. Why? Why couldn't you just let them live? They were doing so well. That is why. Now give it to me or he's next. If I give you the formulation, you will kill him. And if you do, I promise you will never get the formulation from me. So then you might as well shoot me too. He's here now, groaned Yakubu. Gavi looked at Yakubu, not sure what he was talking about. Hey, Bigfoot, came a voice from just out of view. The big guy swung around just in time to see a heavy steel wrench come smashing into the side of his face, then his collarbone and chest, and finally a direct blow across the jaw, knocking him out cold. Caleb, bruised and bloodied, stepped into view. Now, did you miss me? Caleb! Gavi jumped up, relieved to see Caleb, and without thinking, hugged him, causing him to groan in pain. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. How did you find us? Are you okay? I'm so sorry I didn't listen to you. I don't know who they are, but they want my formula. They've already seen my files. Caleb nodded. See, you really can't live without me. We can discuss that later, Gabby smiled, appreciating his joke. They don't want the cure to be released. That's why they've killed my patients. Who would do that? Who are these assassins working for? Caleb looked at the big guy. This is Gurabian's work. He has many labs and experts under his control, working on biological weapons for his purposes. I have seen some of those labs, and they're very sophisticated and well-funded. I'm sure he wants to weaponize your research, and it's in his interest that he be the only one that owns it. Gavi was horrified. Caleb looked down at Yakubu. Who's this? he asked in Hebrew. His name is Yakubu. They were trying to save me, I think. He needs to get to a hospital fast, or he won't make it. The woman, his friend, she was killed in the car crash. I don't know who they are and what they want, but they know who I was and where to find me. They knew someone was after me. Caleb, Yaikubu somehow knew you were coming to save us before you were anywhere to be seen. Caleb wasn't really paying attention. He was still recovering from his previous encounter and wasn't keen on dealing with that guy again. Gavi checked his arm. You need care too. It's just a bruise. I'll be fine. But we do need to get out of here. I doubt they're alone. They're not normal. The last guy was some kind of super soldier, enhanced, I don't know. I left him in worse shape than this one with broken legs and bones, but he healed and came after me. 
I could swear I saw his wounds heal. I was lucky to get away. Gavi was intrigued. They're regenerating, but how? That's what my research is about, but I'm still in the testing phase. Yakubu pointed toward the assassin. His pockets, he said in Hebrew, although he had a heavy accent. They were surprised that he knew Hebrew. Caleb checked the man's pockets and found a preloaded auto pen busted from the blow to his chest. What's this? Strength medicine. It makes them stronger. Caleb handed it to Gavi. Super soldier serum? So that's the difference, said Gavi. It's not a genetic transformation. It's a pharmaceutical intervention. It acts more like a sort of super steroid that temporarily speeds up the body's healing capabilities and boosts the muscle function. But I suspect the effects will not last very long and that repeated use will damage the organs, which would explain why Gurabin wants your research. Yakubu groaned and passed out for a few seconds. Caleb, he's getting weaker. We need to get him to a hospital now. Okay, let me help you. Caleb helped Yakubu up. They were about to move when the skinhead burst through the front door. Caleb's heart sank. Oh no, here we go again. He looked at Gavi. Look for a back door. I'll deal with him. But how? Just go now. Caleb looked around. The skinhead was running full speed toward him. Caleb dove down behind the workbench next to the big guy. He put the man's pistol in his palm to activate the biometrics and while gripping the hand and pistol, swung around just in time to fire into the skinhead's chest. He staggered back. Caleb fired again and the man dropped to one knee. His eye turned bloodshot red again. His strength sapped. He slumped forward and Caleb noticed he clutched his chest. The next moment he sat up again, pulling another syringe from his chest. Caleb shook his head. He fired a shot and it hit the man right between the eyes. For a moment, the wound began to heal, but the man was dead. He dropped back onto the floor. As Caleb got up, the big guy began stirring. Oh no, you don't. He smashed the big man hard in the back of the head with the butt of the pistol. His first instinct was to neutralize him for good, but the idea of killing someone who's not fighting back just didn't sit well with him. Caleb stepped over the assassins and began walking toward the rear of the building when a drone came flying toward him. He saw four more assassins enter the building, so he turned and immediately dashed for the rear exit. They saw Caleb began firing at him, narrowly missing. Two of the hitmen pulled away from the rest of the team and pursued Caleb. With the speed at which they were running, it was obvious they had also taken the shot. Caleb sprinted through the doorway and slammed it shut behind him. He looked around for something to jam the door. Behind him, he saw a beam that could work. He quickly picked it up and turned back to jam it against the door. Bullets came firing through the door at a rapid rate. Caleb jumped back to get out of the way. As he was about to run away, he became dizzy and his vision blurred and grew darker. The world was spinning. As he was losing consciousness, he perceived two glowing figures. Then he blacked out. Chapter 25 White House Visitors Washington, D.C., USA What the? During his ten years in the Secret Service, Commander Luis Ramirez had seen a lot of weird things, but never two guys materializing in front of him. He quickly did a self-check. No, he had not been sleeping on the job, nor had he ever. They really did materialize in front of his eyes. He quickly snapped out of his introspection. His job was to protect the president, and something was terribly off. Freeze! Hands in the air! The two saw him coming and raised their hands, more as if pointing to the sky than giving up. They both started speaking, one in Hebrew, Baalish pota aretz im tzvao miktze hashemaim lechabel haaretz tzeu mi bavel ten tikhu me matkoteha. The other spoke in English. He is coming to judge the earth with his army from the end of heaven to destroy the land. Come out of Babel, lest you receive her plagues. They kept repeating their warning. Ramirez radioed his team. We have two unknowns just outside the White House lawn perimeter. They are strangely dressed, carrying walking sticks. They appear unarmed and are speaking in English and another language. Their intentions are unclear. By now the media had been alerted and passersby were streaming on social media with their smartphones. Soon more agents and a SWAT team showed up and completely encircled the two. Commander Ramirez shouted instructions to lay down, but the two ignored him. Not wanting to kill the two and create an unnecessary media frenzy, the SWAT team threw in tear gas. Immediately a vortex formed in the sky and traveled down to the ground in an instant, creating a small tornado over the canister of tear gas. The tornado sucked the fumes into the sky. The two kept repeating their message. Surprised that the gas was gone and had nothing to stop them, Ramirez shot a bullet into the grass to show the two the danger they faced if they did not comply. They ignored it all. Come out of Babel. After a few moments, two agents set up a fire hose with enough pressure to easily knock over a horse and sprayed it at the two. 
Without explanation, the powerful stream was redirected upward and fell as rain on the SWAT team and Secret Service agents. The crowd laughed in shock. This is your final warning. On the ground now or we'll open fire, Ramirez shouted in exasperation. When no response came, he nodded to two of his men, who then each fired a single shot. The bullets came up to the two and then stopped midair and innocently fell to the ground. Even more shocked and angered, the commander shouted, Open fire! A barrage of bullets sailed in from every direction toward the two. Each bullet came close to the two and then fell to the ground. Suddenly the sky grew ominously dark. Thunder clapped ferociously in large chunks of hail the size of golf balls fell only on the SWAT team, clobbering their helmets and vests. Every man's gun fell, and slowly each man sank to the ground, overwhelmed by the impact of the hail. The eyes of millions of people were watching in bewilderment over the live stream broadcast. Reporters with their hair in disarray from the wind seemed to be shouting into their mics and pointing up. Just then, the creaking of a SWAT tank reverberated through the air. The earth trembled from the 40 tons of steel that lumbered toward the two. The SWAT team moved aside so the tank could come right up close to the two. The tank driver had orders from Ramirez to run them over, though of course he hoped they would move and surrender. Ramirez and the team turned their heads in response to an immense and sudden buzzing sound. They looked up and saw a swarm of millions of hornets that descended upon them and covered the small windshield of the tank, rendering it impossible for the driver to see through and continue. The driver stopped and threw open the hatch, launching himself up and out of the tank as fast as he could to flee from the hornets, which had found their way inside the tank through the gun turret and other openings. He and the entire SWAT team were flailing every which way, trying to get away from the swarm. The two remained unmoved. They came from behind the two. Then coming from behind the two, a stealth Apache helicopter came around a corner in an attempt to mount a surprise attack against the unwanted messengers. Laser dots appeared on their backs, and the helicopter launched two Hydra 72.75-inch laser-guided rockets. They flew with precision and dynamic speed. However, the tens of thousands of hailstones which had hit the SWAT team levitated off the ground and flew with greater speed, some to one rocket and the rest to the other. The enormous hail clusters hit the bellies of the rockets, causing them to veer into an upward spiral so that one was circling the other like a double helix, getting closer until they careened into each other and exploded at a thousand feet in altitude. Without warning, multiple strikes of lightning rained down on the helicopter, followed by hail the size of footballs. The lightning struck the engines and electronics. The hail smashed the blades, causing the helicopter to fall like a rock. The pilots thought their death was imminent. Then the swarm of millions of hornets swooped up the underside of the craft, slowing it and gently setting it down like a mother puts a baby in a crib. At that point, the crowd cheered. They loved the show the two were putting on. The National Guard had been mobilized, along with all available police in the area. The event was turning into a national crisis and a national embarrassment. The United States would never negotiate with terrorists, and today would be no exception. Dozens of giant green military trucks with their four-foot diameter knobby tires descended upon the scene. They came to a stop, and the voice of sergeants could be heard barking orders. Go, go, go! Soon there were hundreds of heavily armored and well-armed National Guardsmen with rifles trained on the two. The two stood motionless and unfazed. A captain lifted a bullhorn to his mouth. This is your last chance. Lie down on the ground with your hands in front of you. The captain motioned to his first squadron of about 50 men to move in to sequester the two. The two nodded to one another. The soldiers in the front line threw down their weapons, began taking off their helmets, loosening the straps of their body armor, removing their flak jackets, shirts, boots, and pants until they were only dressed in their underwear. The crowd roared with laughter. The soldiers lay down on the ground on their stomachs with their hands in front of them. They began repeating the same message in Hebrew and in English that the two had been speaking. The captain ordered all of his several hundred men to fire at will, but it was too late. They too were already removing their clothing and assuming the same position on the ground and announcing the same message. The swarm of millions of hornets hovered in the sky, and each of the hornets acted like a pixel on a television screen that formed a human face. The mouth began to move, and inflections in the wings created a strange metallic-sounding voice. It synchronized with the soldiers who were speaking the message of the two in unison. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the king. He is coming to judge the earth. It will be a terrible day of fury and anger. The heavens will be black, and no light will shine from stars or sun or moon. He will crush the arrogant. Do not make lies your refuge, and do not hide under falsehoods. 
Humble yourselves before him, or he will cause the rain to stop, turn water to blood, and strike the earth with plagues at will, come out of Babel before it is too late. Ramirez thought this was his moment. While the two were preoccupied with their insects and message, his anger was boiling over because they had embarrassed him in front of his men, the president, and now, with hundreds of cell phones recording the entire world, he snatched a machine gun out of the hands of one of the SWAT members and opened fire on the two. In his haste to get revenge, he failed to see a female reporter had also decided this was a suitable time to try to get close to the two for an exclusive interview. The spray of bullets was heading directly for the woman. With lightning reflexes, both of the two quickly pushed her behind them and the bullets hit their bodies. Like before, the bullets merely fell to the ground, as if the two were covered in some kind of body armor from head to toe. Both narrowed their eyes, focusing on Ramirez. They looked determined, but somehow full of compassion. Without moving their lips or opening their mouths, they spoke directly into his mind. How long will you sit on the fence? Decide where your allegiance lies. You can't be hot and cold at the same time. Then they spoke audibly in unison. He's coming with fire in his eyes. Their words acted like an energy weapon that lifted Ramirez up and threw him 20 feet through the air. The gun flew out of his hands and he lay stunned on the ground. One of them called out, Today you have a choice between life and death, between prosperity and plagues. I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Choose life and live. This time the crowd did not cheer. The crowd exploded into a cacophony of dissenting voices. The two walked straight ahead. A dimensional portal opened before them and they disappeared into it. Another reporter was on the scene interviewing people who had witnessed what had happened. He was surrounded by a crowd of people who each wanted to give their impression. They're holy men. We need to listen to their message, one man exclaimed. Holy, another person contradicted. Did you not hear them? They threatened our way of life. They said there'll be no rain if we don't give in to their demands. They're not holy or peaceful. They're terrorists, plain and simple. Another reporter spoke into her microphone. We have just gotten reports that the two are now in Moscow, apparently giving a similar message in Hebrew and in Russian. Ramirez was still lying on the ground. He realized he had landed gently, too gently, in fact. He had trained countless hours, even sparring with a friend who had knocked him over with more force. Yet these two had thrown him 20 feet through the air, and they had put him down like fine china. The soft landing was impossible. Everything that had just happened was impossible. Then he noticed that he didn't even feel the constant back pain he had felt for the past eight years. He had learned to live with it, even with drugs. The best he had been able to do was to numb it, but he had never truly had a moment without it. He put his hand on his back, feeling the place where he usually felt the most intense pain. There was nothing, no discomfort, no pain. He couldn't believe it. Who were these two, and what was this message they were bringing? Who was the king they had spoken of? How had they appeared and disappeared? What were they calling America to do? Suddenly it all made sense. He had more clarity of mind than he had ever had in his entire life. He thought back to his days growing up with his grandmother. She had taught him about this day. He knew whom they served. He decided he should go home, spend time with his family, and rethink where his allegiance truly lay. Chapter 26. Friend or Foe Caleb Baruch. Caleb opened his eyes. It took him a few minutes to focus. Where... Where am I? The first thing he saw was the smiling face of an African woman in her late fifties. She was dressed in a bright yellow traditional robe and headscarf. She looked dignified in appearance with a strong but calm appearance. Caleb sat up slowly. He was sitting on a grass mat under a stretched canvas awning. It was attached to a building that resembled an old school. In the open area in front of the building, children were running around in the dust, kicking an old soccer ball toward lopsided goals built from not-so-straight tree branches. He looked back at the smiling woman. Who are you? How, how did I get here? Where's Gavi? The woman laughed. They brought you here, but my, my, you have a lot of questions, son of Baruch. Don't worry. Soon you will have more, she laughed loudly, reveling in the humor of her statement with her bright smile contrasting against her dark skin. Come then, let us try and get you some answers for those questions. Gavrielle is safe. I'll take you to her. She turned around and walked into the building. Caleb looked around, completely confused, trying to make sense of everything. He considered whether he should follow. Heavy raindrops began to fall, and a few seconds later, the skies opened up. The children laughed and screamed as they ran to get out of the rain. Caleb got up and ran into the building. The former school building was now residential dormitories. 
Makeshift curtains divided the classrooms into family quarters. People went about their daily business, some preparing food, others doing laundry. Children played. Nobody seemed threatened or alarmed by Caleb's presence. Amansa, Amansa, shouted someone from behind Caleb. A boy about 10 years old came hobbling along the hallway, one knee bent with the kneecap bleeding. My leg is broken. Amansa turned around. Oh no, Pele, look how you're bleeding all over my clean floor. But my leg, protested the boy. Your leg is not broken. It's just another bad cut. You were trying those football tricks again, weren't you? Go to nurse Mina. She will pray with you and fix you up. And when you're done there, come clean up this mess, she said in a mock angry voice. Yes, Amansa, said the boy, looking even more wounded as he left, hoping to get some sympathy from someone. Amansa laughed. Maybe he will be a good soccer player after all. Aye, that boy. His hero is Pele, the old soccer legend from Brazil, which is why everyone now calls him Pele. He always tries those dangerous tricks, just like the original Pele. He is one of our gifts. Gifts? Yes, Wamilele's gifts. These are children who have no families but have been adopted by the community here. We don't use the word orphans because we are their family. They walked down a hallway. In one room, Caleb saw a group of people busy with some kind of prayer service. Some had their eyes closed and their hands raised. Others were speaking loudly in various languages and others were singing. In the middle of the room, a young woman was writing in a notebook as someone else described something to her. What are they doing? asked Caleb. A brother is in serious need of intervention right now, and they will petition Wamelele until the outcome is clear. They passed another exit door with a view to the other side of the building. Caleb peered out and saw a whole settlement of tents and informal housing. Caleb wasn't sure. Was he in a dream state, or was it all real? There was a strange sense of peace in this place and among these people. Are these people all part of the community? Caleb asked. Yes, they come from all over Africa. Many of them are survivors of wars and persecution for their faith, and they have lost everything. They heard the call and came to join us here until the regathering. And who is Wamilele? Caleb asked, just as a man came running down the hallway, calling to Amansa. Amansa, Yakubu is not doing well. Come quick. Amansa sped up and headed for the infirmary at the end of the corridor. Caleb followed close behind. They entered a makeshift clinic with some beds and basic medical supplies. Caleb saw Gavi busy operating on Yaikubu's wound. A few people were assisting her. Her hands and clothes were bloody from Yaikubu's wounds. Yaikubu's mother, an elderly woman, was crying as she saw him fighting for his life. She clasped her hands together in prayer. Gavi was desperately trying to save Yaikubu. She spoke to the man assisting her. Put pressure here. I need anesthetic and something to close this wound or he will bleed out. Quickly. The man handed her a bandage and shrugged his shoulders. There was no anesthetic. Gavi looked around and saw Caleb. He could see in her eyes that she wasn't expecting a good outcome. Amansa stepped forward and took Yaikubu's hand. Her eyes and Gavi's eyes met. Gavi shook her head, indicating that Yaikubu wasn't going to make it. Amansa turned to him. She closed her eyes for a few seconds and then looked down at him again. Amansa placed her hand on the wound in his leg and the other hand on the wound on his side. Yaikubu, stand up. Stand up. Rise and be healed. Gavi was taken aback by Amansa's commands. No, stop that. He, he can't. He's dying. The hemorrhaging stopped. Vitals came back to normal. And in a few moments, he regained consciousness and opened his eyes. Yaikubu lifted himself up onto his elbows. Gavi was shocked. The other people in the room moved closer. Yaikubu looked around the room. He slowly got up into a sitting position and then stood up. Everybody rejoiced. Yaikubu's mother lifted her hands in gratitude and embraced her son. Gavi was stunned. That's impossible. That, it's impossible. The man who had called them in the corridor ran to spread the good news. Another couple came running into the room. Yaikubu! Yaikubu looked up and saw the parents of the girl who had been with him in the taxi. He and the girl had been friends since childhood. To him, she was more than a friend, although he had never expressed that to her. Nervously, the mother approached him as the room grew silent. Marie? Yaikubu's smile faded to sorrow. We were rammed by a car. Then we had to leave quickly, and I left her behind. I think she was... Tears welled up in his eyes. Amansa teared up, too. The mother groaned in agony. Some of the others gathered around her began to comfort her. The father tried to be strong, but his body quivered. Then his chin shook at the news of his daughter's passing. Caleb and Gavi looked at each other, trying to comprehend what they were experiencing in this strange place. 
Caleb and Gavi, along with Yakubu Amansa and the two others, were gathered in a small meeting hall. You have many questions, I know. I'm not sure. I will answer them all. But you need to know we mean you no harm. You are safe here. Caleb started. I don't know where here is. Who are you people? One moment I'm being chased by super thugs, and the next I wake up here. How did that happen? Gavi pointed to Yakubu and quizzed. How did you heal him? Did you somehow inject him with the serum without me seeing? Amansa lifted her hands. She waited for them to settle down. You have heard my name is Amansa, and you know Yaikubu. I sent him and Marie to find Gabriella. Marie was like a daughter to me. Amansa's eyes glistened with tears as she smiled through sadness. I am so sorry, said Gabi. Marie was prepared. She told me a few days ago that time was short and change was coming. When I received the news, I realized she was referring to herself. She died trying to help me. I, I, I didn't know. If only I hadn't struggled with her, how can you be so peaceful about it? Because it isn't the end for Marie. We will be reunited soon in the rising. Her work is complete, but Yakubu still has work to do. I know it will be difficult for you to understand my words now, but in time you will. Poverty and famine had swept across Africa. Governments collapsed. Unpaid militaries transformed into rogue militias. Their commanders became warlords, and each one was crueler than the next, with no one to keep them in check. Wars were fought over territories, tribal affiliations, resources, and even water. But no matter who was fighting, the innocent were affected the most, especially those who tried to assemble and live as communities. Spiritual leaders were brutally murdered, often in front of their families or congregations, as an example to others. So we learn to live our lives day by day with no demand on tomorrow. Tomorrow belongs to Wa Milele, Amansa concluded. Gavi had tears in her eyes. Even Caleb, who had seen the realities of war, was affected. I cannot even imagine going through that, said Gavi. Amansa didn't say anything, but the wash of pain in her eyes answered for her. Like Marie, we know that not all of us will make it to the end, but we are not afraid. So how did all these refugees end up here? Caleb asked. They were led, as was I, and we found a refuge here in Jindala, thanks to the president. He is remnant too, you know. He has also met them. Caleb was surprised at this information. He thought Remnant was nothing more than a game. I, I don't understand. What do you mean, led? Who led you all here? Who are they? Zahara, can you explain to our guests? Zahara, who had been standing in the hallway, curious about the two newcomers, stepped up to the front. She explained that in her dream, she saw the path she should take to come to the compound. Caleb listened skeptically as she retold her strange experience with the orbs and the tall beings. Zahara then shared a starting conclusion. I think one of them took eggs from me while the other stared deep into my eyes. He was probing my mind. Somehow he communicated to me that my sacrifice would help save humanity. They want to create a mixed race as an insurance policy. Mixed race? Gavi tried to clarify. Amansa thought for a moment how to best translate the words Zahara had told him. Hmm, when two different seeds are put together. Gavi immediately responded, hybrids. Caleb was shocked. Suddenly, his search for Garabian started to feel like a wild goose chase. Or the more rational explanation was this simple village girl from a third world country had just had a seizure and her mind made up the fanciful details. Theron had demonstrated that the UFOs and the beings associated with them were here to help us, not sacrifice us. So how did it end? Caleb challenged. Zahar explained and Amansa then translated back to Caleb. She doesn't know, but she thinks two glowing men somehow interrupted the tall beings and then transported her to us. She looked at Caleb, who had a look of disbelief on his face. You are looking for an explanation that fits in your worldview. You don't believe in such metaphysical things, yet you've had many dreams lately where you felt like you were losing your mind. But you've not spoken to anyone about them, have you, Caleb? Caleb was caught completely off guard by the question. He had been interrogated by enemies occasionally in the war field. They could try to get into his mind, but his training had prepared him well. But how could she know his dreams? Dreams that are so real it's hard to distinguish them from reality. You're fighting it, but you know you can't. A time is coming when those dreams will visit you in your waking, not only in your sleeping. You need to pay attention. Wa Milele, the Eternal One, is speaking to you, Amansa said. Caleb had read about mentalism, in which practitioners demonstrated highly developed mental or intuitive abilities such as hypnosis, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, psychokinesis, mind control, and more. 
While those skills were impressive, they were just that, developed skills, tricks. Hamansa was just incredibly good at reading people's body language, intonations, and other subliminal clues, as well as understanding other psychological principles. To the primitive and uneducated, it could seem like magic or like their god, Wamelele's power. Just then, Marie came running through the door. Everyone looked at her as if she were a ghost. Marie? Even Amansa was shocked to see her. But you are... you were dead. I don't know if I was dead. Mawilele's two messengers came and healed me. Amansa was speechless, as were all the others. Caleb and Gavi's faces turned white. Marie said, with Mawilele, all things are possible. After several moments of trying to come to grips with her appearance, everyone there broke into song and revelry. Caleb looked over at Gavi to read her reaction, but he couldn't say for sure whether she bought it or not. He could not yet explain what had happened to Yaikubu's wounds back in the infirmary, but there had to be a logical explanation for it all, much like the healing of the super soldiers. Even Marie's supposed death must have been a misunderstanding. She had been knocked unconscious, but not killed. Caleb had times in the field when he thought a soldier was gone, but he revived after a few moments. A good knock to the head could lay someone out cold for quite a while. These fake miracles had always been a highly effective way to deceive and legitimize a religious movement, especially with vulnerable people desperate for hope. He wasn't fooled, but he had more important questions that needed answering. Caleb was still not exactly clear on how he and Gavi came to this fanatical religious cult compound, protected by the president of the East African Republic. What power did Amansa hold over the president's decision-making? Was she the reason the EAR had resisted the Babel Initiative? Did she have something to do with the plague? Amansa was very persuasive and obviously good at reading people, a skill often employed by cult leaders and religious fanatics to manipulate their followers. Caleb felt his hatred of religion well up in him again. These people might be nicer than Amir Atta, but they could still be just as dangerous in the end. Caleb rolled his eyes. Enough of that. You still haven't told me how I got here and why your people came after Gavriella. You said the president is a remnant. Is he also a member of your cult um, community? Is this the only base like this one or are there others? Are you working with the two strangers? Don't give me the runaround again. I need straight answers. Gavi's dissatisfaction beamed from her face to Caleb. Amansa, what Caleb is trying to say to ask is this. Can you please help us understand what is going on here? We do not mean to offend your, she searched for a kind word, your faith, but there's a lot that doesn't make sense. Amansa smiled and offered, Don't worry, Gabriella, and yes, Caleb, I owe you some answers. Dr. Levy, we have been observing you since you came to Jindala. He led us to you. We know about your work at the hospital and that you are working on a cure for the outbreak. Some of our people have family members who work on staff at the hospital. Last night, Yakubu saw a few young thugs trying to break into your room. Yakubu nodded. I ran to get help, but when I returned with the security guard, they were gone, he said. We knocked on your door, but you weren't there. Initially, I thought it was a random crime, but when we heard there was an attack at the hospital, we knew it was related because the only computers that were taken were from your office. Amansa nodded. We realized you were in danger. The thugs that tried to attack you last night were local gangsters, extremely dangerous, likely hired by someone to get you. If they had managed to enter your room, you would have been kidnapped. The people who hired them were likely the same people who came after you today. Yakubu and Marie were trying to bring you to safety. Caleb rolled his eyes. If they have Gavi's files, why would they need her? They need my formulation, which I haven't documented anywhere, Gavi answered. It's a habit I learned years ago at college and some of my research was plagiarized. I always commit key information to memory. But how they knew it wasn't all in the files, I don't know. You would need someone with advanced knowledge and insight into molecular biology and immunology to even be able to understand it, let alone apply it. They had to know what they were looking for. Caleb had interrogated many people over the years, and one thing he learned was to always come back to the part of the question that was not answered. Most often, the truth could be found right there. We were being pursued by super assassins. Where did they go? What happened to them? Yakubu seemed to have knowledge of the serum they were using. How? Are you using the same serum to regenerate your wounded? You keep saying that you were led here, or led to find Gavriella. By whom? Who is feeding you intel? Please don't tell me it was dreams. Was it government intelligence? And how are you connected? Mansa had a calm face, completely unaffected by Caleb's tone. 
Dreams and visions aren't the only ways he communicates. Sometimes his voice speaks directly into our souls, other times through sent ones. He speaks through nature as well, sometimes through the two. Mostly he speaks through the ancient texts he left us. When you have learned to recognize Wa'amilele's voice, you'll hear it, no matter where it comes from. But yes, dreams are an important part of that. It has become more so in recent times. Caleb shook his head. He was about ready to walk out because of all this religious mumbo-jumbo. Amansa closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Last night I had a dream. There was a voice, a woman's voice. Caleb rolled his eyes, shook his head, and sighed, Here we go again. Kof Katan, was that what she said a few times? Isn't that Hebrew? Caleb froze when he heard her say that. Yes, it is, replied Gavi. It means little monkey. Little monkey, Amansa laughed. Ah, that makes sense now. In the dream, I saw a little curly-haired boy swinging from tree branches and running off and leaping off walls. There was a lot of laughter, but then a pitch-black crow flew in and stole the laughter. The voice was gone. The little boy was instantly a man, still jumping and swinging even higher than before, but without the laughter. The crows were circling him, waiting for him to fall and die so they could pick at his corpse. At that moment, a powerful eagle swooped down and the crows scattered. That was the dream, and I know it means something. The man in that dream should have died many times already. He lives a dangerous life, but he's protected. He has a purpose to fulfill. Caleb, son of Baruch, hate is a strange companion, at once both an ally and a foe. Like burning coals, it draws from the flames that ignite it, growing in its destructive potential, biding its time. And then when it burns hottest, it unleashes that power onto whatever it touches. All the while, as it burns, it is dying consumed by the very force that fuels it, until in the end nothing of its former state remains but ashes and dust. If you are not careful, your hate will consume you. Caleb could feel the blood rush to his face, but he didn't react. Amansa continued, Then there's the young doctor who wants to conquer death itself because she also has lost someone dear. She has faith in no one but herself. Gavi wasn't comfortable with where the conversation was going. Was that a dream too? No, it's something I perceive. I've learned to trust those insights, too. I know it's hard for scientific or analytical minds such as yours to understand, but it is real. We don't have special abilities or powers, but we trust the one who does, and we allow him to do his work through us. Amansa looked at Caleb. You've seen too many things recently to dismiss what I'm saying, haven't you? Even though you struggle to accept what you've witnessed here in your spirit, you know it's true. In times to come, you will encounter much more than this, this is only the beginning. You still haven't answered my question about the assassin and the serum, Caleb interrupted, visibly annoyed by her religious lecture. We've encountered them before. Foreign agents organized a coup and overthrew our government. That's when the assassins came. They have been difficult to stop because of the serum. They attacked at a public ceremony and killed all the president's guards and were about to kill the president when the two messengers appeared. Amansa paused and chuckled. Oh my... Those super soldiers were no match for them, she beamed. All the attackers were killed instantly, in full view of thousands of witnesses. They saved you as well, Caleb. Oh, so you are working with the two, just as we thought, Caleb blurted. Namely, he couldn't believe that he was so unprofessional as to actually let that slip out. He was a trained professional soldier. He'd gone through years of training to not let such things happen, even under pressure. With her knowledge of his dreams and intimate memories, Amansa's religious opium had struck a nerve. He didn't know how she did it, but he would find out some reasonable answer. Caleb's phone rang. It was from an emergency number to which only two people had access, Caleb's father and Brigadier Doron, and was only used in absolute emergency situations. Caleb excused himself and left the room. Hello, Abba? Yes, I'm safe. What's wrong? Gavi had more questions to ask Amansa. Amansa, do you know anything about the outbreak? I'm not sure. Maybe you noticed something strange about the virus when you studied it. There were witnesses who testified that they saw shipping containers enter the country and mysterious cargo being offloaded. Not long after, the outbreak happened. The government believes it was a biological attack, but they have not been able to prove it, and they don't have clarity on the origins. That is why they don't trust the international agencies who have offered to come to here to help. Some of these very agencies could be behind the attack. Caleb came running into the room. We have to leave now. Asher was attacked and is unconscious in the hospital. Amansa, we need to get to the extraction point. Is there someone who can transport us? I'll have someone drive you now. 
Chapter 27, Wounded Soldiers, Jerusalem, Israel Caleb walked up to the nurse's station at Sharei Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem. A nurse pointed him down the passage to a waiting area outside of Asher's room. Seated there were Eitan and Ava. Ava's makeup was smudged from crying. Eitan saw Caleb and gave him a long hug. How is he? Eitan looked tired. His shoulders were sunken. It was like he carried the weight of the world. He's been in surgery for the last four hours. We're waiting to hear what the doctor says. Eitan's lips began to quiver, his voice constricted as he said, He looks really bad. He's such a good boy. Why would anybody want to hurt him? Ava looked up. I told you, I didn't want him staying in that place. It's a dangerous neighborhood. He should have been staying with us. She sobbed into her hands. Eitan put his hand on her shoulder. I don't understand it. Caleb was angry at whoever had done this. The doctor walked into the waiting room. Eitan and Ava stood to their feet. Prime Minister, Mrs. Baruch, the surgeon went as well as we could have hoped. We managed to stop the hemorrhaging, which was good. There is still considerable damage and swelling on the brain and some of the vital organs. Eitan needed more information, so he asked, But he'll recover. He's going to recover, right? When will he wake up? Your son is still in a coma. We're hopeful. But I can't promise anything. I'm not going to lie to you. His condition remains serious. We'll do everything we can for him. Ava tried to keep her emotion in check, but had to ask, How serious? What are you saying, doctor? He might die? That is a possibility, yes. Or he may have permanent brain damage. We can't say for sure at this stage, but while he's alive, there's hope. They were both breathless, like someone had punched them in the stomach. The doctor tried to be as sensitive as possible. He's in a post-op recovery room now. I'll allow you to see him for a few minutes, if you wish. Eitan nodded slowly. They entered Asher's room. He was hooked up to life support equipment. His face was swollen and badly bruised. An IV drip hung from a pole. The rhythmic breathing of the respirator offered little hope. Ava held Asher's hand against her forehead, trying to fight back her tears, but failing. Eitan's eyes were also red. Caleb clenched his jaw. He was boiling with rage. He would find the ones responsible and make them pay. He slipped out of the room and briskly walked down the hospital corridor. His attention was on his phone as he scrolled down the contacts to Malcolm Seeger's corporate contact. He glared at his phone and didn't notice the elderly gentleman in front of him. Caleb bumped right into him, dropping his phone. Oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry, said the man. Caleb picked up his phone and didn't even acknowledge the man. Hello, Caleb. Caleb stopped and turned around. Professor Emmett, how is Asher? Not too good. What do the neighbors tell you? Chaim's head dropped. He was shaking as he shared his news. Asher was attacked by some men in suits. If it wasn't for an off-duty police officer on the same floor, they might have killed him. The officer wounded one, but they got away. They were looking for something. I think it's best that we talk about it at my house. There's a lot you need to know. Suddenly the ground beneath him started quaking so violently it toppled coffee cups and clipboards into the nurse's station. Quake subsided after a second or two. The sound of a car and house alarms, dogs barking and people shouting could be faintly heard coming from outside the hospital. The power shut off and the hospital went dark, except for the light coming in from the noonday sun. Caleb ran back to Asher's room. By then, the emergency generator had kicked on, providing power to the most critical life-saving machines. His parents were still there, and they indicated Asher was stable. Then the emergency lights clicked on as well. He went out and joined Chaim, who was helping some of the nurses clean up their stations. Tell me why the power is out. Chaim looked at him with a serious face. It's the two. That small quake was a warning. The world needs to surrender. If not, I'm afraid that to say that more will be coming, and much worse than that. They are not who you think. Just then, the power came on. Computers and monitors beeped. The air conditioner whooshed to life again. The TV in the waiting room reset, and on the screen, an international reporter was standing in the old city. About 30 minutes ago, we happened to be at the Jaffa Gate of the old city of Jerusalem when the 6.2 earthquake shook the city. The epicenter was the Temple Mount. Shortly thereafter, sounds of explosions and gunfire began erupting from there. Witnesses have reported seeing some kind of confrontation between the two strangers and the Israeli government. Caleb looked at Chaim, surprised. How did you know that? Was he with Remnant? Was he a supporter of Gurabin and the two? Could the Muslim myths of the Mahdi be correct? 
Is there a link between the two and Gurabin? It would explain so much. He turned back to the news on the TV and saw scenes from various incidents around the world involving the same two. Caleb's eyes widened. They were definitely the ones he saw in Hermon. A SWAT unit attempting to neutralize them was hit by a gale force wind, sending vehicles and men sliding across the ground and flying through the air, smashing into buildings. The camera zoomed in on one of the men. He gestured toward the sky, speaking passionately about something, but the camera was too far away to pick up the sound. The reporter continued, They seem to have the ability to control the elements, wind, temperature, hail, lightning, even earthquakes. Just today in Russia, a Spesna's unit was instantly wiped out by fire that came from who knows where. We have burned victims here as well. We did see the UFOs not too long ago. Could these two strangers be hostile aliens who want to destroy Therian's Babel initiative? Suddenly the hospital doors flung open with nurses wheeling in gurneys with wounded Israeli soldiers and police officers. There were two, then six, a dozen, and they kept coming. Soon the entire ward was full of soldiers. Some of the wounded were completely wrapped in burn dressing. The ER had run out of bed, so this wing of the hospital was being used as a triage unit. Dr. Shem Tov, the PR called. Dr. Shem Tov to ICU, stat. Dr. Shem Tov walked in quickly. Give me an update. He barked at the nurse on duty. No fatalities, but many in critical condition. Caleb looked around at the wounded soldiers. He was stunned. He knew some of the soldiers and policemen on those gurneys. He walked up to one of the injured. It was Sergeant Barak. They had served together on a number of missions. Barak was conscious and in pain. How are you? I'll make it, Baruch Hashem, he thanked God. They appeared out of nowhere and started demanding allegiance to El Yon and calling for us to stay out of Babel. Any civilians injured? Barak shook his head. They just reacted to soldiers and police. The more we tried to shut them down, the bigger the scale of their response got. In fact, a little kid was at the wall and got in between us. I don't know how, but their energy weapon completely bypassed him and hit me instead. This is nuts. First UFOs, now this. The last time he had witnessed a scene like that was during the war. Caleb could fear his anger rise to the surface. How dare they attack Israel? Muslim Mahdi, aliens or whatever, he put a stop to them. The natural light in the hospital began to dim. Caleb looked at the window where Chaim was standing. He walked over to him and they stared out the window. An eerie darkness was spreading out across Jerusalem's blue skies. It was only afternoon. It reminded him of the full eclipse he had seen a decade earlier. Yet this darkness came much faster. He waited several minutes, thinking the eclipse would pass, but it didn't. It only got darker and darker. Now it was completely dark, like a moonless night. He turned back to the TV and the same reporter continued, As you can see, it is in the middle of the day in Jerusalem. We were able to capture the event on camera. The video showed a black spot in the sky directly above the Temple Mount. It formed in the sky and then spread out in every direction. The studio then cut to a satellite view of Earth, showing a strange phenomenon as darkness was spreading over the Middle East and parts of Europe. Meteorologists have no explanation for what the world is witnessing. The reporter put her hand onto her ear to listen to incoming communications from the studio. We just learned that the darkness has spread as far as Babel. Inexplicably, this darkness remains over almost a third of the planet, yet in other areas where it is still day, they are reporting daylight. Suddenly, an ultra-Orthodox Israeli ran in front of the camera shouting, The plagues of Egypt have returned! Moshe and Eliyahu have come! The reporter stepped aside and the cameraman turned the camera while the rest of their team got the man under control. We apologize for that, the reporter said, slightly shaking, but continuing... Apparently that man is likening this phenomenon to one of the mythological ten plagues as stated in their holy book. She paused a minute considering the correlation. In any event, she continued, the lack of sunlight is already causing huge problems in regions that are now reliant on solar power as their main source of energy. It is unclear at this stage whether any governments are going to heed this demand, but for the most part these events seem to have strengthened the unity of the nations allied to the New World Council, rather than weakening it. I know everyone is praying for a solution, a savior who can defeat these enemies of humanity. Caleb ran out of the hospital, hailed a taxi, and sped toward the old city. He might not be a savior, but oftentimes one man could make the difference. New Babel Therian looked out the window of his office near the top of the Babel Tower and saw the darkness flowing across the plains like a tidal wave until it finally completely enveloped New Babel. He was seething with anger. The river flowing into New Babel had already turned blood red in color. The plants on its banks had started to fade. 
As the sunlight disappeared, millions of solar panels powered down into sleep mode. Talos, give me an update on the water, he demanded from the AI. Authorities have warned that until proper testing is done, it must be considered unfit for use. Call Seer. Calling Dr. Seer, the AI obeyed. Therion waited while still staring out into the darkness. The video panel came on with Seer's face filling it. Alexander? Therion motioned to the window. They're making a mockery of me and destroying everything we've built. We, um, Seer struggled with the response. We've had some challenges. Don't give me excuses. They ruined Hermon. It cannot happen again. Seer was indignant and defended himself, saying, Don't blame me. I never wanted to do it at Hermon in the first place. I told you the quantum fields there were unstable, but you listened to Isabel instead. It's different here. We have a stable field, and the quantum field phase inducer is almost ready. This time it will work. I'm sure of it. Therian turned toward the screen. It has to work. The world will be looking to me for an answer. The messengers will not be stopped by conventional means. Only Enlil has the power to do it. We're almost there, Seer assured. Within a day. While Antonio and I are finalizing work on the inducer, Isabel and her people are doing what's necessary to establish the quantum connection with Enlil. Talos will then lock it in and we'll be ready to go. Don't let me down, Seer, or there'll be hell to pay. Don't lose faith, Seer signed off. Therian turned and looked toward the darkness outside. Isabel Markov stepped into the light and said, Alexander, I'm the only one who can help you. Therian sneered. Isabel was useful for the time being, and admittedly she played a big part in what he had achieved in New Babel, but he knew full well she had her own ambitions, which, if not kept in check, would become a problem. Isabel's ability to manipulate the minds of men was notorious, and her loyalty questionable. Once the meld with Enlil was complete, he would deal with her. Chapter 28 Unexpected Encounter Old City of Jerusalem, Israel Caleb sprinted through the streets of the Old City, Jerusalem, toward the Western Wall. It was dark except for the electric lights. Market vendors who were prepared for the day's sales instead scrambled to pick up the goods that had been strewn across the road after the earthquake. Others were afraid of the gunfire and had shut their doors and gates. As Caleb got closer to the Temple Mount, the sound of gunfire intensified. There was a rumble in the sky as the clouds rapidly moved in. It was the same pattern that Caleb had noticed before at Mount Hermon. These two strangers had to be stopped at any cost. He arrived at the western wall, which was lit up with its normal lights and even more army floodlights. The Israeli army was in a standoff against the two. The shots being fired at them seemed to have no effect. The commanding officer shouted into his radio set, Cease fire! Cease fire! There was a wide perimeter around the messengers. Reporters and camera operators tried to get a clear shot of the action, but the soldiers kept pushing them back. A stoutly built sergeant shouted commands at the civilians, Move back! Move back! Caleb stepped into the perimeter. The sergeant ran over and challenged, Hey, you, get back! The officer in charge was Captain Horowitz, who recognized Caleb. Sergeant, don't you know who that is? It's Captain Caleb Baruch. The sergeant felt foolish for not recognizing him. I'm sorry, Captain Baruch, but it's a bit wild here, as you can see. Carry on, sergeant. Horowitz pulled Caleb aside. I'm really glad to see you, Caleb. We could use some help here. Do you have any units nearby? Is New Babel going to assist? Caleb shook his head. No, I'm here on my own. I saw some of the injured at the hospital earlier. What happened? The police tried to arrest the two, but they resisted. It turned ugly fast. The army was called in. We were ordered to use extreme force, but we haven't been able to get close to them. They have some dangerous powers. Did you feel the earthquake? Caleb frowned. I've encountered that before. I just don't understand how they do it. I know, it's hard to explain. And so far, we haven't been able to do anything to stop them. You've got to see it for yourself. It's like they have some kind of force field around them. It is similar to what happened days ago at the White House. What happened there? Where were you? It's been all over the news. I was doing some important business elsewhere. Conventional weapons are useless. Did they attack first? They were being a nuisance at the Temple Mount, shouting at the crowds. The police tried to remove them before Passover. But as I said, they wouldn't go. So we engaged them first. Horowitz nodded and said, I told the brigadier it was a bad idea that we should try nonviolent means, negotiate. I mean, look at what they did in other nations. But the orders were clear to engage with maximum force. Now look at Jerusalem, and it's just going to get worse. We're waiting for the big guns to arrive. Brigadier Doron? Yep. 
or what's pointed to the mobile command center parked behind a wall of armored vehicles. You see the MCC over there? He's in there. Stop! Come back here! shouted the sergeant. Caleb and Horwitz turned to see Juliet Simon, a young French reporter, sprint toward the two strangers. Hey! One of the other reporters quickly switched on their tablets to follow Juliet's live stream. Horwitz saw and quickly grabbed one of the military's tablets. The footage was shaky as she was live streaming while running toward the strangers. Juliet stopped when one of them turned toward her. Suddenly she had second thoughts and nervously looked back toward where the other journalists were. Everyone was quiet, watching to see what the strangers would do. She looked back to one of them, who seemed quite fierce in his appearance. Caleb looked up from the screen and saw Juliet addressing one of the strangers. He heard her voice coming from the tablet speaker. Pardon, monsieur, can I ask you a question? The stranger nodded and motioned with his hand for her to come closer. Who are you and why are you doing this? Chaim was following the events on the news while trying to clean up some of the mess from the earthquake in his apartment. When he saw the stranger was about to speak, he sat down at his coffee table to watch. The stranger looked around and then at the camera. Elion is coming with fire. The mountains will melt before him. Juliet pressed further. Where do you get your powers? Is Elion for us or against us? Some people say you are not from this planet. Is that true? Have you been sent to prepare the world for an attack from your kind? There was a wild passion in his eyes, and he said, Do not be deceived. We are not your enemy. Return to Elion. Come out from Babel, for it is destruction is near. High-tech military vehicles made their way toward the Western Wall Plaza. Overhead, an armed military drone flew past. Inside the command vehicle, a screen showed the drone's view of the two strangers and the journalist. There was a target locked on the heads of the messengers. The drone operator subconsciously rubbed his trigger finger with his thumb. An officer peeked over his shoulder. As soon as we get a go, you take them out. The drone operator nodded and placed his hand back onto the trigger. Caleb saw the military vehicles enter the plaza and take their positions. He said, this is a bad idea. Look how he's talking to the reporter. They seem willing to engage. I want them neutralized as much as anyone, but we can't keep shooting them. I'm going to speak to the brigadier. He walked toward the mobile command unit. As Caleb was about to enter, he heard Malcolm Sears voice coming from the computer speakers. He stopped to listen. What do you mean they're still alive? I was relying on you to take care of it. Brigadier Daron was talking to Malcolm Sear by video call. We haven't been able to get close to them, and conventional firearms have been ineffective. We're deploying energy weapons now and have a drone in position to take them out when they're distracted. Sear wasn't impressed. I don't care if you have to use nuclear weapons. Just get it done. Finish it today, Brigadier, or you're finished. Don't you threaten me, Sear. If you had delivered me a working super soldier program like you promised, this could have been taken care of. Sear raised his hands. Our efforts here have been hampered by those two and their followers. Deal with them and you'll have your super soldiers. Sear clicked off. Daron slammed his fist on the cabinet. He picked up the comms unit. Where are those sonic weapons? An officer seated next to Daron raised his hand to get the brigadier's attention. They've arrived, brigadier. Well, get them into position. Tell the drone unit to wait for them to weaken and then take them out. Brigadier Daron got up to walk outside. Caleb quickly ducked out of the way. He saw the directed energy weapons unit assume its position and take aim at the two. Brigadier Daron gave the signal to fire. They began blasting the messengers with sonic waves. The young female reporter screamed in pain. One of them stepped between her and the beams, taking the full force of the sonic blasts. Still reeling from pain, she managed to run to safety. You bastards! She yelled at the Israeli soldiers. More weapons were turned on them until they were trapped within the waves. The world looked on as the two appeared to be immobilized, but they didn't seem to be suffering. The skies turned a glowing red color. A strange cloud vortex formed above Jerusalem with thunder and lightning bolts flashing from it. The two messengers seemed to be slowly pushing the sonic waves back. A drone circled, two missiles locked into firing position. The drone pilot zoomed in on the two strangers. He tapped a few keys on the keyboard and readied his finger to fire. One of the two turned and looked straight toward the drone camera. He lifted his staff and shouted something. The drone was out of sight, so it surprised the pilot that the two seemed to know it was there. Surely he can't see the drone, can he? The next instant, a powerful lightning bolt hit the drone, exploding it in midair. The crowds watching all the events unfold screamed as chunks of debris from the destroyed drone came crashing down all around them. The two stood resolute, apparently once again impervious to the attacks. They were clearly angry. Loud cracks of thunder and lightning reverberated through the skies. 
Brigadier Daron ran to one of the directed energy weapons vehicles. Increase the output. Push it to full intensity. Do it now. The operator shook his head. We are at full capacity, Brigadier. They should be cooking by now. Brigadier Daron looked back in amazement, trying to comprehend what was happening. He took a few steps away from the vehicle with his hands on his head. Just then a blazing projectile slammed into the vehicle behind him, exploding it on impact. The crowd screamed and scattered as flaming rocks started raining down on the military vehicles, including the command center, engulfing them all in flames. Soldiers fled from a wall of fire surrounding the two beings. The heat was intense. A powerful wind was blowing. The dust and smoke mixed with columns of fire, making it hard to see. Through the smoke, Caleb made out the figures of the two men walking away from the plaza toward the Temple Mount. He looked around and saw on the floor a riot gear shield left behind by a fleeing police officer. He picked it up, and holding it in front of him, he ran full speed through the wall of fire and smoke after the strangers. Once he broke through, he looked to where he last saw them, but they had moved on. Caleb set off after them. Brigadier Daron saw the man leaping through the flames and called to Horwitz, Who was that? Is he with us? Horwitz frowned. It's Captain Caleb Baruch. Didn't you see him earlier? He was walking over to Mobile Command. No, I didn't. He saw Caleb sprinting up the stairs. Caleb didn't see any sign of the messengers. He ran toward the tabernacle to see if they'd entered there. As he got closer, a wind started blowing and a dust cloud swirled around him. He stopped in his tracks. The hour has now come, boomed a voice from behind him. Caleb spun around to see one of them standing right there. Caleb decided to negotiate and hopefully calm things down. What hour? The ingathering. One of the two reached toward Caleb and grabbed his arm. Instantly, Caleb found himself alone in a desert valley. He looked around, trying to comprehend what was happening. The sun was blindingly bright and hot, and a cloud of dust blew hard against his face. He vaguely saw a ridge up ahead and walked toward it. He tripped and fell over something. As he looked around, he saw he was surrounded by skeletons. Everywhere he looked were skulls, bones, and skeletal remains. It was like the site of a great massacre. He jumped up and ran, stumbling over the bones. Then the bones started moving, taking on flesh. He bumped into a few that were in the process of transforming. He ran as fast as he could. Eventually the bones were fully human. Just as he broke through the crowd, he suddenly was in a vacuum of space. He tried to breathe and realized he was okay. He saw a bright object in the distance. To his surprise, the object turned out to be a pregnant woman in the last stages of labor. Below her feet was a white glowing ball. On her head was a crown of twelve shining lights. The labor pains grew more intense. Caleb stepped nearer to try and help, but he couldn't reach her. She was in a different dimension. As the woman was about to give birth, a terrifying red dragon flew around her. Caleb's heart raced. He tried to get away. It was the same dragon he had seen in a dream before. The woman delivered a boy. As she lifted him in her arms, the dragon rushed toward the child, but a powerful hand grabbed hold of its neck. A being of light appeared, taking the child from the woman and ascending to what looked like a throne of fire in the sky. The dragon shrieked and roared from being yanked by the neck. Then a powerful luminous being hurled the dragon down to the ground. Suddenly, Caleb was back on the Temple Mount. He felt feverish and depleted of energy. He was shaking. He staggered for a bit and then blacked out. Chapter 29. Something Must Change. TV Studio, New York City. Daniel Lopez couldn't believe that he was interviewing the Alexander Therion, a true legend. His producer rolled a video clip. A young girl named Louisa stood up from her wheelchair. Her legs wobbled a little, then steadied. She beamed with joy. Oh, gracias, señor Therion, gracias. The scene cut to a doctor putting eye drops in a blind man's eyes. After a few moments, the nanobots in the solution went into the eyes and corrected the refractive errors. The man sat up and looked around. It was the first time that he had seen light and colors and people. He looked at his wife, who was next to him, and started crying. Thank you, Mr. Therion. The video clip finished playing. Therion had tears in his eyes. Daniel was equally moved. Mr. Therion, thank you for being on my show. Please, call me Alexander. Very well, Alexander, he said tentatively. Your technology has done so much for the world, as we just saw. Then you, in conjunction with the Anunnaki, proposed the Babel Initiative to the world, which I believe is absolute um, genius, but but I digress. He couldn't believe that he was getting tongue-tied at this moment. He had interviewed hundreds of guests. Come on, Daniel. He paused for a moment to regain his composure. It really seemed like there would be just a brief period until we would fully realize your vision. 
But then the two strangers showed up, threatening to undo it all. What do you make of their message against the Babel Initiative? Daniel, their arrival, while disappointing, is frankly not surprising. Israel's book states that when humankind was united in purpose and language, Elyon came down and confused our one language, so it became many. Ancient Mesopotamian documents speak of this as well. Now that we are united in purpose and speak a common language again, he sends his two goons to disrupt everything yet again. Wait, 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 Alexander. You are saying the story in the Bible is accurate? It relates from the oppressor's point of view. So how can we win if we are fighting God? Therian paused to look deep into the camera and explained, Listen to me. He may have seemed like an all-powerful being ages ago, when we were confused and weak, but now we are strong. We've evolved so that we conquered the atom, unraveled the Higgs boson, the God particle. We have decoded our own genetics. We stand at the precipice of truly evolving into gods. We have achieved quantum supremacy and have achieved unfathomably powerful computers. The reality is that he is scared. We will not be bullied like before. This time, we will outfox him and beat him. We will become gods and will finally fight him on equal footing. No, indeed, we will far surpass him and defeat him. Daniel stared at Therion, awestruck at this man who was giving humanity so much hope and was willing to lead the way. He suddenly realized that, as the host, he ought to keep the conversation going, but Therion's words had literally left him speechless. Therion sensed it too, but took the lead and said, You are wondering how we are going to defeat the two when all the world's armies have failed. They failed because our earthly weapons are for earthly wars. We are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against dark and ancient forces. We must fight their fire with fire. We must evolve to be like them, but better. I have decided to become the guinea pig and undergo quantum entanglement with an equally powerful being. I cannot expect anyone else to do something that I am not willing to do for myself. Then I will show the world how we can stop the two, or any others like them, and finally bring peace to the world. New Babel, Iraq Therian sat at the head of his giant conference table surrounded by members of the New World Council who sat in virtual displays. Therian's TV interview had just finished playing in front of them. The various council members looked at one another. None of them wanted to speak about the elephant in the room. Finally, Linda Reuters, head of the America Bloc, broke the silence. Sir, your words inspire us. Yet, as you know, the world woke up to a shock a week ago as U.S. markets tumbled, losing more than 3,000 points. Other international markets followed suit. Other regions and local governments have been unsuccessful in stopping the terroristic message and activities of the two. Many believe that unless you are able to somehow deliver quickly on your promise, the Babel Initiative may be a failure as well. Another member added, Our districts are demanding answers. The people are suffering because of the two. A third council member timidly opened his mouth. In our district, rivers and lakes have dried up, and there have been massive fish die-offs. Hydroelectric plants have stopped operating, causing rolling blackouts. The price of food has gone through the roof. Theron remained silent. He despised these bureaucrats as much as he currently needed them. They were imbecilic twits and knew nothing and could do nothing. Could they not understand the road to freedom is often full of potholes and roadblocks? Did they not comprehend the magnitude of the evolutionary leap they were about to make? Instead of being grateful for the honor bestowed on them to have a seat on the council, they dared now challenge him? Question him? Did they forget the price they paid to be here? If Therian exposed their evil deeds to the world, they would instantly be hung in the public square by their angry citizens. Indeed, their positions of power were bought by the souls of men. He chose them, and he could just as easily dispense of them. They did not forget, however. They knew very well who Alexander Therian was, not the Therian the world saw, the Prince of Peace, but the real Therian, who would do whatever it took to get what he wanted. One of them, more than any of the others, could attest to that. His hands were drenched in the blood of the multitudes who were sacrificed so that Therian could be where he was. General Nasir Gurabian looked around at the other members with concern. 
They knew as well as he did that he had played Therian's game as requested. His role had been to serve as a foil to help unite the world against a common enemy. The name Gurabin struck fear in the hearts of nations. Yet that was all before the two strangers showed up. They were a monkey wrench in Therion's brilliant machine, and now they were threatening to undo everything. They were clearly besting Therion at every turn. Should they, the World Council, not address the obvious? Were they all going to just skirt the issue? They were all in this together, and certainly it was their duty to bring some guidance and truth to the situation. Garabin would play the patsy no longer. This was his time to speak and not just be the boogeyman. He did control one-tenth of the world, under a different name, of course, and he had an obligation to them. He cleared his throat, indicating he would speak. Therian's eyes narrowed and his brow furrowed. He glared at Thurabin with disdain. He was nothing more than a puppet, a puppet who provided no more value to him. And as puppet master, he could raise him up or cast him down. Gurabin had better mind what he said. His words might seal his fate. All eyes turned toward Gurabian. He cleared his throat again. He hadn't done any speaking during his reign of terror. He had always been the figure behind the scenes, but it felt good to finally have a voice. Yes, he would speak his mind. He was on the New World Council. Indeed, he was the revered General Nasi Gurabian. Therian was not the only one who demanded respect. He felt his courage rise. He sat taller in his seat and boomed. The two clearly made good on their threat to stop the rain. Who can stand against the two? We can't. He looked squarely at Therion. And you can't either. Therion, is it possible that you are out of your league with the two? Therion exploded inside. How dare he suggest the two were out of his league? He was the one who had elevated Gurabian to worldwide notoriety and also to the prestigious Council of Ten. He was nothing more than a pencil pusher. If it were not for Therian, he would still be languishing in some mid-level career with no hope. But now he governed one-tenth of the world. It was just as well. He was certainly annoying and could be a, even a threat. Therian would simply have to eliminate him. Those would be Gurabian's last words. We do not negotiate with terrorists, even extraterrestrial terrorists. Therian shouted indignantly. He ended the teleconference. Alexander sat back in his chair and sighed. Talos, send in Isabel. He walked to the window, looked out across the city, and waited for Isabel to arrive. After some time, the luscious Isabel Markov came in, walked up to him, and put her hand on his shoulder. I think your TV interview was spectacular. And just look at this great city that you have built by your wisdom and great power. She praised him, and they both remained quiet for several moments. Then she added teasingly, Now those two are threatening it and are making you look like a fool. She knew just how to press the right buttons. It was like fishing. Give a little and pull a little. Eventually she would catch her fish. You need to contact him. Therian hated her for saying the obvious, but she was right. He needed to make contact with Enlil, now. She had already sensed what he would want to do. She spoke to Talos to lower the blinds. A large place on the floor opened and a shrine rose up to their level. In the center, five candles were burning on the points of a pentagram and a white ring encircled the platform. In front of the pentagram, a statue of Enlil stood 15 feet high. He had a crown with 10 horns on it. He was flanked by lions, which barely came up to his knees. She had not done enough to cause Enlil to manifest on such short notice. To bring Enlil through would take much more planning and, of course, blood. However, she would be able to open a portal of the mind, which was just as good for what they needed. They both went to the middle of the circle and sat down cross-legged, back to back. Then quietly and softly she ch chanted, Then quietly and softly she chanted, Ati me peta babka, Ati me peta babka, Ati me peta babka. She then said in a loud voice, Enlil! House of the Lord, whose return is triumphant, who shows the way to his great mountain house, I, Inanna, mistress of the netherworld, am become black, tremble, shaking with fear. Open the gate for me so that I can enter here. In a moment, they were transported in their minds to a high mountain. The wind whipped their faces. They could feel the frigid air bite their skin. Directly in front of them was the same being depicted by the statue, but alive and moving, flanked on either side by lions. 
He stood about 15 feet tall and was a truly imposing being. He had an aura of light glowing around him. He wore a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a dazzling gem and his face shone brightly. His voice was like the power of a train horn. Therian knew Enla existed, but to see him in such form and so clearly was breathtaking. To finally see the great mind who was guiding his steps and opening doors nobody could shut was astounding. He needed Enlil's help and his power, yet he also sensed Enlil needed him. Malcolm had said that the Anunnaki told him that as long as the dimensional membrane remained, they could not be anything but ghosts in our realm. Enlil was not here merely to help. He needed Therian to open the gate. Therian implored, My lord, none of the world's armies are able to overcome the two. Their power is too great. Until Israel, Elyon's nation, rebels and betrays their chief prince who stands watch over them, we have nothing. Unless they join us, he will continue restraining us. Surely, my lord, you could defeat such a foe. Do not flatter me, mortal. I have scuffled with him. Our fight is not about strength, but authority. And until Israel betrays him, we cannot act. Did he stop you at Mount Hermon? Your insolence is beneath me, Enlil's voice boomed. He is a worthy opponent, but no. Enlil clenched his fists. The two have legal right to be there, and I do not. It is that simple. They were with Elyon on the mountain two millennia ago when he transformed and reclaimed it. That change in legal standing had been hidden from me until now. Remove their legal right, and I will give you my power, throne, and authority. You will be a god among men and will defeat them. We will rule the world as father and son. Darkness enveloped them, and Enlil was gone. Theron and Isabel opened their eyes and were back in the circle at his office. What, what happened? Theron questioned. Where did he go? Can we get back and keep talking? No, it doesn't work that way. Summoning a being like that through the veil, the dimensional membrane, takes energy, and we need more. Essentially, we have to pay to make these long-distance calls, like in the old days. Reflecting back on his instructions, Theron exhaled slowly and said, You saw Eitan Baruch at Hermon. He will never acquiesce. Isabel looked at him inquisitively, wondering if the great Therion was worth all the hype. It didn't matter. She was playing the long game and would do his bidding for now. She thought of the classic story where the ancient king Ahab had been in a similar predicament when the pesky Nabot would not sell his vineyard. Naturally, his mentally superior wife, the enticing Jezebel, devised a solution. How ironic! So all you really need is Aton removed and Daron to assume control, she teased. Therian thought for a moment. Yes, that is all that's required. She touched his shoulder to use her charm as she had always done on feeble-minded men. You see, just like I said, you need me. I am the only one who can help you. She knew that he had not shared all there was to know when they uncovered Gilgamesh. He had been holding back and now she would collect payment. She reveled in seducing men. It was so easy. Her hands on a man's body caused them to melt, and then they were under her power. They wanted her voluptuous body and would give up their soul to have her, and their souls she would gladly take. They would serve as payment for the injustices she experienced as a little girl when her innocence was stolen. Yes, men's souls were a just reward for the pain men had caused her. She ran her hand down his shoulder to the small of his back. She pulled him in closely with her other hand so that her breasts pushed against his chest. Their bodies pressed together. This was the moment where every man would succumb to her. They would give anything to have her. She pursed her lips, moving in toward his lips. I will do it, she kissed him. But it will cost you, of course. She pulled him even closer and kissed his neck. Therian rolled his eyes. He knew her ways well. Inanna, Ishtar, the seductress. She was just a fool. She really thought she could outmaneuver him. Such a fool. She truly believed she was in control. He had used her from the beginning. Iraq, 2003. Sander, come quickly. Alexander Schwartz's pulse elevated as he walked as briskly as his 85-year-old legs would take him to the entrance. After so many years of trying to find it, he could barely believe the moment had come. He knelt and ran his fingers around the edge of the tomb that was slightly protruding from the flat ground. 
Isabel Markov, his trusted and beautiful 25-year-old aide, had beckoned him and was raising a crowbar to begin prying open the door. He snatched the crowbar out of his hand. Yes, he was old, but he wasn't dead. And it mattered who broke open the tomb. It knew him. For it to reveal its magic, he had to be the first one to crack the sealed door and enter the tomb. Petta Babkama. The voice was again beckoning Alexander to open the gate, but this time it was louder and more agitated, as if it knew he was close. He leaned onto the crowbar with all his weight, and the voice persisted, Petta, Petta, Petta. It sounded like the voice was eager to be released from the abyss. Alexander looked at his aides. They heard nothing. He was the only one who could hear it, but he knew he wasn't crazy. The voice had helped him discover the tomb in the first place. Modern scientific tools were amazing, and coupled with ancient texts, he had discovered the general area to look. But the voice led him to the exact place. After a moment of leaning onto the tool, the seal broke. The rest of the team assisted in opening the door. Air rushed inside as if the tomb was breathing in life once again after thousands of years of sleep. The wind moved over the mouth of the opening, creating a hum like the sound made by blowing over the mouth of a bottle. The tomb was releasing a sigh, relieved it had been finally found and liberated after thousands of years of imprisonment. The door was pushed aside, and an aluminum stepladder and lights were lowered into the tomb. Alexander entered first, followed by his team of archaeologists, aides, and interns. They descended into a massive room. The ceiling was 30 feet high, and in the center was a magnificent stone sarcophagus with a host of ancient Sumerian cuneiform symbols etched on it. It was enormous, measuring at least 19 feet long and 9 feet wide, and roughly that tall. Alexander hurried over and laid his hands on it. He felt the connection. The power was here. This was where the voice had been leading, and it was satiated. Isabel stood next to him and looked closely at the cuneiform, hoping to decipher it. If Sander was right, today would change their lives forever. Indeed, they would be forever young, beautiful, and full of life. The elixir was at least in reach. For generations, her family had been searching for the ancient gods, and without her family, Sander would not have started hearing the voice. He thought he was the only one who could hear, but she heard it loud and clear. Alexander felt giddy like a schoolchild just before Christmas, It was the anticipation of a lustful dream finally coming to fruition. He put his hand on hers and said, It's him. She looked at him, realizing there would be no need to decipher the cuneiform, at least not today. His team brought in equipment to remove the massive lid of the sarcophagus. After a few hours of prying with crowbars, adjusting the jacks, and lots of sweat, the enormous cover was removed, and the stone revealed its hidden secret. Alexander climbed up the ladder next to the sarcophagus and stared in silence at the well-preserved and enormous head. The face was stern. Even in death, it was obvious Gilgamesh was the son of Enlil. His arms were folded across his chest, and he was holding a tablet. Alexander gasped. He felt his pulse quicken. There it was, the Tablet of Destinies. He had no words. This was better than he could have ever imagined. He envisioned the future and heard the old axiom. He who holds the Tablet of Destinies controls the fates of mankind. He would soon unlock its secret power, too. Alexander's team was busy mapping out the room and taking pictures of the sarcophagus to study it later. This moment was too special to share with them, and he blurted, Please, may I have a few moments with him, alone? Isabel knew exactly what was going through his mind. She had also dreamed of this moment and knew what it would mean for her own cause. She helped usher the team and herself out of the tomb and up the ladder. After a few minutes, Alexander was alone. He reached out with a swab to Gilgamesh's face to take a DNA sample from his 18-foot body. The skin looked surprisingly vibrant and supple. The giant looked like he had just laid down for a sleep, not like he had been entombed for thousands of years. His size and vibrance was godlike. Alexander had decided to search for him in the first place because of reports that Gilgamesh had become part god. The ancient epic of Gilgamesh had proven very reliable. Alexander's team used it to find structures and to locate the grave under the Euphrates in a tomb constructed when the waters of the ancient river had parted following Gilgamesh's death. The magnetic imaging system had also proven quite useful in locating him. But it was the voice that had led him here. Sander, Isabel's voice echoed in the tomb. The Marines are telling me that we need to wrap it up. We must go before dark, or there is no escort. 
Alexander appreciated and despised the U.S. military. Under Hussein's days of ruling Iraq, such a discovery would have been much more difficult. Yet the U.S. was puffed up with arrogance due to its weapons and economy. But the U.S. would be humbled soon enough. His many years in Himmler's protective echelon, the SS, had taught him there were forces far beyond guns, tanks, and bombs. There was an entire realm of beings known as ancient aliens, Anunnaki. It didn't really matter which epithet. They existed and had borne sons of greater manifestation on this planet. Like the Nazis, many of the beings were equally against Elyon and his so-called chosen people. These beings had aided Hitler and Himmler in their existential battle against them in the final solution, and they were committed to the fulfillment of exterminating Elyon's chosen. Indeed, he had spent a lifetime seeking the help of these beings, and now it was all paying off. After a lifetime of searching for Gilgamesh, Alexander had finally found the famed tomb. Alexander studied Gilgamesh's thick hair, pulled out tweezers, and plucked out some strands. According to the epic that bore his name, Gilgamesh, the ancient hero, was two-thirds god and one-third human. Alexander had spent years researching Gilgamesh, and with the help of the brilliant Isabel Markov, great-great-great-granddaughter of the world-famous Charles Warren, they discovered that Gilgamesh was also known as Ninurta, meaning Lord of the Earth, in ancient Mesopotamian. In the Chosen People's book, Ninurta was twisted to Nimrod, let's rebel, to reflect his subversive character. Alexander smirked as he thought of how he loathed using their book. Nevertheless, it did prove useful at times, and they at least correctly noted how Nimrod had transformed into a demigod. He put the hair samples into a jar and carefully screwed on the top. With these, he would be able to synthesize an elixir to prolong his life and reverse his aging process long into the future. Just as immortality was the quest of Gilgamesh, or as the Greeks called him Heracles, so too was Alexander's quest. But all he needed for the moment was to extend his own life and increase his strength. He could strive for immortality later. At age 85, he didn't have much more time to resolve this matter. And as he promised, he would share enough with Isabel to keep her loyal, that is, as long as she proved useful to him. Alexander leaned over to see Gilgamesh's enormous hands, which were holding the tablet. He beamed. It looked astoundingly fresh and new, not like it had been sitting in a tomb for thousands of years. A grid of six by six, or thirty-six squares in all, were arranged on the tablet. He tried to pull it out from Gilgamesh's hands, but it would not move, as if he refused to let it go. Alexander smiled. Of course, the giant would not let go of it easily. The mighty lord of the earth, son of Enlil, became a hybrid and gained strength in a long life. But it was the Tablet of Destinies which Enlil had given him that had granted him authority over the earth to decree the fates of men. He had used that authority to spearhead the first rebellion after the flood. No wonder the chosen people's god felt threatened and needed to confuse mankind's languages. Never mind, though. It would be just a matter of time until Alexander would right the old wrongs. Soon Alexander would be the son of Enlil and take Gilgamesh's place. As a superior substitute, he would wield Enlil's power, throne, and authority. The world would bow to Alexander, the locum tenens of Enlil. He simply needed to follow Enlil's ancient and brilliant plan. The voice suddenly communicated to him again. Alexander pondered the communique, groom a son of the king to pull the trigger. Interesting. Alexander stared at her dispassionately. She imagined that she was the woman riding and controlling the beast. Her seductive powers held no sway over him. He could not be bought by the love of women. She, too, was merely an instrument to bring the world under his authority. When she had fully served her purpose, he would destroy her. Your antics will not work with me, Isabel. I know how you are. He pushed her away and said, But fine, name your price. Get Israel to agree to our covenant, and you can have whatever you want. The city of Babel! and I bow to no one, she shouted out audaciously. Therian thought about the request, the audacity to ask for his city, the glorious city that his hands had built, his prize, his monument. He hated her for doing this to him. She thought she could get him over a barrel and not have to pay. Was she that vain? She would regret this day. He would exact his revenge and burn her, reducing this luscious goddess to nothing. She would sit naked, exposed, destroyed. The great goddess would be humbled once and for all. No longer would anyone covet her body. He would show the world that she held no power over him. 
But could he give up Babel? Babel for Jerusalem? Jerusalem? Yes, Elyon City. Therian wanted to burst out laughing from pleasure. He could build a thousand Babels. But there would only ever be one Jerusalem, and he would put his throne there. He smiled. Done. Chapter 30. Betrayal. Jerusalem, Israel. Etan has no idea what he's doing. Joining the Babel Initiative is what Israel needs, now more than ever, Daron said as he stared at the ceiling of his Jerusalem office. Israel needs a leader that will not be afraid to make the tough decisions. Decisions that are for the good of humanity and the entire human race. He paused and got to the point and said, So if I join you, Theron will be able to get rid of the two and ensure Israel has a premier position in the Babel Initiative? Isabel wrapped her hands around him, tenderly comforting him. Darling, I know this is a hard decision, but sometimes we have to do what is best for the many, and not just a few. She started unbuttoning his shirt. Not only will you save Israel, but you will get me too. Besides, that silly old-fashioned Eitan is the only thing that has been standing in the way of progress. With Israel on board, nearly every nation, the ones that count anyway, will have joined the Babel Initiative. Just think of the power you will wield. Think of the good you can do for your country. This will be a covenant of many nations, and Israel will actually be at the head. The world will thank you. She caressed his chest and played with his chest hair while biting her lip in a sexy way. The world will say, finally, a man with conviction, a man with stamina, where it counts. She pressed herself into his torso and continued, and the will to do what it takes to bring peace to the world. With Israel's confirmation of the covenant, Theron will be able to truly make a united front against those pesky two space invaders. The world will hail you as a hero. Doron kissed her, but then pulled back. And what will I get in return for this? I am betraying the prime minister. Betrayal, she asked in a pretend shock. Betrayal, such a mean word. Her tone was plainfully seductive. Everyone has the right to switch sides, don't they? You are just switching sides for the common good. She kept caressing his face while playing with his hair and running her hands along his body. You are merely forcing his hand. If he knew what you knew, he would have made the right decision already. But silly Aton is holding out for a fantasy instead of reality. You have the wisdom and vision to see that. Daron embraced her and went to unbutton her slacks. She stopped him. Let's get Israel's confirmation and your position secured first, and then we can celebrate she said, pursing her lips seductively. Okay, so how do we do it? Don't worry, sweetie. I have just the solution. She pulled out a small vial from her handbag. Aton loves his seltzer water. He suspects nothing. Just a touch of this, and in a few minutes, he will be loopy. Then when he starts talking funny, make the call. Daron walked down the hall with a seltzer for Aton and a drink for himself. He entered Aton's office and gave him the drink. Eitan responded, Thanks, Daron. You know me too well. These really hit the spot. Daron engaged in some worthless banter, and when he could tell the potion began to take effect, he asked a leading question. Sir, what of the two? They threaten the entire planet. Don't we have a duty to be rid of them? Daron, we will never sign Therion's treaty, Eitan said and got up, but instead of looking out the window, he looked at the blank wall. The two are a gift to Israel. Aton said, and then started saying mostly gibberish. Sir, are you in your right mind? Daron egged him on. Of course I am my right mind in. Where else would I be, right? Daron picked up the phone and called the head of security and the deputy prime minister. We have a situation. I fear the prime minister has had a mental breakdown. As head of the military, I am recommending that he immediately be relieved of all duties until his mental state can be properly determined. Deputy Prime Minister Gideon Shapiro came in, flanked by security. A doctor followed them to make a diagnosis. After speaking with Eitan, he looked back at Doron and the others and shook his head. Sir, I'm afraid you've become incapacitated and are unable to execute your duties. We've decided, based on the recommendation of the doctor, that you will be immediately relieved of all duties until further notice. I demand to know who came up with this shtuyot, Eitan said once again to the blank wall. He went over to his lamp and began talking to it. This is treason. I know perfectly well what I'm doing. Daron walked up to him, put his hands on his upper arms, leaned in and kissed him on each cheek, as is custom in the Middle East. My friend, you are not well until we meet again. 
He nodded. The security approached Eitan. He tried to resist, but they overpowered him and wrestled him to the floor. They gently but forcefully escorted him from the premises. Shapiro looked at Daron and said, I will stand in until Eitan is... Shapiro staggered and put his hand on his heart. What? He looked dazed and turned his head all around. He knew he wasn't crazy. He really was seeing ghosts. No, he saw demons, ominous creatures of the dark realm. One of them had sunk its talon into his chest and was turning it back and forth, back and forth. No, this couldn't be happening. The promise he made so many years ago with the Ouija board, when he crossed his heart and hoped to die, was a joke, a dare. Growing up an American, finding a Ouija board was no big deal. He thought his friends were moving the oracle. They were in college, just wasting time. He was totally joking about the promise. He didn't believe in demons. Yet now, they were coming to exact payment for his foolish promise. It couldn't be. He fell to his knees and looked to the sky. He felt his life ebb from his body. It was all real. If they were real, then so was Hashem. Shapiro started falling on his face. He knew he had little time. He cried out, Hashem, save! He fell down dead. The doctor who was present witnessed the entire thing was upon him before he even hit the ground. He turned him over and beat his chest and started compressions. I think he just had a massive heart attack. The doctor continued working with no success. After minutes of trying to resuscitate him, he gave up. Just then the paramedics arrived to assist, but it was too late. Shapiro was dead. Daron looked shocked. Oh my, oh my. Some members of the Knesset who had been in the building had been alerted to the events and came just in time to witness Shapiro's heart attack. They were in shock. Nothing like this had ever happened. They looked at Doron, who looked dumbfounded. One of the members of the Knesset spoke up. Doron, until the Prime Minister is back to health, and for the continuity of government, you are the interim Prime Minister. Doron pretended to be shocked and said, Oh, it is with a heavy heart that I accept this temporary post. Someone filmed it on their cell phone and uploaded it to social media. He was sworn in, and then everyone returned to their offices with tears in their eyes. Daron went back down the hall to his waiting love goddess. Is it done? He nodded. Isabel beamed at him and then wrapped her arms around him. He started kissing her and attempting to disrobe her. She started unbuttoning his shirt while cooing. Darling, you know I want you, she said while kissing him, and then pulled away and said, But there is just one more matter. Damn it, what now? Does Theron want me to sign something? No, darling, not him. His boss. All you need to do is pledge your fealty to his name. He will hear you and hold you to your contract. Don't worry, it will only take a second. With that, she took a knife and cut his palm, eliciting a yell from him. Hey! Blood makes it official, she said with a sinister wink. Now repeat after me. Anaku Tamuma. Wait, what am I swearing? You are swearing and will fulfill your pledge on the life of Edlil, and if not, you will go to your fate, she said with a mischievous grin. Ready? Anaku tamama tilnis ilim zakaru Enlil. I swear an oath and will fulfill my pledge on the life of Enlil. Suma la ana simtim alaku. If not, I will die and go to my fate. There now, that wasn't so hard, was it? She took his hands and put them on her hips, and they embraced. Chapter 31, A Moment of Truth, Jerusalem, Israel Caleb groaned as he woke up at Chaim's couch. He was groggy and confused. On the coffee table there was a metal basin with water and a wet towel draped over the side. He sat up and looked around. The television set was on, showing news images of the events at the Temple Mount, with the sound muted. Caleb looked around for a remote and turned the volume up. Nations from around the world are calling on the New World Council to do something about the two strangers' terroristic activities. Alexander Theron is expected to make a statement to the press in an emergency briefing within the hour. Our reporter is on the scene in New Babel. We cross over now. A chair leg scraped against the floor of the next room. A few seconds later, Chaim entered the living room. Oh, you are awake. Good. How did I get here? You don't remember? You showed up at my house several hours after the earthquake, delirious and with a fever. How long have I been asleep? On and off, almost two days. Your fever broke a few hours ago. Caleb was shocked. Two days? I wanted to call a doctor, but you insisted I didn't. Did you encounter the two messengers? Caleb thought for a moment about the events on the Temple Mount. The messengers? Something strange. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. One moment he was standing in front of me, the next... I don't even know if it was real what I saw. 
Chaim said nothing but waited for Caleb to speak. A dry valley, skeletons everywhere, like a mass grave. Then the bones began to move and grow, flesh. It seemed so real. Caleb ran his hand through his short cropped hair. And the bones became living people? Chaim wondered aloud. I know, it sounds crazy, but yeah. Anything else? Caleb thought for a bit and further explained the experience. Come with me, Chaim said excitedly. Every available space on the walls in his study was filled with notes, pictures, newspaper clippings, timeline charts. One entire wall was painted with chalkboard paint and was covered with notes in various ancient languages. Different colored chalk lines connected different points and facts to each other. Ever heard of a computer, Professor? Chaim ignored that question. You saw events from the past, from the present, and the future. And they are all connected. I've spent most of my life working on this. He beamed, showing off his work. But I've learned more in the past year than in all the time before it, thanks in part to your brother. Remarkable young man, you know. He's got a talent for seeing patterns where others don't. Chaim looked at the floor. Caleb winced, thinking about his brother. Well, in any event, he helped me connect many of these dots. It's no accident he came across my path. Caleb saw the word remnant on the wall. He placed one finger on it and with his eyes followed the lines connecting it to other events. Caleb said, is this why he was attacked because he's part of remnant? Chaim raised his hands. Amansa was right. You have many questions. Good. It's time for you to learn the real truth of what's happening in the world, Caleb. You're remnant too, aren't you? Did you get Asher involved with this? No, no. He heard the call himself. Chaim said as he stared at Caleb for a few moments. Caleb suddenly felt as though Chaim were sizing him up. Is there a problem, Chaim? No, no, I'm, I'm just remembering how I used to think I knew it all, too. Anyway, for years now, Remnant has been persecuted, pursued, and hunted down like animals. Many have died or endured torture and imprisonment. Others have lost families, homes, jobs. They became the scapegoat for everything that was wrong in the world. They, well, we, have had to adopt to survive. Your brother's work has saved many lives, enabling us to communicate with each other, undetected, until now. Caleb shook his head and said, Remnant is a threat because they sabotage the efforts of governments and the New World Council. You still don't see it. Or is it you won't see it? Caleb let the comment go. There were a lot of things that didn't make sense. There was no question about that. The things a monster could do were impressive, but they were things any skilled mentalist could do. He still didn't trust that Remnant was anything good. Chaim took a large old book from his shelf and opened it. The pages had become worn and discolored over time. He flipped to an illustration. The illustration showed a valley of skeletons coming to life. Look familiar? Caleb studied the picture and his jaw dropped. The picture was what he had seen. But how could someone know that? Chaim handed him the book and took another from the shelf. Caleb read the Hebrew title on the spine, Brit Chadasha. On the front page, he saw the Hebrew title and printed in English underneath it, New Covenant. Chaim paged through it. Ah, here it is. A woman clothed of the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. The dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Caleb felt the blood drain away from his face. Both of them are exactly what I saw. What does it mean? He found it necessary to sit down. It was the same feeling as when Amansa knew about his dreams. Perhaps she was more than a mentalist. He had interrogated many prisoners in his life and had to use torture and drugs to make them reveal the thoughts in their minds. But somehow, someone was planting things in his head. Amansa and now ancient books seemed to know what he had personally witnessed. The being on Mount Hermon is an ancient entity known as Enlil. Chaim opened his many books and showed Caleb images of the ancient gods. He was known by many different names. One of them was Ushumgalu, the great serpent. Another was Mushhushu, the great red dragon. Chaim pointed to another picture of the seven-headed dragon. There are others like him, the Watchers or Anunnaki, Immensely powerful beings from beyond our planet, not equal to him, but still very powerful. They were all created by Elyon and were to watch over mankind and relay his will to them. But then some of them decided to forsake their original task and use their knowledge to create their own kind, thereby corrupting the image of Elyon. These hybrids, or Nephilim, were worshipped as the gods of the ancient world. 
Chaim waved his hand across a section of the wall depicting all the ancient gods. Take a guess where the Watchers first made contact with mankind. Caleb shrugged. Chaim walked over to an old map of the Middle East. He tapped on a mountain region. Mount Hermon. Isn't that interesting? What they did angered Elyon, and as a result, they were imprisoned into another dimension, while their children, the Nephilim, ruled the world by fear, superior intellect, and raw power. From their extra-dimensional parents, the Nephilim inherited advanced technologies, the likes of which we've not known since ancient times until now. Mankind was not satisfied to remain slaves to the Nephilim, however, and many great wars were fought. Actually, their greatest defeats came from the followers of Elyon, this threatened the Watchers' dominance, so they determined to destroy mankind by corrupting their humanity, their unique genetic code, which would separate them from Elyon forever. They were almost successful, too. The whole world's population had become genetically corrupted, except for one family. You know the story of Noah, right? Caleb nodded. Chaim continued, The great deluge wiped out all the Nephilim and their technologies. Almost every ancient culture recounts the same story. Since that time, mankind has tried to recover the knowledge of the Watchers. Whoever finds and controls that knowledge will rule the world. There was another incursion after the flood, led by Nimrod, or Gilgamesh, and, of course, we all know about David and Goliath. Caleb remembered Asher mentioning Gilgamesh. Wait, Goliath was real? Chaim chuckled. Now who is behind the times? Caleb was trying to connect it in his mind. What does all this have to do with Remnant and my visions? Chaim began... When I was a young man doing my studies on ancient Near Eastern languages, I befriended a brilliant man, a young Jesuit priest. His name is Malcolm Sear. His knowledge and interest in ancient sciences and mine in linguistics and philology were a great complement to each other's work. We were able to help each other with our research and would spend hours sharing our discoveries from the archives. His first taught me about the Watchers and the technologies they had given the world of ancient civilizations far more advanced than we have ever learned about in our history books. It seemed like science fiction, but it was all true. Oh, it was there in the manuscripts and the scrolls all along. I just didn't see it until he pointed it out. Fascinating. He knew more than I could understand. He realized all the knowledge uncovered by explorers and archaeologists over the centuries was only the tip of the iceberg compared to what had been lost. He started obsessing over it. He began theorizing about the opening of dimensional portals. At first, I thought it was merely an academic pursuit, a hypothesis. But then I realized he was completely serious. His research focus shifted to the occult. He wasn't going to be restrained by ethics and political processes. He was convinced that the only way to access that knowledge again would be to go to the source, the very ones who gave it to us in the first place. The Watchers? Correct. But Elyon had imprisoned them, remember? And even the mighty Enlil, though he wields great influence over the minds of men, is limited. Elyon sealed this dimension, and only three-dimensional material beings like us can fully exist and wield direct influence here. Enlil cannot enter this dimension, though he has tried many times. Throughout history, his worshippers have attempted to open portals so he and the Watchers could enter. You see, many of these ancient sites and temples were built to do exactly that. He showed pictures of ancient sites like the pyramids of Giza, Mayan temples, Stonehenge, Mount Hermon, and others. The closest they ever came was right here. Chaim pointed to a map. Elion himself had to intervene that time. Caleb read the name on the map. Babylon. That's where New Babel is now. Chaim smiled. Becoming clear? So my old friend Malcolm, seer, somehow attached himself to the richest man in the world and set out to build Babel, the gate of the gods, the very place where the dimensional portal was almost open before. Chaim continued, Through their partnership, they have reintroduced many of the ancient technologies to the world, albeit modernized versions of them. I wondered and hoped that Malcolm had let go of his former obsession. When you met me at the Knowledge Center, Malcolm had brought me there to help decipher this. Chaim took out a blown-up copy of the Sumerian document Seer had shown him. He chuckled and took his monocular out of his pocket. Caleb at once recognized the top-secret technology only Mossad agents had access to. Chaim just smiled. What does it say? I cannot say it. Words have power. A lesson I had discovered years ago with Isabel. I never told her what else the text she and I discovered said. I suppose I might have bought us a little time. It speaks of Enlil, raising up the dead and then consuming the living. It's an ancient poem, but the poem is hiding a code. Do you see these characters here that look like decorations? 
That's what gives us the clue. What code? To open the portal, of course. Isn't it obvious? Chaim didn't understand why Caleb couldn't see it, but determined to reveal the secret, he continued, The part they haven't figured out. His voice trailed off. Oh no. His head sank. I shared this with your brother, and they might have tortured him to figure this out. Chaim sat silent. Caleb grew impatient for the reveal. Figure out what? How the logogram, the symbol of Enlil's name, is spelled out and pronounced. Caleb was connecting the dots. So Seer is still trying to open the dimensional portals? That's what he was trying to do on Hermon, but failed because of the interference of the two messengers. And because he doesn't have the right pronunciation? I know he's busy with some kind of secret project at New Babel. I don't even have access to his underground lab. Chaim nodded and said, Malcolm believes that bringing Enlil and the Watchers back will benefit humankind, that we will evolve into an advanced civilization, become like the gods of old. But from what I've learned in my research, if he does succeed, it could literally mean the end of life on Earth as we know it. I always knew Seer was up to something. What about Alexander? How does he fit into all this? Is Seer just using him? I've spent time with him. He genuinely wants to improve the world, and it's working. Even the Middle Eastern nations are rallying around him, rather than General Gurabian, because they see a better future. Chaim pulled a Tanakh from the shelf. Here, look. The ancient prophet spoke of the name. Once they figure this out, the portal will open. Caleb's interest was picked, though he remained plenty skeptical. Chaim thumbed through the book until he came to the writings of Yehezkel. He was speed reading through the Hebrew until he came to the right place. Behikad shi becha le'nehem gog. That name is not Hebrew. It comes from ancient Sumerian, Gug. It means death, enmity. It has been hidden in plain sight. Enlil is unable to tell humans how to say it. Humans must figure it out and invoke the name for it to work. Chaim wrung his hands. I fear I might have put your brother in danger, and now Therion has what he needs. From the corner of his eye and through Chaim's office door, Caleb noticed Therion on TV. He turned from Chaim to hear what Therion was saying. I am here today to assure you that victory is imminent against the two terrorists. We, as the human race, will defeat them and send a message to those coming after them. Conventional weapons and military tactics are useless against enemies like these. We will soon unveil groundbreaking advancements that will redefine who we are as a species. Together we will be able to face and defeat any threat against our planet and our existence as a species. The Anunnaki have pledged they will be returning soon to ensure our success. A German reporter got the nod from Therion. What about the people who claim to be prophets warning us to return to the true God before we are doomed to destruction? Therion shook his head and countered. They are misguided, deceived. Remnant is a dangerous cult. Would you want to serve a God who rains judgment on mankind every chance he gets and rejoices in the suffering of others? Those who seek to sabotage a dream of a new world in favor of the two and the one they serve will be treated as enemies of freedom and liberty and will be dealt with. The reporters all called out with their questions, trying to get Therian's attention. Therian raised his hands and stepped back to the microphone. He waited until they all settled down. Patience, it will all become clear soon. Humanity's story is not ending. It's just beginning. There was a moment of silence, and then one of the reporters started clapping. She was soon joined by the rest, clapping and cheering in a standing ovation. Some wiped the tears from their eyes. Caleb looked back at Chaim, who shook his head and threw his hands up in the air. He was conflicted. So much of what Chaim had said made sense, but it was all predicated on the God of Abraham. This was a leap he just couldn't take. Caleb furrowed his brow. The more he thought about it, why did that God let men like Hitler, Stalin, and Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, Amir Atta and Gurabian destroyed so many lives when with just a snap of his divine fingers he could end it all. The UFOs and Anunnaki were at least here to help and they were clearly demonstrating their goodwill. Caleb's phone rang. It was Gavi. He walked to the kitchen. Caleb, I've been so worried. I've been trying to get a hold of you for days. Where have you been? I'm still in Jerusalem. A lot has happened. I'll tell you about it later. I've learned some things here about Seir. We need to warn Alec me too, interrupted Gavi. Caleb, you were wrong about him. I was wrong about him. He's not behind the attack on your brother or the attacks on us. They believe those were rogue agents working for General Gurabian. 
Dr. Sear has helped me nonstop since I last saw you. He wants to help Asher, Caleb. He genuinely wants to help the world. The reason you couldn't access his lab is because he wasn't sure you could be trusted yet and that you weren't a spy. I'm in the lab now and it's incredible. You must come see it. Oh yes, you'll have full access now. When you return to Babel, go to the security center where you will be issued a biometric pass to the lab level. Did you hear Alexander's speech? Yes, I just watched it. Gabi continued, I discussed your concerns with him and he put my mind at ease. He's not the bad guy and neither is Dr. Sear. They are brilliant men who are dedicating their lives to make this world a better place. There are some important things happening here. Caleb looked at Chaim, who was pacing up and down in the living room, obviously talking to himself. Don't worry about Asher. He will get well again. I'm a scientist and I wouldn't say that if I didn't believe it. Caleb didn't say anything about his encounter with the messengers. He wasn't sure how to explain it yet. He wasn't even completely sure it happened or if it was just one of those dreams again. Gavi seemed excited about something. Well, I have some good news. Dr. Sears' assistant, uh, Antonio, somehow was able to recover my research. I don't know how, but they did. I thought it was lost for good. It must have something to do with that AI of theirs. I don't even care. While we were in East Africa, Dr. Sear made the connection between his research and my own. He said they've had a breakthrough, which means we might be able to help Asher regenerate the damaged cells in his brain. We could save the people of Jindala. Caleb, it's everything for which I've been working and hoping. We have discovered the molecular regeneration code. It's the final piece of the puzzle. The World Council has been summoned. Caleb looked back at the dark clouds again and responded, Look at the sky, Gavi. Things are not right in the world. I know. The two messengers are destroying everything that Alexander is trying to build. They are hostile aliens who work for their jealous and petty ancient being called Elion. I think that he has something to do with today's event. They say what happens today will change everything. Caleb, you need to be here for this. She paused for a few seconds and continued in a softer tone. Caleb, I want you to be here. Caleb was surprised at Gavi's comment, but the meaning was clear and it made him happy. It had been so long since he had felt like that. Okay, Gavi, I'll see you soon. He tapped the disconnect button and slid the phone back into his pocket. Caleb ran his hand through his hair again, unsure what to think. He walked back to the living room. Chaim was still processing the information Theron had shared. You see what I told you? They are deceiving the world. We have to do something to stop them. The world is believing the lies. It's only remnant. It's only remnant who can see through it. Professor, how do you know remnants, not the ones deceiving the world? Would you recognize if you were deceived? Chaim was surprised by the question. What? But I showed you the proof. And then your visions. How do you explain that? Clearly supernatural things are happening in the world right now. What I'm looking at is the actions and motives behind the ones using those powers or technologies. What Alexander said was true. Wherever remnant is active, there's disaster. The two messengers at the tabernacle, they're hurting and killing good soldiers and officers. They were attacked, Chaim responded, because they resisted. No harm would have come to them if they had peacefully complied. And just look at what they're doing to the world. Where do they get their powers? I'm thinking what Alexander said makes a lot more sense to me. Caleb, he is a deceiver. Open your damn eyes. Caleb started moving to the door. I'm going back to New Babel. They're going to help my brother. Chaim tried once more. No, sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry I lost my patience. Wait, you asked me earlier what Alexander Therian's role in this is? Yes. In the ancient prophecy I read to you, it talks about the dragon. It foretells a powerful leader that will rule the world. He will rise as a man of peace, but will lead the world to destruction. He is referred to as the beast. He will be the dragon's vessel for destruction of the world. I can't listen to any more of this. You must listen, Caleb. Do you know what the name Therion means in his language? Beast. It means beast. He is the beast, the ruler who will carry out the will of Enlil. A thought suddenly hit Chaim. That's it. I hadn't seen it before. The portal isn't a place. It's a person. It's him. Caleb shook his head. I'm Caleb, Kalev. You know what that means, right? It means dog. Does that make me a dog? Oh, wait, the hound of hell? Well, actually, it means Caleb had heard enough. I'm wasting my time. He walked out the door. Chaim was desperate for Caleb to understand. Wait, Caleb, come back. If you give me some more time, I will prove it to you, please. Chapter 32, Son of Perdition, Babel Tower. 
Caleb entered Babel Tower lobby like he always did, but this time he felt different. For the first time, he really noticed the statue of the dragon, and it brought back memories of the events in Jerusalem. It was the same dragon he'd seen in his vision. Chaim's explanations stuck in his head. He might accept them if not for the preposterous idea that a good, all-powerful being called God, Hashem, Wamilele, whatever, could help, but just didn't. He knew Seir was hiding something underground. Was it really a portal to let in ancient gods, as Chaim had suggested? Gabriella said he needed to get a biometric pass in the security center, but that meant he would be tracked. He still had questions, so he preferred to explore the lab and whatever else was down there without being tracked. He just needed to find a way to get down to it without arousing any suspicion. And Talos was always watching, but Talos couldn't read his mind, or at least he hoped it couldn't. Just then, Isabel Markov, with a crowd of people following, made her way to the elevator. They all stepped inside, and Isabel told Talos to go to lower level 33. When they all turned back to face the elevator, Caleb was surprised to see Brigadier Doron standing next to her. Perhaps it was something to do with the soldier program he had overheard him discuss with her. Doron was obviously desperate for solution to defeat the two. Still, he wondered if his father was aware of this visit. Brigadier Doron! Caleb! Doron knew the voice immediately. I didn't expect you here. Caleb stuck his foot in the door. Thankfully, elevators in the high-tech new Babel had the same safety features as in old buildings. The door squeezed his foot for a moment, then opened back up, and Caleb walked in like he belonged there. Therian wanted me to accompany you all to ensure your safety. One can never be too safe. He wondered if the last line was too much. Dr. Markov, Captain Baruch, is not currently authorized for access to the lower level, Talos informed. Isabel stared closely at Caleb. Caleb had learned after years of training to keep a perfectly straight face. He realized that part of his job had always been to be a good actor. Malcolm told me you were expected, Caleb. You obviously forgot to get your clearance. Caleb smiled and lifted his hands in an oops gesture. The thought occurred to Isabel that she hadn't spent much time with Caleb since he joined the New Babel staff, something that would need to be remedied in the future. He was a fine specimen indeed, she smiled. Well, no time for that now. Talos, I authorize him, Isabel finally said. The doors closed and through the glass-walled elevator, lights blurred as they descended deep below the earth to Sierra's laboratory. Ages ago, Elion, Enlil, and Man all existed in the same realm, the same plane of existence, Isabel explained. Daron stood next to her, beaming because he and she were a thing. Caleb's presence was unexpected, but Daron belonged here because he was prime minister now. Certainly, Caleb would understand that he meant his father no harm once he learned of all that had happened, but a country had to be governed properly, and Eitan Baruch simply wasn't able to do that. His arcane policies were going to sink the country into oblivion. There was no other option but to side with Theron and the Anunnaki. Caleb was unaware of Israel's political changes. Isabel continued explaining. Lord Enlil, in his sublime wisdom, stood up against Elion, who was demanding a world based on favoritism and inequality. He vowed to bring balance to the cosmos, even at great personal sacrifice, so we could eat from the proverbial tree of knowledge. He has been fighting for our freedom ever since. She agreed that Elion's system was unjust. She was willing to give credit where credit was due, why should the weak be shown any favor? The strong deserved admiration and praise. And though she would eventually become greater than Therion and Enlil, she admired the latter's ability to stand up to Elion. After descending for about eight minutes, the elevator slowed and the doors opened. Everyone stepped out into a huge cavernous space. Giant tunnels with roads and trucks extended from the base in various directions. The trucks were similar to the self-driving ones Caleb had seen on the surface. No windows, no driver's cab, fully autonomous. The scale of the operation was enormous. There were no humans in sight. An overhead line moved partially assembled components further down the assembly line. They boarded a tram and continued their journey. Isabel continued her explanation. Unfortunately, when Enlil began fighting for freedom, a thin psychical dimensional membrane, something like a veil or force field, descended between their realm and ours. Man and Enlil have attempted to overcome this barrier through portals. The Tower of Babel was just such a device. Elion, the petty being that he is, Isabel said with a joy and a lot of attitude, felt threatened by us reestablishing communication, so he scrambled the language. 
Thanks to the generosity of Therion and the genius of Malcolm Seer, we are able to finally make contact with Enlil, this most sublime ancient being who has been the greatest champion of humanity. She decided to leave out her own brilliant role in making all of these things happen, at least for the time being. She knew the importance of delayed gratification. Very soon the whole world would know of her greatness, would worship her for it. She had already outwitted Therion and had acquired Babel. The world was next. The tram stopped, they unloaded, and walked into an enormous room. Caleb stayed to the rear of the group. A metal-framed glass chamber was towering in the center of the room, with giant tubes connected to it on either side. The walls of the whole area were clad in a crystalline-type material and fiber optics. Machinery of all sorts filled the perimeter of the room. There were computers and equipment, as well as hydraulic and robotic arms, moving back and forth. Quantum computers equipped with 600 terracubits of computing power, which outpaced anything in the high-tech or governmental sector by a magnitude of millions, emitted a low rumble as they performed trillions upon trillions of computations per second. Men and women in lab coats walked around checking on the computers to ensure everything was working properly. Dr. Sear stood in front of the group, eager to welcome his first and only guest. The greatest mind in the world had little time to put on a circus. They were about to cross the glorious finish line. So why wait? The Council of Ten would be the first in the world to be made into gods, after he and Isabel, that is. He imagined how she would treat him once he became a god. She would finally worship at his feet and not him at hers. It would only be fitting that the world's most beautiful woman would idolize the smartest and most powerful man in the world, at least the most powerful after Therion. But Seer had thought about how to equalize that as well. He had more tricks up his sleeve than anyone could imagine. He would not play second fiddle forever. The world would know of his greatness, and they would worship at his feet, even if that meant he would direct them to worship Therion in the interim. Welcome! Seer didn't like small talk, so he decided to get straight to business. Behind me is the quantum field phase inducer. We will use this to create an Einstein-Rosen bridge, a wormhole that will open a portal between dimensions, which the ancients called the spiritual and physical realms. In string and M theory, they're called brains, that is, dimensions that are at right angles to one another. Just as we in the three-dimensional realm cannot exist in one dimension or two dimensions, so too it has been impossible for us to travel to a higher brain. Our brain is at a right angle to their brain, just as a 4D cube is at right angles to our 3D reality. Isabel sensed Dr. Sears' explanation was getting too detailed. Due to her having spent a lot of intimate and not just professional time with him, she knew he was apt to doing that all too often. He was brilliant, but boring. She interjected during his brief pause. Their realm is an overlay on our realm, not far away. It's on, below, and beside us. Travel from one to another has until now been impossible because entropy or decay exists in this realm. If the two realms should ever meld back together as they were initially, everything would cease to be, and that is precisely why Lord Edlil's plan was genius. Elion can never reclaim this realm without his own energy destroying it. But now, thanks to quantum computers and Seer's genius, she said with a glance like someone who knew him far more than just professionally, Seer's face lit up with a boyish pride and excitement for the machine he had made. Oh, it was so easy to manipulate him. He was such a child. She had ridden him and Theron to the top. She pursed her lips at the thought of the praise she would soon receive from the world. The thought filled her with immense pride. I am the queen, she mused. Isabel continued. We will now open up that realm and pull them back into ours to make an effect in our world. We will take advantage of their resources. Seer was eager to tell the story and took over the explanation. Once we establish communication, we will help Enlil and the Anunnaki enter our realm, and in return we will gain unlimited power. He paused to let that sink in. His guest did not seem to appreciate the magnitude of his words as much as he did. He continued without losing any enthusiasm. You see, if they come as they are, they are nothing but ghosts and spirits. Hence all of the ghost stories. With the right tool, my tool, he said, pointing to the quantum field phase inducer, they will morph with humanity and us with them. Of course, El Yon sent the two at this time to try to stop us once again. The process is actually quite easy. We simply change the polarity of the brain so they overlap and create a quantum superposition. Daron grew bored of the lecture and went back to staring at his new love, Isabel Markov. However, he kept noticing that Seer was giving her the same glances, and she smiled back almost as if they had something going on. She even pursed her lips. 
Was she in love with him or Seer? He looked at Seer. He was just an aging man with no real muscle to speak of. Had he ever fired a rifle or pistol? Could he defend himself to save his life? Daron snickered. He had nothing to fear from this man. He thought he saw in Isabel a feigned interest. She was just using Seer. She didn't love him. She wanted a real man, an alpha male, who could protect her with his muscular body and genius leadership qualities. He turned back to hear the final words of Seer's lecture. The photons in the middle are in a state of superposition. Just think how polarized lenses work. Just then, Theron entered the room, and everyone stood a little taller. Welcome, he said. His presence was powerful. He looked at Doron. Thank you, Prime Minister Doron, for assuming control of Israel in this challenging time of uncertainty. I do hope former Prime Minister Eitan Baruch heals soon. I would like to personally thank you for bringing Israel into the Babel Initiative. Without Israel's support, we were lost. Now there is truly hope. Caleb, who had been quietly observing from the back, perked up. How could that be? His father was strong and ready for service. What had happened? His heart sank. Who appointed Doron to be Prime Minister? Did someone betray his father? Doron? No, it couldn't be. He needed to ask Doron. At that moment, a squad of ten armed guards surrounded Gurabian. Down to the ground! Gurabian's eyes widened, completely surprised by the turn of events. He was dumbfounded. What was happening? He had played his part perfectly. He had been the scary threat that helped to unite the world. He could have used his power against Therian, but Therian had guaranteed he would get all that he deserved. He deserved great rewards. He deserved to have one-tenth of the world. That was their bargain. On the ground, the commander screamed. No, he, no, he would not just lie down. He would fight for what was his. He was a great general and soldier. But in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the elite guards both outmaneuvered him and outnumbered him. In a moment, he was lying on the ground, face down. One of the men knelt on his back and put handcuffs on him. Another put duct tape over his mouth. Therian paused for a moment as if listening to an inaudible voice and then said, Thank you, Talos, for letting me know Captain Baruch is here. Caleb, I present to you General Gurabian. Your efforts helped us sniff him out. Caleb wasn't aware that Therian had a mind interface with Talos. Caleb thought of the irony of finally catching up with Gurabian after searching for him for so long. Not long ago, he would have relished the opportunity to finally catch Gurabian, but now he knew... But now he knew the threat was much greater than Gurabian. There was Remnant and the two, and who knew what more was coming? Were they the first of an army? Just two was enough to fight off entire battalions with advanced weapons. How could Earth stand a chance against more of them? He needed to interrogate Gurabian and find out what more he knew. Prime Minister Daron, I would like to invite you to join the New World Council, Therian said enthusiastically. Daron's eyes lit up. He knew it. Therian had seen his leadership qualities and was advancing him. Isabel would now see how alpha he was. He had nothing to fear from the overweight and old Dr. Seer. Thank you. To be part of the New World Council is a great honor. I will serve you well. I am counting on that, Therian said while motioning him to go to Garabian. One of the guards handed Daron a knife. Therian had an ominous presence as he said, There are only ten seats on the New World Council and General Garabian is in your seat. Do you want it? Gurabian's eyes widened. How dare Therian sacrifice him? They had an agreement. He had faithfully executed his role. He had sacrificed his own people, and now he deserved what was his. He tried to speak, but the tape prevented anyone from understanding him. Daron had killed plenty of enemy soldiers in his many years in the military, but it was never like slaughtering an animal. Gurabian had served his purpose, but him being alive was a threat to Daron's position. If Israel knew how he had betrayed their soldiers in Damascus, they would destroy him. Instead, it would be known that Daron himself had eliminated Israel's most feared enemy. Daron straddled Garabin's back and put the knife to his throat. Caleb's eyes widened. His heart raced. Something was way off. This wasn't how things were done. He had questions for Garabin that needed answers. And how could Daron just agree to kill him like a lamb to the slaughter? How could Daron demand such a thing? This wasn't the Therian he thought he knew. This wasn't he wanted to protect. Was this the way of the New World Council? Why did no one object? If this was how things were done at the top, when no one was looking, then Caleb wanted nothing to do with it. Chaim's words flooded his mind. The dreams, the two, the ancient texts, Therian's name meaning, the beast. Oh no, what if Chaim was right? But that would mean that Hashem was real. Oh, his heart was conflicted. God had failed him and abandoned him. He couldn't be real. Therian was real. The UFOs were real. He had seen the enormous craft with his own eyes. 
the Babel Initiative was real and it was improving the lives of so many, or was it? Could he be the one who was deceived? He didn't know the answers, but he knew killing Gurabim like this right now was not right. Then another thought occurred to Caleb as he saw Daron there doing... Then another thought occurred to Caleb as he saw Daron there doing Therion's bidding, standing over Gurabim. It all made sense. It suddenly all made sense. Nobody knew Israeli tactics and operations better than Daron himself. All the events since Damascus flooded his mind. He was the traitor all along. Daron was the reason Amitai was dead. He was the reason Garabin always seemed two steps ahead. The attempted assassination on him, Jindala, the attack on Asher. Asher! Rage filled Caleb's being. He looked around and saw a sharp and weighted crystalline pyramid-shaped instrument on a desk, picked it up and threw it at Daron. Daron saw it coming and blocked it just before it hit him in the head. Caleb lunged at him, but the squad of guards immediately surrounded him and tried to grab hold of him. He fought as hard as he could. He took out three with rapid blows to vital organs using elbows, punches, and open palms, smashing one's windpipe and driving another's known bows right into his brain. But even he could not stop ten armed guards, and they were some of the best, since he had personally trained some of them. Three of the men shot him with a neurotoxin, which brought him crashing to the ground. His body convulsed for several seconds, then stopped. Caleb was conscious but aching from the pain. He lost all muscular control and could only observe what was about to happen. One of the guards leaned over him to remove the dart. It was Davidi. After all they had been through, how could Davidi turn on him? They made eye contact for a second, and then Davidi moved away. Ah, Talos was right, Therian exclaimed contentedly. He was able to analyze your heart rate and smell to know something was different about you. He said there was a 73% chance you had disloyal intentions, and now we know that to be the case. Bind him hand and foot. I would lie if I said I wasn't at least somewhat disappointed. I really thought you might be ready. I had high hopes for you, Caleb, and so many plans. So many years I've invested in you to shape you and make you the man you are today, creating points of trauma so that I could activate you when the time had come. You could see the confusion on Caleb's face. Yes, including your parents. Theron laughed at his own genius. I know who you are, Caleb Baruch. I know you better than you know yourself. I programmed you. I created you. I underestimated, though, what influence Baruch would have over you and your connection to Israel. I shouldn't be surprised, though. You are a son of David, after all. But soon I won't have to bother with those outdated methods of mind control. So bothersome. So ineffective or those barbaric means of torture to get information like we had to use on your brother to get the secret name Chaim kept hidden from us all those years. Caleb cringed. You know all about torture, don't you, Caleb? Caleb's heart sank. Using torture on Israel's enemies was justified, but on his own brother was unthinkable. His mind raced, seeking a means of escape, but nothing came. Oh, I can't wait for you to see what I have in store for you, Theron smiled. Enlil had been right. Of course he had. The son of Baruch would fulfill his role in this game. Caleb had to be the Judas for the moment. Then he, Therian, would be glorified before all humanity. Therian turned back toward Daron, who was nursing his arm where the object had hit it. Shall we continue? Daron resumed his position over Garabin, put the cold blade to his throat, and pulled it quickly to one side. He had not noticed that, in the interim, a bowl had been placed under Garabin's neck, and Isabel was there saying her incantations as the man died. Caleb witnessed the slaying, but was bound and too weak to do anything but sigh in despair. He couldn't believe how wrong he'd been about Therian. His mind reeled with everything Therian just said. What did all that mean? Was he just being manipulated? He still wasn't sure Chaim's claims about Hashem were right, but his claims about Therian absolutely were. Then he worried about his father. What had Daron done? Oh, how had he not seen this coming? Was Gurabi nothing more than a diversion? What a fool he'd been. It was unbelievable. And his little brother Asher had been right. He was so arrogant to not believe him. Caleb's eyes welled up and tears gushed uncontrollably. For the first time in a long time, he was not able to control his feelings. He wasn't crying about being physically bound. No, these were tears of remorse and regret. Tears that fell because he had failed Israel. He failed Asher and Amitai. These tears he shed because he failed his father. His tears flowed for a long time. 
Excellent, Therian motioned toward Doron. I present to you the newest member of the New World Council, Prime Minister Magan Doron. Doron nodded slightly, feeling proud but awkward at the same time. Now that these unpleasantries are over, Therian said, pointing to Garabian's corpse, let's move on. What I'm about to do might cost me my life, but I am doing it to rid the world of the two, once and for all, and to restore hope for humanity. Yes, he, Therian, would die, but he would be reborn with all of Enlil's power, throne, and authority. The world would be his. What had the carpenter said? He who loses his life will gain it? We are entering a new era. We will reach into the improbable and resequence ourselves into a new being, supernatural, incorruptible, eternal. Enlil's attributes will be mine, Therian proclaimed and then entered the chamber. Gavi was lost in thought, wondering why Caleb had not come as he had said he would. This would undoubtedly be the greatest achievement in human history, the culmination of her life's work, and all she could think of was that she wanted to share it with him. She was so sure he would come. Focus, Gavi, you have more important things to think about right now. She had no idea of what had just transpired on the other side of the lab. News spread throughout the laboratory that an attack by General Gurabin himself had been averted and the tyrant eliminated, and a dangerous traitor had also been captured. Gavi was frankly glad for the world to be rid of the one who had caused so much harm and had threatened Theron's Babel initiative. She did find it surprising, though, that Gurabin had gained access to the high security facility. She would usually have questioned an oddity like that more, but since her biometric check-in upon arrival, she hadn't quite felt herself. She still wasn't able to do all she was meant to do, but her mind seemed incapable of retaining information beyond her routine. Within moments, all thoughts of Caleb and Garabin had faded from her mind. The only thing she could think of was Therian's procedure, and it filled her with joy. Caleb had been taken to a separate glass-encased room. The armor-plated one-way glass window overlooked the chamber and the lab below. The only thing in the room was a large X-shaped structure in the center of a carved circle with a pentagram etched into the floor. The room was dark except for the light coming through the tinted window. It stank of sulfur and dried blood. Caleb wondered if it was human. Based on what he had just witnessed, that was likely. Was that what Therian had planned for him? Would that be how it would end? Would he be sacrificed to Therian's god? They spread Caleb's arms and legs and shackled them to each leg of the X. His head was held upright by a titanium bracket that was bolted to the structure. Even at full strength, Caleb knew he would not be able to escape let alone in his current condition. He could feel the toxin slowly weakening. From Caleb's position, he could see everything. He could see Therian in front of the chamber. He saw Doron and the rest of the ten in an opposite viewing area. He saw Gavi attending Therian. She had no idea what a monster Therian was. Gavi. He tried to shout to warn her, but only gargled sounds came from his mouth. She could not hear him, though, and she could not see him through the dark glass. Gavi checked Therian's vitals. What a moment this was. They had cracked the molecular regeneration code. How many millions, no billions, would be saved? No more sickness or degenerative diseases, and possibly even an end to death. She was sure her formula would work, but still, there was always a risk. And how fortunate that the Anunnaki had come along when they did. They were able to provide the missing key genetic sequences. Dr. Seer had explained to her how Enlil himself would donate his uncorrupted DNA through a temporary meld with Alexander like a DNA transfusion. As soon as the meld happened, the combined DNA would be extracted and synthesized into a serum, which would then be immediately replicated. In a matter of weeks, enough would be produced to distribute to every person on the planet. Gavi marveled at the implications. Indeed, life on Earth would never be the same. Therian was so brave to be the first to try it on himself, leading the world through his example. He truly was a great leader. She knew the science books would have to be rewritten after this, and she would write a detailed account of everything they had done and the results. Gavi wondered if she would one day be able to interact with the Anunnaki directly and to learn all about their sciences. Merging with these benevolent beings who had been watching over humanity was a gift. If there was a god, then he must have sent them. She smiled to herself. Dr. Seer handed a syringe to her, and while the council watched, she carefully injected it into Therian's arm. Gavi said, The nanoreceptors are now ready for input. 
Therian nodded. Seer gave everything a last-minute check. He looked over to Gavi and raised two fingers, then waved it in a circular gesture. Gavi turned around and walked back up to the control room from where she could monitor the process and keep an eye on Alexander's vitals. She was lost in the glory of the moment and paid no attention as the four priestesses, who were summoning Enlil with the blood of Gurabian, took their positions around Therian. Isabel, the high priestess of Inanna, walked up to him, took his hand, and ran her knife across his palm, spilling his blood into a separate basin. She collected the blood and set it on the floor inside the six-sided metallic glass chamber. Gavi couldn't clearly see from her position what Isabel was doing, but she recognized that it was some kind of ritual. She just shook her head at the thought that an enlightened man like Therian would be bothered with superstition. The chamber measured about 10 feet in diameter and was 18 feet high. Hoses, pipes, and electrical lines were running into it. In the center was a stainless steel stool. Therian stepped inside the chamber and the door closed and sealed behind him. He sat down on the tall metallic stool that was bolted to the floor in the center of the pentagram. The council members stood. They were ushered to an upstairs glass-encased gallery overlooking the chamber and the team's work area. Antonio and the rest of the team were sitting behind a row of monitors. Seer hurried over and was joined by Gavi. Seer picked up a pair of dark lensed goggles and put them on. The rest of the team followed suit. Antonio looked up to the gallery and pointed to his goggles, indicating for everyone else to put on their goggles. Seer checked the monitors one last time and nodded to Antonio, who tapped on the screen. Inside the tubes that were connected to the main chamber, bright beams of light began shooting back and forth at high speed. The speed increased until the various beams seemed to meld into one. The sound was like that of a wind vortex growing louder as the light grew brighter. Seer tapped on the screen again and the chamber began turning slowly. When the chamber reached a predetermined marker, hydraulic latches locked the chamber in place. All the spectators leaned forward in their seats. From their vantage point, they could see the two bright beams of light in the tubes on either side of Therion. An electronic latch dropped and the two beams of light shot into the chamber, causing an explosion of light. Even with the goggles on, it was hard to see Therion clearly. After a while, the beams of light began to focus, creating streaks of brilliant light bouncing around the chamber until Therion was enveloped in a cocoon of light. The beams appeared to bend until Therian was in the center of a revolving double helix. It spun faster and faster. Then in the middle, right in front of Therian, a dark hole began to open. Like a miniature black hole, it sucked in the surrounding light, growing larger and larger. A wormhole was forming in front of their eyes. The dark matter mixed with the light, pushing it back into the tubes, with flashes of electricity pulsing throughout. Streams of electric current flowed through Therian's body, lifting him off the ground. Suspended six feet off the ground, he was in the center of the dark void, weightless, with his arms stretched out. He convulsed uncontrollably from the effect of the electric current and magnetic field as though his body was trying to keep something out. The spectators were transfixed by the events playing out in front of them. Gavi checked his vitals. They were through the roof. This is getting dangerous. I think his body is fighting the nanoreceptors. He's in sensory overload. She pulled out a vial from her workstation cabinet. She noticed an empty spot where another vial had been removed and paused for just a moment to reflect, then shut the cabinet. She quickly inserted the vial into the machine. Inside the chamber, a long arm with a needle at the end injected the contents into his blood. After a few seconds, the convulsion stopped. His heart rate settled down and his blood pressure normalized. What was that? Daron quizzed. It's my formula which serves as a decoy to the brain so that it won't reject foreign inputs and treatments. Alexander is the first to have experienced what he did today. The level of energy and radiation he was exposed to would have killed anyone else. But the treatment, the MRC, is rewriting and regenerating the code in his DNA, which theoretically is fighting cellular decay and restoring the cells as we saw earlier. The nanos embedded in his brain serve to both stimulate cognitive function as well as enhance transmission of commands from the brain to the receptors in the rest of the body. And is everything working? Daron was concerned. He had just gotten a promotion and had betrayed the Prime Minister. He didn't want Therian to die now, just when everything was going so well. Gavi was delighted to share how the process worked. Like we know with transplant patients, sometimes a body will reject the transplant and begin to fight against it. That's what I believe happened here. The nanos were able to reach some parts of the brain, but not all. The brain resisted. The nanos, as intruders, began fighting back. Hopefully now the nanos will be able to bypass the brain barrier and be delivered 
deep into the prefrontal cortex, the decision-making area of the brain. In essence, it allows Alexander to will it into effect. So basically, the brain has to accept the MRC for it to take effect? Correct. His body is rejecting the process, Gavi noted while nervously biting her lip. He must choose to accept the meld. In the wormhole, Theron found himself alone, shivering in the darkness as the wind whipped over jagged peaks of a mountain. He knew it to be Mahermon, the majestic mountain, Enlil's mountain. He soon felt the foreboding presence of an enormous and luminous being towering over him. Lord Enlil, he proclaimed, understanding who stood before him. In a moment, Enlil presented a panoramic view of the kingdoms of the world and all their glory before him. It was impressive. The power, money, fame, skyscrapers, rockets, missiles, armies, and nuclear weapons beckoned him to claim them. All these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Finally, the world would be his to command. No one would be able to stand against him, and all would fall before him. He had no second thoughts. Without any hesitation, he fell prostrate before Enlil. There is none like you, O Enlil. You are the god of light and god of good. Thank you for showing me the light. I pledge my fidelity to you alone. Therian lifted his head, fixing his eyes on the one who could grant him his wildest dreams. I want the key to the dynamo of living power. I want immortality, your throne, your power, and your great authority. Then together we may prevail in your ancient struggle to shake off the binders of Elyon. Take my body, mind, and soul. They are yours to command. They... Then both chanted in unison, Anaku Bad Bad Anaku Gug. Then his body went limp, still hovering in the air. As those up in the gallery watched, Enlil appeared partially materialized in the chamber, though not as a glorious being of light as Therian had seen him before, but in his normal, hideous, black, and shriveled appearance. He dipped his hand into the vial with Therian's blood, and his ghostly form took on more resolution. In his semi-materialized form, Enlil walked into Therion's back, immaterial into material. Their bodies were in superposition, perfectly superimposed, hand in hand, chest in chest, face in face. The hum of the quantum computers powering the device whirred methodically in the background. Therion and Enlil lingered there for several minutes. The quantum entanglement process was underway, and their DNA merged. The next moment, light burst out from all of Theron's pores and his body glowed dark blue. His stature became taller. His torso became thicker and more muscular. His face became bolder and harsher. His eyes darkened and glowed red for a moment. Superimposed over Theron's body was a faintly ghostly black and hideous form. Then for a moment Theron's body pulsed like a shimmering jewel refracting light in every direction and he appeared to have wings. Caleb saw it all happen. For most of his life, he had chosen not to believe in anything he could not see and considered those who did believe in spiritual things to be ignorant. But there was no denying that what he was seeing was real. It was real and it was evil. The empty room suddenly felt dense, suffocating. The pentagram beneath him seemed almost to glow. Dark shadows came up through the floor from the five points of the pentagram. They began to circle Caleb, lashing out, their claws slicing into him. Though no wounds showed on his body, the pain was very real. Like multiple sharp razor blades, it lashed him again and again. Caleb tried to fight back the fear, tried to fight it with logic. Did they inject him with a hallucinogenic? Was it another nightmare? The next moment, the shadows melted into one giant shadow, eyes glowing red, sulfurous smoke dripping from its gnarling mouth. It leapt onto Caleb, sinking its claws into his brain. Whatever resistance Caleb had was gone. Fear washed over him like a flood. Images flashed into his mind. The bodies of his parents brutally murdered. His adoptive mother riddled with cancer. Half-dead Syrians cradling their children in their arms as their skin melted off their bodies. Amitai reaching out to him, mouth agape. His body enveloped in flames. He saw the bodies of Jindala's dead, thousands of them. Then Caleb saw a cascade of faces of enemies he had killed in battle, most without a second thought. He saw the young Rahul on the rooftop in Damascus, and he saw Amar. He saw those he had tortured and killed in his search for Gurabin and Amir Atta lying in a pool of blood. The shadow spoke with as many voices repeating the words, Killer, murderer, slayer of souls, as it drove its claws deeper into his skull. Guilt and shame washed over him. 
Then Caleb saw himself in Jerusalem, and the bodies of dead people were everywhere, on the streets and parks, wherever he looked. It was so real. Caleb looked up from the Kidron Valley to the eastern wall and the Temple Mount beyond that. On top of the wall was the dragon, more fearsome than ever. Beneath the dragon, the walls of Jerusalem were red with blood. The voice spoke again, saying, Worship the beast, son of David. Bow before him, lest you feel his wrath. Caleb shook his head in agony. He had never experienced such dread before. Even death would be preferred. A thought faintly entered Caleb's mind. If those entities existed, perhaps Hashem did, too. Please, if you're real, help me. The shadow jerked Caleb's head in anger. It didn't want to let go, but for the moment it had to. As its claws released Caleb's mind, it said, You belong to us, and we will have you, Baruch. It slid down his body and melted back into the floor. Caleb was shaken, his body trembling. What evil was about to be unleashed on the world? Below in the chamber, Enlil Theron was a spectacular sight to behold in the full display of his glory. They had become one being. Isabel turned to Seer. The merge is complete. Do it now. Seer pulled down on a control switch. Needles jabbed into Therian's forearms. Blood started running up the tubes attached to the clasps through the roof of the chamber. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, spirit of my spirit, spoke the voice of Enlil. Seer looked in with awe. He removed his goggles and stepped up to the chamber, placing his hands on the glass. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, spirit of my spirit. Seer repeated the words. Therian's blood ran up through the tubes, through the roof, and down into a sealed vial. Seer was mesmerized by Enla, who was staring right at him through Therian's eyes. Therian's face morphed back and forth between his and Enlil's. It was hard for Seer to accept that this moment had finally come. After so many years of searching, studying, struggling, he had done it. He'd created a portal through which the ancient beings would come to our world. Finally, humans could mingle with the gods, who would give humankind their powers, knowledge, and resources. Seer had finally made contact with the gods, who wanted to help the world evolve to be strong like them, not like the god who died on the cross. He thought about his wasted days in the church, how foolish he had been before. But now, now he would become more powerful than any god. The next moment, Therian's head snapped back and his body began contorting in pain. Antonio ran up to Seer, who acted like he was in a trance. Dr. Seer, we need to close the vortex. He won't be able to take it much more. It's unstable. Seer slowly turned to look at Antonio, then coming out from his thoughts, He realized what was going on around him. Uh, Yes, yes, we need to disengage now. Seer returned to the control center. He rapidly typed on the keyboard and slid his hand across the switch. The vortex began closing. The light emanating from Therian's body dimmed, and his body gave a final jerk as if something were pulled from him. The latches closed again, and the chamber returned to its original position. Therian dropped to the floor in exhaustion. The light beam slowed down and eventually stopped completely. Seer walked over to the slot where the vial containing Therian's extracted blood was secured. A light shone down into it. Seer spoke into the control tablet. Talos, analyze the blood sample. Analyzing, sample is good. DNA sequencing in process. Quantum communication established. Seer smiled. We've got it. Chapter 33, Hive Mind Therian, who had until then been weak and not been able to stand, felt power surge through his body. He felt each of his trillions of cells transform one by one. The sensation was beyond all imagination or expectation, more sensual and intoxicating than any drug or earthly pleasure he had ever encountered. The seething power of Enlil was in his very DNA. He was transformed. He was transhuman, even post-human. He had fused with Enlil, transcended humanity, and ascended to divinity. Enlil's thoughts were his. Enlil's hands were his. Enlil's feelings, desires, wisdom, hatred, power, authority, and throne were now Therian's. He sat upright, completely alert. Therian looked around the room, his eyes wide and awake. He leapt up from the floor. I am a new creation, Therian spoke in an ancient Sumerian dialect only Seer and Isabel could understand. But he wasn't addressing the humans anyway. He was declaring it to the domain beyond the veil. Born anew, the shackles of Elyon which bound me are gone. I have transcended humanity and have become incorruptible. I have perfect knowledge and perfect will. I have become a god. 
I will now take the universe into my hands and transform it into my image for my own delight. There is no God but me. As it is on earth, so it shall be in the heavens. Looking around, he saw beyond the thin psychical dimensional membrane that separated the two domains. Millions of dark, malevolent beings prostrated themselves before him, ready to do his will. They were his to command. He looked higher and saw a yet higher realm. I curse you. I will cut down your people and prosper, he shouted. My name shall be greatly extolled above every other. To me, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that I am Ninurta, Lord of the earth. Theron looked down at the bandages around his wrists and pulled them off. In front of their eyes, the puncture wounds and bruises healed. He clenched his fists and flexed his muscles. I feel strong in my mind. It's incredible. Isabel was beside herself in excitement. Dinger Ninurta, Lipu Enlil. God Ninurta, son of Enlil. Isabel announced. Behold Ninurta, God, son of Enlil, Lord of the earth, your liberator. Seer's eyes were wide. What do you feel? Therian blinked his eyes for a few times. He looked down at his hands. I feel power. He smiled and looked around. In the next moment, the lights in the building began flashing on and off. The chamber started up again. Electric lighting began flashing around in the giant tubes. Seer ran to the controls where Antonio was already trying to disable it. Antonio said, I don't know what's happening. I can't shut it down. Seer wasn't having any success either. It's going too fast. Talos, override, override, Talos. Theron laughed. They looked at him and wondered if he was the one controlling the machine. He tapped his head with his finger and then snapped his fingers. The chamber shut down again and the lights came back on. Talos is now part of me. Very impressive work on the coating, Malcolm. It just needed a few improvements. Seer nervously walked up to Therian. You changed Talos's code? How did you... He hadn't counted on that. In fact, he had programmed Talos so that it would eventually respond to only him. That was the ace up his sleeve. So he would rise to the top. Hmm, there might still be a way. Theron smiled at Seer's reaction. He knew what Seer was thinking. He knew that he would betray him, given the chance. So would Isabel, Daron, and the whole lot. It didn't matter. No one could withstand him now. He had the raging power of Enlil flowing through him now that he and Enlil had become one. The council had come back downstairs. Isabel and all the others moved closer to see Therion, while Seer had left to go see how Dr. Levy was doing with the synthesis of the master sample and the preparations for mass replication. Therion turned to face the council. Today is a new dawn in the evolution of man. We have taken control of our destinies and rewritten the very laws of nature itself. We will no longer be slaves to entropy and decay. Our new world defies death. There's no limit to what we can do together. Everybody cheered. Ninurta, the new Therion, a breathing avatar of Enlil himself, stood in front of his subjects. Daron and the nine others bowed down before him in fear, sensing his power and authority as never before. The entity before them was no longer Therion. He was altogether different, foreboding, dark, merciless, and dreadful. My faithful subjects, I am son of Enlil, Enlil incarnate, I am Ninurta, Lord of the Earth, your God. Obey me and live. Seer walked up to Theron with news. We have synthesized your blood, and I have administered it to myself. Seer already felt stronger, smarter, braver, taller, and even thinner. He felt the surge of power already flowing through his body as his trillions of cells transformed. It works, my lord. Seer bowed before Theron. We can begin transforming all of them, and we will be done within the hour. Therian motioned to his subjects. Come, I want you to share in my power, throne, and authority, so you'll be the first to become gods, along with me and Dr. Seer. Daron and all the Council of Ten received an injection of the hybridized DNA, and once the new DNA was transported by nanobots to every cell in their bodies, Daron felt a dark, overwhelming power rushing through his body. Each cell underwent a transformation as his DNA was being rewritten with Enlil's and Therion's hybridized DNA. He could sense his mental capacity, strength, and abilities increase enormously. He realized he possessed nearly the same powers as Therion. In his mind's eye, Doron saw a door, and someone was knocking. He opened it. There was Enlil, in his glorious form, not the hideous black form that he had seen earlier. Permit me to enter your mind, and you will not just have immortality and superhuman ability, 
but you will have my mind, too. You will reign with me on the council of ten. My destiny will be your destiny. Bow down to me, and I will come in. Daron was so glad he had listened to Isabel. He started to bow, and then another mighty humanoid being of light showed up out of nowhere. Son of Adam, the being spoke with compassion, if you let him in through the door, you will be tormented with the fullness of Elyon's wrath and will have no relief. Daron paused. Such a threat was severe and horrible, if it were true, but Enlil's demonstration of power was so real and present. Theron would soon dispose of the two annoying terrorists, and then Doron would begin establishing his own empire. No, he would not fear such a threat, but would press forward. He would do what was right in his own eyes. He bowed, and Enlil came in. Immediately, Doron's mind flooded with knowledge about humanity, the earth, and the ancient struggle against Elyon. He reveled in the ecstasy of his power, ability, and knowledge, and along with it his sense of pride and arrogance rose to untold heights. He was the greatest there ever was. Decay, age, and death had no power over him any more. Millennia to come would be his to live. He realized that he was a god. He scoffed at that being's attempt to scare him. New thoughts entered his mind. He thought about how he would rule the world and do what was right in his own eyes, how he would eventually ascend above the heights of the clouds and plant his throne above Therion, above Enlil, even above Elion himself. Suddenly his ethereal moment was interrupted by an impulse to submit to Therion. He sensed the other nine in his mind. They had undergone the same experience, made the same decision, and were sharing a common impulse. The same arrogant thoughts had flooded their minds, too. But Therion's will had dominated theirs. They all sensed their individuality was ruled by Therion. There would be no dissension, no disagreement, no discussion. There would only be adherence to Therion's will and desire, and only one that mattered. They had become part of his image. They were of one mind and knew what they had to do. In unison, they said, we give our authority to you, for you alone are worthy to exercise dominion over us and the earth. All we have we give to you, Lord Ninurta. Isabel had received the MRC as well. Her heart was racing with anticipation of what was to come. At last she could break free from Elion. In her mind's eye she saw a door and heard a knock coming from it. She strode up the door and opened it. It was Enlil standing gloriously. Permit me to enter your mind, and you will have not just immortality and superhuman ability, but you will have my mind, too. My destiny will be your destiny. Bow down to me, and I will come in. No, she said firmly, standing her ground. We have a deal which you must honor, or I will call on Elion. She despised Elion, but she knew Enlil could not afford for her to turn on him now. She knew too much. She was too powerful, and Enlil knew it. You will grant me your power and mind, but Babel becomes mine, and I will not bow my knee to you. I am the master riding the beast. He carries me where I wish to go. Oh, the glory, she felt commanding Enlil. After so many thousands of years, here she was, finally commanding the king of darkness. She had played her cards perfectly, and now he found himself in a legal bind. The very game he had played to steal earth from the creator, leaving the creator with heaven, she was now using against Enlil. This battle they waged against Elyon was not won by possessing greater strength, but by holding greater authority. Elyon had foolishly entrusted mankind with his authority over earth, and they innocently gave it to Enlil. Once the authority was forfeited, it was gone, and only through legal action could it be remedied. Yes, Elyon had come to redeem it, but the foolish humans kept giving it away. Now Enlil would take back the planet, and be lord of the earth. That was fine. She could not fight the battle by herself. She would let him fight the greatest battle, and she would have her slice of the kingdom, where she would be queen supreme, the queen of heaven, Ishtar reborn. All men would worship at her feet. She could feel her ultimate victory, as she had known it those many years ago when they had found Gilgamesh. Granted, Enlil said. Immediately her mind surged with untold knowledge from Enlil's mind. She looked at the New World Council, at Theron and Seer. They were pawns that she had used to ascend to greatness. She had ridden atop Theron all these years, and now she would be the greatest goddess there ever was, the Lady of Kingdoms forever. There would be none beside her. She would never see sorrow. One day she would take what was Enlil's too. 
Therian smiled as they worshipped him. Seer and Isabel stood beside him. His satisfaction would only be complete once the two thorns in his flesh were dead and lying in the streets for all to see. He immediately left the laboratory and set up for Jerusalem. The ten followed. Chapter 34 Triumphal Entry Jerusalem, Israel Interim Prime Minister Daron stood behind a podium at the front of the lookout point on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. The lookout point was built out of a beautiful Jerusalem stone in a semicircle in amphitheater style. There were dozens of news crews, some from Israel and some international reporters who were normally stationed in Israel. Toda, thank you everyone for coming today. Daron was so excited about the announcement he was about to make. Earth had no idea what was coming. I invited you all here to witness a historic event today, the 10th of Nisan of the Hebrew calendar. Since the beginning of the Babel Initiative, Therian has offered us a chance to become one and to transform our world from its old ways into something better and brighter. Yet that progress threatened a cosmic power who sent the two. We have all suffered at their hands. They have plagued our planet since the moment they arrived. Why hasn't Therian done anything to stop the two already? An Israeli reporter interjected. What has he been waiting for? That is an excellent question. It will be answered in just a moment. I promise Daron felt insulted that he had to talk to these lower life forms. They didn't realize who they were talking to. He was a god. But he must follow Theron's directives and play the game with these rodents a bit longer. Since taking the office of interim prime minister, I realized that if we were to survive as a race, then we must be united. That is why, unlike my predecessor, I have decided to sign the Babel Initiative, making Israel one of the last but the most important member of this multi-nation covenant. Daron then went to a small table and sat down on the chair. He took up his pen and signed Therian's Babel Initiative. The document itself was just a formality. All Therian needed was a yes from Israel's legal representative in front of world witnesses. Just as he put the pen down, a massive peal of thunder boomed and thousands of orbs of light appeared overhead. The media immediately trained their cameras on them. Then they saw a figure in a standing position moving quickly through the air. As he came closer, people realized it was Therion, and they started speculating about what was happening. Therion landed and went to the podium. Do not be alarmed, Therion said confidently. Those beings above us are on our side, and greater are they that are with us than those that are with the two. The orbs hovered above Jerusalem and didn't move. Why haven't I dealt with the two yet? Therion said, picking up the reporter's question. I haven't yet because there are forces bigger than any of you can imagine operating behind the scenes. We are in the midst of an ancient battle. The two came to terrorize the earth so that we would give in to the demands of El Yon, the ancient one. Until Israel joined the Babel Initiative, my hands were tied. Now that you have joined, I have the legal right to be here. In other words, I was not authorized to stop them. I am now. Thanks to the wise leadership of Prime Minister and New World Council member Doron, I finally have that authority. The reporters and cameramen all cheered, something untypical for the press. The thought that the terror of the two would finally be over filled them with hope. He's coming to judge the earth, the two finished delivering their warning in yet another country and another town. Just then they felt a disruption in the cosmic order. They looked into the sky. They could see beyond the psychical dimensional membrane separating the two dimensions. Enlil's forces, which had largely been contained behind it, began to pass through it like water through a colander. They felt their bodies change. Suddenly, in contrast to the sweet fragrance of Elion's presence, they realized they were smelling the odor of degeneration, decay, and death. The smells reminded them of their former lives. They both shot their hands to their hearts. They felt the sting of mortality set in. They could sense their bodies beginning to wither, and their auras were slowly fading. Enlil has regained lordship over the planet. And Therion is his vessel in this dimension, the other said dryly. He hopes to undo what Arye accomplished when he defeated Enlil, god of death, and regained dominion of the earth, the other said. They said no more. They had little time until they were as weak as any other. To humans, Enlil's fighting forces that were descending through the membrane looked like glowing orbs, but the two saw their true hideous and dark forms. They headed straight for the two. Unable to hide and already feeling mortality setting in, they opened a portal and stepped onto the Temple Mount of Jerusalem, where the newly built tabernacle stood. 
Therian, you are looking different. Have you been working out? All the reporters laughed timidly at the badly timed joke. Therian smirked. These peons had no concept of who he'd become. They were like bugs that he could squash at any moment. I have become one with Enlil. From now on, call me Ninurta, son of Enlil, lord of the earth. Jerusalem is my footstool. I will place my name here. I will fight and will not rest until the two and their master are destroyed. Doron walked up to Therian and whispered something in his ear. Yes, you need not tell me, he said disdainfully. I saw them coming. They are running because they have been stripped of their authority. This is the only place on earth where they can survive, but they have fallen into my trap. In the distance, the media could see the two hovering hundreds of feet over the Temple Mount, back to back, speaking in two directions. You scornful rulers, you have made a covenant with death. You did not love truth and have found refuge in lives. Blow the shofar. The dreadful day of doom and gloom is coming. The sun and moon will grow dark. Truly that day will be wretched, abominable, and more terrifying than anything you have ever known. Your only hope is to welcome Arye, the precious cornerstone in the name of Elion. The media looked longingly at Therion, and he loved it. They were like lost sheep. He would be their shepherd. The two are like cornered rats and will use any last tricks remaining, Therion scoffed. By Passover, they'll be gone. Chapter 35 Liberation New Babel Caleb's body was back to strength, but his mind was still reeling from the nightmarish encounter with the shadow. The terrifying vision of Jerusalem had seemed so real. Was it a vision of the future? Please, no, it can't be. He had to stop Therian somehow and reveal to the world all he saw and warn them of the evil to come. Would they believe him? He hardly believed it himself. The two, I need to find them. They'll be able to stop Therian. He had to find his father and together with those loyal to him, retake the government of Israel. Caleb yanked as hard as he could against the shackles, but they were too strong. Stop fantasizing, Caleb. You're not getting out of this. There's nothing you can do to stop him. The next moment, the door of the chamber opened. Caleb drew his breath. Was this it? Did they come to finish what they had started? He only heard one set of footsteps come closer. The silhouette of a man moved into view. Caleb, it's me, Davidi. You bastard, shouted Caleb. You traitor. He spat at Davidi, but Davidi managed to jump out of the way just in time. No, wait, I'm on your side. He raised his palms toward Caleb in an assuring gesture. I'm here to get you out. I'm sorry I couldn't stop them before. There were just too many of them, and some of them were enhanced soldiers. I had to wait for an opportunity to come to you. Therian had commanded that you were not to be killed, so I counted on that. By the way, what the hell have you gotten me involved with here? Davidi looked at how Kayla was shackled and the pentagram on the floor. There was a stench of death in the room. What sick deeds had been done there? It made his stomach turn, just trying to imagine. As a special op soldier, he was used to seeing brutal sights on the battlefield, but that was war. Soldier against soldier, army against army. It was different than this. Spiritual things gave him the creeps, and the quicker he could leave that place, the better. He had seen enough that day to know he didn't want any part of it. No job was worth that, even one that paid really well. He examined the clamps and saw that they were held in place with lock bolts behind the X structure, impossible for the captive to reach, but not a problem for the captor. Davidi pulled the bolts, releasing the clamps and freeing Caleb. Caleb was still shaken by his experience. He pointed toward the lab. Did you see what happened in there? Davidi nodded. Yeah, I saw it. Pretty wild. Caleb rubbed his bruised wrists. Then he remembered Gavi. I need to get to Gavi, he said urgently. She's gone to Jerusalem. They took a case of those ampules with them. We need to get to Jerusalem fast. I have a feeling if we don't stop Therian today, it will be too late. And we'll need to get reinforcements. The problem is, the moment the cameras see me, Talos will know I've escaped. I think I know a way, but first you need to change, said Davidi. Inside the door of the chamber was a soldier that Davidi had taken out before entering. Caleb stripped the man's uniform so he could change into it. While he was changing, Davidi said, That shot, I saw Doron take it. It changed him instantly. I could swear he got more buff, and old Dr. Seer, too. They actually looked younger. But the strange thing was, it was like Big T was controlling their minds. At one point, they all said the exact same thing at the exact same time. Very weird. Caleb looked up from a bootstrap he was focused on. Did Gavi take it? Davidi shook his head. I think only the council so far. Seer and Markov, too. Dr. Levy wasn't there when they did it. Caleb's heart sank. 
He needed to stop Gavi before she took it and before she gave it to anybody else. The last thing the world needed now was an army of superpowered Therian clones. Now tell me about the way out, Caleb said as he tied the last button and picked up the soldier's weapon. It's the tunnels. Early this morning, two of us were sent there to escort a shipment that arrived from Jerusalem. It was something for Dr. Levy. Jerusalem? Are you telling me there is a tunnel that reaches Jerusalem from here? Yeah, and from what the other guy told me, it's a whole system of tunnels that go to various major cities and locations. When we leave the room, we are going to take a left. I'll go right. Walk until you get to a door that leads to a stairway. Go down two flights. When you exit, follow the direction of the overhead conveyors. You'll find the tunnels. The one marked with the Israeli flag is what you want. Hitch a ride with the next hauler in the load bay. You won't have to wait long. Seemed to me it was non-stop loading going on there. Hopefully it goes all the way. I'll stay back and try to keep them off your scent as long as possible, and then I'll be getting out of here too. Caleb nodded in agreement. Thank you, Davidi. If any of the other recruits are still loyal to Israel, pull them out of here. But not those loyal to Daron. He's a traitor. You know the guys. Just be careful of Talos. It sees and hears everything. I'm sorry I pulled you into this. I didn't know. Get to Jerusalem as fast as you can. There's work to be done. Okay, let's go. As they left the room, Caleb turned away from the lab and walked briskly down a long passageway. He kept his head slightly tilted down to avoid the camera's facial recognition system. He knew Talos could use various other identifiers, but it first needed to know it was looking for something or someone. For the time being, it did not know he had escaped. He found the stairway and ran down the two levels. As Davidi said, it was clear the direction the conveyors were moving. He followed it until it reached the tunnel system. The tunnels were huge. What were they transporting? He knew of the transport systems above ground that distributed food and various other goods to the world, but this was something else. He looked for the Jerusalem tunnel and waited. An autonomous transport hauler with a large load bay came to a halt. The conveyor system began loading it with various mechanical and hydraulic components. Caleb slipped around the back of the vehicle and climbed up the side, out of view. As soon as the hauler pulled away, Caleb climbed to the top and found a more secure spot between the components. Caleb thought about Gavi again. He was worried for her safety. He had to save her, and he had to save Israel. How would he do it? He didn't know. As he traveled down the tunnel, Caleb was stunned to discover mile upon mile of military equipment lined up in gigantic storage facilities ready to be deployed. There were other tunnels that branched off from the one he was on. The scale of it was all mind-boggling. There was equipment he didn't recognize. The strangest was what looked like mechanical creatures, more than he could count or even estimate. The hauler was traveling fast, but it still took a while to pass all the creatures. It was clear Theron was planning to go to war. There were as many other tunnels leading from the Babel Tower, and Caleb deduced each of those tunnels led to various other cities, each with its own armory. No military on earth could stand a chance. As Caleb neared the end of the tunnel, the vehicle slowed down. Caleb could see that up ahead was a huge underground loading area and thousands of uniformed soldiers wearing the same uniform as his, that of the Global Council. He had no idea New Babel, the Global Council, even had an army that size. Caleb waited till the vehicle slowed down sufficiently and leapt off just in time. He ran to the side wall of the tunnel, peering around the corner to see if anyone had noticed him. It seemed they hadn't. Caleb slipped out and blended in among the other uniformed soldiers. They were all armed and geared up for battle, just awaiting orders. Caleb's heart sank as he realized Jerusalem was their target, and no one there had any idea what was right beneath their feet. One of the officers noticed Caleb's division marking on the uniform. Your new Babel division, why are you here? Caleb had to think quickly. He wanted to get to the Temple Mount, where he had last encountered the two. I've been reassigned to Temple Mount Protection, sir. I'm a Hebrew speaker. Hmm, well, you're late. Temple Mount Division is about to ascend, he pointed in a direction. Get there now. Caleb ran past the other soldiers in the direction the sergeant had pointed. He came upon a large structure with three sides. He guessed about 600 soldiers had entered through the open side and were neatly arranged into equal lines and spaces. There was one spot left open in the front row, and Caleb took it. In front of him, a grid lowered down as a fourth wall. The floor they were standing on moved up at a rapid speed. It was like a gigantic elevator. As it ascended, they passed multiple floors. It took almost six minutes to reach the surface. It stopped inside. There was an entire multi-level parking garage in Jerusalem that was just a facade, but no one knew it, as it was supposedly still under construction. There were whole divisions of soldiers already lined up and ready to deploy right into the heart of Jerusalem. All that was needed was the order. 
Caleb had to eliminate Therion before he gave that order. Chapter 36, Clash of the Gods, Jerusalem, Israel Therion hovered down to the western wall complex where Seir had already established a base and was surrounded by the New World Council. The two are trapped, but have a defensible position, Therion said. They are in the connecting point between the upper and lower realms and are standing on holy ground. Lord Therion, Daron said, holy ground is nothing to us. We can defeat them either way. Therion flicked his fingers in the air and used his new powers to teach the man a lesson. He immediately fell on his back. You know nothing, Daron. You're but a worm and a fool. Do not ever question my leadership again. We're not fighting merely against flesh and blood, but against ancient cosmic forces. The weapons of our warfare are not guns and bombs. It is a war of authority. I now possess authority over the earth, but that one piece of land, the Temple Mount, still holds sway. It is only a matter of time until we dislodge them from their haven, and then we will strike. Seer had modified his quantum field phase inducer into a directed ray gun that stood three feet tall. Its barrel could emit a quantum field phase in a specified direction. If it worked right, it should disrupt the holy space and make the two subject to his attack. He looked at Therian, who gave him the signal. He turned on the power, and he gave a low rumble, just like the bigger machines did back at his laboratory. It didn't need to open a wormhole for an entity like Endel to come through. It just needed to mess things up for the two. He turned on the beam and it hit the two, who were still in the air, repeating their message. The two felt a disruption in the quantum field and they dropped down to the ground. They moved themselves out of the field of the beam and regained their ability to hover. Therian ascended into the air in the direction of the two. He could sense them losing strength, though he knew that even a wounded dog can give a lethal bite. He would kill them, but he had to proceed cautiously. He would need to get them off the Temple Mount, where their strength was the greatest. They knew they must act quickly, and cried out, Barad! The clouds above began to swirl, and lightning flashed. Suddenly, Barad, hail, fell on the city. Dr. Seer acted quickly and managed to cover his machine so it wouldn't get damaged by the hail. Theron smirked at their juvenile attempt. The plague of hail might have frightened Pharaoh ages ago, but they forgot that unlike Pharaoh, who had just pretended to be a god, he truly was, and such physical weapons had negligible effect on him. Suddenly dozens of lightning bolts struck Therion, at once hurling him down. His body lay limp on the ground, his hair singed, his clothes were smoking. He lifted himself off the ground. Clearly the two were not out of tricks yet. He dusted himself off indignantly. The two then opened their mouths and fire streamed directly at him at the speed of sound. Theron immediately held up his hand and the streams of fire bounced off like water off a rock. He casually turned to Dr. Seer. Can you expand the beam to cover more area? Yes, I suppose I could. He changed the settings on the machine and sent the beam once again. While it was less potent, it covered more area and the two were sure to be enveloped in it. This time they fell to the ground and landed with a thud. The fall was the first significant pain they felt since they had started their ministry. Well done. Now let's direct the energy weapons against them. We will weaken them and then go in for the kill. Daron had called up Israel's military to assist in the fight. They aimed their sonic and microwave energy weapons at the two. The two were pushing back the waves of an energy field emitting from their hands. They're resisting. The last time we used these on them, they had no effect. But this time it appears they're losing strength. My recommendation, Lord Therion, is to keep pounding them with these as long as necessary. After several hours of barely fending off the energy weapons, the two knew they were sitting ducks as long as the quantum field phase inducer disrupted the energy of the holy place. Perhaps if they were moving, they would at least stand a chance of defending themselves. They moved in opposite directions, away from each other and out of the range of the quantum field ray. They felt the power surge back into them. Without hesitation, they unleashed a lightning strike on Theron's command post. A powerful lightning bolt hit the energy weapons and destroyed them. Another bolt came racing down, about to destroy the quantum field phase inducer, when Theron covered it with an energy field of his own. Screams of panic were heard in the crowd and among those who were recording the events on their devices. Theron motioned to the New World Council members and said, You have one job, and that is to protect the phase inducer. Together you can summon an energy shield to protect it. Dr. Seer, keep it aimed at the holy place. So long as we can keep them out of that safe place, we can do our work. Strange shadows were approaching the two. They looked like beings surging from the underworld. 
Chaim moved quickly through the old city streets. He normally would have been with family and friends celebrating the retelling of the ancient story of how the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had delivered them out of their Egyptian bondage. As he moved between homes, he heard a medley of sounds as each family was at a different place in the story. Baruch atah Adonai. Blessed are you, O Adonai. Some were in the midst of recounting the ten plagues. Dam, blood, Tzvadea, frogs, kinim, locusts, Hoshech, darkness, Bechorot, death of the firstborn. He walked past one house where he heard, I will carry out judgments against all the gods of Egypt, I the Lord. He loved that part where God had framed the Exodus as a battle between himself and the false gods of Egypt. God had sent Moses and Aaron to liberate his people and had warned Pharaoh about what judgments would come if they did not heed the warning. In a way, very similar to the message of the two who were also warning the world of the coming judgments and what would happen if they did not heed. Others were singing the happy song, Dayenu, if the Lord had merely rescued us and had not cast judgments upon the Egyptians, if he had merely cast judgment upon the Egyptians, but had not cast judgment upon their gods, if he had merely cast judgment upon their gods, but had not slain their firstborn, Dayenu, it would have been enough. The voice he heard was so clear. Caleb was in danger. Chaim picked up his pace. He truly wondered if it would be enough. He hoped, at least, that there would be time to save his friends. He kept walking and noticed a child had opened a door to look this way and that to see if Elijah had come. Chaim smiled as he walked briskly by. Ever since the two had shown up, the world had not been the same. Many in Israel had come to the conclusion that Elijah had finally come. The two spoke in ancient biblical Hebrew and kept speaking of the great and terrible day of Adonai. Chaim thought about families that had been restored through their message. Could the hearts of the fathers have finally returned to the children, and vice versa? He recognized the prophetic passage from the book. He turned the final stretch to the Kotel, or what the outsiders called the Western Wall. Up until Theron had hovered into the city days ago, the two had brought a special sense of security to the ultra-Orthodox and religious factions in Jerusalem. Some religious said they were protecting Israel against the ever-increasing threat leveled by enemies. Indeed, while much of the world was suffering by the plagues the two were bringing upon the world, Israel was somehow spared, which of course only made her enemies hate her all the more. But the sudden signing of the Babel Initiative by the conniving interim Prime Minister Doron had changed everything. Suddenly the ground under Chaim's feet convulsed and shook violently. It was as if a massive hammer had just descended upon it. In the sky, a lightning storm raged over the Temple Mount. The wind picked up abruptly, creating a turbulent storm. Another massive thud crashed down. Dishes fell off tables and windows broke in their homes near the Kotel. An elderly woman in front of him lost her balance, and he steadied her just in time to keep her from hitting the hard, ancient floor, which would have certainly broken her hip. At last, Chaim was able to get through the security to see what was happening. There at the western wall, he saw Therian shoot lightning from his hands. The two looked different. They were no longer the confident and powerful messengers. No, they looked ragged and exhausted. They looked mortal. They were able to deflect the lightning strikes with energy fields, but with every strike they grew weaker. They looked like a boxer who can't keep his hands up and finally gets the knockout blow. Therian sensed their strength was gone and sent lightning strikes from multiple angles. He then pummeled them with baseball-sized hail, followed by balls of fire falling from the sky. The two who had been able to withstand the world's greatest weapons were failing against the might of Therion. While lightning continued to strike them rapidly from multiple angles, Therion hovered closer to them. With a motion of his hand, one of the two was suspended in midair. A kind of electric rope held him tight while Therion turned his attention to the other. He immobilized the other and then brought his hand back and launched a palm-heel strike to the solar plexus with the impact of a cannon. The prophet flew backwards and hit the western wall. Massive Herodian stones broke under the impact. The prophet fell to the ground and was near the point of death. Therian levitated a huge 20-ton stone from the Temple Mount ruins nearby. He raised it hundreds of feet into the air, then brought it down on the prophet like a hammer with all his might. The prophet's once impervious body absorbed much of the blow, but even that was too much. He was dead. Then Therian turned back to the other who was still suspended in midair, tied by the electric rope. The prophet had regained just enough strength to levitate a Herodian stone. He attempted to throw it at Therion, but Therion quickly parried, took control of the stone, and set it on the ground. Then, just by the power of his hands, he took hold of the prophet, and like someone who would beat out a carpet, he held his feet and smacked his head into the wall, back and forth, again and again, bludgeoning him. The prophet was able to slow his impact slightly, but not enough to stop massive damage. 
His blood splattered against the stone. He was dead. They were both dead. Therian's heart filled with pride. The two who had terrorized planet Earth were dead. Earth could finally breathe easy. Elyon's messengers were dead. It would be just a matter of time until Elyon's claim to the planet was gone, and he would present no more threat. This world belonged to him now. Soon, if the son of Baruch played his role as expected, then heaven would be his too. He smirked. So much for an all-powerful being. Incredible that El Yon could be roped in by his own laws. His own sense of righteousness and justice tied his hands. And his love for the pathetic humans was his undoing. But now, he, Therian, was a god. All would worship him and him alone. All rivals would be put down. Humanity would bow before him and kiss the ground he walked on. Or they would die. He chuckled. Either option was fine. Chapter 37 Wounded Savior Temple Mount, Jerusalem The battle had been live-streamed over the new internet, so the reaction to the two's death was immediate. Inhabitants of Jerusalem quickly began rushing up to the Temple Mount to witness with their own eyes that they were indeed dead. The tormentors of the earth were finally gone, and their message of hate had been silenced. Those who had been the most targeted by their message were the most ecstatic. Women and men were crying tears of joy. Some were hyperventilating at the thought that the two were truly dead. The euphoria after the Allies had defeated Nazi Germany paled in comparison. Earth itself was saved. There was dancing in the streets and massive public displays of affection. Once the reality that they were dead had sunk in, the crowd turned their attention to the one who had destroyed them. They started chanting uncontrollably, Therion! Therion! Women were swooning. Some were promising their bodies or their firstborn to this savior of mankind. Outside the Temple Mount, people were watching on their phones, and every city screen around the world was watching the momentous occasion. Caleb made his way to the Temple Mount, but found that even the stairs going up to it were completely blocked by people. He then remembered from his army training many years ago that there were a series of secret security entrances designed for the police and army in case of riots. He found one of the doors and navigated his way through. All he could think about was finding Therian and stopping him. But how? He stepped out onto the Temple Mount and was stunned. There were throngs of people crammed into the space. In all his days, he had never seen the Muslims press in so closely in their worship of Allah. All the people had their hands reaching toward Therian and were incessantly chanting his name. Why would they do that unless they were worshiping him? The realization hit him like a bomb exploding in his heart. They were worshipping him. Chaim had explained all of this from the ancient texts, which he claimed were written by his god. Caleb searched for a reasonable explanation, but could find none. His mind was racing. He was trying to remember how the text went. He would exalt himself, defy every other god, desecrate the temple, sit in the temple, and then show himself to be god. Caleb was relieved. Sure, people were ecstatic about Therian, but he wasn't claiming to be god yet. Caleb chuckled and reasoned that if he were to be quite literal, then it couldn't be true because Therian was standing. The ancient text said he would sit in the holy place. So, technically, the prophecy was not being fulfilled. Rabbi Israel Cohen was startled at the massive rush of people onto the Temple Mount who were coming dangerously close to the holy space. Even Therian should not be there, though he did purchase it. Only priests, the Levites and Kohanim, of which he was one, as evidenced by his last name, Cohen, were allowed to be in the holy place. So long as Therian remained outside the outer perimeter, the tabernacle would remain undefiled. He prayed Hashem would protect his space. Israel had waited far too long for this opportunity to restart the sacrifices. It had been 2,000 years without sacrifices, and now, thanks to Therian's generosity in brokering, they had been able to resume them. But now Therian had brought a mob into the sacred space, so long as no one crossed from the profane into the sacred, it would be okay. Cohen was also shocked that the crowd kept chanting Therian's name. It must have gone on for 20 minutes, and it was not subsiding. The crowd got more and more excited with each minute. Cohen went to the tent door to look out, and to his utter shock, Therian was right there, approaching the entrance. Cohen protested, Mr. Therian, you are not permitted here. Please leave. Therian stared at him as if he were a bug to be squashed. He crossed the threshold into the holy area where the altar was located and proceeded toward it. 
Cohen protested furiously, but his cries were quickly drowned out by the followers immediately behind Therion. Daron walked up to Cohen and with just one hand picked him up and held him suspended. Therion ascended the altar in front of the tabernacle so that everyone could see him. Cohen's heart sank. He tried to break free from Daron's grip, but to no avail. Daron was too strong. Cohen protested again, but his voice was drowned out. The tormentors that plagued earth are gone, Therion boasted. Immediately, the audience broke into euphoria once again. He had to wait several minutes before he could continue speaking. The two hostiles who challenged mankind's way of life are no more. Truly, a new age has dawned for humankind. How could there not be jubilation? He shouted at the top of his lungs. Gavi, Isabel, and the Council of Ten stood near the altar. Droves of people chanted his name at the top of their lungs. Soldiers formed a barrier around the altar so that the crowds couldn't get to Therion. Seer was on the steps of the altar. On Seer's head, a symbol had appeared. The crowds pushed to get closer. Gavi stared at the symbol. That was impossible. Her formula would never have produced that. Something was off. They needed to do more testing. This wasn't ready for prime time. Oh, Therian was a genius, but still the prudent thing to do would be to run more tests and discover what they really had created. It might not be safe. She just needed a chance to speak with him. Therion, 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 the crowd continued chanting. Therion, still basking in the moment, raised his hand and the crowd went quiet. Look at this monument to Hashem. He has only controlled us, divided us, and weakened us. He waved his hand, indicating the tabernacle behind him. Let the bodies of the two messengers of this god lie ingloriously where they are, he said, motioning to them. They will serve as an example for anyone who will defy me, the one true God. I will not bow my knee to any so-called gods any longer. I am God. The crowd went ballistic. Caleb's eyes were wide in astonishment. Was he seeing the prophecy being fulfilled right in front of his eyes? It couldn't be. Therion almost appeared to glow. It was as if the adoration of the crowd caused his presence and power to grow stronger. They hung on his every word. I am God. I am God. I am God. And you can be like me. I defy the God of this tabernacle. I denounce the God of heaven, Elion. You can all be gods. We can be one people, united, strong, and invincible. The crowd started chanting, You are God! You are God! You are God! Several men ascended the altar carrying an ornate chair they had clearly pilfered from the nearby Al-Aqsa Mosque. They set it on the altar behind Therian, who was still reveling in their praise. He looked back at the seat and then sat down. Again, the crowd exploded with excitement. Their champion had ascended the throne and had taken his rightful place. Therian sensed Caleb was there. He smiled. The son of Baruch would play his part perfectly. Caleb had no idea who he was. His biological parents never told him whose family line they were a part of. Therian's actions would shame this location, which Israel's greatest king had prepared for the building of the temple. Everything was going according to Enlil's plan. He chuckled at the brilliance of it all. Oh, Enlil was so worthy of praise, for there was none like him. He was full of wisdom and beauty. He was the seal of perfection. It really hadn't been that difficult to outwit Elion. A respectable foe he was, yes. But that only made the game that much more enjoyable. And yes, Enlil had needed to bide his time. But what great chess master doesn't understand that? Caleb's heart was racing. Everything he had believed in was failing, and the things Haim, his father, and his brothers stood for all of a sudden seemed true. Theron was doing exactly as the prophecies had foretold. Large beads of sweat dripped from his brow. His breath was short and shallow. His mind was flooded with questions, doubts, and fear. He felt the darkness surround him and call him. This fear entered his bones and his every cell. He needed space. He needed to think. From his many years of military and Krav Maga training, he knew that fear made one dumb. The flow of blood was directed away from the prefrontal cortex where conscious thinking took place and redirected to the amygdala, the so-called fight-or-flight area of the brain. As a soldier, his responses to situations had been so well ingrained in him that there was no need to consciously think about things. They had become part of him. 
they were as much part of him and were automatic and second nature as catching a ball was to a baseball player or a dance move was to a dancer. But the revelations he had just seen were not part of that dance. This was all new. It was different and utterly unexpected. He hadn't trained for this. He knew he was frozen like the proverbial deer in the headlights, but he could do nothing to snap out of it. Fear had him, and despite his mind shouting to move and do something, there he remained, stunned, immobile, and dumbfounded. Therian felt Caleb's fear. It was perfect. He turned to Seer and held out his hand. Seer, looking younger than before, walked higher up the ramp of the altar and held out a box to Theron. A latch slid open, and from it he took an injector pistol. The key to immortality. I am the resurrection. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The crowd chanted once again, We believe! We believe! We believe! Come to me, all of you who are tired of status quo, and I will give you rest. Take my burden upon you and become a god. Caleb shrank at his words. He felt his mind become cloudy. His eyes were heavy. He couldn't think, move, or choose. He could only watch in horror and disbelief. Therian walked up to Seer and reached out his arm. He placed his hand on Seer's forehead, where a curious shape had developed. It was two parallel lines with in-facing triangles at either end. Caleb looked at the ten. They also had the symbol on their foreheads, though not all of them. He noticed that some of them had the mark on their right hands instead of the foreheads. Caleb stared at it in a moment of deja vu. He was sure he had seen it before, but where? After a few moments, the memory came rushing to his mind. Chaim had shown it to him in the research papers. It was the logogram of Enlil. Caleb felt his legs giving way under him and was grateful there was a wall behind him to steady himself. Everything Chaim had told him was there, right before his eyes. Dr. Seer, Dr. Markov, and the 10 New World Council members have all taken the MRC, the Molecular Regeneration Code, and look at them. They stand before you taller, stronger, and they even look younger. If you care about our world and our freedom, then everyone must want to receive the MRC. Gavi stood to the side, still looking for a chance to speak with Therian. The crowd went wild, reaching for the injector. Do you want this? We want it, they all screamed. Do you want to be remade in my image? The crowd again went wild with anticipation. Yes! Receive the MRC with joy and open your minds to become part of my mind. My destiny shall be your destiny. Caleb had an urge to reach into his pocket for some strange reason. His finger slid in and he felt something. He pulled it out and there was a Pesach Zman candy bar. Where had that come from? He was not the type to buy candy bars and forget them in his pockets. He decided not to think about it too much. The truth was he had not eaten in an awfully long time. He opened up the wrapper and ate. He could feel the sugar give him an immediate boost. At just a few moments, he was regaining strength and brain clarity. The fog was lifting and his power was returning. Perhaps his fainting had been due to low blood sugar. He wasn't sure, but he still needed to get closer, if nothing else, to protect Gavi in case something got weird. Therian raised his hand and the crowd pulled back. Those who labor shall receive the first reward. He motioned to Gavi, smiling. Gavriella, come to me. She walked slowly toward him. She was scared. No, she was petrified. But her parents had always told her she had to move toward her problem, not away from it. She would have to overcome her fear and do the right thing and warn him of the dangers. Therian, you, you're making promises that might not be true. We discovered something amazing, but perhaps we ought to do more testing before rolling it out to the general public. And it isn't to make people into gods. It is to stop suffering. You will have to speak up, he said condescendingly. The crowd can't hear you. Gavi didn't want the entire world to hear. She wanted to keep this matter professional and discreet. Caleb tried to get her attention. Gavi! Gavi! She looked around, imagining she had heard someone call her, but the noise was overwhelming. Caleb again called, but she could not hear him. Caleb tried pushing his way through the crowd, but saw he wouldn't get to her in time. He looked back to a raised ledge against the wall of the tabernacle and jumped onto it. Theron reached his hand out, and Gavi took it. He brought his other hand with the injector closer. 
She tried her message again now that she was closer. Therian, we need to do more testing. I'm concerned about the mark on Seer's forehead. It shouldn't be there. Did you hear that? Therian said playfully. My lovely scientist is concerned about us becoming gods after I just killed the two greatest terrorists the world has ever known. Gavi was becoming concerned. Therian must be experiencing some effects from the dangerous procedure to which he had so willingly submitted himself. She was glad he volunteered to help, and frankly, she was glad the two were gone. But still, they needed to do more testing. She knew if she had some time, she could remove whatever caused the mark to appear on his forehead, and she could balance the formula to make it stable and safe. Caleb was watching in horror. He could see what was happening. He panicked. He had to stop Therian. But how? All he had was a pistol he had taken off the guards in Babel, but it had an accuracy of no more than 50 meters. The gun was not amazing, and he was about 45 meters away. He took it out and looked inside the clip. Oh no, there was only one bullet. It would have to count. Theron was holding her by the wrist with one hand and the injector gun in the other. Oh no, Gavriella thought. No, 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 she wasn't ready. It wasn't ready. The menacing look in Therian's eyes frightened her. She threw herself back and fell off the altar into the crowd who caught her. Gavi tried to free herself, but the entranced crowds passed her along and threw her back onto the altar, where she landed on her knees in front of Therian. They cheered, Therian, Therian, Therian. Some people in the crowd noticed Caleb and climbed up to pull him down. Thankfully, they could only come up from one side of the wall. They came at him and he started taking them out one by one with his skills, all the while keeping an eye on Therian. He grabbed Gavi's wrist with an iron grip. She struggled to free herself, but his grip was too strong. He moved the injector toward her arm. This was it. Caleb ran up the bodies of those he had knocked out, took the gun from under his shirt, jumped in the air, and fired. Therian had already jabbed the injector into her arm and the MRC went into her veins. She cried out and the crowd went wild. The next moment a loud bang was heard and Therian's head snapped back. Blood ran down his face and he collapsed onto the altar. Blood was freely running out of the bullet wound that took his eye. The crowd screamed in agony. They began trampling each other in the panic stampede, trying to get away. Caleb fell to the ground, now clear of people, did a forward roll, and sprang to his feet. He ran as fast as he could to Gavi. She couldn't believe it. He had injected her. Her mind flooded with fear. She hadn't wanted it. She couldn't believe that he had done it against her will. Certainly this was part of the formula that could still be adjusted. Even his own genetic makeup could be adjusted if he would just give her time. But now he had injected her. What would that mean? Before he had injected her, she had all the answers. She was the scientist, the specialist. But now she was the patient, the experiment. She was in a daze. She looked around, completely overwhelmed by the moment. Then suddenly she was in a trance. In her mind, she saw a door and heard knocking. She went to the door. Who was there? A voice responded, Permit me to enter your mind and you will not just have immortality and superhuman ability but you will have my mind too. My destiny will be your destiny. Bow down to me and I will come in. I I don't think I want to. No, I I don't want that, she said, backing away from the door. The knocking grew louder. The one on the other side rammed against it. No, she screamed. No, no, I don't want it. You can't come in. She didn't fully understand what was happening, but she knew something had happened when she had been injected. Now the voice demanded entry into her mind. Fear struck her. Then in front of the closed door was a being that looked like an angel. She hadn't noticed him before. He looked gentle and kind, but at the same time incredibly strong. The door will not open unless you want it to. She felt relief and then heard her name again. Gavi! Caleb shouted at her. Her eyes were glazed over. Gavi! Suddenly she woke. Where were you? Gavi focused and looked at Caleb. Um, tell me later. Jump! Daron looked at Caleb and sent his men after him. Caleb looked around for escape routes. Come on, let's go, that way. They ran toward the security entrance and tried to hide themselves between the fleeing crowds as they did. Seer and Antonio rushed to Therion to see if there were signs of life. Chapter 38, Regeneration, Jerusalem, Israel. Caleb and Gavi ran out the security entrance. Doron's men fired and one narrowly missed Caleb's head. Caleb closed the door and jammed it shut. There, he pointed toward an area that looked clear. Gavi suddenly stopped. Wait, what? We can't wait. We need to go now, Caleb pressed. Oh no, Alexander. She started to cry as the implications of their situation dawned on her. You killed him, Caleb. You murdered him. 
I had to. He was hurting you. No, he wasn't himself. It was a side effect of the MRC. He's still adapting. He wouldn't... She slammed her fist into his chest. Caleb was surprised. You killed him. You didn't have to kill him. What have you done? What have you done, Caleb? He was our best hope and you killed him. Caleb grabbed hold of her hands as she struggled against his grip. Gavi, you don't know who he is. He was going to do terrible things against our people, worse than Hitler. The pursuers banged against the door. Caleb wanted to run, but Gavi refused. How do you know that? The sounds of police sirens were rapidly approaching the Temple Mount. Gavi, we need to go now, please. I'll explain it all later. Gavi pulled away. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me. How do you know? The door began moving. More soldiers came running across the Temple Mount. It was prophesied. I, I know you don't understand, but you need to trust me. We need to go or it will be too late. She looked him in the eyes and nodded sadly. He let go of her arms. Okay, let's go. Gavi turned away and ran toward the door to release it. Caleb was shocked. What? No. He realized he needed to run, but he didn't want to leave her. But sadly, she had made her choice and refused to come with him. His heart broke. He would have to cry later. He sprinted down the side of the security tunnel with his soldiers in hot pursuit. Shots fired, but he managed to duck around the corner in time. Caleb was faster than they were and managed to create some distance as he ran across the mount. As he reached the gate, two soldiers blocked his way, but before they could aim their weapons, Caleb had disarmed them and had knocked them down. More soldiers pursued him, firing at Caleb but barely missing. He spun around and fired back at them with the rifle he had just taken off one of the others. They took hits in their bulletproof vests, which slowed them down, but they kept coming. The rifle jammed. Caleb dropped it and grabbed a pistol instead. Caleb saw a police car parked on the side of the road. The cops had been busy with some troublemakers further down the road, but when they heard the shots at the Temple Mount, they immediately came running back. They were still too far away to stop Caleb from jumping into their car and speeding off. Police and soldiers closed in on Caleb from different directions. A drone flew overhead. CCTV cameras turned to follow him as he passed. He turned down some side streets and momentarily avoided detection. Unfortunately, the road was jammed with traffic. Caleb stopped the car. He saw a police cap and jacket on the back seat and quickly put them on. He tucked the pistol into his belt and started walking briskly down the street, making sure that his face avoided the cameras. Cops were approaching from all sides. One pointed at him, and he quickly turned the corner. He saw a high-cost apartment building and entered. The security guard thought he was a cop and waved him past. Caleb skipped the elevators and took the stairs. Once in the staircase, Caleb locked the door behind him and sprinted up the stairs, skipping two at a time. Police and military officers burst into the building. The security guard was overwhelmed by the sudden activity in the lobby. A police sergeant approached him and asked, Did a man wearing a police jacket just come in here? The security guard pointed toward the elevator lobby. Yes, he went that way. The rest of the officers pursued immediately, but the sergeant needed more information. How many floors does this building have? How many apartments? Eight floors, 200 apartments. They ran to the elevators and pushed the buttons. The ranking officer directed two other officers to the stairs. Caleb exited the staircase onto the roof of the apartment building. He again shut the door, but there was nothing to lock or jam it with. He ran to the edge of the roof. There was no building close enough for him to leap to. He leaned over just far enough to see more soldiers and police officers entering the building. He looked around for a hiding place and saw a brick structure housing the building's air conditioning motor. The soldiers and police officers went door to door, floor to floor, searching for Caleb. Caleb had his back against the wall of the air conditioning motor. From his position, he had a view over Jerusalem toward the Temple Mount. Caleb released the magazine from the pistol and checked his rounds. Ten. He reinserted the magazine and charged the round into the chamber, ready for action. Caleb video dialed a number on his phone. Eitan Baruch's profile picture came up while it was ringing. It was an old picture of Eitan with his three boys in happier times. The profile pic disappeared and its place was Eitan. Caleb? Abba, I can't speak long. How's Asher? Eitan looked as if he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's gone, Caleb. I don't understand it. Caleb had to pull the phone away from his face as tears immediately welled up. He tried hard to compose himself. He was a good boy. But I don't understand, Caleb. The doctors don't want me to give answers. He disappeared from the hospital. Please, can you talk to them? I don't understand how. Can't you use Babel's AI to find his body? Caleb shook his head. Listen, Abba, I don't have much time. Where are you? What did Daron do to you? I'm on medical leave or a nice form of house arrest. Are you in trouble? 
At the moment, a drone came flying around the building and it spotted Caleb. Caleb could see the camera was trained on him. He knew what was coming. Eitan could see Caleb was looking up at something, then back down at him. Abba, you are going to hear some things about me, he said and continued looking up at the drone. Just know I had good reason. Inside the building, the unit commander had been shown the drone feed. He's on the roof, he called into his radio. All units, he's on the roof. Approach with extreme caution. Subject is armed and extremely dangerous. Across all floors, they ran toward the stairs. Tears were flowing from Caleb's eyes. It was hard to keep it back. I failed you, Amitai, Asher, and Israel. Abba, I'm sorry I couldn't do better. Hatan shook his head. No, not again. Not his only son. I have to go, Caleb said. Wait, I love you, Caleb. Hatan was crying. The group of heavily armed soldiers and police had increased to 23 and were bolting up the stairs toward the roof. A few stayed in the lobby to maintain the rear guard. Caleb wished he'd had more time. Get out of Jerusalem, Caleb told Eitan. He dropped the phone to the ground and shot the drone with one shot right through its control center. The drone fell from the sky, crashing down on a car below. Caleb took aim at the doorway. After what seemed like an eternity, the door burst open. Caleb shot the first soldier in his kneecap and the second in his collarbone, causing them to block the doorway. After they cleared the doorway, the soldiers began firing a non-stop barrage of bullets toward Caleb, who had ducked behind the air conditioner housing again. Every now and then, he fired back until he was down to his last round. The rifle fire ceased. Caleb steeled himself for what was coming. A grenade came flying out the door toward Caleb. He dove for cover just before the grenade exploded. The massive blast ripped up the asphalt on the roof and sent debris flying in Caleb's direction and off the rooftop. The concussive blast caused Caleb's ears to ring and his eyes to blur. He tried to wipe the debris from his eyes. He could hear the muted sounds of gunfire. Caleb saw a bright flash of light shining from around the corner. He reached for his pistol, which had dropped from his hand. Still struggling to see, he lifted his pistol and stepped out to meet his fate. As Caleb rounded the corner, he saw a man standing between him and all of the bodies of Caleb's pursuers, which were strewn across the roof. The shouting had stopped since they were all on the ground. The man turned to Caleb, and it seemed as if his face was glowing. Caleb. Caleb recognized the voice. Caleb. The man walked toward Caleb. Caleb took two steps back and lifted his pistol, but stumbled and fell back. The man stepped forward and placed his hand over Caleb's eyes. When he removed his hand, Caleb was stunned to see Asher standing in front of him, completely healed. His face was glowing, and on his forehead was some kind of ancient symbol. Asher? How? Asher smiled. I'll explain another time. Now we have to go. Asher's glow dimmed to normal and the mark on his forehead became invisible. Caleb looked at all the bodies. They're sleeping, Asher said, to answer the question on Caleb's mind. Come on. As Caleb entered the staircase, he saw all the soldiers and police officers knocked unconscious and spread out over a few floors of the staircase. They walked between them, climbed over, and around them. Asher and Caleb went from the staircase into the lobby, where a few more officers had passed out. Ibrahim, the building security guard, was standing between them, trying to figure out what had happened. Up until 20 minutes earlier, the day had been such a normal day, but suddenly the world had gone crazy. He looked up to see Caleb and Asher walk past. Caleb waved and smiled. Without thinking, Ibrahim waved back. In the street, Asher stopped and turned to Caleb. Walk to the main road. A green bus will stop on the corner tomorrow at midnight. Caleb could see who was talking to his brother, but he had never heard him speak in such a clear and confident manner. He had so many questions, but understood it would have to wait for another time. In light of recent events, nothing could surprise Caleb more. Asher, I killed Alexander Therian. Isn't it over now? No, brother. It's just begun. Gavi walked back to the altar with tears streaming down her face. She saw paramedics trying to resuscitate Therian, but she knew it was too late. Not even the MRC would have been able to save him. His blood was everywhere on the altar. Seer and Antonio were in deep discussion. Nearby, women were still weeping. Reporters tried to push past police to get better pictures of Therian's lifeless body and the constant sobbing flashes and the constant strobing flashes from their cameras created a blinding display. Gavi looked down at her arm where Therian had ejected the MRC and rubbed the bruised area. She really hadn't been prepared to receive it, nor had she wanted it. I won't give up the dream, I promise. Those who had, just moments ago, pinned their hope on him for eternal life wept bitterly. 
They cursed Caleb and Remnant. They cursed the two and the supposed God they had once served. They looked in horror at their dead Savior and wept. They hated the whole group of religious bigots and wanted them dead. Gavi stared at Therian's lifeless body. Someone came over with a sheet to cover him. But she said, just a moment. I need just a moment more. She wept bitterly and laid her head on his chest. She had been so sure that he and she were going to help so many people overcome sickness and even death one day. But now all those dreams had perished with him. If only Caleb hadn't acted so impetuously. Caleb, what have you done? She sobbed. We were going to change the world, but you killed him. She then lifted her head in rage and overwhelm. You killed him! She screamed at the top of her lungs. You killed him! Why did you kill him, Caleb? The world was so close to a breakthrough. The Babel Initiative, the MRC, it was everything the world wanted and everything it needed. Oh, Therion, she moaned. Oh, Therion, you can't be dead. Not now, not like this. You're going to save us from ourselves and lead us to peace. Peace like never before. Harmony, goodwill toward men. She laid her head back on his chest and wept uncontrollably. All her hope was gone. She couldn't bear it. This man was going to change the world. Then she heard the sound of air rushing in, then an exhale. She imagined his chest was rising and falling, rising and falling. She opened her eyes. Indeed, his chest was rising and falling. Wait, could he? She turned her head and looked at his face. Suddenly, an eye opened. To be continued. This concludes the reading of Read Genesis Code by Dr. Douglas Hamp and Monet Theonisen, published by Eschaton Media Group, 2023, All Rights Reserved, read by the author. Thank you.